The Lost Revolution The Story of the Official IRA and the Workers' Party Brian Hanley and Scott Miller Penguin Ireland Penguin Ireland Published by the Penguin Group Penguin Ireland 25 Street Stevens Green Dublin 2 Ireland A Division of Penguin Books Limited Penguin Books Limited 80 Strand London WC2R0RL England Penguin Group USA Inc. 375 Hudson Street New York New York 10014 USA Penguin Group Australia 250 Camberwell Road, Camberwell, Victoria 3124, Australia. A division of Pearson Australia Group Thai Limited, Penguin Group, Canada, 90 Eglinton Avenue East, Suite 700, Toronto, Ontario, Canada M4P2Y3. A division of Pearson Penguin Canada Inc. Penguin Books India Private Limited, 11 Community Centre, Panchshiel Park, New Delhi 110,017. India Penguin Group, NZ. 67 Apollo Drive, Rosedale, North Shore 0632, New Zealand. A division of Pearson New Zealand Limited, Penguin Books, South Africa, Thai. Limited, 24 Sturdy Avenue, Rosebank, Johannesburg 2196, South Africa Penguin Books Limited. Registered offices, 80 Strand, London WC2R0RL, England www.penguin.com First published 2009 Copyright Copyright Brian Hanley and Scott Miller. 2009 The moral right of the authors has been asserted all rights reserved without limiting the rights under copyright reserved above. No part of this publication may be reproduced, stored in or introduced into a retrieval system, or transmitted, in any form or by any means, electronic, mechanical, photocopying, recording or otherwise, without the prior written permission of both the copyright owner and the above publisher of this book ISBN. 978 O, in memory of Una Hanley 1944-1989 and in memory of Dearmood O'Leary 1976-1998 Contents Prologue 1 The Patriot Game 2 Army of the People 1962-1968-3 A New Revolution 4 1969 Backlash 5 Defense and Retaliation 6 Civil Rights Not Civil War 7 Towards the Revolutionary Party 8 Brothers Fighting Brothers 9 The Pogrom 10 A Historic Mission 11 Peace Work and Class Politics 12 Group B13 Hunger Strikes, Hahi and Heroin 14 Fight Back. 15 Workers Unite, 16 Special Activities 17 The Flight from Socialism Epilogue Acknowledgements Bibliography Notes Index Prologue The 25th of November 2005 The clapping and cheering died down and the throng around the bar went quiet as the stocky 71-year-old man mounted the stage. Restrained emotion was evident on his face as he gripped a handful of notes and prepared to begin his speech. Approximately 150 people had gathered in the basement hall of the Teachers Club in Dublin's Parnell Square. Outside sleet fell on a cold November night. Inside the atmosphere was more akin to a family reunion than a political meeting. The mainly middle-aged audience warmly greeted performances of ballads that celebrated the struggle for Irish independence and international socialism. Sean Garland, the president of the Workers' Party of Ireland, began his address. His speech was delivered without formality, in an unmistakably Dublin accent. Garland condemned his arrest, seven weeks previously in Belfast, on foot of a United States warrant accusing him of aiding the North Korean government of Kim Jong-il in an international multi-million, superdollar, counterfeiting scam. He praised the efforts of those gathered to bring attention to the arrest, which occurred on the eve of his party's annual conference. He berated the police service of Northern Ireland for doing the dirty work of the United States Secret Service and the so-called neocons who ruled that country. Warming to his theme, he denounced Tony Blair and Silvio Berlusconi as the willing lackeys of George Bush's regime, which was set upon the domination of the world. He reminded the audience, who greeted his more intemperate remarks with claps and cheers, of the anti-imperialist struggles of the last 50 years that had pitted revolutionaries against the agents of the United States across the globe. In the process he dismissed the so-called new democracies of the former Eastern Bloc for their subservience to the U.S. and their complicity in the secret torture prisons of the CIA. Closing his speech, Garland outlined the career of late U.S. civil rights lawyer Arthur Kinoy, who had defended those accused of communist sympathies in the 1950s, including Ethel and Julius Rosenberg, executed in 1953 for passing U.S. nuclear secrets to the USSR. Garland quoted from a speech of Kinoy's, I will never quit. I am old and small, but I will not stop because I know what I am doing and the others do not. And I believe in what I am doing and the others believe in nothing and fear everything. Garland added that, this statement stands as testimony to all those who have gone before us throughout the world who have lived their lives by the principles of Arthur Kinoy and to those who continue his and our struggle today. We can do no better than to follow the example of our fellow comrade U.S. citizen Arthur Kinoy.
Garland then left the stage to cheers and clenched fist salutes. Initially organized as a folk concert to raise funds for the Stop the Extradition of Sean Garland campaign, the event had taken on a more celebratory air since Garland had traveled south of the border on the grounds that he required medical tests, and then announced that he would not be returning to Belfast for an extradition hearing, claiming that he would not receive a fair trial. Instead he declared that he would place himself, under the protection of my own government and my country's constitution which will guarantee me basic human rights and freedoms. In the process he forfeited £30,000 in bail. The U.S. indictment outlined a case officially titled, The United States of America vs. Sean Garland, aka the man with the hat. U.S. agencies claimed that they had evidence of the central role the elderly Irishman played in an attempt to undermine the U.S. economy. The indictment also identified Garland as chief of staff of the official Irish Republican Army. It alleged a conspiracy involving former KGB agents, the North Korean Secret Service, British criminals and members of the official IRA. Garland's network was said to have distributed $29 million worth of high-quality forged $100 bills that had been printed in a secret location in North Korea. According to the indictment, the U.S. authorities had first become aware of a possible Irish connection in the early 1990s, when Irish banks had stopped handling over-the-counter transactions of $100 bills because of the number of forged notes in circulation. The people among whom Garland circulated following his speech were not concerned by these accusations. They were in the main the loyal remnants of a party that had once aspired to political power in Ireland. These men and women, unlike many in a country struggling to come to terms with the aspirations brought about by a dramatic economic boom, took pride in the designation, working class. No matter how small and politically obsolete the Workers' Party of 2005 appeared, for the faithful few gathered in this hall they were the true inheritors of the Irish revolutionary tradition stretching back to the United Irishmen in 1798 and continuing on through the IRA that fought against British rule after 1916. Like a number of his comrades gathered in Parnell Square that night, Sean Garland was a child of North Dublin. Born in 1934, he was raised in one room of a run-down tenement at Seven Belvedere Place as one of nine children, some of whom died in childhood. He was educated by the Christian brothers, then worked as a messenger boy and a bar help. He joined the IRA in June 1953 after making contact with them through the United Irishman newspaper. Like most of his comrades, Garland had joined the Republican movement driven by a belief that Ireland's greatest ill was partition. Stenciled slogans on the dilapidated walls of Dublin declared, Freedom Calls. Join the IRA, while songs recounting the glories of the Patriot dead were sung in pubs and learned by children. To remove the border and unite the country, was, Garland recalls, the only aim. Between 1956 and 1962 Garland and his IRA comrades had attempted to achieve this aim, in the so-called border campaign, which ended with an order to dump arms in February 1962. That order was to be the starting point of a political odyssey for Garland and for Tomás Maggiola, who became president of Sinn Féin in that year. Mac Giola would serve on the IRA Army Council with Garland during the 1960s, and side with him in 1969 when the Republican movement split into official and provisional wings. As Garland sat beside the 81-year-old Mac Giola in the teachers' club, they may have dwelt on memories of comrades from times past as the band struck up, Sean South. Garland sat quietly as many in the crowd joined in with the chorus of the song that recalled that day in January 1957 when an IRA column of 14 men under Garland's command attacked an RUC. Barracks in Brookborough, County Fermanagh. The raid left Sean South and Fergal O'Hanlon dead, and Garland, among others, badly injured. From the jaws of this defeat the Republican movement, as it had done many times before, drew a moral victory. Outpourings of nationalist sentiment at the young men's deaths resulted in thousands of people lining the streets for South's funeral cortege and for a time restored the IRA's position as idealistic heroes in the eyes of many. The raid also consolidated Garland's position as a man of action within the IRA. In June 1989, when the Workers' Party had won seven Dale seats and its president Proinches de Rosa had topped the poll for the European Parliament in Dublin, Garland had been the party's general secretary. But within three years the party had torn itself apart in a bitter split. Hence many of Garland's former party colleagues were not present that November night. These included the then Labour Party leader Pat Rabbit and his colleagues Liz McManus, Joe Sherlock, Eamon Gilmore and Kathleen Lynch as well as Mep Proinches de Rosa. Also absent were the numerous former members of the party in senior positions in the trade unions, the media, academe, the judiciary and the state sector on both sides of the border. Of the TDs who had once represented the Workers' Party only Mac Giola was present, accompanied by his wife May, herself a Republican activist since the 1940s. They sat beside Garland and his wife Mary, as the night's entertainment neared its end with, the red flag. 
the juxtaposition of the socialist anthem with the final rendition of Amran na bhfin, the Irish national anthem, may have caused Garland and Magiola to ponder the political journey they and their colleagues had made over the decades. The story of that journey is told in this book for the first time. It encompasses armed insurrection, several bitter splits, and the development of the most successful radical political grouping in the Republic of Ireland in recent decades, a party that would play a large part in the death of irredentist ideology in the South and stand for unity between Catholics and Protestants in Northern Ireland's working class as they teetered on the brink of civil war. The movement served as the training ground for much of the leadership of the present-day Labour Party and trade unions in the South. The revolution it struggled for, through violence and political activism, never took place, but the struggle helped shape modern Ireland. 1. The Patriot Game I was taught all my life cruel England to blame, and so I'm a part of the Patriot Game. Dominic Bean, The Patriot Game, in early September 1962, six months on from the cessation of the border campaign, Cathal Golding was appointed Chief of Staff of the IRA. Born in December 1922 in Dublin's East Erin Street, close to the River Liffey, Golding had the perfect pedigree to assume the highest rank within the movement. His grandfather had been a member of the Invincibles, the offshoot of the Fenian movement that had assassinated British ministers in the 1880s. His father Charles and uncle James had been members of both the secret Irish Republican Brotherhood and the Gaelic League. In 1913 Charles joined the Irish Volunteers, and in 1916 both Golding brothers took part in the Easter Rising as part of the Jacobs Factory garrison. Both were deported and interned in the rebellion's aftermath. Charles became a member of the Dublin Active Service Unit of the IRA during the War of Independence and took the anti-treaty side in the Civil War. A house painter, like many other Republicans he found it difficult to gain employment in the post-Civil War period. He became a self-employed, jobbing contractor, finding intermittent work during the hungry 1920s. Cathal Golding attended National School in Strand Street, and then St. Joseph's Christian Brothers School when the family moved to Ballybell. He left school in his early teens and became a house painter, his father's trade. He was a neighbor of the Bean family in Russell Street, with whom his father worked. He and Brendan Bean were, like brothers, and both joined the Republican Boy Scouts, Nafiana Aran, in 1931. In 1939 Golding joined the IRA itself and in December of that year took part in the organization's successful raid on the Irish Army's ammunition stores in the Phoenix Park. But the IRA was entering a grim period, having launched a disastrous bombing campaign in England the previous January. The beginning of the Second World War and the potential threat the IRA posed to the Irish state's neutrality saw Eamon de Valera's government clamp down hard on their former comrades. Hundreds of IRA members were jailed or interned without trial, while several were executed or died on hunger strike. In November 1941 Golding was jailed for a year in Mountjoy Prison for membership of an unlawful organization and possession of IRA documents. On his release in 1942 he was immediately interned in the Curra camp in Kildare, where he remained until late 1944. The Curra saw numerous splits and schisms, as comrades became enemies overnight. But the young Golding was a conventional IRA man and stayed loyal to what was seen as the hardline faction led by Liam Leddy. Golding and most of his fellow Republican prisoners emerged from internment in prison during 1945 to find the IRA shattered. It had lost several leading members during the war years, among them Chief of Staff Sean Russell, who had died on a German U-boat en route to Ireland. The leadership's tactical alliance with the Nazis had proved contentious while its involvement in gun battles that left several Guardi dead had shocked public opinion. So complete was the organization's defeat that the Fianna Fáil minister for justice Gerald Bulland reputedly boasted the IRA was dead and that he had killed it. But among some Republicans there was a determination to carry on, and in 1945 Carryman. Patty Fleming was appointed as the IRA's new chief of staff. The 22-year-old Golding was among a minority of former internees who returned to activity and was sent to help reorganize local units. In early 1946 representatives of the IRA from across the country met in the Ardy Bar in Dublin, only to be arrested by waiting Garda special branch officers. Several, including Golding, again received prison sentences. By 1947 Golding was out of prison and involved in running training camps in the Wicklow Mountains. In September 1948 the IRA held an important army convention, bringing together delegates from across the country to discuss the organization's future. This meeting saw a new leadership trio, who would dominate the IRA for over a decade, come to prominence. The three Max, as they came to be known, were led by Tony Megan, a farmer from Co. Meath who had spent five years interned in the Curra and was now chief of staff. Megan had a reputation for single-mindedness and discipline and was set on reading the IRA of the gangsterish image it had picked up during the war years. Sean Garland, who would later work closely with Megan, recalled him as a very decent individual and a very generous man, and as having no left or right political 
vision, just straight ahead. The second of the Max was Padraig McLogan, a native of Armagh, who had previously been a member of the Irish Seven-Man Army Council during the 1930s but was now a publican in Port Lawas. Within the organization McLogan was viewed by many as cold and autocratic. Completing the trio was Cork's Tomás Mac Curtin, who was released from Port Lawas jail in 1948. Sentenced to death for the murder of Agarda in 1940, Mac Curtin had been granted clemency, partly because his father, the mayor of Cork, had been murdered by British forces during the War of Independence. While imprisoned Mac Curtin had refused to wear prison uniform or conform to regulations. He was recalled as a great mixer and the most sociable of the new leaders. The three Macs believed that a degree of political mobilization was necessary to help rebuild the IRA, and towards this end a monthly Republican newspaper, The United Irishman, was launched in May 1948. During 1949 IRA volunteers were ordered to join the moribund Sinn Féin party. Sinn Féin recognized that supreme authority rested with the IRA Army Council and maintained a strict adherence to the policy of abstentionism, refusal to take seats in either the southern or northern parliaments. Republicans regarded both institutions as puppet creations of British imperialism. For the same reason, arrested IRA volunteers refused to recognize the courts, north or south, a stance that usually guaranteed a conviction. Non-recognition and abstentionism were seen as key principles that marked Republicans out from corrupt, compromising politicians. The year 1948 had seen the election of a new inter-party government in the South, which included the recently formed Clan Na Pablakta. This party was dominated by former senior IRA figures, including Sean McBride, who had been chief of staff in the late 1930s. Despite the larger coalition party being the pro-treaty Fine Gael, the new government had within a few months of taking office withdrawn the state from the British Commonwealth and declared it a republic. While the IRA denounced the actions of its former comrades in entering the Dale and still refused to recognize that the southern state was the republic, they were forced to acknowledge that a new situation existed. Due in part to the changed political atmosphere and in part to lingering public revulsion at the deaths of several Guardi and Republicans during violent clashes between 1939 and 1945, the IRA leadership decided it would now avoid any type of aggressive military action in the South. Instead all energies would be focused on a campaign in the North. In 1950 McLogan became Sinn Féin president and Megan also took a place on the organization's ruling executive, the Ard Chomherly, ensuring that the party was, in every sense IRA controlled. In May 1951 a military council was formed within the IRA leadership to plan a successful military campaign against the British Army of Occupation in Ireland. The 1950s might have offered fertile ground for Irish revolutionaries. The Republic was desperately poor at the start of the decade, and real national income stagnated between 1950 and 1958. The 1956 census revealed that the state's population was 2,894,822, the lowest ever, and net emigration was higher than in any period since 1881. 70% of emigrants were under 30 years of age. Economic distress led to some protest by the unemployed, but Ireland remained notably conservative, and the lack of a vibrant left did not preclude the existence of an intensely anti-communist right. In 1949 150,000 people, including many trade union leaders, had taken to the streets in Dublin to protest at communism in Eastern Europe. Collections were taken up at church gates to aid the Italian Christian Democrats in their struggle with Italy's Reds in 1948. The powerful Archbishop of Dublin, John Charles McQuaid, sponsored private clerical investigations into left-wingers, augmenting those of the special branch. Catholic papers such as the Standard hounded unemployed activists, and groups like Maria Duce warned Irish cinema-goers of the influence of communists in Hollywood. The deference shown by government ministers to the Catholic hierarchy during the thwarted attempt by Clan Na Pablakta Health Minister Noel Brown to introduce free health care for women and children in 1951 was a potent illustration of church power. Away from public view on married mothers, their children and working-class young offenders were subjected to often horrific abuse in church-run institutions, details of which would only emerge in later decades. Emigration helped siphon off what anger there was. Meanwhile, a great deal of emotion was expended on the question of partition. During 1949 an all-party campaign had organized a nationwide churchgate collection, rallies and public meetings in support of Irish reunification. For many people, the claim by the Irish press in the midst of the Second World War that there was no kind of oppression visited on any minority in Europe that the six county nationalists have not also endured, was not an exaggeration. Hence there were solid reasons behind the IRA's belief that if it avoided confrontation with the authorities in the South, a campaign in the North might be tolerated. The Republican movement also benefited from public disillusionment over the lack of progress of state-endorsed anti-partitionism. Tomás Mac Giola, who would become chairman of the IRA Army Council and president of Sinn Féin, 
was one of a number of people who left mainstream anti-partition groups, including Plan Na Pablakta, to join the IRA in this period. The IRA did not challenge the ethos of the 1950s southern state. In fact, in many ways they promoted a more extreme version of it. Republicans blamed the state's poor economic conditions on the legacy of British rule and argued that once the British were ousted from the north, the island would flourish. Republicans bemoaned the loss of the nation's lifeblood through emigration and promised that a free Ireland would stop it. But the United Irishmen also felt that one of the evils of emigration was that it exposed Irish youth to the irreligious completely materialistic atmosphere of England. That paper celebrated the intertwining of Catholic and separatist thought and cranky notions about Judeo-Masonic conspiracies found their way into its pages. In 1952, in a state in which cultural censorship was already pervasive, Sinn Féin launched a Stop Foreign Publications campaign that aimed to prevent the circulation of material that was not merely anti-Catholic or anti-Christian but definitely and deliberately pagan. The politics of the IRA reflected the ethos of the southern state in other ways. Dublin Fianna boys on their weekend hikes in the Wicklow Mountains were always marched into Enniskerry for Sunday Mass. In 1951 the IRA made clear that it had no link with communism, an ideology repugnant to the overwhelming majority of Irish people. Army Order No. 4, forbidding membership of the IRA to communists, had been in force since 1933. Despite the paranoia, the actual number of communists in Ireland was minuscule. In the South most were organized in the Irish Workers' League, which had 79 members in 1953. Several of this group's activists were ex-IRA members who attended the Wolf Tone commemoration at Bowdenstown every June. Their presence provoked warnings from the Speaker's platform to ignore them, but some would go on to play important roles within the Republican movement. Among the communists attending the 1953 Bowdenstown commemoration were former Kerr internees Ned Stapleton and Joe O'Connor, along with Eamon Smullen, who, as a 19-year-old IRA volunteer ten years previously, had been convicted of shooting and badly wounding an informer. In Portlaois Smullen had followed Mac Curtin's example and refused to wear prison uniform, instead fashioning a smock from blankets. This disobedience earned him extensive periods in solitary confinement. On release Smullen had drifted out of the IRA and into communist politics. In 1954 the communist contingent at Bowdenstown was joined by Trinity College Dublin graduate Roy Johnston. According to Sean Garland, issues such as unemployment didn't impinge or in any way disturb the 1950s IRA, which remained focused on partition. Yet many young men did join the movement out of unease at the economic situation, believing, however vaguely, that the IRA's campaign to unite Ireland would also improve living standards. Mick Ryan, from Dublin's East Wall, vividly recalled the poignant scenes as emigrant ships left Dublin port, those on board waving handkerchiefs to family left behind. Articles in the United Irishman on the need to stop emigration sparked his interest in republicanism. Mac Giola remembered seeing the people heading for the boat at Westland Row Station, with their big cardboard cases, it would really shatter you. But the ultimate aim of the IRA was a campaign against the Northern Ireland state. The prevailing belief in the nobility and heroism of the War of Independence, reinforced by numerous romantic accounts published during the 1950s, contributed to a sincere conviction that a guerrilla struggle could be successfully waged against British occupation. Mac Giola remembered people saying things like, we were able to keep Munster with one flying column, and that was only 30 years before. The southern-based leadership of the IRA wishfully believed that northern unionists would accept republican appeals to refuse to become embroiled in the conflict between the foreign forces of oppression and the volunteer soldiers of the IRA. They even asked that the locally recruited, and mainly Protestant, RUC and B specials, stand aside, and allow the IRA to fight it out with the British army. But in the early 1950s it looked unlikely that such a fight would occur any time soon. In 1951 the Garda Special Branch calculated that the IRA had no real organization in most areas and did not want trouble with the authorities. By the summer of 1952 police estimates of membership were about 200 in Dublin and 50 in Cork. Around 750 people attended Bowdenstown that year, but there was evidence of arms training and an effort to revive interest through Sinn Féin and the United Irishmen. Private houses were used for smaller weapons classes. Mac Giola remembered one of his first classes in the Crumlin area of Dublin. I was led up the stairs in darkness. A man lit a candle and I could see other people in the room and we crowded around as we were shown basically how to use a rifle and assemble it and clean it. You had a real feeling of a very secret conspiracy. It was only after he left the meeting that Mac Giola found out that the session took place in darkness because the old woman who let the IRA use her house could not afford her electricity bill. The IRA men then held a collection for her. Some impetus also came from an arms raid on Ebrington Barracks in Derry, in June 1951. Cathal Golding was increasingly prominent in the organization, 
taking charge of the Dublin Brigade at the unveiling of a statue of Sean Russell in September 1951. Tony Megan had high regard for Golding and entrusted him with organizing a raid on an officer training corps base at Felstead in Essex. In June 1953 an IRA gang succeeded in stealing a substantial amount of weapons from the base, only to be captured when their overloaded van attracted police attention on the way to London. Golding was arrested along with dairyman Manus Canning and Sean Stevenson from Essex. During their trial Golding informed the court that he and his fellow defendants were soldiers of the Irish Republican Army who believed that the only way to drive the British Army of Occupation out of Ireland is by force of arms. We make no excuse or apology for capturing arms from the enemy for that purpose and our one regret is that, in this instance, we were not successful in placing them in the hands of our comrades at home for use against the British forces in Ireland. The three received eight-year jail sentences. Golding would spend much of his in Pentonville, Wakefield and Stafford prisons. The IRA had more success with a raid on Gough Barracks in Armagh, in June 1954. The raid was the brainchild of Leo McCormick, a former British commando and Dublin IRA training officer. He had noticed the lax security at the base and, aware of the success the Fenians had had in infiltrating the British Army during the 1860s, considered that establishing a contact inside might be the best method of operating. Young IRA recruit Sean Garland agreed to go to Armagh and march and enlist in the Royal Irish Fusiliers. Garland was then able to supply maps, documents and photographs of the base to the IRA in Dublin. In a final preparation for the raid, Dublin IRA officers Charlie Murphy and Eamon Boyce visited the base for a dance along with a member of the Republican women's organization Common Na Amban. Under cover of an amorous encounter Garland took her on a detailed inspection of the entire barracks. On a Saturday afternoon in June a stolen truck arrived in the barracks yard and the sentries were held up, within 20 minutes the weapons, including 250 rifles, 37 Sten guns and 7 Bren guns, were spirited away. Garland, still under cover, remained behind to be told by one of his sergeants that the IRA were, terrible bad men. Public interest in the raid saw sales of the United Irishmen reach 39,000. Intralee Republicans took over a cinema and interrupted a movie entitled The Raiders by displaying a slide proclaiming. Join the IRA. We have the guns now. Several county councils expressed support for the Armagh raid and extended congratulations to the IRA. Garland's regiment was due to depart for Kenya that winter but he had, no intention, of going to, fight the Mau Mau. Instead he deserted in October, having first helped reconnoiter Oma barracks for another IRA raid. The Oma operation, in October, was unsuccessful, ending in a shootout with several IRA men wounded and others captured, but the fact that they had engaged in a gun battle with British troops, for the first time since the 1920s, further boosted confidence. The Guardi were forced to reassess the level of threat from the IRA, describing it that month as, a problem of considerable and growing importance. It was felt within the IRA that the organization had gained immeasurably in prestige by the success of the Armagh raid, as well as increasing the striking power of the army. At Bowdenstown a week after the Armagh raid there were shouts of, give us the arms, while the speakers emphasized that the weapons were for use against the British occupation forces and that there was no fear of civil war in the south. The Guardi feared that the IRA would receive the sympathy, if not the actual support, of increasing numbers of the general public and noted that the organization was carrying out training on a more extensive basis as those seeking to join increased. The Armagh raid was the deciding factor in 18-year-old Mick Ryan finally joining the IRA, and OMA was the clincher for Jim Lane in Cork, as several of those captured were local men. The raids inspired Seamus Collins, then a teenager in Limerick, to want to be in something like that. During the same year 16-year-old Myron de Burka joined Sinn Féin in Newbridge, Co. Kildare. In August 1955 the IRA attempted another arms raid in Britain, at Arborfield in Berkshire. Despite making off with a major haul the raiders were caught and Seamus Murphy, Joe Doyle and Donald Murphy sentenced to life in prison. The three men joined Golding in Wakefield. Among those imprisoned with the IRA men were several members of the Greek Cypriot group Ioka, then waging a bloody campaign against the British, and Klaus Fuchs, the German-born spy who had worked on the development of nuclear weapons in the US and then passed on vital information to the Soviets. The IRA men had plenty of time for discussion with fellow prisoners and access to a wide variety of reading material. Golding and Seamus Murphy developed an interest in the Russian Revolution, and their reading of Fitzroy Maclean's biography of Marshal Tito resulted in the Yugoslav communist leader becoming something of a hero to the Irishmen. The IRA made two attempts to free Golding. On the first occasion he almost made it over the wall before being captured. The near success resulted in Golding receiving a long period of solitary confinement, and patches marking him out as an attempted escapee, were sewn on to his prison uniform. On the second occasion it was decided that the IRA would, if necessary, 
shoot their way into Wakefield Prison and rescue both Irish and Ioka prisoners. IRA volunteers practiced scaling walls with extension rods at Croke Park before Garland traveled to England to reconnoiter the rescue mission. Judging it a possibility, he returned with 15 other volunteers, including five women posing as an acting troupe, in a plane chartered from Aer Lingus. Weapons were concealed under the women's clothing and Garland carried a Thompson gun strapped to his body. The troop arrived safely but the escape attempt had to be aborted and the weapons dumped in England. The IRA revival of the mid-1950s came against the backdrop of the emergence of rival armed groups. The most significant of these was Sor Ulog, formed by Liam Kelly from Pomeroy, Co. Tyrone. In October 1951, after Kelly was dismissed by the IRA for carrying out an unauthorized raid in Derry, he took a large part of the local organization with him. To the disgust of the IRA, Kelly's group carried out armed robberies and also formed a political party, Fianna Ulad, in 1954. Fianna Ulad had no quarrel with the constitutional position of the 26 counties and called on Republicans to take part in politics there, including taking seats in the Dale. In Northern Ireland it continued to support abstentionism. This was not an abstract position, as in 1953 Kelly was actually elected to Stormont for mid-Tyrone. He was jailed for a year for making a seditious speech and during this period was nominated to the Southern Senate by Sean McBride. The IRA considered this treachery and poured a regular stream of invective on Kelly and his partitionist organization. But Kelly's popularity in his native area, where he was greeted by a crowd of 10,000 on his release, meant that there was nothing they could do about him. In November 1955 Sor Ulad attacked Roselea RUC barracks in Fermanagh and one of Kelly's key men, Connie Green, a former Royal Marine, was killed. Sor Ulad's activities had the potential to win over impatient recruits from the IRA. In Belfast a number of Republicans, including Billy McMillan, who'd been jailed for IRA activity during 1953, were attracted to it. The introduction of IRA General Order No. 8 after the Oma raid, expressly forbidding any conflict with the Guardi or the Irish Army, caused some resentment among militants. The discontented rallied around Joe Crissel, a law student and charismatic orator who had taken part in both the Armagh and Oma raids. While Crissel attracted some support, Garland and others resented what they saw as the elitism of his faction. During 1956 Crissel and a number of his supporters were expelled or left the Dublin IRA. As far as the IRA was concerned, both Kelly's Roselea raid and Crissel's group might draw unwelcome attention to their military plans. A great deal of effort was put into building up intelligence. On the splinter groups, with Mick Ryan assigned to shadow Crissel himself. Unfortunately for Ryan, Crissel was a champion cyclist, one of the founders of the Ross Tailtan, and he regularly sped away from him on his modern racing bike. Despite the criticism of the splinter groups over the lack of urgency in IRA military preparations, increased training was taking place, with weekend camps and forced marches in the Dublin and Wicklow Mountains and West Cork. The Lee Enfield Mark IV rifle, the Sten and Thompson submachine guns and the Bren light machine gun were the standard equipment. Political circumstances were aiding preparations. From 1954 a new inter-party coalition was in government and many felt that Garda attention was notably more relaxed than it had been during Fianna Fail administrations. New recruits continued to come in. Dublin Fianna boy Frank Ross, later pro inches de Rosa, joined the IRA within a few weeks of his 16th birthday in May 1956, one of 40 or 50 feet youngsters who took the Pledge of Loyalty to the Irish Republic in front of Tomás Mac Giola. Earlier that year IRA members in Dublin had been told that serious operations were in the offing and only those ready to take part in them should stay in the organization. During 1955 Sean Cronin, a journalist and former Irish Army officer, had arrived back in Dublin from the United States. Despite being a new recruit to republicanism Cronin brought a dynamism to preparations, partly because, as Garland recalls, he seemed to know a lot more than many of us about military matters. He was quickly promoted to taking charge of training. Outlining his ideas in a booklet, Notes on Guerrilla Warfare, Cronin argued that no nation had a greater tradition of guerrilla fighting than Ireland and that there was no other means by which a small nation fighting for freedom could defeat its oppressor. He was influenced by the guerrilla campaigns then taking place against the British in Cyprus and the French in Algeria. According to Cronin's thesis, Guerrilla strategy should be to cut all communications, telephone, road and rail, destroy all petrol stations and enemy vehicles, hit enemy strategic strong points, and strike at their supplies and their administration. In time, centers of resistance established by guerrilla units would be knitted together into one liberated area, where the enemy's writ no longer runs. Cronin became the chief strategist behind the IRA's planned campaign in the north, Operation Harvest. Flying columns from the south would launch attacks on RUC barracks, destroy communications and link up with the local IRA in the border region, 
eventually creating liberated areas where nationalist alienation would guarantee popular support. Volunteers would wear battle dress with tricolor insignia in order to comply with the Geneva Convention. On the 11th of November 1956 an alliance of Sor Ulad and the Crystal Group destroyed six customs huts along the border. Whether or not the IRA's hand was forced by the activities of these groups, as the Guardi contended, is a matter of dispute. Garland contends that Mac Curtin argued that the campaign should not be attempted without building a stronger organization within Northern Ireland. But the IRA were optimistic, in part because there had been political returns in the north from the OMA raid. In May 1955 two of the OMA prisoners, Tom Mitchell and Phil Clark, won seats in the Westminster elections for Mid-Ulster and Fermanagh South Tyrone respectively. Even more encouragingly, when Mitchell was disqualified he held his seat in the resulting by-election. Altogether Sinn Féin, running men held as prisoners in England and Northern Ireland as candidates, 152,310 won votes. The results came mainly in rural areas, where mainstream nationalists were not contesting the poll. In the Belfast constituencies Labour candidates polled more than double Sinn Féin's vote. Nevertheless, the elections added impetus to the belief that Northern nationalists would respond positively to an armed campaign. In December 1956, with the world's attention focused on the aftermath of the Soviet invasion of Hungary and the Suez Crisis, about 150 men were moved from various points in southern Ireland to a farm at Athboy, Co. Mead. Here Jim Lane met Sean South from Limerick, who greeted him with a question, and ECO Rudd Atha made ATH Phytham La Fata? Is this the thing we have been waiting for, for so long? South, a clerk, always began conversations in Irish. A former member of Maria Duce, he was a devout Catholic and conservative even by the standards of the day. Yet Garland, who had decided early on that he had no time for religion or God or anything else, found South, very kind, gentle, and the kind of person you would have as a friend. Four fighting columns named after Republican heroes, Pierce, Clark, Teeling and Lynch, were created at Athboy. To Mick Ryan's dismay, when Cronin read out a list of the column personnel the Dublin volunteers who had trained together were split up into units with men from other parts of the country. His humor was not improved when he discovered he was to join a group far from the border, in North Antrim. Garland was made officer commanding, O, C, of the Pierce Column, with corpman David O'Connell second in command. South, who had been in the Irish Army Reserve, was given the job of setting compass and directing the column. Equipped with nothing heavier than Bren guns and some mines, grenades and Molotov cocktails, the column set off. Operation Harvest began in the early hours of 12 December 1956. There was an abortive attack by Garland's column on his old regiment's base at Gough Barracks. Bridges were blown in Fermanagh, and a territorial army barracks attacked in Enniskillen. In Magarafelt, Co., Derry, a unit led by Seamus Costello, an 18-year-old from Bray, destroyed the local courthouse. A special Republican bulletin announced that organized resistance to British rule had begun and that many clashes with British military, armed B-specials and police had taken place. While the B-specials were not explicitly targeted, units had permission to engage them if confronted. Despite formal condemnation of the IRA by the Catholic hierarchy, many units were given absolution before going out on operations. Some veterans claimed there were orders that not a shot was to be fired in Belfast, because of the combustible nature of that city's sectarian makeup. In reality, moves to create an active service unit in the city were abandoned because of fears that informers had access to the IRA's plans. The Belfast question became academic as the northern government rapidly rounded up and interned Republican suspects, including Sinn Féin, Ira and Sor Ulad members. Over 100 men, including the majority of Belfast activists, were arrested on 12 January 1957. On New Year's Eve 1956 Garland's column, after spending their Christmas in Dublin, attacked Brookborough RUC barracks in Fermanagh in what became the iconic encounter of the campaign. The barracks was a symbolic target, Lord Brookborough was Prime Minister of Northern Ireland, or, as Republicans saw it, Stormont's puppet premier. The plan was for the Bedford truck carrying the 14 IRA volunteers to pull up opposite the barracks and cover the placing of a mine at the barracks door. However, the truck pulled up under the gable end of the barracks, directly underneath a window, and after the attack began police were able to open fire on the lorry from the window overlooking it. Erman did tremendous damage with the range and angle, Garland recalls. South was unable to return fire from the Ira's Bren because of the lorry's positioning. Both he and 18-year-old Fergal O'Hanlon were fatally wounded. Garland was hit in the left thigh and three other volunteers were also injured. Garland gave the order to withdraw and, despite the lorry stalling and its tail tipping and almost spilling the men onto the road, they made it out of the town. They regrouped at a farmhouse, knowing that RUC patrols were in pursuit. 
it was decided to leave the bodies of South and O'Hanlon in a cow buyer. Garland argued that if he and another wounded man, Paddy O'Regan, were a burden then they should be left to stand our ground and give the others their opportunity to get away, O'Regan remembers being somewhat dismayed when Garland asked if he would take a Thompson and fight a rearguard action with him. In the end it was decided the two men would be carried by their comrades into the mountains and across the border. The escape took them over harsh terrain, with Garland in pain and fucking everything from Jack to Jill, so much so that one of his comrades admonished him to stop cursing lest he bring bad luck. In Monaghan the injured were taken to hospital and the others arrested. With the deaths of South and O'Hanlon the raid quickly passed into mythology. Ira men had been killed in gun battles with the Guardi during the 1940s, but these men had died fighting to free the North. The words of a new rebel song, Sean South from Gary Owen, were published in the Irish Catholic within a week. Thousands lined the route of South's funeral as it passed through Monaghan and then on to Dublin, where Proinches de Rosa was part of the Fianna Guard of Honour, and to Limerick. They kept faith, a pamphlet recounting the story of the raid, sold 10,000 copies in the space of a month. For a brief period it looked as if the IRA had indeed unleashed the latent irredentist soul of the South. Garda reports confirmed that IRA membership reached its highest level since 1945, numbering almost 1,000. There was also an electoral payoff for Sinn Féin. In March the inter-party government fell over disagreements on what measures were needed to deal with the IRA. Fianna Fáil won the ensuing general election but Sinn Féin pulled a healthy 5% of the vote, with its 16 candidates winning four seats. All the victories were in rural areas, Sligo Leitrim, South Kerry, Monaghan, and Longford Westmeath, where Rory O'Bradi, whose column had killed a policeman at Darylland just before the Brookborough raid, took a seat. In Dublin, Sinn Féin stood three candidates who 7,522 won votes between them but did not come close to taking a seat. Increasing anger over unemployment was reflected in the election of a Dublin TD on an unemployed protest association ticket. While Sinn Féin had avoided engagement in unemployment agitation, some of Crystal's group had become involved. As protest spread to Waterford and Cork, the IRA remained aloof. Cork Sinn Féin members were threatened with expulsion if they became involved in use of the movement's Thomas Ash Hall was denied to the unemployed protesters. The new government at first adopted a wait-and-see attitude towards the IRA's campaign but the killing of an RUC constable in July 1957 provided the impetus for Fianna failed to act decisively. Internment without trial was introduced and 63 Republicans were arrested within two days, including Mac Curtin, McLogan and Mac Giola. Soon over 100 men were held in the Curra camp. Having absconded from his hospital bed in January, Garland was captured training in Glen Cree along with 37 others, including De Rosa, in May 1957. After serving several months in Mountjoy, all of the IRA prisoners were transferred to the Kura. There they would be joined by several volunteers captured in the south, among them Maliki McGurran, an 18-year-old from Lurgan, Seamus Costello and Mick Ryan. The Sor Ulad Crystal Alliance meanwhile continued their activities north and south. They blew up the locks on Nuri Canal in May 1957, and during the same month their robbery of Gelignite from a quarry in Co. Laos was denounced by the IRA. When internment was introduced 12 of the group's members were rounded up and placed in the Kura, where they were ostracized by the IRA prisoners. Some in the IRA blamed Crystal's activities for giving Fianna fail an excuse to introduce internment in the first place. The impetus of the IRA campaign dissipated within a year. The emotional response to the deaths of South and O'Hanlon was not replicated on the same scale after other Republican casualties, such as at Edentubber where five men died when a mine exploded prematurely. Indeed certain IRA actions produced hostility. Seamus Collins remembered getting terrible stick around Dublin after the killing of a policeman in a booby trap explosion. People asked him, ah Jesus, what did he do to that poor RUC sergeant? By 1958 there were already many in favour of calling the campaign off, and the Cork IRA had already effectively withdrawn. In 1959 there were just 27 IRA operations, compared with 341 two years earlier. Morale was not helped by a bitter and debilitating dispute in the Curra. A large number of internees became extremely hostile to Thomas Mac Curtin, the Camp O.C. As far as Garland was concerned the split was all centered on personalities and not on politics. He felt closer to Mac Curtin and Megan than to their critics, who had no discipline or structure. A breakout took place without permission from the camp's IRA leadership, and some prisoners refused to join official escape attempts. By mid-1958, 500 Republicans were in jail or interned north and south. Sean Cronin joined them later that year after being arrested with a number of other senior IRA men. But the decline in activity meant Fianna Fáil felt confident enough to end internment in March 1959. After their release Garland, 
Ryan and McGurin met Cronin at a farmhouse in Laos. Despite their disenchantment, Cronin, a persuasive individual, was able to convince them to continue the campaign. His view was that it was keeping the flame alive, and that events might yet turn in the Ira's favor. But arms and ammunition were now in short supply. In late 1959 Garland was sent to reorganize in Belfast, which he already knew a little from nights out while in the British Army. Cronin had authorized IRA operations in the city, but a shipment of explosives from Glasgow had been discovered by the RUC and surveillance was stepped up. Garland was arrested at Great Victoria Street Station, despite having dyed his hair black and claiming to be a Glasgow University student called John S. Hamilton. In November 1959 he was sentenced to four years in jail. He eventually became Ira O. C. in Crumlin Road Jail, where quite a few of the prisoners were worried that they would never be released while the campaign stuttered on. A number took the opportunity to sign out, pledging to give up Ira activity. But most internees refused the opportunity and remained in jail. In Crumlin Road there was some discussion on the future of republicanism. Belfast volunteer Art Macmillan remembered these debates amounting to the same old doldrums, 1798, 1803, 1848, 1867, 1916, 1921 and all. You were running it off like a rigmarole and they were still talking the same old bullshit. But Leo McCormick stirred things up with a lecture on the socialist ideas of James Connolly. Some prisoners walked out and others almost came to blows. Hopes that northern nationalists would respond positively to the armed campaign had been misplaced. In the Westminster elections of October 1959 Sinn Féin's vote slumped to half that of 1955, despite several internees and prisoners being put forward as candidates. Teenage Fianna boy Brendan Mackin collected for the prisoners in bars along the Falls Road in Belfast, finding some sympathy and respect, but no real support. The Unionist government seemed unmovable and, even the most optimistic of people could see it, the campaign was not going to succeed. In the South many people were as moved by the death of Dubliner and Manchester United football player Liam Whelan in the Munich air crash of February 1958 as they were by fatalities north of the border. About 3,400 people attended Bodenstown in 1959. The special branch counted 79 members of the Dublin IRA, including Mac Giola, DeRosa and Cathal Golding, who commanded the parade. Golding had been released from prison that April and on returning to Dublin was appointed IRA quartermaster general. With Mick Ryan he took charge of a shipment of bazookas from the United States. The weapons were tested on St. Stephen's Night 1959 in the Dublin Mountains, and were found to be duds. When news of this anticlimax was eventually conveyed to volunteers it created an even greater sense of demoralization. Internment had ended but Republicans were still being jailed. DeRosa, Peter Pringle and Tony Hayde were among those arrested during 1960, as was Joe Sherlock from Mallow, caught with a rifle. In local elections that year Sinn Féin stood 134 candidates but polled badly, winning only 2,000 votes in Dublin. A year later the general election saw Sinn Féin lose its four seats. The Guardi estimated that only one-sixth of the IRA's membership was still active. Fianna Fáil were returned to power in an up-and-coming TD named Charles Hahi was appointed Minister for Justice. He promised that he would use every means, including the army if necessary, to bring the IRA's futile, evil campaign of violence to an end. The campaign continued without any great strategy except the hope that a spark would ignite popular feeling. During 1961 two RUC men were killed and the southern government was put under pressure to crack down on the IRA again. In November the military tribunals, used against the IRA during the war years, were revived by Hahi. By the end of 1961, 25 men, including Cronin, Golding and Mac Giola, were imprisoned under their auspices. Mac Giola recalled being pulled out of bed at 6 in the morning, and jailed for refusing to account for my movements before three colonels in Collins barracks. Sentences of up to eight years were doled out. There were also major arms fines in Dublin and Monaghan in early 1962. The Department of Justice was in no doubt that Hahi's move to establish the military tribunals played a major role in forcing the IRA to end the campaign. The RUC concurred, noting that the fear the sentences produced had the greatest possible effect on Republicans, North and South. The decision to end the campaign was made in early February 1962, and it was enacted on the 26th with an order to dump arms. In Crumlin Road a sarcastic warder, an orangeman, called to Garland's cell to inform him that the war's over. It had not been an easy decision. Considerable sacrifice and emotion had been invested in the struggle, particularly among those who had opened up their homes to men on the run. Mick Ryan, who was director of operations, received a cold reception at one billet when he supported the ceasefire statement. These reactions were felt across the movement. 
Myron de Burka recalls crying herself to sleep the night the end of the campaign was announced. What became known as the border campaign cost the lives of 18 people, including 11 Republicans, 5 in combat, and singularly failed to achieve its objective. Although the IRA had not killed any civilians nor undertaken any aggressive action in the South, it had attracted repression there. Fianna Fail had once again delivered a crushing blow to the organization. The electoral support won in 1957 had drained away and the movement had not been rewarded for its adherence to abstentionist principles. The statement announcing the end of the campaign lamented that the public's mind had been distracted by secondary issues. The hoped for uprising of northern nationalists had also failed to materialize. Some southern Republicans had come to realize how little they actually knew about the North and unionism. Garland recognized that it was a much deeper problem than we envisaged. The failure of the campaign was a formative experience for the core group who would lead the IRA for the next decade, causing them to rethink many of the certainties that had inspired it. During the 1960s they would embrace the revolutionary tradition of the 18th century United Irishmen, rediscover the socialist republicanism of the 1930s, and finally seek inspiration from, and hope to emulate, left-wing national liberation movements from Cuba to Vietnam. 2. Army of the People, 1962-1968, The Fight for Freedom is a Class Struggle. The Republican Army, North and South, must become the Army of the People in fact as well as name. Sean Garland, Bowdenstown, 1968 The IRA had been defeated in 1962, though it would be some time before it would publicly acknowledge that fact. Their ceasefire statement emphasized the brave fight they had waged against unequal odds and struck a defiant note. The Irish resistance movement pledged eternal hostility to British rule and looked forward to a period of consolidation, expansion and perfection for the final victorious phase of the struggle for the full freedom of Ireland. In reality the IRA was in a bad way and their opponents knew it. Such was the government's confidence that it began to release IRA prisoners, including those jailed by the military courts. During April those let go included Golding, Mac Giola and Cronin. Minister for Justice Charles Hahi, with more than a hint of condescension, argued that there was no particular reason to fear the organizing ability of these men of limited education and poor personality. Recommending a general amnesty, he speculated that it is probably true to say that at no time in the past 40 years has the IRA had less hope of being backed by public opinion. They publicly admit it, a resort to arms in present circumstances and for some considerable time to come appears to be out of the question, they have no funds. Their external sources have dried up, it is likely that quite a number will avail of the present situation to ease themselves out of the organization. The northern authorities were more cautious. Garland was not released until August 1962, and the other four IRA prisoners in their custody remained until December 1963. Joe Doyle, the last IRA prisoner held in Britain, had been released in July that year. The Ireland they emerged into was changing rapidly. Sean Lamass, who had succeeded Eamon de Valera as Taisha in 1959, had made clear his intention to abandon protectionism and open up the southern economy to international investment. These moves, coinciding with the boom in U.S. multinational investment in Europe, had a dramatic effect. Unemployment was lower by a fifth in late 1960 than it had been a year earlier, and the numbers emigrating dropped from 212,000 between 1956 and 1961 to just 80,000 over the next five years, while some of those who had left during the 1950s returned. For the first time in generations Ireland experienced a feeling that things were getting better. The rigidness of traditional Irish Catholic thinking and practice was being questioned, in part due to the influence of the Second Vatican Council, which sat from 1962 to 1965. There was a slow liberalization of the censorship laws. Radio Telefis Aran made its first television broadcast on New Year's Eve 1961, dramatically expanding horizons in a variety of ways. When RTE was launched there were 93,000 licensed TVs in the Republic, mostly on the East Coast, where British channels were also available, by 1968 there were 377,000. All of these developments contributed to a sense that old-style Irish nationalism was finished. Under La Masse and Northern Premier Terence O'Neill the governments of the two states were enjoying a rapprochement, discussing trade and peaceful relations. Charles Hahi, now Minister for Agriculture, entertained his northern counterpart Harry West at his home in Dublin during 1965, something unthinkable a decade earlier. Commentators in Northern Ireland remarked on how sectarian tensions seemed to be easing and how many of the young were mixing without concern for religion. For the IRA, much of 1962 was taken up with dealing with the fallout from the campaign's failure. The ceasefire was not universally accepted. Megan and McLogan, still smarting from the Curra disputes, demanded that a statement be issued absolving them of responsibility for the end of the campaign. Mac Curtin, 
who had been largely marginalized since his release in 1959, also associated himself with the two men. The critics toward Shin find Kumain pushing their view, and the new IRA leadership eventually had them expelled from the party, a small number of other members resigning in solidarity. In many ways the row was a culmination of the disputes that had begun in the Kura, representing more a generational divide than a political one. After years working with them Garland respected the three Max, Megan in particular, as honorable people, but he felt they were too honorable to be revolutionaries. You can't fight an enemy with your hands tied behind your back or with some kind of principles, where you say I won't do this, I won't go into parliament and tell lies, I won't recognize courts and this kind of thing. You have to have your hands free to do what's possible or what you want to do. Another dispute arose when some Irish Republicans in America accused Sean Cronin of being a communist and of having been responsible in some way for the execution of IRA leader Charlie Cairns in 1944. The first accusation centered on Cronin's progressive American wife Terry Millen and on positive articles in the United Irishman regarding Castro and Cuba. The claim about Cairns related to Cronin having once been an officer in the Irish Army. An IRA Army Council investigation into the allegations cleared Cronin but he left the IRA anyway, though remaining sympathetic. That an inquiry was held at all disgusted Garland, who felt that it was McCarthyism. It was also an indication of how powerful anti-communist sentiment remained. The United Irishmen of July 1962 re-emphasized that the Republican movement had no connection with atheistic communism. This statement reflected the views of many, if not most, within the IRA, and even those sympathetic to radicalism were very wary of the communist label. The IRA constitution specified that in peacetime the General Army Convention should meet every two years. Units from around the country sent delegates who elected an army executive of twelve, who in turn elected a seven-member army council, the supreme leadership body, which met once a month. The organization's chief of staff was then selected from among these seven. By all accounts Golding, then aged 40, was reluctant to take up the position of chief of staff when his colleagues offered it to him in September 1962. His view later was that not many others wanted to do the job and that he represented the shakings of the bag. But after a week's consideration Golding accepted the position, succeeding Rory O'Bradi, who had held the post since 1960. O'Bradi returned to Roscommon, a teaching post and his young family, though he remained on the army council. The five other men on the army council were all well known to one another. Seamus Costello, then 24 and working as a car salesman in Dublin, was nicknamed the Boy General, because he had led a flying column during the border campaign while still a teenager. Costello exuded charisma, many were struck by his dark good looks and a tendency to slowly draw upon a cigarette in a manner which drew attention to a missing finger, a battle scar from his recent military activity. Costello's job gave him access to high-powered cars, which he drove, like a madman. An exasperated passenger once complained that taking a lift from him was like traveling in a spaceship. Costello's curt response was, were you ever in a spaceship? Some of his senior colleagues found Costello arrogant and abrasive, but volunteers liked the fact that he wasn't afraid of getting his hands dirty. He led from the front. Mac Giola was both chairman of the Army Council and president of Sinn Féin. Mick Ryan kept in close contact with the grassroots of the organization nationwide. At 26, he was regarded as very much a military figure and only, reluctantly, began to pay attention to political developments during the 1960s. Completing the 1962 Army Council were two volunteers based outside Dublin. Paddy Mulcahy, aged 45, was a Limerick insurance agent and Sinn Féin counselor who had joined the IRA in the 1930s. His wife Susan was a senior figure in Cumann na Emban. Finally there was Clare IRA leader Dennis McInerney, in his mid-twenties and a printer by trade. Of these seven only O. Bradi and Mac Giola had received third-level education, both at University College Dublin. Golding appointed Costello to the post of Adjutant General, which was arguably the most important position after the Chief of Staff, while Ryan was now Quartermaster General. Members of the Dublin-based General Headquarters staff oversaw the day-to-day -day running of the IRA and other branches of the movement, including the United Irishmen. Each of the IRA divisional areas had its own local command staff, largely replicating the roles of the Army Council and headed up by an officer commanding O.C. These local commanders were appointed by the Chief of Staff but in practice had to be popular locally if good order was to be maintained. With the decline of active involvement after the order to dump arms, it was a very junior volunteer indeed who did not have some rank within the organization. Those leading volunteers who made up the GHQ staff, Army Executive and local commands were a mixed group a coalition of men with differing political views and backgrounds united only in the desire to use physical force to end partition. Garland, then 30, was typical only in his belief that there could be no question of walking away. After the ceasefire. For him, 
the IRA existed. There were comrades in prison whose release had to be campaigned for, and Ireland's revolution was still unfinished. He operated full-time for the IRA after 1962, following a short period working in a dairy. Garland's military record gave him tremendous authority and he was highly respected, if not liked, by all. Many saw him as a dour figure, though those who knew him well felt this arose from shyness. He maintained his low public profile during the early 1960s. After his return from prison in England Golding resumed running his family's small painting and decorating firm. He had moved to Rathfarnham on Dublin's south side, and often met Garland and Ryan at the weekend in local pubs such as the Yellow House or Slattery's. Malachy McGurran, a native of Lurgan who had come to prominence during the recent campaign, and Tom Mitchell, the OMA prisoner who had won a Westminster seat in 1955, were also occasional members of this social group. Costello was living with his wife Maliosa and their children in Cornell's Court, a south side suburb of Dublin. He didn't socialize much with his fellow IRA leaders, although Golding had been the best man at his wedding. The Guardi estimated that the IRA had 657 volunteers in the south at the end of 1962. The question for those still involved was, what next? To many, including members of the leadership such as Mick Ryan, simply preparing for a new and better campaign was the answer. Clandestine recruiting, training and rearming were resumed. Weapons instruction and drilling took place with small groups in private houses, including Costello's own home. Emphasis was placed on teaching recruits how to care for and dismantle small arms. Weekend or week-long camps were organized intermittently in secluded districts such as the Sleeve Bloom Mountains or the Glen of Amal, where firing practice, explosives training and instruction in battle techniques took place. Often the volunteers would have little idea where they were, having been transported at night in the back of a van to an isolated farm or woodland. Becoming accustomed to living and sleeping in rough conditions was an important part of the training, and for the physically unfit the regime could be quite a shock to the system. The weapons used were often old. These included Lee Enfield rifles dating back to the Civil War, Thompson guns, and a variety of revolvers and automatic pistols. Sometimes Golding or another senior figure would attend and give a lecture outlining the organization's aims. The wider public was made aware of ongoing IRA activity in July 1963 when Gardy raided a camp in the Knockmealdown Mountains. Four men were arrested and eight weapons, including a Bren gun, seized. Charged in relation to this incident, Belfast man Bobby McKnight told the court that the weapons were to be used against the British forces of occupation in the six counties. He and his colleagues were sentenced to two months. In jail, one source of IRA recruits was the Fianna Arian, which was reorganized in the post-1962 period by a new chief scout, Sean O'Chanath. Born Sean Kenny in Ballinasloe, Co. Galway, O'Chanath had been active in Sinn Féin in London in the late 1950s. Fianna branches were established or revived in Belfast, Castlebar, Ennis, Limerick, Cork, Galway and several parts of Dublin. Groups were also established in England and the United States. Much Fianna activity was similar to that of ordinary scouts, and its summer camps were advertised openly. Other activities were less public. In Belfast, Fianna members were employed in intelligence gathering and surveillance. One task was to watch for patrols on the Falls Road by RUC Special Branch Detectives Harry Taylor and Davy Armstrong. Many Fianna progressed to arms training classes, at which IRA officers would start by instructing the boys in the use of handguns before moving on to the Thompson and finally to explosives. Girls still joined Cumin na Gikalini, the female version of the Fianna, which placed less emphasis on military training. The failure of the border campaign had illustrated, to Golding at least, the inability of the IRA to achieve its aims solely through force of arms. He had come to feel that in the past the IRA had been elitist, its attitude towards the mass of people being that, we didn't care what these bastards want, we know what is good for them. But now he felt that the demand for revolution should come from the people, not from a number of people sitting in a back room. As a youth Golding had witnessed the radicalization of the 1930s, when a number of socialist-leaning IRA officers broke away to form the Republican Congress. The group split after only five months over the question of whether or not to become an openly socialist party. Some of its leading figures later departed to fight for the Republicans in the Spanish Civil War. Despite its short existence the Republican Congress had left an indelible mark on left-wing Republican thinking, not least due to its ability, however fleetingly, to overcome the northern sectarian divide. Congress supporters from Belfast's Protestant Shankill Road famously carried a banner inscribed, Break the Connection with Capitalism, at the 1934 commemoration at Bowdenstown. In 1963 awareness of these aspects of Republican history was becoming more widespread. Desmond Greaves' biography of James Connolly, which made clear the influence of Marxism on the 1916 martyr, was published in 1961, 
and in 1963 Republican Congress veteran Peter O'Donnell's memoir There Will Be Another Day brought the left-wing Republican analysis of the Civil War to a new generation. George Gilmore, a Republican Congress founder from a Protestant background, would advise Golding and other members of the IRA leadership on the lessons of this failed left-wing venture. Golding concluded that the great mistake of O'Donnell and his comrades had been to leave the movement. If the socialists had stayed inside the organization, he believed, they could have eventually won over the majority of the 1930s IRA. Golding hoped to use the bicentenary of the birth of Theobald Wolf Tone, in 1963, to bring people together for a re-examination of Republican strategy. Following discussions with Sean Cronin and others he started to assemble like-minded thinkers into the Wolf Tone directories. Initially these groups were focused on attempting to reawaken interest in Tone's widely misunderstood legacy. Regarded by many as the father of Irish republicanism, Tone, a young Dublin Protestant lawyer, had been a leading figure in the clandestine society of United Irishmen of the 1790s. This organization, dominated by Northern Presbyterians, had attempted to introduce the ideas of the French Revolution to Ireland, eventually leading the ill-fated rebellion of 1798. To Republicans, Tone's most profound statements were his wish, to substitute the common name of Irishmen in place of the denominations of Protestant, Catholic and dissenter, and to break the connection with England, ideas that seemed to offer the possibility of an Ireland free from British rule and sectarian division. Dismayed at the failure of many of his own propertied class to support the United Irishmen, Tone had written, Our independence must be had at all hazards, if the men of property will not support us, they must fall. We can support ourselves by the aid of that numerous and respectable class of the community, the men of no property. Golding hoped that the discussion groups would decide upon appropriate events to commemorate the bicentenary, as a launching point from which the doctrine of republicanism could be taught anew. Although many of those involved in the Wolf Tone directories were serving or former members of the IRA, non-IRA members were also included in an attempt to broaden the ideological pool from which Republicans could draw inspiration. Among the plans drawn up were ceremonies at the graves of the leading United Irishman Thomas Russell, William Orr and Jemmy Hope. There was also a commemorative event on Cave Hill, overlooking Belfast, which marked a 1795 gathering there by United Irish leaders. The highlight of the year's commemorations was a series of lectures in Dublin's Mansion House in September. By this stage the number and range of people contributing to the Wolf Tone directories had grown. The openness and success of the lectures was surprising, considering the concept had emerged from the clandestine world of the IRA. Roger McHugh, head of English at University College Dublin, was director of the event and delivered a paper, as did the Protestant essayist Hubert Butler. Discussions within the movement increasingly focused on the egalitarian aspects of the United Irishmen. Tomas Mac Giola and others were enthused by reading about the life of Jemmy Hope, a downpatrick Presbyterian weaver whose political struggle had continued for decades. After 1798 and whose writings seemed to provide a working-class analysis of the rebellion. In 1964 Sean Cronin published a pamphlet on Hope that was promoted as recommended reading for IRA volunteers by the organization's clandestine journal and T. Oblick. Golding's increasing embrace of left-wing concepts shocked many who knew him as an orthodox IRA man. Some began to suggest that he had been converted to Marxism by the spy Klaus Fuchs in Wakefield. However, his fellow prisoner Seamus Murphy contends that Golding turned to the left on his own steam, through reading and discussions with other Republicans and that Fuchs never tried to turn anyone, it was hard to get a word out of him. A cursory glance at contemporary developments in Asia, the Caribbean and Africa might also have pointed Golding towards socialism as a model that offered his revolutionary organization the best chance of success. Over half of the world's population lived in societies that defined themselves as communist, the USSR, China, Eastern Europe, North Vietnam, North Korea and Cuba. The age of European empire was over. France had been humiliated in Vietnam and at Suez and was on its way out of Algeria. Its partner in the 1956 Middle Eastern debacle, Britain, had seen repression fail to halt independence in Kenya and was giving up its colonies in Africa in rapid succession. By the mid-1960s Portuguese colonial rule in Africa, along with the last bastions of white supremacy on that continent, Rhodesia and South Africa, were being challenged by guerrilla movements. The Cuban experience struck a particular chord with some Irish Republicans. As Mac Giola reflected, all our heroes were losers. Che and Fidel were the first winners. It was easy to conclude that socialism in some form would ultimately be victorious over capitalism. The Soviets themselves, through the KGB, decided in 1961 to utilize national liberation movements in order to create circumstances, which would assist in diverting the attention and forces of the United States and its allies and destabilize Western capitalism. Despite the economic advances of the early 1960s, poverty and inequality remained a part of Irish life. Emigrants returned to a housing crisis in Dublin, 
where four people died when tenements collapsed in 1963. Thousands of families lived in dilapidated flats while awaiting an affordable home. The west of Ireland continued to decline, as small farms vanished. Fianna Fáil ministers such as Charles Hahi and Brian Lenihan cultivated relationships with property developers and the Mohair Suit Brigade, who frequented the Shelburne Hotel's horseshoe bar and had none of the old Fianna Fáil reticence about ostentatious wealth. Meanwhile, liberalization went only so far. In 1965 author John McGahern was sacked from his job as a teacher after the Catholic Church objected to his book The Dark, which was itself banned in the Republic. But there were stirrings of opposition. Cooperatives were set up, in the hope of reversing rural decline, and Father James McDyer's Glencomcle experiment, of cooperative farming in Donegal and the Save the West campaign attracted wide interest. Liberal clergymen emerged demanding action on problems such as housing. The changing political climate even saw the Irish Labour Party begin to talk cautiously about socialism. Workers were unwilling to wait until gifted their share of the economic boom. Strikes, official and unofficial, became commonplace. In Northern Ireland, Catholics were still deprived of equal access to jobs in many areas, and the linkage between local voting rights and home ownership disenfranchised the poorest, disproportionately Catholic. Ulster's heavy industries were in decline and uncertainty about the future seeped into the Protestant working class. The dynamics of Northern Irish society were also affected by Catholics taking advantage of free third-level education and entering Queen's University Belfast in ever greater numbers. 22% of Queen's students were Catholic by 1961. This generation would be more ready than their parents to question both the Northern establishment and their own community's structures. The idea that the Protestant working class's changing relationship with the establishment might lead the community to reappraise Republican politics was the basis of much discussion among radicals. For some southern border campaign veterans, their first experience of the reality of northern Protestant identity had come in jail. Garland broke up the monotony of prison routine by attending Sunday hymn recitals given by Protestant church choirs in Crumlin Road. It struck me at the time, how determined and sincere they were in proclaiming, their, beliefs. The mixture of the religious and the political was so dominant, you could see that these were people who were not engaged in some frivolous thing. For them it was deadly serious. By the end of the time I was in the jail I had a different view of the makeup of the society. In 1965 and T. Oblick argued that, the successful completion of the Irish National Revolution, is, going to depend on the movement building good relations with disaffected elements among the present supporters of unionism. This means basically the Belfast working class, many of whom support labor. In Belfast, internees released during 1961 found that there were only about 24 IRA volunteers in the city, with access to a minuscule quantity of weapons. Billy McKee, a 1940s veteran and devout Catholic, took over as the local O.C. The first task was to convince former prisoners to report back, but the results were disappointing. Several men had left for Britain to find work. A number of others, like Joe Cahill, declined to re-involve themselves. But reorganization was aided by the fact that the Sor Ulad schism had been healed in Belfast, after returning from a spell working in England, Billy Macmillan became McKee's adjutant. The two men were central to a row that would shape the Belfast organization for a generation. The confrontation developed around a wolf tone commemorative parade from Beechmount to Casement Park in June 1963. Just a few hours before the parade, the RUC demanded that the event proceed without the tricolour, the display of which was illegal in Northern Ireland. The organizers, including McKee, reluctantly agreed, but many other IRA men were disgusted. They claimed a failure to show defiance had made the IRA a laughing stock. While spectators were watching entertainments in Casement Park, a furious row erupted in the Belfast Republican Movement's HQ in Cypress Street. McKee was severely criticized and left in a fury, resigning as O.C. and eventually leaving the IRA altogether. At the age of 35, Billy McMillan became the new Belfast commander. A scaffolder by trade, he was stocky and short, a fluent Irish speaker who was active in the Gaelic League, where he was generally referred to as Liam. Macmillan's elder brother Bob had served several years in jail during the Second World War, having been wounded in Belfast in 1942, in an incident believed to have been the inspiration for F. L. Green's novel Odd Man Out. His brother Art was also a member of the Iris D. Company, having joined the Fianna in 1945. Macmillan's command staff included Bobby McKnight, Jim Sullivan, Dennis Toner and Leo Martin, all of whom had been imprisoned during the border campaign. Unlike some of his contemporaries, the wee man, as Macmillan was known, was comfortable in non-Republican company. The Falls Road was the spine of nationalist Belfast, stretching from Devis Street out to the new housing estates of Andersonstown. The heart of Belfast Republicanism was the area of narrow terraced housing bordered by the Grosvenor Road, Culling Tree Road, 
Albert Street and the Falls Road near the city center. This was the home of Belfast Brigade's 1st Battalion, D Company, a designation that harked back to the days when the city's IRA structure contained hundreds rather than dozens of volunteers. Men were sworn into the IRA in an upstairs room adjacent to the Long Bar in Leeson Street, so called because its entrance was in Leeson Street and the exit in Cypress Street. It was owned by Paddy Lenahan, a gentleman, who was on friendly terms with his Republican customers. Family background was very important in Belfast Republicanism and most of the IRA's recruits in the 1960s were already connected with the movement. Sean Curry from Abercorn Street grew up playing hurling and going to Irish dancing classes. Curry joined the Fianna in January 1965 because he knew a lot of people in it, and it was some time before he realized it was actually illegal. Many of those who joined the IRA had no great expectations, it was just something you done, you never thought anything would come of it. There were active Republicans in other areas of the city such as the Markets, New Lodge and Ardoin, but in much smaller numbers. Seamus. Lynch, a docker from Moffat Street in Sailor Town, joined the IRA in 1965 when a monthly sale of 25 United Irishmen was considered good in North Belfast. Republicans formed a subculture within broader nationalist society and had never been a majority among Catholics in the city. Attitudes towards them ranged from passive respect to bemusement and at times hostility. Catch yourself on, was a common refrain when young Fianna members collected for the prisoners in bars along the falls right up to the late 1960s. One Republican remembered an occasion when he and a comrade were carrying rifles and desperately trying to evade capture by the RUC. They entered what they thought was a supportive house, but the occupants tried to push us back into the street. Republicans generally socialized in their own pubs and clubs, and many of the senior figures did not drink or socialize with non-Republicans at all. A few of them cultivated an aloofness that sometimes annoyed their younger comrades. At one Easter commemoration men wearing Glasgow Celtic scarves were told to leave the parade, with some regarding Celtic fans as corner boys, not real Republicans. Gaelic games and Irish dancing were encouraged, with Dwyer's Gack on the falls the club most associated with the movement. Public attention was drawn to the movement in 1964 when Sinn Féin contested the Westminster elections as Republicans in order to circumvent Northern Ireland's ban on the party. In Belfast there were four candidates in the IRA run campaign, Macmillan, McKnight, Frank McGlade and David McConnell. In late September rioting broke out after the RUC smashed into Macmillan's election headquarters in Davis Street and confiscated a tricolor from the office's window. A free Presbyterian minister called Ian Paisley, who was making a name for himself as a demagogic preacher, had threatened to march on Davis Street if the flag was not removed. When the tricolor was displayed again the next day, the police returned in riot gear but were met by bottles, stones and petrol bombs. Over the next three days up to 2,000 people were involved in fighting on the falls with the RUC. Macmillan and McKnight symbolically hung out another tricolor and led crowds in Amran na BHFI Ann. Support of the candidates also came from James Connolly's youngest daughter Ina, who claimed that, your cause is my father's cause. Later that week 5,000 people marched behind the tricolor on the falls, escorted by Fianna boys carrying hurleys. Meanwhile 2,000 Paisley supporters rallied at the Ulster Hall. Speaking to the Falls Road crowd, Macmillan made it clear that it was not the intention of Republicans to provoke Unionists, with the tricolor only being displayed in a completely nationalist area. But it was clear that communal loyalties were a powerful mobilizing force. Smaller-scale trouble broke out elsewhere during the election, with Loyalists attacking Republicans campaigning in several rural towns. According to Macmillan, the IRA in Belfast gained a couple of dozen new recruits after the riots, but local rivalries were apparent too. The Republican Labour Party accused the Unionists of trying to boost Sinn Féin by giving them publicity in order to split the nationalist vote. A Unionist actually won the seat. Away from the sectarian tensions of Northern Ireland, the maintenance of Ireland's distinct cultural identity was a major concern for the IRA leadership. The IRA's 1963 Easter Statement had asserted that, the continued existence of the Irish people as a distinct national entity is endangered as never before by the proposed immersion of a weak, anglicized and foreign-occupied Ireland, into a, Western European superstate. Agitation against the European common market would become a major facet of Republican activity over the next few years. Much of the rhetoric was explicitly traditionalist. In 1964 the IRA stressed that, our native language and culture are being systematically obliterated, our finance is being controlled by the Bank of England, our land is being grabbed at an alarming rate, and, our industry and commerce is controlled by foreigners. There was little there for Republicans of the 1950s to disagree with, but the involvement of Roy Johnston and Anthony Coughlin in discussions within the Wolf Tone directories, which were reconfigured as the Wolf Tone Society in 1964 was leading to increasing internal unease. 
Both were seen as outsiders and, worse, as communists. Johnston, now 34, had emigrated with his young family to London in 1960. While there he joined the Communist Party and both he and Coughlin were members of the Connolly Association. Coughlin was a graduate of Cork University and had been a member of the Irish Labour Party before he emigrated in 1958. He had been secretary of the West London branch of the Connolly Association. He returned to Ireland in 1961 to take up a post at Trinity College, and now rented a downstairs flat in Johnston's home in Ranelagh. The origins of the Connolly Association lay in the remnants of the Republican Congress in Britain during the 1940s. Its leading figure was the historian Desmond Greaves, who also edited its paper The Irish Democrat. Outsiders often saw it as the British Communists' bridge into the Irish community, but the Communist Party was not very enthusiastic about work among Irish emigrants and the Connolly Association generally ploughed its own furrow. Greaves' ambition was to make Irish unification the policy of the British labour movement. He believed that activists should not criticise the Southern Irish state, which he once described as the most progressive state in Western Europe, but rather concentrate on exposing injustice in Northern Ireland. Greaves suggested that, both pro-communists and anti-communists, should forget that little quarrel until we get Ireland free, but this did not stop priests warning their congregations in Kilburn and elsewhere against buying the Irish Democrat. Dot. In addition to its directly political content, the paper also provided a forum for Irish workers to highlight health and safety issues, particularly in the building industry, and brought progressive opinions into Irish communities on issues such as apartheid and Vietnam. Greaves' most important idea was to launch a civil rights campaign to discredit Ulster Unionism in Britain by exposing its discrimination towards Catholics. He believed that this would lead to sympathy for Irish unity. This strategy had been the policy of the Connolly Association since 1955. The relationship between the Irish Communists and the Association was not straightforward. For a start there were two Irish parties, the Communist Party of Northern Ireland and the Irish Workers' Party. The parties took subtly different positions on partition and discrimination in the North. The CPNI had a significant membership among trade unionists from Protestant backgrounds in Belfast while the IWP had a small but important base in Dublin trade unionism. The chairman of the IWP was Mick O'Reardon, a bus conductor and veteran of the Spanish Civil War. He won 183 votes in the 1965 general election, which was an accurate reflection of the party's popular appeal. Blessed with plenty of personal courage and routinely denounced from the pulpit for many years, O'Reardon was single-mindedly loyal to Moscow, as was his party. After 1965 the IWP's youth wing, the Connolly Youth Movement, a more flexible and popular body, began to recruit among Dublin working-class youngsters. Johnston and Coughlin were seen by some IRA leaders as agents of Desmond Greaves, and hence of the British Communist Party. Although Johnston and Coughlin were close socially and shared similar views, both believing that Lamasse's economic policies were increasing the dependence of the South on British capital, facilitating a master plan to reintegrate the Republic into the British imperial system, the pair had differences in their political approach. Johnston was not a doctrinaire communist thinker. His personal experience had led him to conclude that the Irish communists were so entranced by Russia that they ignored the Irish historical tradition. Moscow was Rome to them. Johnston was attracted by the idea of civil rights but he thought that Greaves was too dismissive of the potential of republicanism. For Johnston it was, a matter of attempting to influence the radical tradition in a national context, as distinct from the radical tradition in an alien context. By 1964 he was impressed by the example of Cuba, where a broad-based movement, rural as well as urban, had, upstaged, a narrow moscow line communist party and carried through a popular revolution. He also departed from orthodoxy by stressing that, in Ireland as in Algeria, resistance to imperial domination was more likely to be rural-based than urban-based. A lecture by Johnston on economic resistance was published in the United Irishman of October 1964 under the byline Rio Mesa in. in the following month's paper he put forward a suggestion that Ulster Unionism could be divided by a campaign for democratic rights that highlighted the issue of discrimination against Catholics. Coughlin was much closer to Greaves in his thinking. His aim was, real, Irish independence, defending Irish economic sovereignty against Britain and the EEC, rather than any form of socialism, which for him was not on the agenda. Neither Johnston nor Coughlin had any of the traditional Republican worries about entering Parliament. Johnston built a close relationship with Golding, who invited him into the IRA during the summer of 1964, creating more unease in the ranks. Apart from their communist connections, there were several other reasons why Johnston and Coughlin were regarded with suspicion. They had never been militarily active in a movement that above all valued such experience, preferably with some jail time included. Johnston had a bad stammer that made listening to him frustrating, some found him arrogant, and his background as a Protestant Trinity graduate counted against him in some circles. 
Coughlin's status as a key advisor to the IRA leadership, even though he had not actually joined the organization, was also resented. In British intelligence reports he was referred to as an IRA, traveling lecturer. Suspicion among some IRA members about the leadership's direction was intensified by the untimely death of one of the three Macs in July 1964. Padraig McLogan, who collected handguns, was found in his Blanchardstown home with a bullet wound to the head, and a Walther 9mm pistol was found beside his body along with a spent cartridge. An inquest ruled that his death was accidental, resulting from a fall while carrying a loaded weapon, but among Republicans there were rumors McLogan had been murdered because of his opposition to the Golding leadership. Eventually Garland was identified in these conspiracy theories as the main suspect. The murder allegation had little basis in reality but it gained adherence as the years went on. Another Republican who died during 1964 was Golding's friend Brendan Behan, whose alcoholism led to his death at the age of 41. Despite his wayward relationship with the movement Behan was given an IRA funeral complete with color party. Golding, who was the first person to reach Behan's deathbed, soon began a relationship with Beatrice Behan, the writer's widow, despite being married himself, the couple eventually had a son, Podge. Golding's plans for Republican revitalization involved convincing IRA members of the importance of social agitation. An IRA Department of Political Education was set up in early 1965 and began organizing educational sessions for volunteers. All units were ordered to appoint an education officer, and T. Oblick explaining that, the idea is that each area shall have one specialist who understands the nature of British rule in Ireland in all its aspects. It was emphasized that to fight the checkbook is going to require a high order of skill. The enemy is not going to be so obliging as to make it easy for us to shoot at him with a gun. Therefore all units needed to appoint someone who understood the importance of economic intelligence, where is land being sold up to foreigners, and what is the likely effect of a proposed new factory on the economy of the area. One of the first education meetings took place in March at the La Cabina Ballroom in Hoth, where about 20 IRA members heard Johnston and others present lectures on the importance of political education, economic resistance, cooperatives and trade unions. At a later conference Northern speakers introduced a session on local democracy as a threat to unionist rule. Units were asked for details of their volunteers' occupations and whether or not they were active in trade unions or cooperatives. This information was used to help education officers formulate plans for economic resistance. The department's work was bolstered by Bobby McKnight's transfer from his duties as a training officer to work countrywide on education. The IRA's 1965 Easter Statement mentioned a major internal examination taking place within the army. This was a reference to a special conference of Republicans which had been proposed at the 1964 General Army Convention to discuss political tactics, policy and internal organization and make recommendations. Mac Giola recalls this period as consisting of meeting after meeting after meeting, in rooms, absolutely chock full of smoke. The discussions resulted in 10 recommendations being put forward for debate at an extraordinary General Army Convention held on 5 June 1965. Delegates from across the country gathered to take part in the first major discussion of the movement's future direction since 1962. Among the recommendations up for debate was that elected Republicans take their seats in Leinster House. This was guaranteed to produce dissension, and Golding, who had concluded that abstentionism would have to go if serious political advances were to be made, addressed a special pre-convention message to all IRA volunteers, urging them to study the recommendations, without emotion or prejudice. He was aware that, some of our finest, were in favor of taking seats in the Dale just as, some of our finest, were opposed. He asked that they all give it their, maturest thought, and, give a reasoned and fair reply. In particular Golding urged, should it happen that you are against the recommendation you must not regard those who favor it as traitors. Should it happen that you favor the recommendation you must not regard your opponents in the matter as either stupid or traditionalist. You will debate this question, as all others, with comrades and friends, not with enemies. The proposal to drop abstentionism was defeated by a large majority, despite the support of Golding and Costello. Even so, the debate over the future direction of the movement had moved from the drawing room discussions of the Wolf Tone Society to the floor of an army convention. The convention had also renewed calls for preparations to be made for a new campaign, and a military council, that included Garland, now an army council member, and Max Steofen was given the job of formulating a plan of action. Among the prominent opponents of the proposal to drop abstentionism was Sean Max Steofen, O.C. of the Cork, South Kerry area, who was elected to the Army Council at the convention. Born in London in 1928 as John Stevenson and of only distant Irish extraction on his mother's side, Max Steofen had done national service in the Royal Air Force but became involved with Sinn Féin and the IRA in the late 1940s. Imprisoned for his part in the Felstead Raid in 1953, 
he moved to Ireland with his wife upon his release in 1959. His status as a convert to Irish republicanism made him quite zealous, even by the Irish standards. Golding considered Max Steofen a courageous person, but would later suggest the Londoner was continually trying to prove that he was as much an Irishman as anyone else. At his first army council meeting Max Steofen argued that Johnston's IRA membership was in contravention of the organization's standing order against communists being volunteers. Golding refused to countenance this argument, warning that if Johnston was forced out then he would resign as well. Meanwhile Johnston attempted to encourage Max Steofen to support the new political direction, introducing him to the work of Italian communist peer Paolo Pasolini, who had made a film based on the gospel according to St. Matthew. In Johnston's view the work portrayed, Jesus Christ as a revolutionary in the Roman environment, which he hoped would appeal to the strongly Catholic Max Steofen, but there was to be no meeting of minds. The question of political development was not the only source of strains. The IRA was in no state to reopen military hostilities and there were disagreements as to how seriously the organization was taking this task. New weapons would obviously be required, as much of the IRA's arsenal had been lost during the previous campaign. Mick Ryan as quartermaster general on occasion had to move a single .303 rifle from one end of the country to the other for training purposes. He proposed a plan whereby two volunteers, unknown to the Guardi, would join the British Army in England and prepare the ground for an arms raid there. Golding disagreed, arguing that it was not the priority at that time. Frustrated by the unwillingness to take rearming seriously, Ryan resigned from his position in October 1965 and decided to concentrate on his day job. But he remained on friendly terms with his IRA comrades, continuing to drive Garland around the country on organizing trips. While these debates were going on the IRA had become more intensely involved in social agitation. In December 1964 the organization issued a statement condemning the exploitation of Irish fishermen by foreign competition, in the opinion of the Irish Democrat this amounted to the organization's first independent political statement since the 1930s. During February the IRA became embroiled in a struggle over evictions in Middleton, Co. Cork. The town, with a population of 2,700, was owned by the Earl of Middleton, who had announced his intention of selling up. The IRA, with local O. C. Max Steofen to the fore, began a protest campaign demanding that the government acquire the land by compulsory purchase and give the local tenants and leaseholders the option of purchasing their property at a minimal sum. Volunteers distributed a leaflet arguing that, every town in Ireland should be the property of the people who live in it. No town should be condemned to live or die in the manner ordained by any outside body, whether in London or Dublin. They called for locals to consider the possibility of cooperative ownership and promised to take the necessary steps to prevent any evictions. The campaign built up momentum, with 2,000 people marching in Cork City and boycotts of property sales taking place. IRA volunteers were finding social issues to become involved with in other places as well. In Dublin the growing housing crisis escalated in August 1965 when homeless families barricaded themselves into Griffith Barracks. A total of 18 families, 87 people in all, were being housed in old army quarters while awaiting accommodation. The barracks were overcrowded and unsanitary, and men and women were segregated after 10 p.m. there was barbed wire on the walls and soldiers on guard duty. Guardi eventually moved in to remove the barricades and evict the homeless families, who then marched across the city to Mountjoy Square, where they set up home in wooden shacks and tents on a derelict site. The encampment was adjacent to the United Irishmen offices at Sinn Féin headquarters in 30 Gardiner Place, which became the center of much of the agitation. During the same summer a two-month strike took place at Dundalk Engineering Works. Local IRA volunteers were involved in support work for the strikers and the United Irishmen gave the issue extensive coverage. The IRA was also involved in mobilizing opposition to redundancies at the Castlecomer Mines in Kilkenny, holding local meetings to rouse support and calling for cooperative ownership of the industry. Most controversially in October 1965 the organization backed striking telephonists, who were demanding recognition for their union, the Irish Telephonists Association. Clashes on picket lines led to arrests and the government using the offensives against the state act to jail several strikers. A hunger strike followed. In December, the strike went down to what an IRA statement termed, shameful defeat, due to the lack of support from the other trade unions. Some Republicans feared that such social interventions meant the military role of the IRA was being downgraded. Mindful of this view, Golding continued to stress that, the only way to rid this country of an armed British force is to confront them with an armed force of Irishmen backed by a united Irish people. The British forces in the six counties will be confronted by such a force. However, the IRA leadership was also intent on social agitation in Northern Ireland. Addressing the Easter 1965 commemoration in Belfast, 
Matt Giola outlined the importance of a new campaign for one man, one vote. He stated that until recently Republicans had not understood the importance of the restrictions on local government voting in the North. Now, however, the movement was preparing a national and international campaign to highlight this discrimination. He assured his 3,000 listeners that this was not a distraction from the goal of a united Ireland. Eagerness for armed activity meant that some activists were continuing to be attracted to splinter groups. One such group was the Dublin-based Invincibles, led by Ructions, Doyle. Numbering around a dozen, they undertook rifle practice on Dollymount Strand. One former IRA member recalls leaving this group after six months when he realized that Doyle was a headbanger, even by our standards. In Cork, internal dissatisfaction found violent expression during 1963. President de Valera had been invited to unveil a memorial at the city's Republican plot, in St. Finbar's Cemetery, on St. Patrick's Day. The plot included the grave of John Joe Cavanaugh, who had been killed by the Guardi in 1940. Some IRA members demanded that action be taken, but they were refused permission by Max Steofen. The night before the unveiling, two border campaign veterans, Desmond Swanton and Jerry Madden, attempted to blow up the new memorial. The mine they had constructed exploded prematurely, killing Swanton and maiming Madden. The IRA made it clear that they were not responsible for the explosion, but admitted that Swanton and Madden had been members. Several of Swanton's comrades found their efforts to give him a full IRA funeral blocked by the local leadership and were dismissed from the organization. They published leaflets announcing the formation of a new group. Max Diofen and one of his adjutants, Jerry McCarthy, responded by raiding the group's premises. The dissidents retaliated by seizing copies of the United Irishmen meant for sale in Cork and arriving armed at the Thomas Ash Hall. A standoff ensued when Golding came to Cork to adjudicate, and negotiations to ensure a compromise broke down. Republicans in Cork were informed that Swanton's comrades were now enemies of the IRA. By 1964 the breakaway group was using the name Irish Revolutionary Forces and a year later publishing a journal entitled Infoblacked. The IRF retained access to arms and made clear that they would not be stood down by the IRA. Politically they declared themselves Marxist-Leninists of the Chinese variety. Similar dissent over the lack of armed action was causing rumblings in Dublin. In early 1965 a local IRA officer, Frank Keane, was court-martial led and dismissed for organizing units without Army Council authorization. Keane recalls being tired of training with weapons that were out of date for Jesse James's time. Some volunteers were also unhappy about being ordered to sell the United Irishmen and partake in open political work, which they felt was beneath their status as members of a secret army. Such attitudes contributed to a decision by a group of Dublin IRA men to carry out a robbery of a rent office, without Army Council authorization, in December 1965. One of the raiders, Joe Dillon, was sentenced to five years in jail for the robbery. A visit by Princess Margaret to Burr and Abilex in January 1965 sparked off a round of conflict between local IRA volunteers and Guardi. Prominent graffiti appeared, bearing slogans such as, British royalty get out, and trees were felled across roads leading into Burr. Clashes erupted with Guardi during protests against the visit and several people were injured. Ten Republicans were arrested and more scuffles broke out when they appeared in court. Eventually a crowd of 200 people tried to storm Mount Melick Courthouse and were repelled by baton charges. In September of that year the IRA attacked the British torpedo boat HMS Brave Borderer during a visit to Waterford. The boat was hit by fire from an anti-tank rifle. Three volunteers were later arrested and jailed for the attack. Another vessel, HMS Lofoden, was due to visit Cork in October and Garland was sent to the city to work with Max Diofen on planning an attack. The Guardi received information that machine guns and a bazooka were to be used on the control room of the vessel, with a view to causing casualties. The visit was cancelled, and the IRA claimed this was due to their threat of action against the ship. In October the special branch placed a British Hydrographic Service naval team working in Glencomcle under armed guard after they discovered IRA plans to blow up the group's equipment. The same month volunteers raided Belfast Street Gabriel's secondary school, where a British Army recruiting film was being shown. Ten masked men armed with hurleys destroyed the film projector and injured the projectionist and an army youth liaison officer. In a statement the IRA warned that such immoral proselytism of Irish youths would not be tolerated. In November 5 young Belfast IRA men were arrested and charged with unlawful possession of bayonets and documents dealing with RUC movements. None of the men spoke or gave evidence during their trial and all were sentenced to 12 months in jail. The five silent men included Joe McCann from Turf Lodge, whom the RUC described as the leader of the group. McCann, an 18-year-old bricklayer who had joined the movement in 1963, was tall and lean with gangly arms, 
which no coat sleeves ever seemed to cover. He was already marked out by his peers as a leader, one recalling. He could read a situation very, very quickly. He had the run of everybody. The Garda Special Branch estimated that there were 48 IRA training camps in the South between February 1965 and October 1966. The camps had begun to reflect the new political priorities, incorporating lectures on history and social agitation. The shortage of weapons remained a problem. The Guardi captured 40 IRA weapons, including seven machine guns and one anti-tank rifle, plus 6,000 rounds of ammunition and 344 sticks of gelignite, in the 1965-6 period. And T. Oblick warned that, the army cannot afford the loss of a single weapon, nor can it afford the loss in morale and prestige consequent on a successful police search. One of the weapons captured, a Belgian Vigneron submachine gun, signaled that the IRA was trying to procure new equipment. IRA members in Britain were instructed to survey territorial army bases and their weapons stocks. One base in the West Midlands looked like a good bet for a raid, but plans were cancelled when it was decided that the local IRA did not have the capacity to store the arms. Small amounts of weaponry continued to arrive from the United States, but short of a successful raid or a substantial donation the only way to acquire arms was to buy them. This pointed to a further pressing problem, the movement had hardly any cash. The United Irishmen often teetered on the edge of bankruptcy as local units and Sinn Féin Kumain used monies owed to the paper to pay other debts. Producing posters, leaflets, election deposits and running the Gardiner Place office were all a drain on resources. The families of prisoners also had to be looked after. Then there was the cost of the army itself. Mick Ryan recalls on occasion being reduced to begging your way around the country in order to gain much-needed funds. Collections, fundraising dances and donations from abroad made only a small dent. Ryan and Garland on occasion were forced to ask Moss Twomey, the 1930s IRA leader and shopkeeper, for a loan of £100, and then ask Republican supporter Donald O'Connor, of the Castle Hotel in Gardiner Row, for £100 to pay Twomey back. Irish America had traditionally provided support, but the later stages of the border campaign had seen tensions emerge within Clan Na Gael, the IRA's main US support network. There were vocal complaints about the perceived lack of militancy among the IRA leadership and suggestions that they were willing to compromise with the free state. Golding traveled to Philadelphia in November 1963 and attended the Klan convention in its Battle of Gettysburg commemoration. But the Klan was no longer a powerful or wealthy organization. While it claimed members in most of the large U.S. cities, only five supporters picketed a visit by Sean Lamass to Philadelphia during 1963 and just 15 took part in a protest at UN headquarters in New York a year later. By the early 1960s the FBI had decided to scale down its surveillance due to the Klan's lack of activity. The vast majority of Irish Americans had no interest in the IRA, and without an armed campaign even those who had were reluctant to devote much time or money to it. The political direction in which Golding was taking the movement was also not to the liking of many American supporters. Senior Klan figures such as Tom McGuigan would complain of the appearance of anti-American views in the United Irishmen. Nevertheless, Golding cultivated the movement's American contacts, such as Manus Canning, his company defendant from the Felstead raid, and the IRA leadership received a steady though not great flow of finance from America as a result. Ryan recalls feeling that if gear and money were no longer forthcoming from America then it was time to look somewhere else. Feelers were put out to the Algerian revolutionary government but came to nothing. Despite the growing interest in socialism among some in the leadership, Garland recalls that the IRA were still innocents abroad in terms of the international communist movement. During the 1920s the IRA had received funding and sought arms from the Soviet Union, but establishing ties with the Soviets was still too politically contentious in 1965. There was another option. Ryan and Garland heard from a sympathetic railwayman that large sums of money were being transported, unguarded, on the Dublin Cork train. They traveled on the train and came to the conclusion that robbing it was a real possibility. During the 1940s the IRA had robbed banks and post offices, but it was felt that they had lost a tremendous amount of popular support as a result, and such activity was now forbidden in the South under Army Order No. 8. When Garland suggested the plan to the Army Council it faced furious objections. Ryan recalls that O'Bradi feared such an operation would bring the IRA into disrepute. The idea was dropped for the time being and the funding problem remained unresolved. The IRA leadership had decided to prioritize political campaigning, and the weapons it held were just about adequate for training purposes and the type of low-level armed activities it was carrying out. The strategy was re-emphasized to volunteers. It will be necessary to widen the basis of support for the national revolutionary movement before thinking in terms of armed action again. Political developments in Britain during the 1960s had an impact in Ireland. 
In 1964 the Republican movement set up Plan Na Aran as a support group in Britain in place of a staid Sinn Féin organization. Former Fianna chief scout Sean O'Chanath returned to England to become Klan organizer. One of the major tasks of the new organization was to provide funding for the movement in Ireland. Klan organized weekly club nights where Saley and old-time music was played. Birmingham and Glasgow were the two busiest areas of Klan activity, in contrast London is recalled as a morass of warring factions which, never realized its potential. Birmingham clan leader Seamus Collins, who had emigrated to England in 1963, felt that one of his teenage recruits, Padraig Yates, brought a political brawn to the fledgling organization in the English Midlands. Yates, the English-born son of Dublin parents, suggested a campaign for emigrants' rights in early 1965, noting that only the Legion of Mary was concerned with the conditions of Irish people living in England. However, the major organizations in the Irish community tended to be the county's associations, which Yates recalls as dominated by people who craved acceptance and middle-class respectability, and very Catholic. The church itself remained a force, and clans sold papers and distributed leaflets outside mass on Sundays. The IRA recruited from clans membership and maintained its own structure in Britain. Volunteers traveled to Ireland for training, usually in Wexford or Wicklow, which were convenient to the ferry. At the time many Republicans were interested in the idea of pan-Celtic unity between Welsh, Irish, Scots and Breton groups, and Ochenath was very much in favour of establishing contacts with groups like the Free Wales Army. Members of the Welsh group would eventually travel to Dublin for Easter commemorations and train in Ireland with the IRA. In return the IRA leadership hoped to obtain gelatinite from the FWA, whose members claimed to have access to it from the mines in South Wales. A number of joint operations were planned, including an arms raid in Chester. The FWA were to claim the raid and the IRA would take the bulk of the arms. The link with the FWA proved to be more trouble than it was worth, however, especially after it started to become public knowledge. On one occasion the FWA requested that a large store of gelignite the IRA were holding for them be moved from Glasgow to Salford. The IRA feared that the explosives were becoming unstable and were forced to dump them in a canal, drawing the attention of the police. Clan attempted to tread a careful line between the various left-wing organizations and the Irish community. It disassociated itself from leftists who became involved in a clash outside the Irish Embassy in April 1965. Much of Clan's campaigning was along traditional lines, the Buy Irish campaign of 1964-5, where efforts were made to enlist support from mainstream Irish organizations, being a case in point. The IRA felt that the campaign had given Clan a certain amount of respect heretofore missing. During 1965 and 1966 efforts were made to get Clan members to Donegal to work on FR. McDyer's cooperative project, Clan also picketed the Irish Embassy in support of strikers in Ireland and occupied it in protest at the jailing of Republicans in July 1966. Some Clan members were sympathetic to the Connolly Association, though relations between the two bodies could be fraught. Some younger Clan members saw the association as too conservative, while older Republicans distrusted it because of its communist links. Other sections of the British left also had their attractions for Republicans. After emigrating from Belfast Brendan Mackin, who had been a Fianna boy, became an active trade unionist in the building industry and joined the Labour Party. Others joined the Communist Party, while Yates would join the International Socialists, who were very active in Birmingham. Some were drawn into campaigns against racism, in which Republican building workers, armed with lengths of heavy cable up their sleeves, helped steward meetings against attack by far-right groups. On another occasion during a strike in the Midlands a gang of bikers had assaulted pickets before clan members armed with pickaxe handles saw them off. The IRA saw major opportunities in the 50th anniversary of the Easter Rising, in 1966. Northern members reported to the Army Council that, every commemoration committee in Northern Ireland was under Republican control and, widespread publicity, was being planned. In Belfast the, whole resources, of the movement were put into organizing a major commemoration in the city, which Billy Macmillan hoped would, drive a coach and four, through the laws that banned display of the tricolor. In the South, the early months of 1966 were dominated by the state-endorsed commemorations. Arte ran numerous programs on the Easter Rising and the local and national press contained hundreds of articles and memoirs. Popular nationalism was reflected in the pop charts. The Beatles, the Small Faces and the Rolling Stones all had hits in Ireland that year, but it was Dermot O'Brien's version of Dominic Behan's, The Merry Plowboy that spent six weeks at number one with its cheery if anachronistic chorus, and were all off to Dublin in the green, in the green where the helmets glisten in the sun, where the bayonets flash and the rifles crash to the echo of a Thompson gun. But the IRA was not going to have 1966 all to themselves. 
The issue of communist infiltration in the movement became a matter for public discussion early in the year. First the Fianna Fail Minister for Justice Brian Lenihan warned of a definite policy of intervention by anti-state groups in the telephonists' dispute. Then the Evening Herald reported on how Reds were becoming involved with Republicans. In January 1966 the Sunday Independent exposed the communists' quiet revolution within the IRA. The article, which clearly drew from special branch sources, noted how sinister intellectuals had assumed positions of influence within the organization committing it to a policy of encouraging social disorder. The paper stated that what was happening was an exact repeat of the Republican Congress of 1934 except that, whereas the Congress had been a schism, now the mainstream IRA itself had been converted to communism. Intervention in Middleton and the telephonist strike had been the result. Significantly, the article noted that some IRA leaders were uneasy with this trend and many of the rank and file were unaware of the communist influence on their leadership. The special branch had collected a significant amount of internal IRA correspondence and first-hand reports on discussions at conventions through at least one senior IRA informer, George Points, the Monaghan O.C. In a February 1966 Belfast Telegraph interview, Tony Mead admitted that allegations of a person holding communist sympathies being in a leadership position were current but denied there was any truth in them. Communist influence in the IRA was also the subject of discussion among British intelligence officers in Whitehall during April though they identified the IRA Director of Education as a Trinity professor, whereas Johnston, who had been appointed to that position, worked for Aer Lingus. It is possible that they had Johnston confused with Coughlin. In February an RUC vehicle and the Unionist Party HQ in Belfast were petrol-bombed, though the IRA denied any connection with these incidents. Two Catholic schools were firebombed during the same month. In March Billy McMillan and Dennis Toner were arrested and held over the Easter period. More critically, in February Golding was stopped by Gardy while driving through Port Lawas. Asked what was in the sacks weighing down his large console car, he replied, potatoes, carrots and parsnips, which was true, though he also had 3,000 rounds of ammunition and a Luger pistol. Golding was held until June. In an April court appearance he stated, if you find me guilty of this charge, you are finding every Irishman of every generation from Tone to the men of 1916 guilty of the same thing. He was eventually convicted but released after the Army Council broke with normal policy and paid a fine. The increased Garda attention was intended to prevent the IRA from capitalizing on the 1916 anniversary with a show of arms, but this was exactly what the Republican leadership intended in Newry that spring. A raid on a territorial army lockup was planned, involving Garland, McGurran and selected volunteers. Some of the raiders were to pose as RUC men and hold up a car outside Warren Point before entering Newry. IRA intelligence indicated that every Sunday arms were delivered to the local Territorial Army unit in two RUC Land Rovers. The IRA raiders planned to take over the lightly guarded lockup, hold up the RUC and drive the Land Rovers and their cargo across the border to Dundalk. However, on the night before the planned raid a local guide, a smuggler, bottled it after McGurran teased him about the likelihood of a long jail sentence if he was caught, and the operation was called off at the last minute. The following day scouts spotted a heavy RUC presence in the area of the tall lockup. George Points was one of those supposed to take part in the raid, and those involved came to suspect that they were being led into a trap. In May Garland was arrested in Co. Laos. On his person were copies of plans drawn up by the Special Military Council. He was convicted of IRA membership and jailed for two months. In contrast to Golding, Garland remained silent during his trial, sitting with his arms folded and refusing to answer questions from the judge. Brian Lenihan read out selected passages of the captured plans in the Dale, drawing attention to the IRA's strategy for infiltration of trade unions and social agitation. The quoted documents actually drew praise from TCD, a Trinity student magazine, which welcomed them as representing a well-thought-out plan of social reform and democratic ideals. The IRA claimed that the plan was for discussion purposes only but Tony Meade took the opportunity in the United Irishman to laud the plan. He argued that Republicans had to face up to what had been their conspicuous failure from 1922 onwards. The captured plan had contained no romanticism, no escapism, no attempt to find a miracle cure for the evils which afflict the Republic we cherish. Instead it had offered practical steps to attain popular support. Meanwhile, Republicans continued to carry out armed actions. Richard Bahill, who had been jailed for the brave borderer attack, escaped from Limerick Prison in February without consulting the leadership and then appeared at several social events in his native Kilkenny. During March and April Bahill and his allies blew up a telephone exchange, felled trees and tore up railway sleepers in the southeast. In the same period several attacks were carried out in Dublin, 
with an attempt to blow up a telephone exchange, the firebombing of the residents of the British military attaché and a petrol bomb thrown into the gym in Kathalbrugge barracks. Most dramatically, former members of Joe Crystal's group blew up the 134-foot Nelson's Pillar in O'Connell Street on the 8th of March. The IRA stated that it had nothing to do with these attacks and claimed not to be concerned in the slightest way with the destruction of monuments of foreign origin. It reiterated that its policy since 1954 had been to avoid armed action in the South, the one exception being the brave borderer attack. It warned that the recent senseless attacks could give the authorities an excuse to reintroduce internment without trial. Behal issued his own statement, claiming that the actions in the Southeast had achieved their purpose by focusing attention on the continuing detention of Republicans. He denied any connection with the Dublin attacks, though he later claimed that they were carried out in support of him. Behind the scenes patience had run out. Behal was court-martial led and sentenced to death, the Army Council dividing four to three on the issue. Costello, who was acting chief of staff while Golding was in jail, wanted Bale shot, but it was decided instead to exile him, on the grounds that killing him would be unpopular with rank and file Republicans. He was dismissed from the IRA and emigrated to New York. Easter brought more incidents. There were two Republican parades in Belfast on successive Sundays, despite loyalists planting a bomb at Milltown Cemetery. Clashes also took place after a Paisleyite rally in the city center. The northern government had banned railway travel between Belfast and Dublin in the run-up to the Easter holiday to prevent Republicans traveling north. But in Belfast itself 20,000 people took part in the Republican parade, while the falls was festooned with tricolors. Betty Sinclair, president of Belfast Trades Council and a leading member of the Communist Party, had been due to speak but agreed to stand down due to pressure from the GAA, which threatened to withdraw the use of Casement Park if she did so. Costello delivered the main oration, welcoming the participation of trade unionists in the parade and explicitly blaming capitalism for dividing the working class in the north. The numbers attending commemorations in Northern Ireland reflected the occasion, 7,000 in Coal Island, 1,000 in Derry City and the biggest parade since the 1930s in Newry. The authorities banned the commemoration in South Derry, deploying 200 police to ensure there was no parade. Instead 700 people visited Republican graves. The turnouts reflected different traditions from area to area. The previous year only 150 had attended the commemoration in Derry City, where there were only about six active IRA members in early 1966. In contrast there were several Republican clubs active in Tyrone, with particular strength in the east of the county. The commemorations drew new recruits for the IRA and the Fianna in Derry and Belfast. In Dublin, about 5,000 people set out on the parade from St. Stephen's Green to Glasnevin Cemetery on 24 April. At their head the color party unfurled the blue Oblai Na Aran flag of the Iris Dublin Brigade. Detectives tried to seize it but were repelled in a series of scuffles. There were further clashes outside Trinity College, and at the Parnell Monument in O'Connell Street fierce fighting broke out, with batons, fists and boots used freely. The Guardi were still unable to capture the flag, and later that evening 400 Republicans paraded with it from Parnell Square. Guardi tried to seize it again and during the fighting Bobby McKnight, walloped, a superintendent. Under cover of darkness Gardy attempted to take revenge for their earlier loss of face and a number of marchers were badly beaten. Several arrests took place and a number of IRA members received prison sentences including McKnight, Leo Steenson and Lar Malone. McKnight expected a beating after his arrest but recalls being surprised to find Gardy whispering, good man yourself, to him. It transpired that the officer he had hit was rather unpopular with his men. 17-year-old Tony Heffernan had gone to both the government and Republican parades. During the disturbances he was struck by a Garda and afterwards became interested in Republican politics. Which probably proves that there is nothing that will politicize you as quickly as a whack of a baton. The post-Easter period brought grim reminders of the reality of politics north of the border. Early June saw serious trouble in the markets area of Belfast when Ian Paisley led a protest march through Cromack Square against the supposed Romanizing tendencies within the Presbyterian Church. Local people gathered to oppose him and violent clashes took place. After the RUC attempted to disperse crowds in the area there were dozens of injuries. The following night a large force of police again moved in and the IRA responded by attacking RUC vehicles with hand grenades and petrol bombs. Tensions were high because the revived Ulster Volunteer Force had publicly stated that it was declaring war against the IRA and had launched a campaign of violence. On the 27th of May a UVF gang had shot a Catholic man, John Scullion, on the Falls Road. He died on the 11th of June. They had planned to kill IRA officers Leo Martin and Jim Sullivan, on the 26th of June UVF members had been watching Martin's home before they killed another Catholic, Peter Ward, instead. 
A Protestant woman, Matilda Gould, died of burns received when her home was mistakenly firebombed by the group. The emergence of the UVF reflected increased unease among working-class Protestants, unease encouraged by Paisley and others. Billy Mitchell, a future member of the UVF leadership, remembered hearing rumors that the IRA were going to take over City Hall in Belfast or seize Newry and make a stand like they did in 1,916 feet. Gusty Spence, jailed for the 1966 killings, later claimed that members of the Unionist Party establishment had helped set up his organization to undermine Premier Terence O'Neill. The IRA believed that prominent RUC detectives had provided information on Sullivan and Martin to the UVF. These developments indicated that it was going to be difficult for Golding and his allies to get through to the Protestant working class, though they remained optimistic. During 1965 and T. Oblick had claimed that the crumbling of Unionist support is only beginning but it has in fact begun, and the 1966 IRA convention passed a motion that the army do everything possible to widen the rift between the UVF and the Unionist Party. In June Johnston wrote a letter to the United Irishmen criticizing the saying of the Rosary at Republican commemorations. There was an immediate backlash and Max Steofen refused to have the paper sold in his command area, an action that resulted in him being suspended from the IRA for a short period. More opposition to the IRA leadership was expressed during the Republic's June presidential election. De Valera was the Fianna Fáil candidate, opposed by T.F. O'Higgins of Fine Gael. Among the IRA documents captured on Garland when he was arrested in May were draft leaflets for surreptitious distribution by Republicans urging voters to reject De Valera. One leaflet stated that, De Valera has led us to the generation of Lamas, Hahi and Lenihan. They have sold everything in sight and will sell more given encouragement. The proposal caused problems in North Kerry where trouble had been simmering since Easter when the local organization had rejected Dennis Foley as a speaker for their commemoration because he was associated with moves to abandon abstentionism. Now they refused to distribute a leaflet they claimed would have us supporting a candidate in a 26-county presidential election, something that would have made a mockery of our dead. During the autumn three IRA members from North Kerry were court-martialed led and dismissed by the Dublin leadership. At Bowdenstown in June the Dublin IRA flag again led the parade, which included a delegation from the Belfast Trades Council. In his oration Costello emphasized that the policy of the movement was that key industries be nationalized, with the eventual aim of cooperative ownership by the workers, and that the large estates owned by absentee landlords be compulsorily purchased and worked on a cooperative basis. To imagine that this could be achieved by constitutional means, Costello said, was utter folly. In the final analysis the robber baron must be disestablished by the same methods he used to enrich himself and retain his ill-gotten gains, namely, force of arms. Another opportunity for the IRA to utilize force during 1966 concerned the Irish language. During the autumn Mertan O'Cadame, professor of Irish at Trinity College, approached Mick Ryan, the ex-quartermaster general who had resigned as QMG but was now back as Dublin O.C., with a request. O'Cadame, a former IRA officer who was interned during the 1940s, wanted the IRA to disrupt a public meeting of the language freedom movement in Jury's Hotel. The LFM, of which the playwright John B. Keane was a prominent supporter, was campaigning for Irish to be non-compulsory in schools. The Dublin IRA acted on O'Cadhane's request, with volunteers turning the meeting into a shambles. Republicans also helped disrupt a much larger LFM meeting in the Mansion House in September. In early 1967, the LFM leader Christopher Morris publicly highlighted the role he felt Tomas Mac Giola had played in the Mansion House disturbance, adding that he had knowledge of a plan by the IRA to attempt the kidnap of the chair of the second meeting, broadcaster Gay Byrne. He also blamed Republicans for a break-in at his home. The military council's plans captured with Garland, which supported Costello's assurances to volunteers that force was still an essential component in the Republican strategy, also contained more radical suggestions. The section dealing with political action contained a list of six key strategic programs. Topping the list, and of fundamental importance, was that the movement assume an organizational form that will attract back people of national outlook in the trade union movement so that their efforts can be co-coordinated. A group under the control of the chief of staff would organize union activity. This body would act to make the unions more revolutionary, and also to educate IRA volunteers on labor agitation. Committees to oversee intervention in housing and other campaigns would also be set up. Another crucial proposal was that no longer would men be recruited on the basis of an emotional appeal to arms. In future recruit training would emphasize social and economic objectives ahead of arms and battle tactics. It had to be understood that boring and unromantic work would have to be done in order to build Republican influence. The document also called for the empowering of Sinn Féin, hitherto a rubber stamp, for IRA decisions. 
The new aim was to have a political, national and social revolutionary organization with an open membership and legal existence. The IRA would develop revolutionary action legally and seek to develop political action as openly as possible. The IRA would be able to choose its recruits from the best and most conscious members of Sinn Féin. The problem was still that not enough Republicans had experience or links to social agitation. Only a few had any experience of trade unions or co-ops. Local Kumain needed to set up specialized groups for work in tenants associations, youth groups, credit union groups and cooperatives. Special importance was placed on the formation of factory Kumain in workplaces. These groups would be the dynamos generating local and specialized Republican leadership in all areas of the people's needs. They would also be the basic channel for recruitment into the movement and serve as a training ground for revolutionary government. In theory the use of social and economic agitation along with growing electoral strength might see a dual power situation emerge, with the army, trade unions and co-ops as the new organs of state power. This would be the signal for the completion of the job by military action. The section of the document dealing with military strategy was similarly ambitious, stressing the need to learn from the Cypriots and engage in terror tactics only. It stated that, our campaign will be fought in the six-county area, but recognized that the IRA was as yet unprepared for such a campaign. Due to the hostility of the Unionist majority and the strength of the RUC and B specials, classic guerrilla-type operations cannot be successful. A five-stage plan involving large stunt-type operations, agricultural and industrial sabotage, and assassinations was outlined. It was made explicit that the idea is to prepare the way for a campaign, to get our people psychologically prepared for future killing. Suggested tactics included open assassinations of police, using silencers and even poison darts. Meeting the needs of the plan would require a dramatic upping of the IRA's military capacity. The document enumerated a wish list including 10 tons plastic explosive, 5,000 grenades, 1,000 short arms, 200 automatic rifles, 300 bazookas and 3,000 shells. The possibility of a coup d'etat in the south was also discussed. The groundwork for a coup would have to include proper infiltration of the police and military, as well as propaganda aimed at undermining the loyalty to the state. Newer political strategies were also being attempted. On the 13th to the 14th of August a Wolf Tone Society convention took place at the home of Republican Kevin Agnew in Magara, Co. Derry. Johnston attended along with a number of society members from across Northern Ireland, including Fred Heatley and the journalist Jack Bennett. Golding was also present with a number of IRA officers. Owen Harris, a 23-year-old recalled by Johnston as a fringe member of the Dublin Wolf Tone Society, read out a strategy document written by Coughlin, who was unable to attend. The young Corkman's eloquence was preferred to Johnston's stammer. Coughlin's document addressed the task of how to win an all-Ireland republic, politically and economically in control of its own destiny, where the exploitation of man by man would be abolished. Looking at the situation in Northern Ireland, he argued that the moves towards reform by Terence O'Neill were having the effect of unfreezing political life. The Unionist government was being forced to modernize against its wishes, but this was creating resistance on its right wing. The Unionists should now be squeezed from the left by demands from the disenfranchised, oppressed Catholic and nationalist minority. Republicans must be to the fore in demanding civil rights and electoral reform. The task was to force O'Neill to concede more than he wants to do or thinks he can give without risking overthrow by the more reactionary elements among the Unionists. Such a movement, it was believed, had the potential to win support from progressive Protestants provided it completely divorced itself from any elements of Catholic sectarianism. The temptation to engage in provocative actions that would allow the Unionists to portray the movement as subversive should also be resisted. The meeting decided to develop the idea of a civil rights charter and involve groups already working on related issues. These included the Communists and the Campaign for Social Justice, a pressure group that had been founded in Dungannon in 1964 by Dr. Con McCluskey and his wife Patricia. Since the early 1960s the couple had been collecting data and attempting to publicize cases of discrimination against Catholics in housing and jobs. While the IRA's attempts to form one man, one vote committees in 1965 had failed, it was hoped that this new initiative might provide a springboard to a wider audience. The IRA Convention of October 1966 passed a motion that an economic resistance campaign be developed. The 55 delegates also endorsed the emphasis on internal education, but demanded that all these politically centered programs have the caveat that they will not replace but supplement ordinary unit activities and training programs. It was decided to order volunteers to join Sinn Fein, if there was no common locally they would establish one themselves. Golding himself finally joined the party.
Volunteers were also ordered to join trade unions. According to Garda Surveil Lance Brian Quinn from Tyrone replaced Paddy Mulcahy on the Army Council at this convention. In November a meeting of the Army Council affirmed the need to bring Sinn Féin policy in line with that of the IRA, with one member even suggesting that if it did not, a new party should be formed, possibly based on the Wolf Tone Society. It was also decided that GHQ was to make every effort to obtain modern weapons. Gardy estimated in December 1966 that there were now 1,039 IRA members in the Republic, of whom only 251 were border campaign veterans, suggesting many new recruits. They also speculated, however, that only 312 of the IRA's volunteers would engage in armed action if ordered to do so. Dublin Brigade's strength was estimated to be 306, with 80 likely to involve themselves in military activity. The Guardi considered that the IRA had not been very successful in securing financial support or amassing any significant amount of arms or explosives. Hence they might leave armed force, in abeyance, for a period in order to build public support for Sinn Féin. Army Council members of the period suggest that while the organization was growing, the police figures were overestimates. Even as the IRA leadership moved leftwards, they were also subject to criticism from the left. During 1966 the dissident Irish Revolutionary Forces in Cork opened a bookshop in Tower Street. They continued to criticize the Republican movement for having, in their view, neither a military strategy nor clear revolutionary politics. O'Bradi was deemed a petty bourgeois reactionary, and Mac Giola came in for particular abuse. Criticism also came from émigré sources. In London during 1965 Jerry Lawless, a leftist agitator who had been part of Joe Crystal's group before emigrating, had helped establish the Irish Communist Group, whose publications celebrated the memory of Sor Ulad. Ex-Ira and Sinn Féin members such as Liam Walsh, Phil Flynn and Frank Keane became involved in the group, as did other young emigrants without Republican backgrounds, such as Eamon McCann, Michael Farrell and Brendan Clifford. The group soon divided into Maoist and Trotskyist factions, with the Maoists, led by Clifford, eventually breaking away to form the Irish Communist Organization. Lawless and his Trotskyite comrades, meanwhile, formed the Irish Workers' Group. Lawless was dubious about the supposed leftward turn of the IRA leadership, he reserved particular ire for Mac Giola, whom he claimed had been, hounding socialists out of the Republican movement, in the early 1960s and yet now called himself one. The Irish Workers' Group's Irish militant also adopted a hysterical tone towards Johnston, referring to him as, a Stalinist hack and longtime servant of the Russian bureaucracy. The IWG made contact with a Dublin-based IRA splinter group in 1966, seeing them as a left-wing opposition to the IRA leadership. They were inclined to view even right-wing Republican opponents of Golding as anti-Stalinists rather than conservatives, and the Irish militant gave positive coverage to attacks on the IRA leadership by one such conservative, Cork's Jerry McCarthy. Beyond the political debate, there was continued dissension over the lack of immediate armed action. In January 1967 a group of former Dublin Brigade members robbed the home of a licensed arms dealer and stole 26 old but serviceable handguns and five rifles. They then took £3,500 in a raid on the Royal Bank in Drumcondra that February. This was the first bank robbery in the South for decades and caused a major stir. In October the group carried out a firebomb attack on Fianna Fáil headquarters, issuing a statement claiming the action was taken to highlight the cases of Republican prisoners. At the 1966 IRA convention it had been agreed to take action to stamp out such splinter groups, and in November 1967 the IRA abducted a man in Bray and held him overnight in the Dublin Mountains, where he was assaulted and questioned about splinter group activity. But it was understood that such measures might well be counterproductive, and no general action was taken. During April and June 1968 members of the Dublin Splinter Group robbed three banks of a total of £8,300. There were no more public statements of intent, but the suggestion in Republican circles was that the group's members, fed up with IRA inactivity, were setting about collecting the means necessary to fund an armed campaign. The fact that this type of activity was rare created an aura of mystique around the group and some admired their audacity. However, IRA members suspected that much of the money was being spent in Doheny and Nesbitt's, Toners, Grogan's and the International Bar, rather than on arms. Some military actions were sanctioned. In May 1967 the IRA bombed territorial army centers in Belfast and in Lisburn. The explosions took place simultaneously at night, leaving the Belfast center wrecked. The IRA leadership ordered the operations in response to increased British Army recruiting publicity. But the focus for the organization that year was primarily political. A major effort was made to get volunteers from the country involved in the widespread campaign of marches and pickets being waged by the National Farmers Association. In Derry IRA members were to the fore in a number of confrontations with bailiffs during evictions. 
and T. Oblick explained how an army section actually helped the occupants of houses threatened with eviction to barricade their homes, and actually stayed with the family for a week to help them resist eviction. At Bowdenstown in June Golding drove home the importance of political agitation when he attacked dream-filled romantics who hankered for glory-full military victory, but did not want the painful, slow grueling work necessary to bring that victory about. He complained that even though the movement had decided to involve itself in social struggles, we have done almost nothing. He warned that the demands of the people for their rights would come into physical conflict with the forces of the Gombean establishment. Belfast Joe McCann was one of those quite taken by Golding's speech, according to his comrade Jerry Adams. During the summer of 1967 Garland asked Mick Ryan to undertake a tour around the country to assess the state of the movement at local level. Taking his two weeks annual holiday from his job as an insurance salesman, Ryan set off in his Austin Mini. At the end of the tour Ryan concluded in his report to the Army Council that there was no movement. He recalls his analysis provoking an angry retort from Golding, there is a fucking movement. But Ryan had provoked an honest debate, and the result was an important decision made at a meeting of the most active officers held over weekend at Andy McDonald's farm in Palace, Co. Tipperary, in August 1967. The meeting heard that just 212 of the IRA's 614 volunteers were active in Sinn Féin and that the army has enough ammo for one good job, and a very limited amount of arms and explosives. Nevertheless, there was a consensus that, in Ryan's words, no social revolution was possible without the use of arms and that IRA units should be trained in the use of assault weapons. It was agreed that there had to be a major reorganization effort and that the army's energies were to be put fully behind political agitation. The United Irishman, which was deep in debt and losing circulation, had to be stabilized and used as the basis for expansion. The IRA would openly declare itself to be working for a democratic socialist republic. Following the palace meeting four organizers were appointed to oversee IRA activities across Ireland. Malachy McGurn in Ulster, Ryan in Leinster and Waterford, Sean O'Chanath in Connacht and Barty Madden in Munster. IRA volunteers were to throw themselves into selling the United Irishman, organizing pickets and protests, and stewarding demonstrations. They would assist in Sinn Féin election campaigns and stand for election themselves. Most of their work would be completely open and much of it would be legal. But if necessary they were to provide the backup for illegal activity, to do things ordinary Sinn Féin members wouldn't do. And T. Oblick stressed in December that the IRA must have men that are capable of leading the people in an armed struggle. For of this last let there be no doubt, there will be an armed struggle against the forces who are at present in control of this country. The IRA's journal also serialized Che Guevara's writings on guerrilla warfare and continued to issue instructions on arms in explosives. In Dublin Ryan had established an active service unit, ASU, of seven trusted volunteers, most of whom were unknown to the Guardi. Jim Monahan, a Donegal man who had moved to Dublin as a youth and joined the IRA in 1964, was in charge of organizing most ASU activities. Lar Malone, a dynamic if quick-tempered union activist from Donny Carney, was another key member of the unit. One IRA recruit who was assigned to the ASU recalled seeking information on joining the movement from a man selling the United Irishman at the GPO in 1967. He was summoned to a meeting in the Clarence Hotel on a Sunday morning. Entering a boardroom, which had been hired under the auspices of the Irish Workers' Cultural Society, or something to that effect, he was questioned as to his motives by several men sitting behind a table, headed by Malone. The prospective recruit had heard about the leftward direction of the IRA and was interested in it but was confused by the questions. He was asked if he knew what the IRA's policy was, but because the answer seemed so obvious he thought it was some sort of test and was hesitant in responding. Eventually he convinced them he was genuine and was accepted into the organization's recruitment process. Training camps in Glendalow followed. Due to his lack of a Republican record, he was asked to join the ASU but not to attend Republican functions or join Sinn Féin. As he recalls, they were keeping me very quiet. Despite having only a tiny arsenal of weaponry, and a perception that training was being downgraded, the IRA carried on with what Macmillan called a happy blend of political agitation and military activity. In January 1968 the IRA bombed Tyrone House, the Royal Ulster Rifles Territorial HQ on Belfast's Malone Road. The organization claimed that the action was taken in protest at the recruiting of Irishmen as black and tans in Britain's occupied territories. They warned that responsibility for any civilian injuries rested with the British. Armed involvement in social agitation was increasing. In Shannon, Co., Clare, there was a strike at the U.S. owned A plant, a subsidiary of General Electric. The company was refusing to recognize the ITGWU. On the night of the 29th of May, IRA units destroyed buses and cars being used to ferry strikebreakers to Shannon, 
and in Limerick a Garda was held up while six buses and a car were burnt out. Buses were also burnt in Louth and Meath and unsuccessful attacks took place in Clare and Dublin. At Bowdenstown a few weeks later Garland made clear that the A actions were, no isolated incident, the day is past when the homeless, the worker or the landless, will be left unprotected. Now physical force would be employed where necessary to defend people who are agitating for their rights. The criticisms of mealy-mouthed sentimentalists would not be allowed to stop the IRA becoming the army of the people. In July the Belfast IRA carried out a grenade attack on an RUC patrol in Cyprus. Street after luring the police by a false 999 call. The attack was in retaliation for special branch raids and led to the RUC nicknaming the area, Nagoland, and patrolling it only in strength. On the 1st of August a US-owned lobster trawler, the Mary Catherine, was destroyed by the IRA at Rossavel, Co. Galway. An IRA statement explained the action was a protest against exploitation by foreign interest of Irish natural resources. Gardy noted that the expert bombers had not damaged any of the other boats docked at the same pier. In September a man was injured during an IRA arms raid in Belfast. In October IRA volunteers in Port McGee, Co. Kerry, burned out a bus in connection with a local school dispute. The same month saw IRA members place a bomb under the car of a landlord in Dalkey, Co. Dublin who had been targeted because of clashes with Republican housing campaigners. The device did not explode and the IRA did not claim the action. One volunteer recalls Golding stressing to Dublin activists that such actions shouldn't look like it's organized by us, it should look as if it's spontaneous. In November the Guardi intercepted a group of IRA members on their way to burn a German-owned farmhouse in Mead. Meanwhile the role of women in the movement was beginning to change, following a decision that they could now join the IRA proper rather than remain in the traditionally subordinate Cumann na Amban. Women were recruited directly into the IRA in Belfast, Dublin and Cork. Some but by no means all of these women were related to men already in the movement. Joint training sessions were organized for the first time, and not everyone involved enjoyed the experience. During a training session in the mud and rain at Belcamp in Dublin, one female recruit stormed off after being ordered to crawl along the ground by her training officer. Others, such as the woman who was given command of the women's section in Dublin, were enthusiastic recalling that, we saw ourselves as the first women in the IRA who weren't Cumann na Emban, who, were full members of the IRA, though she recognized in retrospect that, we were in our ass full members of the IRA. There were also moves to make the Fianna open to girls as well as boys, though their camps would remain separate. Resentment at the rise of women came from both male and female Republicans. Cumann na Emban saw its role being superseded while some men believed that women had no place in the IRA. Tensions had come to a head at Bodenstown in June when Cumann na Emban members objected to the presence of communists in the parade. Their contingent split over the issue, with the majority refusing to join the march. The organization was then stood down by the IRA leadership and refused use of Republican premises. But local groups remained in existence led by those, like Mayor Drum in Belfast, who were politically alienated from the IRA leadership. Younger women, such as Margaret O'Leary in Dublin, had been highly unimpressed by the old common na Amban in the first place and were happy to be integrated into all aspects of the movement. The stressing of radical non-sectarian politics had seen a number of Southern Protestants joining the IRA. Stephen Hilliard, an Irish language enthusiast and member of the Church of Ireland, whose uncle Robert had been killed fighting with the international brigades in Spain, became an IRA training officer in Dublin. A young Kerry Protestant was also a key activist in the Dublin ASU. Volunteers recall discussing the prospect that, Southern people, would have to fight the revolution in the 26 counties, fighting moves to European Union, fighting multinationals, seeing these as the key problems. The North, in other words, would not necessarily be the first battleground. By the September 1968 Army Convention Golding's supporters had decided a fundamental restructuring of the IRA was needed. Once again a motion to end abstention from Leinster House was defeated, but another proposal was passed that increased the size of the Army Council from 7 to 20 members. The new structure brought Johnston and McGurn onto the highest executive of the organization, along with a number of local commanding officers and organizers, such as Ochenath, Macmillan and Cork's Eddie Williams. This had the intended effect of giving Golding's supporters a secure majority on the council. It caused consternation for Max Steofen, who later deplored having been left, in a minority, to people who were, obsessed with parliamentary politics and Marxist debates. The convention had also decided to launch the long-planned, nationwide economic resistance campaign, with special emphasis on all lands held by foreigners and large estates held by natives. Action was to be taken against both land agents and property. Efforts were also to be made to win the support of dissident Catholic and Protestant clergy in order to weaken the authority 
of both the Catholic hierarchy and the Orange Order. A resolution was adopted to seek the financial and military support of international revolutionary groups and socialist governments, and again it was decided to make maximum effort to secure modern arms and equipment. The implications of the IRA's new direction and energy were being recognized. The Irish Times speculated on how the chance that a bomb might be used in labor disputes could have adverse effects on foreign investment in Ireland. In a feature forwarded to Dublin by Irish diplomats in the U.S., the Washington Post noted the A attacks and described how the IRA had decided to soft-pedal its old demands for unification, in favor of agitating, via trade unions, for a socialist workers' republic. The internal machinations of the IRA were also having an impact on Irish politics and society north and south, through the movement's political manifestations, Sinn Féin and the Republican clubs, and increasingly through the issue of civil rights. 3. A New Revolution Sinn Féin and the Republican Clubs 1962-1968 The Republican socialist ideology is the only one which can unite the mass of the Irish people both Catholic and Protestant. If we are to create such unity we cannot remain in isolation. We must be prepared to ally ourselves with other radical forces. A new generation of Irishmen are creating a new revolution in Ireland and this time they will not be satisfied with half measures. Tomás Maggiola Sinn Féin Ard Thais, the 7th of December 1968 The Sinn Féin party of which Tomás Maggiola took leadership in September 1962 was a largely moribund organization. The Guardi estimated that membership of the party stood at 5,000 in November 1961. Kumain had little existence outside periods of electioneering, campaigning for prisoner releases, selling the United Irishmen each month and lilies at Easter. They sent delegates to an annual Ard Thais in Dublin, where they rubber-stamped decisions that had already been taken by the IRA and elected officer boards that needed the approval of the army. In the North, where the party and United Irishmen were illegal, Sinn Féin was only a slightly more public manifestation of pockets of the IRA and its supporters. Proinches de Rosa, co-opted onto the party Ard Chomherly in 1962, recalls only two really active branches in Dublin, with little more than a dozen members in each. Many members of the IRA were not even nominal members of Sinn Féin, the tall, slender, pipe-smoking Maggiola, with his gentlemanly demeanor, had already at the age of 38 taken on an appearance reminiscent to some of de Valera. His first presidential Ard Thais speech addressed the need to combat materialism of every brand. He argued that if the communist menace is a battle for men's minds then Republicans should undoubtedly be playing a leading part in the fight against it. He also stated that the spirit in the Irish people is being slowly asphyxiated by American and British materialism and it is now to be finally extinguished in the new materialist Europe on the specious plea that we are aiding in the fight against communism. These sentiments were reassuring to the membership, as was Mac Giola's position within the leadership of the IRA. Mac Giola came from a pro-free state family in rural Tipperary, an uncle had been a home rule MP. He had come to Dublin to study accountancy after a short period in a seminary and had been drawn to republicanism through the anti-partition campaign of the late 1940s. After attending UCD he became an ESB clerk. He was an enormous reader, not just of the Republican staples but also of fiction, particularly the works of John Steinbeck. He was a practicing Catholic and a pioneer. He first met Golding in 1959, and Golding introduced him to the radical ideas of George Plant, the pride of Tipperary, a Protestant IRA man executed by the Fianna Fáil government in 1942. Golding also spoke of his first-hand experience of the Republican Congress of the 1930s, and told Mac Giola that his objective was to take the whole movement in that radical direction, not to break away, to stick with it and to take all the movement. In 1961 Mac Giola had married Mae McLaughlin. Her father Larry had been a member of James Connolly's Citizen Army and her brother Paddy an IRA training officer. She had been sent to America during the border campaign to organize for the Republican prisoner support group in Cumann Cabrock. Active in Cumann Na Mban and, along with Tomas, in the Sean Russell Cumann in North Inner City Dublin, May Mac Giola was seen by younger Republicans as a traditionalist. Whereas after 1962 the IRA was led by a close-knit group based largely in Dublin, Sinn Féin support was drawn mainly from rural Ireland. In the 1961 general election Sinn Féin received a combined first preference vote of only 2,619 in the three Dublin constituencies it contested, coming bottom of the poll in two. In rural constituencies it fared slightly better, contesting 16 seats and gaining 30,517 first preferences. What these voters were supporting, beyond a defiant attachment to militarist nationalism, was ill-defined. Sinn Féin economic policy harked back to the protectionism of Arthur Griffith that had been put into practice by the first de Valera administrations. It included rudimentary concepts of national rendition of capital and profits alongside support for cooperative development. 
but there was little evidence of commitment to practical economic redistribution beyond calls to give the land to the people and support for the Glencomkel cooperative venture of Fr. McDyer. Breaking the Irish punt's link with Sterling was seen as key to separatist economic development. Complete opposition to Irish entry into free trade agreements with the UK and the European Economic Community was the logical extension of this. Irish-Ireland concerns were also to the fore. The Irish census of 1961 found that three-quarters of the population of 2.8 million said they had little knowledge of the Irish language, and only a very small faction of those who had some knowledge used it as their first language. Sinn Féin policy was to restore Irish to the vernacular. In March 1965 the United Irishman's front page had been devoted to outrage over the introduction of the English language into the Catholic Mass rather than Irish. This wish to stand against a turning tide on cultural issues was also evident in the party's total support for the GAA's ban on the playing of foreign games. The United Irishman advertised the anti-Semitic works of Father Dennis Fahey such as Money, Manipulation and the Social Order into late 1965. Sinn Féin's Nation or Province, published in 1963, warned that Masonic influences lay behind the EEC. The party's ruling executive, the Ard Chomherly, continued to be dominated by conservatives. The new strategies being hotly debated by the IRA and the Wolf Tone directories made little impact at its meetings during the first months of Mac Giola's tenure. This lack of debate was due both to the subservient role the party played within the movement and the fact that the IRA men who dominated the party's upper echelons were already well briefed on developments. Sinn Féin did call for action in the wake of the collapse of dilapidated buildings in Dublin's Bolton Street and Fenian Street, which cost four lives, including those of two young girls, in early 1963. A speaker was provided for a protest on the issue in October, and the same month's edition of the United Irishman carried a statement from the Sinn Féin Ard Chomherly calling for government investment in housing stock. In August 1963 the party announced the launch of its Buy Irish campaign which included posturing and pickets of foreign enterprises in addition to opposing attempts by the Industrial Development Authority to encourage foreign companies to invest in Ireland. The campaign's economic impact was negligible in the context of the governmental abandonment of protectionism, but it gave activists a new focus. By the December 1963 Ard Thace the Republican leadership was clear enough on the need to modernize party policy to propose the drawing up of a new economic program in time for the following year's Ard Thace. The movement's struggle to define its political objectives in the early 1960s was mirrored in its slowly changing international perspective. Coverage of international issues in the United Irishmen was eclectic. There was support for the right-wing General Grivas in Cyprus, while articles denouncing Portuguese rule in Africa and Franco's repression of the Basques were accompanied by explanations that they were not the United Irishmen's official viewpoint. In 1964 the Ard Chomherly vetoed a motion calling for support for Nelson Mandela who had recently been jailed by the South African government, and although by December of that year the party had decided to affiliate to the anti-apartheid movement, letters defending apartheid, Portuguese colonialism and Franco's Spain still occasionally appeared in the paper. A series on the Cuban Revolution was accompanied by the caveat that support for Castro was not party policy. Hope was expressed that Cuba could find some way of becoming independent of both the US and Soviet blocs, and the Catholic makeup of the Cuban population was seen as a cause for optimism. During 1964 it started to become clear to the Sinn Féin membership that the radical reappraisal of policy by Golding and his allies would challenge some long-established principles. Some may have been reassured by the economic resistance paper, penned by Johnston, which was distributed to Sinn Féin Kumain for discussion that summer. This paper, which was reprinted in the October issue of the United Irishman, focused on themes long associated with Sinn Féin economics such as the need to break totally from the imperialist economic system once more entangling Ireland through trade agreements with Britain and the EEC. Republican concerns were to the fore in Johnston's call to replace Gombean capitalism with community enterprise in the form of the cooperative movement and credit unions. Sinn Féin contested every northern seat in the Westminster election of October 1964, under the label Republican, as the party was illegal north of the border. The 12 candidates included Tom Mitchell, Billy McMillan and Bobby McKnight, all IRA members. They did not win any seats but took a substantial overall vote of 101,628, largely in rural areas, with Mitchell gaining 22,810 votes in Mid Ulster. McMillan's poll of 3,256 was the highest Republican vote in Belfast, though he came behind the Unionist, Northern Ireland Labour Party, and Republican Labour candidates. Unionists won all 12 constituencies while the NILPs 102,759 votes though derided by Republicans as votes for British Labour, seemed to point to the possibilities in urban areas offered by the adoption of left-wing policies. 
The NILP took 54,482 votes in Belfast compared to 8,985 for the Republicans. At the December 1964 Ard Thace, held in Dublin's Bricklayers Union Hall, a motion from the Newry Cummin calling for the formation of Republican clubs in the North was carried. This, it was hoped, would allow the movement to circumvent the Sinn Féin ban and organize openly in Northern Ireland. Republican clubs were organized in each of the four Belfast constituencies in January 1965 with a directorate chaired by Frank McGlade overseeing their activities. Also passed was a motion from a Wick Low Cummin calling for a national scheme of resistance to foreign takeover of land and industry. In his presidential address, Mac Giola sought to drive home the message that more than the removal of the border was now required by Republicans in their struggle against the British imperial system. We are therefore seeking four freedoms, political, economic, social and cultural. Not any one or two but all four. In this struggle the labor movement was to be a key ally, the Republican movement and the trade union movement must be made to realize their common objective, to restore to the people of Ireland control over all the resources of their country. With the movement undergoing reorganization Sinn Féin did not contest the April 1965 general election in the South, which saw Fianna fail win a majority of just one seat. The Irish Times political correspondent argued that the election had heralded the birth of a new Irish social democracy. His view reflected policy shifts by both major opposition parties. In 1963 the Labour Party had absorbed the small National Progressive Democrat Party, whose two TDs included Noel Brown, and in June 1964 Labour leader Brendan Corish described the party as socialist. Fine Gael was also embracing change. The party's 1965 general election manifesto, towards a just society, included plans for bank credit controls and greater central planning. This was a dramatic turnaround for what had been Ireland's most conservative party, led until that year by James Dillon president of the ancient order of Hibernians and an outspoken anti-communist. In response Fianna Fáil's rhetoric became more noticeably right-wing as it took the lead in attacking Labour as red. The first signal that the summer of 1965 would see a growing rift on the issue of abstentionism was the March issue of the United Irishman. The editor, Dennis Foley, was closely allied with Golding, Garland and Costello, and his editorial condemned abstentionism as being tantamount to fear of real political involvement. Foley argued that it was time for Republicans to re-examine their policies in the light of high emigration, high unemployment and the unavailability of higher education to people of modest means. He asked, did the Irish people have to wait indefinitely for the miracle which the Republicans promise in the free Ireland? Instead of clinging to outdated shibboleths, every avenue should be explored, every shackle cast off, every forum used. The message was rammed home with an ironic cartoon of a ghostly spectre beckoning fearful shin fine TVs into Leinster House one TD saying to the other, no, no, don't go in, you'll be corrupted. Over the next couple of months correspondence condemning the editorial dominated the United Irishman's letters page, with few supporting Foley's anti-abstentionist stance. Sean O'Bradi and others refused to sell the issue in protest. By June's special conference both the pro and anti-abstentionist arguments had been well rehearsed. The IRA, with its majority on the Sinn Féin Ard Chomherly, set an agenda which it hoped would see the party brought in line. One motion included a clause that would allow Republicans to grant de facto recognition to the Irish courts, thereby allowing them to offer a legal defense. The delegates voted against this, and against motions that would have enabled the party executive to allow members to accept a bond of good behavior or fines imposed by the courts, or allow organizers to notify authorities in either jurisdiction about proposed collections or parades. Motions were passed calling for greater cooperation between the IRA and Sinn Féin at local level. A motion that placed infiltration and direction of other organizations as the essential work of the Republican movement was watered down. The amended text called for cooperation with other organizations on limited objectives as preparation for an ultimate confrontation with the British government on the national issue. All the key motions that sought to lay the groundwork for ending abstentionism were defeated. A similar fate befell a clause that sought to bring the executive of the IRA and Sinn Féin into a single body that would control the entire movement. Supporters of abstentionism had won the day against Golding and his supporters. In a conciliatory move Golding had given the duties of chair at the event too. Rory O'Bradi, and this allowed those who were against the new direction to make their voices heard. Jerry McCarthy was to the fore, deriding the entire process as something very old and very dirty. The failure of the conference to even consider a re-examination of abstentionism was too much for Belfast's Sean Coy, a Sinn Féin vice president, who resigned from the party. Some within Sinn Féin were responsive to the IRA leadership's agenda. A disillusioned Myron de Burka had left Sinn Féin during 1962, but the party's support for striking telephonists in late 1965 encouraged her to rejoin. 
she felt, a total sea change, was taking place and was rapidly given an official position in the organization. Proinches de Rosa, enthusiastic and reasonably good at organization, stood out among the mostly older members of the Russell Cummins. Having been interned and jailed twice during the border campaign, de Rosa had become weary of military activity. When in late 1960 he was ordered by Seamus Costello to go on active service in the North, he refused, was dismissed from the IRA and remained in Sinn Féin only at the insistence of Mac Giola. Adjacent to the Ross family's vegetable wholesale business was Stafford Street, where anyone entering faced being, bait, ate and thrown up again, and the poverty he saw made an impact on the young de Rosa. His experiences during the 1957 election in Dublin Northeast, knocking on doors and finding that people didn't know who we were, had illustrated to him how remote Sinn Féin's agenda was to many. After reading an article on the activities of Britain's Citizens Advice Bureau, he approached the party about establishing its own version. The November 1965 issue of the United Irishman carried its first advertisement for the Russell Cooman Citizens Grievance Bureau. In a city where social services largely depended on the Catholic Church or clientelistic politicians, the office was soon inundated with letters requesting assistance, overwhelmingly on the issue of housing. By the October 1965 Ard Thais, Mac Giola was clearly aligning himself with Golding's project for the movement, albeit in his customarily cautious manner. In his presidential address he stated that the choice was not between an unchristian capitalist and individualist system, and an anti-religious, materialist and communist, one. There was a Republican alternative, cooperativism as preached by James Connolly, that is cooperative control of the means of production, distribution and exchange. Quoting Connolly's observation that only the working class were the incorruptible inheritors of the struggle for Irish freedom, Mac Giola presented the left's case without once mentioning socialism. He was also careful to emphasize that Sinn Féin's idea of economic resistance did not include opposition to free enterprise per se and was not linked to foreign communism. Those opposed to Golding's direction were equally intent on pushing their own agenda. In January 1966 a Sinn Féin reorganization plan was announced. This plan was to be overseen by Walter Lynch, Tony Ruane and Sean O'Bradi, three figures who strongly supported the retention of abstentionism. Their aim was to prepare the party for elections with the eventual aim of winning a majority of TDs and establishing a rival Republican Dale. In April 1966 five Republican candidates were fielded in another Westminster general election. The movement claimed that it had decided not to stand candidates in Belfast for fear of adding to growing sectarian tension. In the five constituencies Republicans saw their combined vote decline from 83,534 in 1964 to 62,782. The results were particularly disappointing given that two of the candidates, Charles McLeanan in Armagh and Tom Mitchell in Mid-Ulster, were former MPs. The election resulted in a large Labour majority at Westminster, cementing Harold Wilson's position as Prime Minister. The Unionist monopoly on Northern Ireland seats had meanwhile been broken, with Jerry Fitt of Republican Labour taking West Belfast. Fitt quickly became a spokesman for Catholic grievance at Westminster, a master of the black arts of Belfast electioneering, including use of the graveyard vote. He promoted himself as a working-class socialist in Britain while proving adept at appealing to communal support in Belfast. A notable star turn was his appearance on a platform on the falls with former Glasgow Celtic hero Charlie Tully in a celebration of the club's European Cup win in May 1967. Members of the Republican clubs reported that abstentionism, highly unpopular among the electorate, had cost the party votes. Some felt that politicians like Fit would monopolize support unless challenged by non-abstentionist Republican candidates. By the Ard face of November 1966, held in Moran's Hotel, friction between those supporting the IRA agenda of ending abstentionism and those ranged against was to the fore. In his presidential address, which preceded most of the debate, Mac Giola reprised his role of mediator between factions, a role that he also fulfilled on the Army Council. He asked members to focus on combating the integration with the British economy, which all in the party saw as embodied in the British-Irish Free Trade Agreement of 1965 and which was disastrous to the economy and national culture. He made clear that the question of becoming another free state political party was discussed openly and at length by our organization last year and there was an overwhelming decision against it. But there were motions from Dunnervan, Dunamore and Armagh calling for the end of abstentionism. Dublin's John Mitchell Cummin, based in Ringsend, countered with a motion that any members of Sinn Féin who advocate entry into Leinster House be expelled. Tensions over policy were not confined to abstentionism. A motion from North Kerry attempting to ensure that no member of the Army Council be a member. Of the Ard Chomherly of Sinn Féin most clearly illustrated the fissure between the IRA leadership and much of the Sinn Féin membership. 
With a two-thirds vote needed to change party policy, such divisive motions were unsuccessful. Sean O. Braddy complained about the movement's continuing failure to publish the new social and economic program. As far as he was concerned the document was the party's major contribution to the commemoration of the men of Easter week 1916 feet and was ready to be released shortly to the public. In fact Golding and his allies had already shelved the program, which sought to totally remake the Irish economy on a cooperative model, seeing it as unrealistic. The Ard Chomherly elected at the Ard Thais reflected the growing emphasis placed on developments in the party by the IRA leadership. Mac Giola maintained his position as president with Larry Grogan and Joe Clark, the 76-year-old Dublin bookshop owner and 1916 veteran, elected as vice presidents. Eamon McTomey and Myron de Burka were elected party secretaries. The rest of the Ard Chomherly comprised Niall Fagan, Tony Ruane, Sean O'Bradi, Tom Mitchell, Frank Driver, Frank McGlade, Seamus Costello and for the first time, senior IRA figures Cathal Golding, Sean Mack, Steofen, and Roy Johnston. Of these Golding, Johnston, Costello and DeBurka were strongly identified with the new agenda while Mack, Steofen, O'Bradi and Ruane were traditionalists. The position of the others was less clearly defined. Beyond the disquiet of North Kerry and general support shown by Northern members for ending abstention, distrust of Golding's agenda of change had no clear geographical basis. From late 1966 the IRA decision to exert greater control over Sinn Féin began to change the nature of the party. Key army figures were placed in positions of influence at all levels. A steering committee met weekly to decide on business between Ard Chomherly meetings. This group initially included Ruane, Max Steofen and Sean O'Bradi but was dominated by Costello, Golding, De Burka, Mac Giola, Johnston and others associated with the left. A Republican education department was also established with Johnston for the IRA, Codlin for the Wolf Tone Society and Sean O'Bradi for Sinn Féin. Its program was heavily based on Johnston's ideas of economic resistance. The adoption of the radical agenda was also facilitated by an influx of young members attracted by the commemorations of 1966. The Jubilee year's rehabilitation of Connolly to a central role in the development of Republican politics had also accentuated the left-wing aspect of the movement's history. Many of these new members had a perception of the movement shifting rapidly to the left. This said more about the Dublin-based IRA leadership's aspirations for Sinn Féin than its reality, as Sean Dunn, a working-class teenager from a non-Republican background in Dublin, found out when he joined the party in the summer of 1966. His reading of Connolly and some Soviet history had not prepared him for the reality of the Russell Cummins. There was a woman knitting in the corner, someone talking about the abstentionist policy. I didn't know what the abstentionist policy was, I thought it was to do with drink. I really took it on board, you can't drink, which was grand, it suited me fine, especially when they said we won't enter Leinster House, I thought it was a pub. So I made up my mind not to drink. I didn't find out for about a year what they were actually arguing about. I realized, then, that the politics I was reading about in the United Irishman, which was left-leaning, wasn't in the common I was in, or, in, anyone I met, but that it was coming from the IRA. So I decided to join that. Other Kumain revitalized or newly established by the influx of IRA volunteers and new members were freer of the traditionalist element. When Tony Heffernan, now aged 19, joined the Pierce Cummins in Rathmines during 1968 he found its membership a fairly middle-class group of interesting people. These included Roy Johnston, Seamus Brogan and the Flemish architect and Waffen SS veteran staff Van Velthoven. Younger members included Dubliner Jerry Parker and Nuala Nolan. Nolan joined the movement in 1965, aged 19, and was a FIANA training officer. She married Jim Monaghan, O.C. of the Dublin Active Service Unit, during 1968. Other new branches, such as the Jackie Griffith Cummin, established in 1968 in the Donny Carney, Kulak area of Dublin's north side, were set up and dominated by left-wing IRA members. Lar Malone, of the Griffith Cummin, was emerging as an important figure within the organization. A clerk with the B&I Ferry Company and a union activist, Malone was 20 when he joined the IRA in 1963. As the son of a Garda superintendent he was an unlikely recruit. Andy Smith, a docker from Ringsend, was another activist pushing his local Cummin towards social agitation. The Anne Devlin Cummin in Rathfarnham was even more closely tied to the leadership's agenda, with its meetings held in Golding's home. By 1968, 11 Cummins were operating in Dublin, though the leadership regarded only seven as active. One marker of the shifting political and cultural climate within which the movement found itself evolving was the growing popularity of folk music, in which nationalist and radical sentiments were often fused. Some of this enthusiasm was brought back to Ireland from the clubs of Britain by returning emigrants, including Johnston's wife Myron and Dominic Bean.
an IRA supporter who was close to Golding and Garland and who had worked closely with the British folk revival's most influential figure, Ewan McCall. Behan's song, The Patriot Game, was a scathing critique of the simplistic politics of the 1950s era, and, he claimed, the inspiration for Bob Dylan's, With God on Our Side. The ethos of the folk revival was seen by many in the Republican movement as complementing. The politics of Golding and his supporters, and the United Irishmen strongly promoted the music. Republicans frequented Dublin venues such as O'Donoghue's Pub on Marion Row, Slatteries of Capel Street, the Embankment in Tallaght and Ned Stapleton's Piper's Club in Thomas Street. Fleeds attracted thousands of young people to country towns for weekend-long concerts, Laura Malone and a group of young Ira men often performed at these events. The decade's atmosphere of cultural change was evident, too, in Trinity College Dublin, where the 1916 commemoration had a striking impact. Trinity was described by Hibernia magazine in 1966 as the last bastion of the English establishment and Protestant ascendancy in Ireland. Until 1970 Catholics had to get their bishop's dispensation before enrolling in the college. But by 1966 growing numbers of Catholic middle-class students were entering the university, and enrollment of UK grant-aided working-class students from Northern Ireland and Britain complemented the trend. Among the founders of the Trinity Republican Club, Owen Omer Chu from London and Kevin McCory from West Belfast were both on UK grants. They were joined in an initial core group by Day White, a student from Cavan, and law student Ronnie Lindsay. The endeavor also had a degree of support from Trinity academics, with Mertan O'Cadane and the Reverend Terence McCauley being early patrons. The club's inaugural event was a speech by Professor Theo Moody on Wolf Tone and the Republican Protestant tradition. The Republican Club quickly became one of the college's largest student groups. Due to university rules the club was not officially linked to Sinn Féin, but members sold the United Irishmen, promoted the movement's policies and hosted meetings addressed by IRA leaders. Early members recall a mainly middle-class Catholic membership with a more working-class core. The Republican Club was closely linked to the university's Uncommon Gaelic, an association of students interested in the Irish language and music. Although IRA membership was not a prerequisite of club membership, and many club members were not in the army, Dermot Nolan, who joined in 1967, remembered that people that wanted to get on in the movement felt they should join the IRA. This undercurrent was evident at the funeral of Day White, who died in a car accident in the summer of 1968. And I remember, his hearse was accompanied by a color party of Republican club members who had drilled for the occasion in the university gym. The leading members of the Republican club were strongly committed to Golding's agenda, and in Nolan's view they were also seen as important to its success. The movement saw it as a possible source of intellectuals. Sean Dunn later had the role of liaising between the club and the Dublin IRA leadership. Their independence from Sinn Féin allowed the club's leadership to express freer opinions on major issues, including abstentionism. Initially these were carried in a monthly Republican Club column in the United Irishman, until the club launched its own publication, Republican News, in April 1968. This was edited by Dalton Kelly and Terry Murphy, Omer Chu's brother. Many of the student Republicans used new books, the Communist Bookshop on Pierce Street, as a source of reading material. During 1966 Maoism had arrived in Trinity with the setting up of the Internationalists, a group whose members carried portraits of Mao and brandished copies of his Little Red Book, and the young socialists also established a presence in the college. Their often uneasy interaction with these other left-wing groups gave Republican club members access to arguments not heard elsewhere in the movement. When J.B. O'Hagan called into Omer Chu's Trinity Rooms, after driving the student back from a commemoration in Lurgan, he was surprised to be confronted by posters declaring, Solidarity with, North, Korea. Whereas the Trinity Republican Club was partially funded by the college, Attempts to form similar clubs in University College Dublin and University College Galway met with disapproval from the National University of Ireland. With assistance and advice from members of the Trinity Club a small group of UCD students, among them Dubliners Tony Gregory and Jim Sherry, began campaigning for recognition of their club in 1967. It would take another year before the UCD branch of the Labour Party allowed the club to become affiliated to it and so gain de facto official recognition by the college administration. The UCD club claimed 64 members by November 1968. Dwyer's pub on Marion Row was a mixing pot, for the left and the Connolly youth ran a venue on Pembroke Lane close to Gage's restaurant. This restaurant was run by Scotswoman Margaret Gage, herself a left-wing activist, and was promoted as the place where all the best spies drink their Russian tea. In Gage's and the nearby bars activists could be found, huggermuggering in the back, very cloak and dagger, imagining, we were a threat to the world. Increased Republican activity during and after 1966 was evident in the areas of natural resources, housing and civil rights. 
The National Waters Restoration League had been formally launched during March 1966 at a meeting in Galway, though the initial planning took place in Ira Man, Paddy Kilcullen's back kitchen in Bellina. The campaign had begun as a localized dispute by Galway fishermen, involving protests and illegal fishing, over their right to fish in Galway Bay outside the so-called King's Mile, beyond the mouth of the River Corrib. The legal rights to fish this area were owned by members of the British gentry, whose families had been granted them during the Cromwellian settlement, and similar situations existed on many of Ireland's other rivers. The League was intent on highlighting and if possible reversing this state of affairs. Republicans in Westmeath were also involved in establishing a land league on the 1,100-acre Nocturne estate, owned by the Duke of Mecklenburg, and called for foreign-owned property to be divided among small farmers. A Wolf Tone Society seminar on civil rights, featuring Kader Asmal, a South African exile lecturing in law at Trinity College, was held in Belfast on 28 November 1966. Those in attendance included members of the Communist Party, Northern Ireland Labour Party and Republicans, with most of the city's IRA members ordered to attend. At a second Belfast meeting on 29 January 1967, an organizing committee was elected to establish a new civil rights body. IRA members, once more ordered to attend, were also told whom to vote for, to ensure a Republican and Communist presence on it. The committee included Billy McMillan representing the Republican clubs, Patty Devlin of the NILP, Betty Sinclair of the Communist Party and Fred Heatley of the Wolf Tone Society. It also co-opted a young unionist, Robin Cole. Two members of the British National Council for Civil Liberties attended the event and the new body's constitution was consciously modeled on that of the NCCL, with a broad remit on the promotion of civil rights. Macmillan was one of a three-person subcommittee that drew up a proposed constitution for the new body. The Northern Ireland Civil Rights Association, NICRA, was then formally launched at a conference on 9 April. Macmillan, whose IRA position would have drawn hostile attention very quickly, stood down from the committee that month and was replaced by Kevin Agnew. NICRA's early tactics were confined to lobbying and its first year was relatively quiet, but Republicans pushed from an early stage for the adoption of protest marches as a tactic. The involvement of Republicans gave NICRA a potential activist base, particularly in rural Ulster, that none of the other organizations possessed. Paddy Devlin's involvement was considered significant by Republicans. Devlin had been an IRA volunteer until 1951. Republicans had an uneasy relationship with his party in Belfast and Macmillan blamed the NILP for sabotaging attempts to launch one-man-one-vote committees during 1965. Most NILP members were committed to social reform within the United Kingdom and highly suspicious of Republicans. The party also included a strong evangelical Protestant current, and some in the party saw the issue of civil rights as a Republican conspiracy. However, the party's young socialist group, which included Harry McEwen from West Belfast and Queen's student Michael Farrell, were influenced by more radical views. When Republican Brendan Mackin returned to Belfast from Britain, Macmillan advised him to remain active in the NILP and push for support for NICRA. In early 1967 Northern Ireland Minister for Home Affairs William Craig used the Special Powers Act to declare the Republican clubs an illegal organization. Craig claimed fears of disorder associated with plans to hold commemorations of the 1867 Fenian Rising lay behind the move. The ban did not prevent the clubs from holding an illegal convention in March 1967. Much of NICRA's early activity was centered on campaigning against the Republican club ban. Another response was that students at Queen's University, drawn in the main from the growing number of Catholic students now attending the former Unionist Bastion, established their own Republican club. One such, Mary McMahon from Armagh, thought it would be a good idea to join an organization which Bill Craig banned. In November 1967, 1,000 people joined a protest at Craig's home against the ban. The march passed off peacefully despite a counter-demonstration led by Ian Paisley in Belfast city centre. Another issue that mobilized Republicans at this time was housing. In Derry IRA activists began housing agitation under the banner of Young Republicans. During October 1966 a group of Republicans aided the McDonnell family in Harvey Street in forcibly resisting eviction by council bailiffs. Those involved included Johnny White, then a shop steward at the BSR factory in Cregan, and Finbar O'Doherty, who had been drawn to the Republican movement by its newly radicalized image. Derry, with its Catholic majority but Unionist-dominated council, was a potent symbol of Stormont misrule. It was also a one-industry city, with a mostly female workforce employed in its shirt factories. There was high male unemployment and poor housing. Even though the city displayed blatant manifestations of sectarian discrimination it had little tradition of republicanism beyond a handful of families and core activists. Eamon Malaw had dropped out of Sinn Féin in the city during 1963 because of the lack of republican interest in social problems. 
He became interested again when the United Irishmen began to cover the living conditions in Springtown Camp on the edge of the city. Though Catholic Derry was dominated politically by the Nationalist Party there was also an active NILP branch in the town. Although it was an essentially moderate body it was subjected to periodic denunciation as communist and to openly sectarian attacks from the Nationalists who would claim that, the Protestants, were voting NILP. But radicals Dermy McLennigan and Eamon McCann were a vocal element in the local party. An active party youth wing, eventually the Young Socialists, numerically larger than the local Republicans, became an important source of agitation in the city. White and the other Republicans pushed forward activity on housing and unemployment. Malaw and White set about a survey of the condition of local housing, finding homes there with bugs falling from the ceilings, children with bug bites on their arms and legs. The Dairy Housing Action Committee embarked on a campaign that was to involve squatting and occupation of the city's guildhall. Agitation on unemployment also continued. In the eyes of the younger activists, Sean Keenan and other traditionalist Republicans in the city didn't accept housing and unemployment. As relevant, activities were not confined to the Catholic Bogside and Cregan. White, who had worked alongside B Specials in BSR, had no problem with the movement's aim of influencing Protestant workers, but it was not always possible to put this into practice. The group was approached by a man from the Protestant Fountain Estate who asked them to advise locals on housing issues. After a visit to the area by Republican activists the man's windows were smashed and his family was forced to move. The dairy campaigners received effusive praise in the United Irishmen, which claimed that their housing efforts would eclipse all the similar committees in the country. Housing was also an issue in the South. In February 1967 Tony Mead, who had replaced Dennis Foley as editor of the United Irishman, highlighted a United Nations report that indicated that Ireland had the lowest per capita production of housing in the Western world. Dublin's population had grown from 1961 to 1965 by a greater amount than in any five years since at least 1900. In human terms this meant 6,000 families in the Dublin area alone living in overcrowded conditions, with many others living in condemned buildings. Dramatic cases such as the tenement collapses of 1963 and the Griffith Barracks protests had led to short-lived housing campaigns. The most visible sign of the government and Dublin Corporation's response to the housing shortage was seven 15-story high-rises named after the seven signatories of the 1916 proclamation and built in Ballymun, on the northern edge of the city. The first tenants moved into Ballymun in 1966 and when the scheme was completed in 1969 it housed nearly 20,000 people. The development was separated from areas of non-public housing by a 12-foot concrete wall. Dublin Corporation was meanwhile facing mass protest over the introduction of a differential rent system that would see corporation tenants' rents rise beyond the levels agreed in their contracts. Mead lamented that while the Labour Party was unwilling to begin a campaign, Sinn Féin was too weak to lead the necessary housing revolution. However, the party intended to do just that. In May 1967 the Dublin Housing Action Campaign was launched. Arising from the work of the Citizens Advice Bureau and the IRA's general strategy, the DHAC sought to bring together Republican activists and other radicals in a campaign involving the homeless themselves. All families living in inadequate accommodation were defined by the campaign as homeless. These included people living in severe overcrowding and families forced to live with in laws, paying excessive rent or squatting. At the same time, the operations of the Advice Bureau were to be extended to every area of the capital. Each Sinn Féin Cummin was now to have the responsibility of appointing a member to run an advice office. The operations of this network were overseen by a central office run out of Sinn Féin headquarters in 30 Gardner Place, with Sean Dunn appointed its first chairman. As with the creation of the Advice Bureau, DeRosa was the prime mover in initially establishing the DHAC. Patty Stanley, a returned emigrant living in a caravan in Port Marnock, was elected chairman and Dennis and Mary Dennehy, a couple also living in roadside accommodation became key activists from an early stage. Most DHAC committee positions rotated among Republican activists already involved in the Advice Bureau, most prominently Sean Dunn, Sean O'Chanath, Seamus Radigan and Myron de Burka. From an early stage the Irish Workers' Party and the Irish Communist Organization were also involved, and another important non-Republican ally was Father Michael Sweetman, a Jesuit priest and one of a small number of radicals emerging from the Catholic Church at the time. Sweetman's involvement was seen as a useful deterrent to allegations of communist manipulation. The DHAC highlighted the housing crisis in a campaign that began with pickets on landlords' homes, demonstrations at Dublin City Council meetings demanding, build houses not office blocks, and eventually occupations of vacant property. Initially activists restricted the use of force to halting evictions from premises in which families already lived, but by the first half of 1968 activists were breaking into unused properties to allow families to squat. 
These properties were then physically protected by DHAC activists. As Sean Dunn saw it, the main thing was to get the homeless involved. They did get involved, and, some, joined the movement as well, or joined the IRA. So in all the committees we had a majority. It wasn't organized that way but that's the way it went. The increase in Republican activity in the South encouraged a belief within Sinn Féin that there would be a political payoff in the June 1967 local elections. But despite the new energy in a panel of 110 candidates, Sinn Féin polled badly. There were a few notable successes. Costello and Joe Doyle were elected in Bray, Francie O'Donoghue in Carrickmacross, Patty O'Callaghan in Kalorglan, Redmond O'Sullivan in Killarney, Jim McElwain in Monaghan, Peter Duffy in Dundalk and Joe Sherlock in Mallow. Seamus Rogers held his seat in Glenties, as did a number of other rural Sinn Féin councillors including Norbert Ferguson, who became mayor of Sligo. But the party clearly lacked an urban base. No candidate in Dublin or Cork City had come close to a seat, and Sinn Féin did not even stand in Waterford City. The real story of the election in Dublin was that the Labour Party had replaced Fine Gael as the second party in the city. Labour's rhetoric had been getting consistently more left-wing and its election literature had spoken freely of socialism. Golding and his supporters worried that Labour would benefit from further radicalization while Republicans fretted over abstentionism. Republicans did not contest May's municipal elections in Northern Ireland and a variety of Labour. Candidates were successful in both Catholic and Protestant working-class areas. If Golding's radical agenda was to be successful, members needed to believe in the new strategy. The Republican Education Department's role was to instill such confidence while reassuring the maintenance of Republican principles. By March 1967 conferences had been held in Belfast, Dungannon, Ballina, Cork, New Ross, Wexford, Waterford, Gorey and Dublin. Meanwhile the IRA continued their own education meetings, with experts from outside the movement often giving the lectures. Johnston was aware of the, pretty uneven, progress of movement education. At one IRA meeting addressed by Catter Asmal, a volunteer declared within earshot of the speaker, I see you have coons involved here. Many activists had little formal education and had to struggle to keep up with the new concepts. Desmond Greaves met Macmillan in Belfast during 1967 and found him studying an exercise book in which he had transcribed some of the new ideas. He told Greaves that the IRA would like to cooperate with everybody, including the communists but there was a strong group of old-fashioned Sinn Féin in the way. By early 1968 Macmillan would be among those meeting delegations from the Communist Party in Belfast. In October 1967 an educational manual written by Johnston was distributed throughout the movement. In it he tried to place the movement's leftism within the Irish radical tradition of Tone, Mellows and Connolly while also introducing Republicans to Stalinism and Trotskyism. Johnston argued Republicans could no longer insulate themselves from international politics and theoretical debates. Explanations of terms like progressive, reactionary, and capitalism followed. He argued that the negative tradition of Stalinism had been a major flaw of the communist movement, particularly with reference to its dependence on Moscow. However, the wealth of trade union experience of the Irish communists could not be ignored by Republicans. Johnston hoped that the initiation of dialogue between the Vatican and the USSR had ended the state of Cold War between the two and made it possible for Catholic radicals to find common ground with Marxists. The document outlined a strategy of forming a progressive alliance, which would include pragmatic groups such as members of the Labour Party, nationalists, and social and cultural organizations. Republicans and communists would lead this alliance. Campaigns could be begun on housing, control of resources, rural depopulation, and wages and conditions. There was even an outline of a strategy to aid the survival of small shopkeepers not an orthodox Marxist concern but one very much shared by Sinn Féin, who vocally defended Irish shopkeepers against the threat of foreign supermarkets. Republicans had to recognize that the two major forces of the establishment in Ireland, Fianna Fáil in the south and the Unionists in the north, were disillusioning there. Traditional support base, the bright young men of Fianna Fáil, were seen as intent on bringing Ireland into greater integration with foreign capital all the better to maintain neo-colonial control. Unionism, the most reactionary force in Ireland, was divided and an opportunity existed to undermine it by a campaign for civil liberties. This would concentrate on the discrimination against Catholics in housing and employment and seek to build on the work that had been done by groups like the Campaign for Social Justice. However, no long-term change was possible without the support of Protestant workers, and Johnston argued that they could be won to the campaign by a focus on how local government property qualifications disqualified poor Protestants from voting. The perceived influence of communists within the northern trade unions was seen as key to introducing these ideas to Protestant workers. 
Optimistically Johnston argued that insofar as support for Ian Paisley weakened the Unionist government, Paisley was an ally, and it would be wrong to class Paisley's rank and file supporters as the enemy. Two new political threats to the Republican project were highlighted. One was the Trotskyists, who were essentially anti-national, because they were unconcerned with defending Irish sovereignty from bodies like the EEC. The other was the extreme Republican position that upheld physical force and non-participation in Leinster House as principles rather than tactics. There were possibilities for Republicans to make gains through cultural and language groups and it was important to try to make it fashionable to speak Irish in urban working-class circles. It was also necessary for Republicans to make clear their identification with left-wing struggles in places such as Vietnam or Cuba, partly in order to build for the movement funds of goodwill for the future. The November 1967 Sinn Féin Ard Thais was held in Liberty Hall. The main thrust of Mac Giola's presidential address was the perceived change among the Protestant community. He suggested that they are beginning to think for themselves. Once they open their minds to new ideas no one will be more receptive than them to Republican principles. They were the founders and leaders of the first Republican movement in Ireland, the United Irishmen, the Protestant industrial workers in the North could today capture the leadership of radical Republican thought, if they would only admit they are Irish and have an obligation to their fellow Irishmen. He made clear that the Republican movement was not waiting for events to happen but was becoming a catalyst for change. It is not enough for a man to say he is a socialist, that he is for a workers' republic and against capitalism, revolutionary ideas must be followed by revolutionary action. The Ard Thais left no doubt that the Republican movement had embraced the rhetoric of socialism. Golding moved an amendment to the party's constitution, which declared it in favor of a democratic socialist republic. Costello had attempted to use the election of a new Ard Chomherly to bring about the end of abstentionism. His motion seeking the abandonment of abstentionism as a principle was watered down by a compromise leadership motion seeking to allow the incoming Ard Chomherly to examine the matter over the coming year. Costello had been appointed by the Army Council to oversee the IRA's bloc voting for Ard Chomherly positions. This was done by the distribution of a secret written order to volunteers who were Ard Thais delegates listing who they should vote for. Costello substituted the agreed army list with a list of his own, which was heavily skewed in favor of his supporters and anti-abstentionists. The switch became known to other members of the leadership prior to Costello's list being put into circulation. For his attempt to usurp the army council Costello was court-martial led and suspended from the leadership for a short period. The Ard Chomherly that emerged from the Ard Thais had a majority who were supportive of Golding's direction. Among them were Mick Ryan, his mother Monica, Mitchell, Costello and de Burka. Among those opposed were Mac Tomey, Sean O'Bradi and the two vice presidents Grogan and Clark. Garland was co-opted on to the Ard Chomherly along with two regional IRA officers, Eddie Williams from Cork and Paddy Kilcullen from Mayo, both advocates of the new policies. Not everyone shared the enthusiasm for the emphasis on economic rather than nationalist issues. De Rosa was shocked when Paddy McGlynn confronted him about the housing campaigns and argued that landlords had every right to do as they wished with their own property. McGlynn was far from alone in Sinn Féin in being opposed to the move to the left. During early 1968 Jerry McCarthy savagely attacked Johnston's role at a commemoration in Cork. He compared Johnston to Mrs. Lindsay, a Protestant informer killed by the IRA in Cork during 1921 and urged that he and his supporters be kicked out, lock, stock and barrel. Another dissident remembered lots of clandestine activity going on inside the movement, in opposition to the leadership. Dissension was concentrated most intensely in North Kerry. Sinn Féin there had refused to contest the local elections in June and had even expelled two members who had helped the party's campaign in South Kerry. The three local IRA members who had been dismissed by the Army Council in late 1966 had also remained active in the party. Eventually the Sinn Féin leadership, on the proposal of Sean Mac Steofen, agreed to disband six North Kerry Kumain. A small number of those loyal to Dublin remained active while a large group of former members in the region now operated independently. Despite the internal problems and the disappointment at the local elections Sinn Féin's increasing activity began to pay off during 1968 with new recruits and national attention being drawn to its campaigns. It was aided by tumultuous events around the world. The left gained a new martyr when Che Guevara was killed fighting in the Bolivian jungle in October 1967, Garland writing an obituary in an T-Oblick. Fidel Castro criticized the Soviet Union and China for not devoting all their resources to support for armed struggle in Vietnam and South America and seemed to offer an alternative vision of third world socialism. The January 1968 Tet Offensive by the National Liberation Front inflicted a fatal blow to America's claims to be winning in Vietnam. During March huge anti-war demonstrations took place across Europe and the United States and in London marchers battled police at the U.S. Embassy. 
The assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. in April saw over a hundred of America's cities burn in rage. Later that year mass demonstrations occurred at the Democratic Party convention in Chicago. During May, Protests by students in Paris led to a week of street fighting followed by a general strike by 10 million French workers. The Olympic Games in Mexico were marked by black power protests by American athletes and a massacre of student protesters by Mexican troops. The Czech communists' experiment in socialism with a human face was ended by Soviet tanks in August. Student riots took place in Germany and Italy. The question of social transformation in the West was no longer abstract. Young Republicans like Tony Heffernan were caught up in the mood. There was a real sense that we were on the verge of a sort of very profound change all over the world. With the arrogance and confidence that only 18-year-olds can have, we were sure we were on the verge of revolution. In the United Irishman Alan Matthews described the events in France and Germany as an inspiration to Irish students. During 1967 the United Irishman had begun to take a more upfront line on the Vietnam War, having previously cautiously called for negotiations. Sinn Féin called on Irish emigrants not to become tools of the imperialists after four Irishmen had died in combat in early 1967, three in the British Army in Aden and one in Vietnam. Apartheid was also on the agenda. Trinity Republicans held meetings addressed by Thabo Mbeki of the African National Congress, and the United Irishmen interviewed ANC leader Oliver Tombo on a visit to Dublin that summer. Ideologically the Republican movement weathered the Soviet invasion of Czechoslovakia well, while the Irish communists suffered internal upheaval. Sinn Féin issued a statement condemning the invasion, arguing that socialism can only flourish under conditions of national independence. Some Republican students joined marches protesting at the Soviet action. Among the leadership opinion was mixed. Desmond Greaves, who strongly supported the invasion, recorded that Johnston was not persuaded that the Russians might have a case in Czechoslovakia. Golding was increasingly close to Mikko Reardon, who had supported the Moscow line on the crisis. In fact, a secret mechanism for contact between Golding and his allies on the Army Council and the Irish Communist leadership had already been established. There was some criticism of the United Irishmen's international coverage, particularly from American Republicans. Jerry Boyle in San Francisco complained that the articles were doing grave harm to the movement in the U.S., which was green, not red. Some Republicans were also less than enthusiastic about what they saw as the permissive nature of the new left. One reviewer in the United Irishman criticized both American black power advocates and comedian Lenny Bruce as degenerate. Many of the newer recruits to the movement would not have agreed. They brought a different cultural ethos as well as new ideas. Some new members thought there was nothing incompatible between being in Sinn Féin and listening to rock music and following soccer. Jer O'Leary, a 22-year-old who joined the movement during 1967, was a supporter of both Drumcondra and Glasgow Celtic. He delighted in reminding GAA devotees that the Dublin Iris commander in 1921, Oscar Trainer, had been a soccer player. Younger Republicans dressed differently, with both men and women wearing combat jackets, and often seemed irreverent to their older peers. One woman felt that some veteran female members were mad resentful of young flirtatious women, in makeup and miniskirts, some of whom procured the illegal contraceptive pill from a premises in Mountjoy Square. Sinn Féin's activities were given a major boost by the appointment of a new editor of the United Irishman in November 1967. Seamus O'Tuothale was a young teacher at Belvedere College, a cycling enthusiast and a former chairman of Misneach, an Irish-language activist group. He was not a member of Sinn Féin or the IRA and his appointment gave the paper an editorial independence it did not have under Foley or Mead. This coincided with the decision by the leadership to place a new emphasis on the United Irishman as the basis of the beginning of the rebuilding of the organization, O'Tuothale found the paper in a precarious situation, with circulation down to around 14,000 a month and in massive debt to its printer. Controversies over the paper's editorial line had damaged its distribution in many areas and apart from a handful of shops it was dependent upon pub rounds and a pitch outside the GPO in Dublin for most of its sales. With O2 Othale at a remove from the internal debates of the movement, and with an eye on greater sales, he turned the United Irishman into a campaigning paper, he made policy. He gave greater coverage to the activities of the Dublin Housing Action Campaign, and his articles in the Poacher's Guide to Ireland's Waterways series rejuvenated the campaign to nationalise fishing rights. A regular column, Who Owns Ireland, outlined the men behind the major banks, companies and multinationals. O2 Othale highlighted the fact that members of the British aristocracy were still being paid ground rent for property in Ireland. Jim Fitzpatrick, a young artist who had designed an iconic poster of Che Guevara during 1968, also produced several images for the United Irishman. Paper sales reinforced a sense of equality of membership, with everyone from the Sinn Féin president down helping out. 
Often after he finished editing an issue O2 Othale would be found selling it outside the GPO. It was claimed that sales had increased to 24,000 a month during 1968. By January 1968, when the DHAC picketed the home of the Minister for Local Government Kevin Boland, and participated in the Battle of Sarah Place, in Inchicore, the organization had gained considerable notoriety by its actions and innovative publicity. In Inchicore, activists were aiding residents who had barricaded themselves inside their cottages rather than be relocated to Ballymun. Council bailiffs and 30 Guardi attempted to break the barricades and evict the families. As word spread, more activists arrived. Mick Ryan, driving out of Dublin on IRA business, happened to be passing the area and became involved. By the end of the incident 24 people, including Dunn, DeRosa, Jim Monahan, Lar Malone and Mick O'Reardon had been arrested. Only 23 would be charged as Ryan made good his escape from the back of a Garda van as it was entering the Bridewell. At Easter the DHAC commandeered a number of four-story Georgian houses on Mount Street that were due to be developed into office blocks by their London-based owners. The starry plow and tricolor flags were flown from the buildings and homeless families moved in. Private security firms hired by landlords to repossess properties were confronted by IRA members negotiating for squatters, like the Godfather, with an offer they can't refuse. The DHAC were denounced in the Dale as Reds and fellow travelers. Its chairman, DeRosa, was equally confrontational in an Irish Times interview in June. We don't set out to be respectable public figures. We want to force attention on the problem and force action on it. Ours is only a short-term solution. But I'd like to emphasize one thing. Our gripe is not with officials or the councillors or Dublin Corporation. Our battle is against conditions, against the system. DeRosa recalled that DHAC Secretary Ochenath was a first-class organizer, in particular with the media. I would have the idea to get the thing going, I would get him on board and the thing would take off. The demonstration at the home of Kevin Boland in January 1968 was part of a strategy of targeting Fianna Fail and noting the links between property developers and TACA, the party's corporate fundraising body, or Paola Racket, as the United Irishman described it. Boland hit back, denouncing the DHAC as the creation of an illegal organization. Sean O'Chanath's response was that he considered the British Army, RUC and B-Specials to be the only illegal organizations in Ireland. Emulating Dublin and Derry, Republicans established housing action committees elsewhere. Costello threw his energies into organizing the Bray Tenants Association. There was increasing activity in rural Ulster, with Liam O'Comain involved in housing protests in Lamavity and liaising with Francie Donnelly about the setting up of Republican clubs in Co. Derry. In Belfast Republicans fought for rehousing for 160 families living in prefabricated bungalows in Beachmount, and campaigned on the need for pedestrian crossings and better street lighting in Turf Lodge. Agitation continued against the new Divas Flats complex, drawing condemnation from local curate Father Padraig Murphy, who supported the development because it kept parishioners in the Falls area. Reorganization of the IRA in the southeast had seen an older militarist leadership replaced by supporters of Golding. Now Sean Walsh in South Kilkenny and Mick Dunphy and Sean Kelly in Waterford were among those who brought new activity to the area. Waterford was a factory town, with a large industrial working class population and a strong trade union base. Kelly had been drawn into politics when trying to unionize his first workplace. During 1967 the city's activists established an advice bureau in a rented office on the Keys. The setting up of a flat dwellers association, housing action committee and local civil rights branch quickly followed. An activist recalled, We were the ministers for hopeless cases as well as people that got things done. After a short period of time people became aware if you wanted something done, be it officially or unofficially or dodgy or otherwise, you went to 115 the key. Costello had been upsetting the local status quo as a councillor in Bray. On several occasions he brought housing protesters into the council chamber and demanded that their problems be heard. When Wicklow's Labour TD died in January 1968, Costello was eager to contest the by-election. The leadership's suspicion of their younger colleague saw Mick Ryan appointed director of elections even though he and Costello did not get on. On election day a donkey adorned with a placard stating, Don't be like me. I voted Fianna fail last time, was paraded by Sinn Féin outside polling stations. Costello 2009 won votes, coming forth. Publicly Republicans argued this was significant, especially in an area with little Republican tradition, but there were tensions behind the scenes. Costello complained that Sinn Féin had let Wicklow down very badly, in terms of support and finance. But he also claimed that, during the course of the by-election we found that the greatest single objection to voting Sinn Féin was the existence of the abstentionist policy. One consequence of the increasing activity of Republicans and the left was anxiety about extremism. 
An Evening Herald front page after Sarah Place warned that red cells existed in Dublin and were active in the DHAC. It was claimed housing agitation was the product of a well-known organized movement under the direction of a man who is alleged to have been trained by extreme elements in Britain and sent over here to exploit housing and other problems. The person in question was a Dublin man with exceptional ability as an organizer and was under constant surveillance. The article ended with a doorstep interview with Roy Johnston, in which Johnston dismissed Garda activity, saying, let them investigate away, it is their business not mine. In May 1968 the Deputy Lord Mayor of Dublin Laurie Corcoran asserted to a union conference that there were 3,000 communists, infiltrating, all walks of Dublin life. The same month a demonstration by the internationalists in Trinity against the visit of the Belgian king led to more media denunciation of student radicals. While the college Republicans were highly critical of the Maoists, they helped lead a large protest march to the headquarters of the Evening Herald and Irish Independent. North of the border, Unionists were also playing the red card. William Craig told the Northern Parliament that civil rights agitation was the result of communist and Republican conspiracy. Unionist hardliner Major Ronald Bunting claimed that, if anyone wanted a communistic, godless, Bolshevik, atheistic city then the opening of playgrounds on Sundays was the right way to start. Although most of the mainstream newspapers in Ireland were conservative, and several were closely linked to mainstream political parties, not all media coverage of Republicans was hostile. Under the editorship of Douglas Gageby the Irish Times was generally a benevolent environment for left-wing employees. Dick Walsh from Co. Clare had reported on working conditions and strikes while living in London and after returning to Ireland became a staff journalist with the Irish Times in 1968. Walsh became friendly with Golding and other Republican leaders. The Irish Times political correspondent Michael McInerney was a former communist who was sympathetic to the Republican left. Also working at the paper was Mary Marr, a young Irish American who edited the Women First column during 1968. Marr had covered the Bowdenstown commemoration of 1966 and became closely associated with Republicans, marrying De Gerardy, who had recently left the Labour Party to join Sinn Féin in early 1969. Roy Johnston wrote a series of articles on science for the paper during 1967. Current affairs magazines such as Hibernia and Newsite also gave space to the political and social ferment. The impact of left-wing republicanism was becoming evident at RTE. Producer and activist Owen Harris produced and directed a documentary called The Testimony of James Connolly during 1968. Some of Arte's current affairs output also caused government unease. In May 1968 the religious affairs program Outlook, presented by Father Austin Flannery, had discussed the housing crisis with a panel including Mick O'Reardon and two members of Sinn Féin. Fianna. Fail was enraged, with Kevin Boland calling the program, grossly distorted, and Charles Hahi dismissing Flannery as a, gullible priest. Concerns within RTE about the left-wing tone of some of its programs led the station's director general to introduce strict restrictions on political involvement by station employees. The civil rights movement in Northern Ireland started to heat up during 1968. The Northern Ireland Civil Rights Association's new executive included Republicans Rebecca McGlade, Kevin Agnew and Frank Campbell, and RUC Intelligence recorded that 30 of the 70 people present at the AGM in February were known Republicans or IRA. During April, 400 Republicans attended a banned commemoration in Armagh, which ended with several arrests. NICRA condemned the arrests and the ban. In a climate of growing militancy, and conscious of the example of civil rights marches in America, the NICRA leadership sought to expand its campaign. By this stage the sole unionist on the NICRA executive had resigned in protest at the description of Northern Ireland as a fascist state. During 1968 the Brantree Republican Club helped organize an eight-month occupation of a vacant council house in Caledon near Dungannon. The squad drew headlines when local MP Austin Curry became involved and the squatting family was forcibly evicted in front of the TV cameras. The publicity garnered by the Dungannon events was a huge boost to a more militant civil rights strategy, which Republicans were urging. In Derry housing action protesters disrupted the opening of the new Craghaven Bridge. In early August, Curry, Labour councillor Jack Hassard and Republican club leaders Brian Quinn and Tom O'Connor presented a major survey into discrimination in Dungannon to the Irish News. Momentum began to build from there with increasing calls for the adoption of civil disobedience as a tactic. Curry approached Fred Heatley about involving NICRA in a protest march from Coal Island to Dungannon. Republicans were enthusiastic about the idea. Communist Betty Sinclair was much less so, and only after extended discussions was it agreed to fix the 24th of August as the date for the march. Sinclair was convinced the march would be seen simply as a nationalist demonstration, no matter how NICRA presented it. Loyalists announced they would hold a counter-demonstration in the center of Dungannon and the RUC attempted to reroute the NICRA march, 
but the organizers refused on the basis that their march was not sectarian. An internal Republican document explained that civil rights was of overriding importance in the struggle to educate and organize the people for the achievement of a republic. Tactics adopted could include marches, meetings, sit-ins, sit-downs, and boycotts. If marches were stopped then protesters were to sit down, occupy roads, be carried off physically, no resistance, and in this way expose the violence of the police. Another tactic could be the occupations of central squares at peak hours with press tipped off. It was important to ensure the maximum participation of women and children. The document argued that the success of such techniques in USA, India, Czechoslovakia, showed the power of an organized and disciplined people. It was also important not to display party banners or tricolors and judge carefully the effect on Protestant public opinion and opinion abroad. A disciplined movement with a wide basis of support would be able to undermine the popular basis of unionist rule. In fact, the IRA had been informed of how fragile support for civil rights was within the unions and of emerging hostility to the agitation from Protestant workers by the Belfast communists in early 1968. But on the 24th of August members of the IRA acted as stewards for the 2000 marchers in Dungannon with the bulk of the northern membership, including Macmillan and McKnight, present, though southern volunteers were ordered not to attend. Old habits died hard. As the march approached Dungan and McGurran ordered IRA volunteers to break ranks, you are on a protest, not a route march. While the RUC later credited the IRA's stewards with a high degree of discipline, the Republican strategy was a risky one. Stewards had orders to prevent trouble but also to encourage nonviolent confrontation, prevent the crowd getting near the police, but make them think they want to fight the police, let them get angry. However, the more you stop them the more they wanted to attack. The marchers halted in front of the RUC cordon separating them from the center of Dungannon and 1,500 loyalist demonstrators. Hassard addressed the crowd, telling them many Protestants like himself supported civil rights. Other speakers included Sinclair, Curry and Fitt. Despite Nicra's intentions the support given to the march by organizations such as the Hibernians and the presence of nationalist marching bands gave the event a distinctly communal flavor, as did Fitt's description of the RUC as black bastards. Despite some minor stone throwing the day ended peacefully, Macmillan felt that the march had been a disappointing anti-climax. Others agreed, with Golding finding that some Republicans objected to the attitude of the civil rights marchers in Dungannon when confronted by the police. They said the police cordon should have been broken. This was also the view of groups like the Young Socialists. Despite these tensions, the importance of the civil rights tactic was brought home to young Republicans like Sean Curry after listening to discussions between McCann. Dornan and others on the bus back to Belfast. In the aftermath of the Coal Island March a number of dairy activists, including Malaw, McCann and Bridget Bond, discussed the possibility of a march in their city. The fluid nature of dairy radicalism meant that the proposed march was organized by a coalition of Republicans, young socialists and housing activists, not NICRA, which did not have a branch in the city. NICRA agreed to the proposal and a date for the march was fixed for the 5th of October. Golding told Ulster television viewers on the 27th of September that the IRA was actively supporting the civil rights movement and civil disobedience, though he denied they controlled NICRA. Their ultimate aim remained a united socialist republic. Unionist MP John Brooke countered that this proved that the IRA had become completely perverted by communism. The route chosen by the dairy marchers, from the waterside to the city, and their determination to break any police ban made trouble inevitable. When loyalists promised to counter-march both demonstrations were banned and nationalists like John Hume withdrew support from the protest. Republicans then decided to up the ante. At an IRA meeting in South Derry it was agreed that in the event of the RUC blocking the marchers' path they were to push any politicians or dignitaries present into the police lines. This would ensure that the first people to receive a busted head from a peeler's baton would be newsworthy. Again a contingent of the Belfast IRA traveled to Derry where about 400 people took part in the march, which was confronted by the RUC in Duke Street. An evocative image from TV footage of the march is of Eddie McAdeer, the Derry Nationalist Party MP, Jerry Fitt and other notables marching under a civil rights banner being carried by Johnny White and another Republican. TV viewers saw Fitt and others batoned as the RUC ran amok. Water cannon drenched marchers including Anthony Coughlin and those who had come from Dublin. Two of the first arrests were of Fred Heatley and Belfast IRA man Martin Meehan. News of the events spread to the bogside where major rioting broke out that lasted well into the night. Across Ireland people in living rooms and pubs were transfixed by the television pictures from Derry. Over the next week demonstrations took place in London and Birmingham, and in Dublin a Republican march to the British Embassy ended in clashes, with petrol bombs thrown at the building. 
Macmillan would later argue that the Dairy March had done more for the minority in the six counties than IRA physical force campaigns had been able to do in 50 years. Republicans had helped unleash a new movement and now pushed for the setting up of local civil rights groups and marches in other areas. But the civil rights strategy was undoubtedly also producing polarization. In O2 Othale's view, no one could control it after the 5th of October. Protests continued in Derry, with a demonstration of 2,000 in late October, a sit-down of 3,000 in early November and a march of 15,000 later that month. On that demonstration Johnny White and three other activists symbolically breached RUC lines on Craghaven Bridge, while marchers virtually took control of the city center. But every civil rights event faced loyalist counter-protests and working-class Protestant opinion seemed to be hardening. In Derry loyalists, had attacked Catholic shirt factory workers after the third demonstration and there were increasing clashes between Catholic teenagers and youths from the fountain. Despite Republican efforts the image of the movement was quickly monopolized in public by a range of non-Republican personalities from Curry, Hume and the Labour Party's Ivan Cooper to Jerry Fitt and Eddie McAdeer. The Derry Citizens Action Committee was founded at a meeting on 9 October. White and Finbar O'Doherty were members of the DCAC but were outnumbered by supporters of Hume and local moderates. Liam O'Comain was critical of McCann for refusing to sit on the new body, thus making it easier for Hume and his supporters to gain control. Mass Catholic support for civil rights inevitably gave it the appearance of a nationalist revolt. On 30 November 5000 joined a Nicra march in Armagh, with Dennis Casson as chief steward and Republicans again in the front ranks. Despite the march being legal the RUC allowed hundreds of Ian Paisley's supporters, many openly armed with clubs and sticks, to occupy the town centre. The police then halted the march. Clashes were avoided but locals confronted police and loyalists in the aftermath of the demonstration. Armagh youngster John Nixon was enthused by the fact that the local, great and the good, including priests and his schoolteachers, were taking part in the marches. As well as marking the emergence of a newer generation of nationalist politicians the October events gave a boost to the far left. In Belfast 2000 students had marched in protest at the dairy events. At Queen's a meeting led to the setting up of people's democracy, influenced by the French student radicalism of that year, civil rights and a variety of socialist and anarchist ideas. At its core were Michael Farrell and his young socialist comrades, who felt that Nicra was not militant enough. A 21-year-old student from Tyrone, Bernadette Devlin, emerged as one of the most forceful of PD's public speakers. While most eyes were turned north during October, Fianna Fáil suffered a political humiliation in the South. The government had called a referendum in order to abolish the proportional representation voting system and replace it with a first-past-the-post ballot. This was seen as a purely political maneuver that might lead to indefinite Fianna fail government. Fine Gael, Labour and the trade unions all called for a no vote. Sinn Féin also joined the campaign, though it expressed, some embarrassment, that it was on the same side as Fine Gael. Fianna Fáil's arguments became hysterical, with one TD claiming that only communists wanted to retain PR. This was disproven when the electorate voted by 3 to 1 to maintain PR. Many felt that the arrogance of the younger ministers and their association with the Fianna Fail fundraising body Taka had backfired on the party. Meanwhile the government was preparing its own response to the growing street protests. A new criminal justice bill sought to give Gardi much greater powers in prohibiting demonstrations and arresting those deemed to be or have been engaging in conduct likely to lead to a breach of the peace. Republicans saw the bill as being aimed at their initiative, and the leadership decided that the fight against it could be the basis for extending the civil rights issue to the South. Sinn Féin held its ard face in December. Noting events in the North and the defeat of the PR referendum, Mac Giola referred to October as a truly historic month that will have a significant effect on the future course of both parts of the country. Aware that support within the party was still less than the two-thirds required to change the abstentionist policy, the IRA leadership had decided on a new approach to the old problem. Before debate on motions calling for the end of abstention could begin, Garland proposed an amendment that would set up a commission of persons representing both branches of the movement to examine how the new political situation may be turned to the advantage of the movement. This so-called Garland Commission would advise on changes at the following year's Ard Thais. Costello, in a speech seconding the amendment, rubbished abstentionism to the chagrin of not only those seeking to maintain the policy but also his leadership allies who hoped to avoid overt conflict. The amendment passed. A less contentious suggestion came from Tipperary, that in future the Easter Lily be supplied with adhesive backing. In early December the Northern Premier Terence O'Neill, under huge pressure from both unionist hardliners and the civil rights movement, had outlined a reform package and asked for a chance to put it into practice. Within NICRA there were conflicting views on how to respond. 
It was agreed to suspend marches for a period but PD disagreed and argued for stepping up the pressure with a march from Belfast to Derry modeled on Martin Luther King's 1965 march from Selma to Montgomery. Some NICRA members, such as Kevin McCory, argued very strongly with student Republicans in Belfast that the march would end in disaster. But many were unconvinced and there was considerable rank and file Republican enthusiasm for the idea. NICRA called on its supporters to provide support for the marchers. Mac Giola had confidently predicted that after October Republicans were witnessing the beginning of the disintegration of Unionist rule in the North and Fianna fail power in the South. All were sure that after 1968 Ireland would never be the same again. 4. 1969. Backlash, in different parts of the country units of the IRA, and Sinn Féin, are uneasy about the new left-wing policy of their leadership and about the violent methods that are being adopted in the destruction of private property. Their uneasiness needs to be brought to the surface in some way with a consequent fragmentation of the organization. It is suggested by the Department of Justice that the government should promote an active political campaign in that regard. Department of Justice Memorandum, the 18th of March 1969 The year 1969 began dramatically. The People's Democracy March from Belfast to Derry was underway, encountering opposition in several towns before being ambushed at Burntollet Bridge on 4 January. Loyalists led by Major Bunting, including off-duty B-specials, attacked the marchers, injuring dozens. This news sparked off major rioting in the bogside and barricades went up along with a newly painted slogan, You are now entering Free Derry. Meanwhile, housing activists were squatting with a family of five in Derry's Guildhall. A few days later in Dublin 1,000 people attended a meeting in the Mansion House to protest against the criminal justice bill. Speakers warned against giving Fianna fail the same powers as those of the Unionist government in the North. The following weekend 10,000 joined a civil rights march in Newry and rioting followed that saw seven RUC vehicles destroyed. In Dublin protesters blocked traffic outside the GPO to highlight the case of Dennis Denny, jailed and on hunger strike for squatting with his family. A message from the Guildhall occupiers was read out proclaiming that, the struggle is the same, north and south. Running battles on O'Connell Bridge Gardy and protesters followed another 2,000-strong Dublin Housing Action Committee march on Saturday the 18th of January. In Cork housing demonstrators disrupted a Fianna fail dinner at which Tasha Jack Lynch was the guest, and there were nine arrests when the Cork hack took over City Hall the following week. In Dublin veteran Joe Clark was escorted from a government ceremony to commemorate the 50th anniversary of the first Dale after he interrupted a speech by President de Valera, raising the Dennehy case. Outside, 3,000 took part in another day of housing protests, meanwhile the Labour Party conference pledged itself for socialism and against coalition. While the DHAC protested outside Fianna Fail's Ard Face, inside there was considerable dissatisfaction expressed about Taka and the criminal justice bill, which several speakers compared unfavorably to repressive legislation in the North. The month ended with more than 70 protesters still squatting in Derry's Guildhall. Republicans were centrally involved in this agitation. The housing committees in Dublin, Derry and Cork were largely Republican-led. Sinn Féin was pushing for the campaign against the criminal justice bill to be the focus for civil rights agitation in the South. Following the rioting in Derry Republicans were to the fore in the organization of vigilante patrols in the Bogside. Republicans provided food and shelter to the Belfast Derry marchers as they made their way across Co. Derry. In Magara the marchers were billeted overnight in the Brackriley Hall, while IRA members, armed with shotguns, stood guard. The United Irishmen suggested that, whatever else the march has done it has shown up the corruption and violence at the heart of society in the six counties. Anger over the brutality at Berntalid certainly influenced the militancy of the crowd in Newry. That march was called by People's Democracy but supported by NICRA, with local Republican Dan Moore as the chief steward. Most of the Belfast IRA were present, again to act as stewards, but on this occasion once the RUC tried to reroute the march, Republicans reacted, leading the rioting. Joe McCann, seen steering one of the RUC vehicles into Newry's canal, was among 24 arrested. The Derry and Newry events signaled that Catholic protest had developed a momentum of its own. IRA activity continued in tandem with street politics. When Dublin security men hired by a Mountjoy Square landlord arrived to evict squatters, they found a group of men armed with hurleys waiting for them and thought better of the eviction. Landlords considered, particularly vicious, were also being, made to pay a price. 1. A garage owner had several of his cars burnt out. During March 1969 another landlord had his car firebombed outside his home on the Hoth Road. In that case things almost went badly wrong. While one man poured petrol over the car, one of his comrades threw a firebomb without warning, which narrowly missed him, hit another car and bounced back onto its original target, eventually setting it on fire. 
In early March the IRA burnt a German-owned farmhouse at Ferrand's Lock, Co. Meath, as part of their opposition to what they called the Checkbook Conquest. Shortly afterwards the IRA in Cork firebombed a minibus that was being used to take Republican prisoners to trial in Limerick. An IRA man was badly injured during the operation and received extensive burns. The special branch believed that, landless men, in Meath and Galway were supplied with Molotov cocktails by the IRA for use against, large landowners. In June the IRA destroyed property on the Manon estate in Ardrahan, Co. Galway. They demanded that the estate be, acquired by the Land Commission and divided up among the 13 neighboring smallholders. They also threatened that if a landlord in Otterard evicted an elderly tenant he would be held, personally responsible. Property belonging to the Two Meal Fisheries Company on Loch Need was burnt during a dispute. On the 11th of June, when questions were to be asked in the Bundestag about the Ferrand's Loch burning, four farms in Meath and Louth were attacked and considerable damage caused. Three of the farms were German-owned while an ex-British officer owned the fourth, a 600-acre estate. In early July shots were exchanged between a German farmer and a group of raiders attempting to burn his mansion at Middleton, Co. Cork. Later that month the IRA blew up farm buildings on a 900-acre estate belonging to an English farmer near Trim. Meanwhile, one IRA member was pressing for an operation to raise funds. In 1967 Joseph Brady, an ex-British soldier, had been recruited into the movement and had become a training officer for the Dublin Brigade. During early 1969 Brady raised the idea of stealing the Book of Kells from Trinity College and holding it for ransom, but he found no support. On the 24th of March he broke into the college himself and, unable to gain access to the Book of Kells, stole the Brian Boru harp instead. A few weeks later he contacted the college and demanded £20,000. In April he was arrested while trying to collect the ransom and the harp was recovered from a sandpit in Blessington, Co. Wicklow. Within the IRA there was suspicion that Brady was a provocateur. Later in the year he was picked up at gunpoint but managed to escape, though not before being shot twice, as a result one of the IRA men was arrested and jailed. It transpired that Brady had been giving information to the Garda Special Branch since 1967. Seamus Costello led a campaign to keep British Bay Beach in Wicklow free and open to the public. Regular pickets and protests led to clashes with private security men and arrests. Eventually an agreement was secured to allow public access and was celebrated by a Sinn Féin victory barbecue on the beach. There were over a dozen fish inns organized by the National Waters Restoration League during the first half of the year. Crowds gathered to watch and support illegal fishing, with salmon cooked and distributed on the spot. One such event was attended by 1,500 people on the Boyne in late June on a river owned by Major D. H. Coddington, whose farm had been attacked by the IRA shortly before. Eyes were turned towards the north again during the spring. The February storm-owned elections saw both unionist and nationalist politics fracture. Prime Minister Terence O'Neill lost support to hardline loyalists, while John Hume took Eddie McAteer's seat in Derry and People's Democracy candidates gained 25,000 votes. Republicans did not contest the elections, and some rued this as a missed opportunity. Easter saw large crowds attend commemorations across Ireland, particularly in the north. The 5,000 who turned out in Derry's, biggest ever, parade saw the IRA defy a ban on carrying the tricolor. In Belfast Sean Garland was the main speaker, with Macmillan reading the IRA's statement and Jerry Adams' the 1916 proclamation. Garland emphasized continuing support for civil rights, which had exposed the undemocratic and bigoted nature of unionism and shattered its monopoly on power. But the civil rights movement was fragmenting as it struggled to deal with the mass following that had developed since October 1968. There were dozens of local civil rights groups, many of them virtually autonomous. During the spring several marches were jointly organized by NICRA and PD, and stewarded by Republicans. Privately the Republican movement wanted to establish a civil rights committee, under our control, that would, set the tone or give the lead. Publicly Republicans argued that NICRA should avoid being used by aspiring nationalist politicians like John Hume. And should instead fuse people's democracies, anti-sectarian policies with the unity of the established campaign. Republican delegates refused to vote for the relatively moderate Betty Sinclair as chair of NICRA and supported instead a PD call for a march through Belfast. But there was also an awareness that sectarian tension was growing and it was reiterated that Britain was the main enemy, not the unionists. This argument was complicated by the fact that the movement was resisting efforts to raise specifically socialist demands and insisting Catholic unity be maintained. During February the RUC inspector general had claimed in the Belfast Telegraph that the IRA was fomenting civil disorder in the North for the civil rights campaign, in line with their 1966 strategy document. Golding denied this, 
claiming that Republicans have not organized the civil rights movement and we have not infiltrated it. Mac Giola, however, admitted that most of the stewarding at civil rights demonstrations had been done by IRA volunteers. Loyalists were convinced that civil rights agitation was a front for the regeneration of IRA activity. Golding's statement to the Irish Times in early February that if the civil rights movement fails there will be no answer other than the answer we have always preached, all constitutional methods will go overboard, would hardly have been reassuring. A major debate was taking place within the Republican movement about how to respond to a Westminster by-election in Mid-Ulster, caused by the death of the local Unionist MP. There was enormous pressure on Republicans to field a candidate and, if successful, allow that person to take the seat. Tom Mitchell had won the seat in the 1950s and had taken 27,000 votes as recently as 1966. But he declined to go forward and Kevin Agnew, a Sinn Féin Ard Chomherly member and well-known solicitor, was suggested as an alternative. During December 1968 Agnew had argued to the party Ard Chomherly that if the abstentionist route was taken then there would be no Republican movement in Mid-Ulster in a month's time. Mac Giola suggested that a non-Republican candidate representative of all non-unionist opinion might be a better option, and Labour's up-and-coming Connor Cruz O'Brien was suggested as such a unity candidate. Garland considered that a NICRA personality such as Fred Heatley or Frank Gogarty, who would be amenable to Republicans and under no obligation to abstain, should be considered. Meanwhile Austin Curry had contacted Republicans to see if they would back him. Garland felt that any nationalist candidate and Curry in particular should not be allowed an open run but there was some support for Curry among Republicans in Tyrone. Bernadette Devlin was mooted as a possible alternative and Malachi McGurran and Costello met her to sound her out. By the time Devlin entered the race the local Republicans were hostile, claiming that she accepted partition and was a West. British advocate of dubious socialism. But pressure was applied from Dublin to allow Devlin a clear run and Agnew was persuaded to withdraw. Johnston and Max Steofen successfully convinced the Ard Chomherly not to back Devlin publicly, though Costello dissented. In the event Devlin 33,648 won votes and the 22-year-old became the youngest MP ever elected to Westminster and an international personality overnight. Privately Republicans rude that abstentionism had again prevented what might have been a landmark victory, feeling that had Agnew stood, he would have won. Devlin's election coincided with what the Irish News called the most devastating wave of violence and civil strife since the 1930s. There was intense rioting in Derry on 20 April during which over 200 people were hurt. Police badly beat a number of local people, one of whom, Samuel Devaney, was critically injured. In response Nicra called for solidarity demonstrations across Northern Ireland, in what he called an effort to draw off the large force of police who were laying siege to the bogside, Billy McMillan authorized IRA units to firebomb 10 post offices and a bus station across Belfast. The unclaimed attacks were carried out over a two-hour period and caused considerable chaos. The following day 2,000 people took part in a Republican-led march on the Falls Road. Hastings Street RUC station was stoned and senior RUC officer Frank Lagan was attacked and beaten by protesters. The IRA's actions coincided with loyalist bomb attacks on the Silent Valley Reservoir the same night, which many wrongly attributed to the IRA. On BBC Radio Cathal Golding warned that, if our people in the six counties are oppressed and beaten up, then the IRA will have no alternative but to take military action against the police force. We have no alternative but to protect our people or allow them to be slaughtered and we are not going to allow them to be slaughtered. Golding's rhetoric implied that the IRA were ready to intervene militarily, but arms were in short supply. Macmillan later claimed that the IRA in Belfast had just 24 weapons in early 1969, most of which were pistols. For their part British intelligence estimated that the IRA had 500 members in Northern Ireland in the spring of 1969. They considered that while the morale of the Republican movement was, good, arms and ammunition were, in short supply, and financially the IRA was, weak. The events provided Clan Na Aran with a new focus. In Birmingham the county's association with the support of the Connolly Association had set up a campaign for justice in Northern Ireland but Republicans felt that neither the county's association nor the campaign for justice were doing the business, and so a more radical Birmingham ad hoc civil rights group was set up by Klan and local Trotskyist groups. A major focus was the disruption of the Northern Ireland Tourist Board's Ulster Week. Mass pickets were placed on Rackham's, Birmingham's most exclusive department store, where an Ulster exhibition was taking place. Stink bombs were let off inside the store, causing its evacuation, and IRA members placed an elaborate fake bomb inside an exhibit of a traditional Ulster cottage, labeling the device, Ulster Slum Clearance. There were major strides forward for Klan after the appointment of 27-year-old Jerry Doherty as national organizer. Civil rights also created interest in Irish America, 
A key figure was Brian Heron, a grandson of James Connolly. Heron had been an organizer for the United Farm Workers in California during the long and bitter struggle led by Cesar Chavez to gain rights for migrant grape pickers. In 1968 he helped found Citizens for Irish Justice in San Francisco, which inspired similar groups elsewhere. Musicians Tommy Makem and the Clancy Brothers agreed to fund an organizing trip by Heron to see if these groups could be coordinated. The result was the formation of the National Association for Irish Justice, which gained recognition as NICRA's U.S. support group during 1969. Back in Ireland, and despite increasingly frantic activity, the Garland Commission had overseen discussion at over 20 regional activist meetings. The result was a document entitled Ireland Today. Drafted by Johnston it stressed that British imperialism dominated Ireland, North and South. Ireland was changing, however, with the North, shaken to the core, by the civil rights movement, resulting in the old unionist power structure fragmenting. The achievement of civil rights demands would open the way, for linking of economic demands to the national question. The traditional institutions of the Catholic community, particularly the Nationalist Party, were also in crisis. Gombean nationalism was on its way out. In the long run civil rights could pave the way to a 32-county republic. In the South, despite the moribund bureaucracy of the trade union leadership, there was a new radical mood, expressed through support for the Labour Party and by social agitation. The Republican movement had an opportunity to significantly influence events as it not only represented the great mainstream of the national and social revolutionary tradition, but also had the physical defense experience that would be necessary to resist counter-revolutionary attack. Agitation on housing and trade union activity had to be kept up, and organized to involve all existing radical political groups as well as trade unionists and homeless people. The Republicans were to become the driving force for National Liberation Front, the same title used by the Vietnamese revolutionaries. This new body would include Republicans, labor supporters, cultural activists and communists and embody the radical alliance envisaged in the movement's education program of 1967. Emphasis was also placed on the movement's need to intervene seriously in electoral politics. It was stressed that failure to take Dale seats would allow Labour to reap the benefits of social agitation. Ireland today examined the historical objections to electoral participation and concluded that safeguards could be built into the process to ensure that corruption did not set in, commenting that the elements which were missing in the 20s and 40s have now been developed sufficiently to enable the movement, if it had TDs, to instruct them specifically on all key issues. Refusal to face up to electoral participation could mean that the negative tradition of glorious failures would continue to be the lot of Irish Republicans. The reports of the various regional meetings added several points to the original document, such as the need to tackle the special position of the Catholic Church in the South because of the negative effect this had on Northern Protestant attitudes. Rural members also wanted to know how the concept of a National Liberation Front, NLF, would apply outside of Dublin, Cork and Belfast where other left-wing groups simply did not exist. The danger that too great an emphasis on Dublin might alienate rural Republicans was noted. However, a positive sign was that no significant support for a reversion to the strategy of the 50s had been reported. This reflected the fact that many of those opposed to the left had effectively dropped out of the movement. But the general feeling from most who attended the discussions was that the authority of the Republic should remain with the Army Council for the foreseeable future. During the summer of 1969 Golding and Mac Giola held several discussions with Bernadette Devlin, and it was agreed to stage a special conference to discuss the North at which she and Eamon McCann would be invited speakers. Republicans believe that if the NLF emerged as a convincing force then radical youth will be attracted to it and the apparent need for left-wing splinter groups to assert young radicalism against the alleged conservatism of more experienced revolutionaries will cease to exist so sharply. The communists were to be a key part of the NLF and Republicans were particularly interested in communist trade union work. Private discussions between IRA leaders and Mick O'Reardon continued regularly. Some groups were beyond the pale of the proposed NLF. The Irish Communist Organization, which had adherents in Dublin and Belfast, was dismissive of Sinn Féin's leftism. DHAC activist Dennis Dennehy was one of its members. In Cork Jim Lane and his comrades launched a paper called Sore Eyre, People's Voice, during 1968, taking a broadly Maoist perspective. They wrote to Sinn Féin inquiring about membership of the NLF, but received no reply. The Dublin-based armed splinter group that had formed in 1966 was still active. It consisted of several elements, some of whom had become attracted to Trotskyist politics, another element was attracted by armed crime and the possibility of personal enrichment that this offered. Dublin criminal Christy Dunn was involved in procuring arms for the group. In Newry during early March the group took £12,000 in a bank raid during which shots were fired at the RUC. 
In the South neither the banks nor the Guardi were equipped to deal with determined armed groups. The ability to obtain several thousand pounds at a time bred a certain, outlaw, lifestyle and, as one of the group's leaders recalled, a lot of people, were, there for the adrenaline. The pressures of living on the run and needing ready cash stimulated demands for more action. Many of the group still socialized on Dublin's, Strip, and plans for dramatic guerrilla actions were discussed as the drinks flowed. The IRA, strapped for cash, had noted the Splinter Group's successes. Any serious future electoral intervention would require major funding. The Wicklow by-election of March 1968 had cost £933, and the borrowed £150 election deposit was still unpaid in 1969. It was also unlikely that serious arms supplies could be procured without finance. Golding's fundraising trip to the U.S. in late 1968 had yielded just £865. Golding, Garland and Ryan had been looking at Dublin Airport, where large sums in wages were delivered by Securica. Rather than spend time discussing the morality of armed robbery with the rest of the Army Council they went ahead and organized a raid. On the 14th of May Golding picked up one of the Dublin Active Service Unit outside Quinn's pub in Drumcondra. They drove to Ballymun, where the unit was briefed on the operation. The men were armed but ordered to avoid shooting if possible. At 9.15 a.m., as the Securica van arrived, five IRA men, dressed in business suits, were in place. When the security man entered the administration building one raider held the door open for him while two others coshed him and threw ammonia in his face. The IRA men took two boxes containing £24,600 from the guard and made off in stolen cars. When one of the cars crashed its occupants hijacked a van and made their getaway. At first the Guardi were reported to be baffled by the complexity and ingenuity of the robbery, which they believed involved up to five resprayed and renumbered stolen cars. The raiders buried the money and weapons in a field at Garris Town on the Dublin Mead border. However, the man who had rented the land for them did not know that it was Conacre, which could not be ploughed. A local farmer noticed that it had been dug up and complained. As the Guardi began searching the field the raiders were sitting in Dublin biting our nails as they got closer and closer. The Guardi found 18,000 pounds, two revolvers and a shotgun. When asked to comment by the press, Golding denied any knowledge of who was responsible but mentioned the Splinter Group in passing. Two young men, Roland Giles and Jimmy McCabe, were arrested and charged with the robbery. Although not a participant, Garland was convinced he had been identified and went on the run, removing himself from public activity. Attempts to procure new weapons also led to a raid by IRA volunteers on the Stirling Engineering Works in Dagenham, England. The raiders were unsuccessful, and Cork volunteers Connor Lynch and Pat O'Sullivan, both of whom had previously been active in housing campaigns, were captured. The raid had not been sanctioned by the IRA leadership and two other volunteers involved were dismissed from the organization on their return to Ireland. The Sinn Féin leadership was also discussing the internal politics of RTE. The movement took a dubious view of the station, arguing that its function is to brainwash and manipulate the people in the interests of a small group of politicians, businessmen and bishops who are the local managers for foreign capital. According to the United Irishman a progressive exception was producer Owen Harris, a fly in the rather watery soup which is RTE. During May there had been mass meetings of staff at the station to discuss the resignations of three producers, who complained that they were being restricted in their investigative journalism. The United Irishman argued that management could only be fought by conscious and open activity among large sections of staff, undercover conspiracies get nowhere and alienate potential and essential support. In June a general election took place in the Republic. Costello was strongly in favor of contesting the Wicklow seat. He argued that should it be won, then an extraordinary Shin Fine Art face could be held to discuss the question of abstentionism. Costello warned that failure to contest the seat had grievously affected local morale. The Clare organization also suggested fielding a candidate. But, to Costello's great frustration, Sinn Féin did not contest the general election, in which Fianna Fáil won a comfortable majority. In July the United Irishman headline was, Backlash, a reference to the tactics adopted by the government during the election. Earlier that year the paper had noted the international revival of the right with the electoral victory of Richard Nixon in the US, the emergence of Enoch Powell in Britain and the resurgence of Gaullism in France. Internationally this backlash was often accompanied by populist denunciations of the left as elitist, deviant or foreign. This language of right-wing populism was already firmly entrenched in Irish politics by 1969. When the Dale debated the criminal justice bill some TDs angrily dismissed claims of Garda brutality and blamed the demonstrators themselves. If people did not want to cut head they should not be there. Galway Corporation suggested withdrawing grants from students who took part in street protests. 
there were recurring scare stories about Maoist recruitment in schools. This rhetoric reached a crescendo during the general election campaign. Fianna Fáil speakers accused the Labour Party, which was expected to make gains, of wanting to force communism on the Irish people. Charles Hahi claimed that Labour favoured extreme socialism and a materialistic concept of life. Neil Blaney denounced the pseudo-intellectual Marxists, Maoists, Trotskyites and the like who have emerged, like carrion birds to pick the flesh of the Irish people. Minister for Justice Michael Moran attacked the new left-wing political queers from Trinity College and RTE. Prior to the election Moran had asked Peter Barry of the Department of Justice to supply him with information on the left and on the Republican movement to be used during the campaign. Interestingly, given the developing crisis there, Northern Ireland was barely mentioned during the campaign. Much of the Republican movement's agitation had been explicitly targeting not just Fianna Fáil but the Taka Boys, the real power in the party, who are making fortunes out of the big business that the sale of land has become in recent years. The ultimate Taka Boy was its founding patron, Hahi. In May 1968 the United Irishman told its readers that Hahi was always a great man with the money-making. Ask anyone around Rahini and they'll tell you who made a packet out of the foreknowledge that the green belt was eventually to be built on, and who that knowledge was passed on to. Matt Gallagher was singled out as among the property developers who were closely linked to Taka, and in January 1969 the United Irishman raised the issue of property dealings between Hahi and Gallagher. A housing action publication argued that, the foundations of Irish society, the 1916 proclamation and the first Dale program, are sound. The Fianna failed top stories are crumbling the woodworm of graft and the termites of speculation have eaten into their fabric. The relationship between Republicans and Fianna Fáil became bitter. In February Sinn Féin and the Connolly Youth had picketed a Fianna Fáil meeting in Sligo. Members of the party emerged and attacked the pickets, beating several. Declan Bree was dragged along the ground towards the Garavogue River while several men shouted, Drown the bastard. Protesters alleged that the Guardi had stood by and watched. In response the IRA stated that it would defend the right to protest and would not hesitate to take direct action against any individual or group of individuals who would attack these Irish men and women. During a general election rally at Dublin's GPO, Government Minister Kevin Boland exchanged blows with Sinn Féin protesters. From the platform he then blasted them as communists and psychedelic Maoists. There were a number of clashes with uniformed security guards hired to protect Fianna Fáil's GPO rally as well as evict squatters and prevent pickets at Britta's Bay. The Republican relationship with the Guardi, especially the Castle Rats, of the Special Branch, always hostile, became more confrontational as they embraced street politics. The United Irishmen nominated individual Guardi for Brood of the Year awards after clashes, with their photographs and numbers published regularly in the paper. During 1969 a Special Branch notebook was acquired by the IRA. It contained the names of over 200 activists, including De Gerardi, De Rosa, MacGiola, Sherlock and De Burka. The descriptions caused some amusement and annoyance. One IRA man, a real dub, was described as red-faced and country-looking, while a female volunteer was called plump, prompting the repost. I nearly starved myself for two weeks. Republican activity was also discussed at cabinet level. During March the Minister for Justice had circulated his colleagues with a report on the IRA. Written by Peter Barry, it outlined the situation since 1962, when the IRA had been at a low ebb, militarily and financially. In these circumstances the leaders became very receptive to suggestions from left-wing sources for a change in policy. By 1965 a strong liaison had been established with a number of intellectuals with marked communist histories and these men were given positions of authority in the organization which facilitated them in indoctrinating the rank and file with the conviction that any occasions of social unrest could be exploited to establish the IRA as a dynamic political force on whom workers and small farmers could alone depend for improved social conditions. Coincidental with this indoctrination, the IRA leadership saw that it would be necessary, in order to establish and stimulate the interest of young or new members, to hold meetings and parades of a military character and instructions in the use of arms. By 1967 the leadership were gauging public reaction by statements issued to the public press and on public platforms in which they were openly advocating the establishment of a workers' republic, and an eventual resort to arms for that purpose. The report noted that since May 1968 the IRA had carried out a number of serious crimes, involving arson or the use of explosives, and that the Guardi estimated that the organization had perhaps 1,200 members. Of particular concern was the fact that IRA statements justifying their actions were carried without comment in the press. Most newspapers no longer used the official designation, the legal organization, to describe the IRA, and a new and disturbing feature in recent times is the way in which the press in Ireland and the television service in particular, 
lend themselves to publicizing IRA and communist spokesmen to whom they have given a new and false public image. The report contended that public opinion was being influenced to a disproportionate degree by a small number of left-wingers in key positions in the media. In July a further memorandum noted the commando-style robbery at Dublin Airport and IRA influence in housing action, fish-ins and land campaigns. The Guardi had prevented several attempted bank raids but the IRA was very short of money and was likely to try again. The Guardi were aware that there was unease within the IRA at its leftward direction and Barry urged that this be exploited. So that the result would be, as in the Republican Congress movement, a split in the IRA organization and the communist element would become discredited. Also in July the bodies of Peter Barnes and James McCormick, executed in England during 1940 for their part in an IRA bombing campaign, were released for return to Ireland. The coffins were met at Dublin Airport by Mac Giola and several veterans of the 1940s, along with an IRA color party. A thousand people marched behind the coffins along Dublin's quays while another color party in battle dress led the cortege. On a sunny Sunday up to 10,000 people attended the reinterment outside Mullingar. A minute's silence was held for two Free Wales Army members killed in a premature explosion intended to target the investiture of Prince Charles, followed by a recitation of five decades of the rosary. Then three men in black polo necks and berets fired volleys from revolvers over the coffins. There were large numbers present from across Ireland who had dropped out or left the IRA and Sinn Féin. Jimmy Steele, of Belfast, gave a speech in which he launched what Golding called a vicious attack on the movement's turn to the left. He denounced the adoption of foreign ideologies. One is now expected to be more conversant with the thoughts of Chairman Mao than those of our dead patriots and poured scorn on politicians and constitutionalists. The venom shocked many of those present. The atmosphere was thick with tension and Mick Ryan could feel the ground moving from underneath the leadership. There had been inklings that something was afoot. Ryan had received reports from Ned Dempsey in Carlo that veterans Liam Burke and Miles Shevlin had been circulating in the area asking people what they thought of the leadership's policies. As Bobby McKnight circulated among local intelligence officers he heard again and again that communists had taken over at HQ and that while Golding himself was not a communist, he had been taken in by them. Golding, however, was reluctant to accept these reports and especially reluctant to accept that Max Steofen was spreading these rumors. Ryan had met Max Steofen at his house in Meath during July and they had sat outside in the sun discussing abstentionism and other issues. Max Steofen professed to have admiration for Ryan and Garland but stated that he would never accept people taking seats in Leinster House or the NLF concept. When Ryan disagreed Max Steofen said, I'm disappointed in you, Mick, and a lot of other people will be as well. While the vitriol in Steele's speech was a shock and a sign that many people were unhappy with the movement's direction, he had said nothing about the situation in his home city of Belfast, where sectarian tension was rising during July. A particular flashpoint was in Ardoin, a local priest Father Marcellus Gillespie attesting that during July, Catholics were as much to blame as Protestants for the clashes. The Belfast Housing Action Committee began trying to find accommodation for families displaced by intimidation. Rioting in Dungiven, Co. Derry where an orange hall was burnt down, saw a man die after an RUC baton charge, and dairyman Samuel Devaney also succumbed to the injuries he sustained in April. IRA members were placed on defensive duty in Ardoin and at Unity Flats during July. The RUC noted the presence of Belfast IRA officers Frank McGlade and Jim Sullivan in these areas. Billy McMillan later claimed that he resisted pressure to release weapons because, we realized that the meager armaments at our disposal were hopelessly inadequate to meet the requirements of the situation and that the use of firearms by us would only serve to justify the use of greater force against the people by the forces of the establishment and increase the danger of sectarian pogroms. Confidence in the progress of the civil rights struggle in the North also underwent severe tests during July. Tempers were raised by William Craig's statement that civil rights protesters were the scum of Irish politics. After rioting in Derry during mid-July, Johnny White helped set up the Derry Citizens Defense Association, DCDA, with veteran Sean Keenan as chairman and White as secretary, to organize preparations for the 12th of August Apprentice Boys Parade. In early August there was serious rioting on the Shankill Road between Loyalists and the RUC. There were then more clashes at Unity Flats that developed into the worst rioting in Belfast since 1935. Nikra claimed that the police were allowing mobs to gather in loyalist areas while dispersing Catholic crowds with force. Nightly clashes, rumors of evictions and threats of more violence pervaded the city. Macmillan and Malachy McGurran raised the likelihood of more trouble at IRA staff meetings from early summer. Rory O. Braddy has claimed that Golding told the Army Council that it is not our job to be Catholic defenders and that the IRA would put it up to the official forces, the British Army and the RUC, to defend the people.
This contrasts strongly with Golding's public rhetoric during 1969 as well as the accounts of other leadership figures. His later explanation for not sending extra weapons to Belfast was that the IRA leadership was unsure whether and where violence was going to break out. We felt that if we, previous to the 12th of July, had sent them into Belfast, into Derry, into Newry, there might not be any real fighting, and the weapons might be lost to the police or unavailable if trouble broke out elsewhere. The leadership believed that the best way for people to engage the police and be specials was the way that things developed in the bog side, in other words through mass protests and street fighting. Golding admitted that, as it transpired, the only defense was armed defense. Barricades had already gone up in the bog side before the Apprentice Boys Parade and the DCDA had overseen the stockpiling of materials. In case of attack, an estimated 43,000 milk bottles were unreturned from the area during early August. The IRA had decided not to use arms unless the RUC fired live ammunition first. The Defense Committee made little effort to stop bogside youths from stoning the Apprentice Boys on the 12th of August. They in turn responded and Derry went up, the Battle of the Bogside had begun. Petrol bombs rained down from the Rossville Flats and kept the police confined to the outskirts of the Bogside, from where they fired 1,147 canisters of CS gas. Radio Free Derry was broadcast from a transmitter in Eamon Malaw's home in the Cregan. Republicans and members of the Young Socialists were involved in the organization of defense but the majority of the rioters were the local young. As the violence escalated Jack Lynch broadcast a message to the nation on RTE warning that the government could no longer stand by if violence continued. This had the effect of heightening anticipation on both sides. The B specials were eventually ordered into Derry to back up the police, provoking a flood of refugees and the injured into Donegal as fear of an all-out attack increased. But before the specials could be moved in, the British army had arrived on the streets. On 13 August Macmillan ordered Republicans in Belfast to organize demonstrations to get people on the streets and take the pressure off Derry. Joe McCann and Anthony Dornan led a march of 1,000 people to Hastings Street RUC station. Republicans believed that police were due to leave there to go to Derry, and the idea was to keep them occupied for as long as possible. The crowd stoned the station and at one stage tried to smash in its door with a makeshift battering ram. Nails were put into pieces of cardboard to disable police vehicles and whitewash and paint stockpiled to throw on their windscreens. IRA members were also present with arms. When the RUC attempted to disperse the crowds by driving armored cars into Leeson Street, the IRA opened fire, wounding a policeman. Macmillan authorized members of the FIANA to attack Springfield Road RUC station with petrol bombs. The RUC opened fire on the young Republicans, wounding two. Large crowds on the Shankle looked on but did not join the fighting which on the 13th of August in West Belfast was between nationalists and the RUC, not nationalists and loyalists. However, in Ardoin, where again nationalists had attacked police to divert resources from Derry, the combustible sectarian atmosphere had seen Protestant crowds burn down a Catholic-owned pub and bedding shop. On the 14th of August Macmillan and his adjutant Jim Sullivan ordered all IRA members onto defensive duties, sending small groups to various areas. One participant recalls about 30 IRA men and 12 women along with 40 Fianna boys and 15 to 20 girls being active on the falls, and that their arsenal consisted of one Thompson submachine gun, one Sten submachine gun, one rifle and six handguns. A wee factory, for making petrol bombs, was set up in a house in Leeson Street. The IRA began to hijack buses for use as street barricades. Clashes developed along the streets that led to the Shankle and by evening serious rioting was taking place. As loyalist mobs encroached into Catholic areas, the IRA exchanged fire with the police in Conway and Devis streets. The RUC forced Catholics back towards Devis Street and mobs of Protestants, among them Shankle MP Johnny McQuaid, followed, setting fire to houses as they progressed. As the loyalists approached from Dover Street, four young IRA men in the grounds of St. Comgall's school opened fire, killing Herbert Roy, a 26-year-old from the Shankle, and wounding several RUC men. The RUC then sent Shoreland armored cars, equipped with Browning heavy machine guns, into Devis Street. They were pelted with petrol bombs and opened fire with tracer ammunition, raking Devis flats and killing nine-year-old Patrick Rooney in his home. RUC gunfire from Hastings Street killed another Catholic, Hugh McCabe, an off-duty British soldier. Loyalists sniped from on top of mills and rooftops into the falls, wounding several people. These specials were deployed across Belfast backing up the RUC. Police gunfire killed three more Catholics during the night in North and West Belfast. The RUC and B specials seemed to have believed that the IRA were heavily armed and proceeded very slowly. IRA members in turn tried to preserve ammunition by limiting their firing to single shots or short bursts. One man recalls that the idea was to 
just fire a few rounds up each street to drive them back, but then they came back and that's when I was shot, that was B-men, they came out of the van and opened up on us from the side. Unarmed IRA men ran along with others to take up their guns if they were wounded. Those involved stank with sweat and their throats were parched with smoke. This must be what wars are like, thought one. The noise of the rival crowds was deafening, like a football match. Rumors spread that the Irish army had crossed the border and taken Newry. In Falls Park, through the haze of smoke, men with insignia on their caps were seen approaching. Free state army officers, shouted someone and people began to cheer. It turned out to be the Order of Malta. At 5 a.m. on the morning of Friday the 15th of August, a group of IRA men, their faces black, lay exhausted on the ground in Osman Street, where they each got a bottle of water to slake their thirst. Palls of smoke rose over West Belfast. Their adrenaline and exhaustion produced fits of laughter. An old woman approached them, disgusted, and warned, ye're laughing now but wait until they come in and shoot ye in her beds. She remembered the 1920s, they did not. Despite the folk memory of the pogroms then, the terror, panic and fear of the 14th to the 15th of August was completely new to most people. Early that morning the IRA weapons were dumped in Slate Street. There were just two socks of ammunition left and, they weren't full. Macmillan, McGurran and Frank Card had been arrested in Kane Street and charged with possession of handguns and illegal documents. In total, 21 Republicans across Northern Ireland were held under the Special Powers Act. British troops were now on the streets. Protestants attacked Bombay Street in large numbers and drove Catholics back, burning houses. A small number of IRA men were present at Clonard Monastery but were unable to prevent the attack. Gerald Macaulay, a 15-year-old Fianna member, was fatally wounded by gunfire, the first Republican killed in action since the 1950s. The Bombay Street burning highlighted the vulnerability of Catholics at a time when the fighting was thought to have ended and British troops had arrived. In Belfast seven people were dead five Catholic and two Protestant, while over 400 were treated for injuries, 108 of them for gunshot wounds. Over 1,800 families had been forced from their homes 1,500 Catholic and 300 Protestant. About 150 houses had been destroyed. The IRA had suffered one dead and several wounded but on the falls, at least, the feeling was that they had stopped them. Jerry Adams felt that the IRA's actions had been crucially important in halting the loyalists at decisive times. With Macmillan in jail, Jim Sullivan, who had played a prominent part in the fighting, took over as O.C. while McKnight was sent south to get more weapons. Elsewhere there had been fighting after civil rights rallies in Coal Island, Newry and Dungannon. In Armagh B. Specials killed a local man. In Newry Republicans used stolen lorries to close off the town's main streets. Crowds attacked the police during two nights of rioting, while the post office was firebombed. When B. Special reinforcements arrived the local IRA withdrew across the border, burning down a customs post as they fled, but a premature explosion saw several injured with 19-year-old Coleman Rountree suffering bad burns. In Dungannon armed IRA members had been on the streets following shooting by the B-specials but locals convinced them that opening fire would make the situation worse. Among the IRA leadership in Dublin there was confusion. Golding and Ryan had been taking part in a TV program about the IRA being filmed in the Dublin mountains. Coming back into Dublin, Golding and Ryan stopped off to meet some supporters. Only then were they made aware of what was unfolding in Belfast, and they rushed to Republican HQ at Gardiner Place. With the acting quartermaster general unavailable, Golding, shocked by the turn of events, immediately appointed Ryan to the position and ordered him to begin organizing weapons and men. Word was sent to available Dublin brigade members to assemble in Billy Wright's boxing gym underneath his barbershop on Parkgate Street. In the gym Ryan read out a statement to the 27 men who had turned up and then called out a list of names for active service. Those present were anxious that their names be called out, you weren't worried about getting shot. Or being put in jail, the only thing you were worried about was would you do the right thing and not let the side down. But the weapons produced did not inspire confidence. They included a Winchester rifle that reminded someone of the type used by John Wayne in Rio Bravo. Eventually four units were moved up to the border, with volunteers from Cork and Kerry placed in Donegal while the Dubliners were sent to Monaghan and Leitrim. Some of them were billeted overnight in Councillor Seamus McElwain's house in Monaghan. McElwain's young son was roused to give two Dubliners his bed. They were told that Sean South and Fiergal O'Hanlon had shared the same bed before the Brookborough raid, information that produced decidedly mixed feelings in the men. Command HQ was established in Ballinamore, where another Dublin man was taken to a drainage tunnel by John Joe McGurl, who had been active in the IRA since the 1930s. Two rifles and a Thompson were taken out of the hide and given to the volunteer with the suggestion that, you lads have more use for this than me. The Dublin man admits feeling, so inadequate, we hadn't a fucking clue. 
The unit's orders were to carry out attacks to stretch the RUC and B specials and take the heat off Belfast. On Sunday, the 17th of August, a unit attacked Cross Maglin RUC station using a stolen van packed with explosives that failed to ignite. Shots were exchanged with the RUC before the men escaped back across the border. With British troops on the streets of Belfast and the situation calming down, it was soon decided that more offensive action would make things worse. At the Castle Hotel in Dublin, the IRA leadership agreed not to undertake offensive activities along the border. The presence and perceived influence at this meeting of Republicans who were not IRA volunteers caused some resentment at the time. The units stayed in place for another few weeks. People were well aware that they were there, with one unit regularly sending into a local village for chips. In Ballinamore some of the men drank in McGurl's pub while in battle dress. By September they were finally ordered back, Tony Heffernan remembers being, relieved, to go back home. On the 18th of August Golding issued a statement on behalf of the IRA, acting in its capacity as provisional government of the Republic. He claimed that the organization had, been in action, in Derry and Belfast and that it had sent, fully equipped units to the north. Noting the IRA's support for the civil rights movement, Golding stated that they had been, reluctantly compelled into military action, by the onslaught of the, Orange murder gangs. In Derry the IRA had put themselves at the disposal of the Defense Committee and in Belfast had used their all too limited resources to hold off the assault on the falls. Golding warned British troops that if they allowed themselves to be used to suppress the legitimate demands of the people, then they would have to take the consequences. He then called on the Dublin government to immediately use the Irish army to defend the persecuted people of the six counties. Irish military intelligence noted that, as in Bogside, IRA now seem to be in control of barricade defense in Belfast. Reports indicate that such defense is on an organized, disciplined basis with elements of southern IRA taking an active part. Sinn Féin had decided that, if there was trouble in Derry, they would organize an open-air public meeting in Dublin and demand that the full resources of the state be used in defense of the Irish people in the six counties. On 13 August 4,000 people marched on the British Embassy, and over the following days there were several thousand people in O'Connell Street each night demanding that they be armed. At the GPO Sinn Féin speakers called for a general strike and a boycott of British goods. MP Paddy Devlin, on his way to meet government officials in Dublin, told protesters that the only way we can defend ourselves is with guns, we need them. Mac Giola challenged the Free State Army to use their weapons to defend the people in the north and that if they would not, then they should give them to us. He called on the crowd to come to Collins Barracks and demand the arms. 3,000 people marched down the keys to the barracks chanting, give us guns and several were injured in scuffles outside its gates. Fergus Whalen recalls, the whole of Dublin was a buzz, people marching here and there demanding guns. Mac Giola was outside Collins Barracks demanding guns, Bernadette Devlin was on the news urging all the young people of Ireland to come north to defend the Catholics. I was at a demo I think, in Collins Barracks, they said there would be buses at Parnell Square to bring people up to the north to fight. There was hundreds of people got on to the buses. I realized after the buses pulled out half of them were pissed. By the time they reached Dundalk, most people had sobered up and started walking home. Whalen and his colleagues slept in sheds and got the Belfast train the next morning. They made their way to the falls after some mishaps and Whalen was dispatched to Turf Lodge for barricade duty. 18-year-old Paddy Woodworth had also set off with a friend to go north. We didn't know where we were going, Derry or Belfast, we just thought when we arrived the struggle would be there. We didn't get lifts further than Dunlear slept under a bridge there, we got cold and very wet and said fuck this and hitched back to Dublin. That was my northern campaign. In fact the IRA had hoped to use the buses to divert attention from their own units moving north at the same time. Sinn Féin organized solidarity demonstrations across the south. In Westport Sean O'Chanath called for people to hand over arms, no matter how obsolete. In Sligo a Sinn Féin speaker called for, young men to come and fight, we will direct them where to go. Kerry County Council called on the government to remove the ban on the IRA as a gesture of goodwill. Refugees were coming south and being housed in Gormanstown, Co. Meath. The IRA had explicitly asked the Free State government to intervene in the North and its propaganda was heavily centered on saving our people. The United Irishmen argued that Ulster must be coerced if that is the only way to get civil rights and basic democracy for the Catholic and non unionist population. On BBC television an IRA spokesman insisted that if it had not been for his organization, the people in the Davis Street area would have been massacred. Golding told our days seven days that his organization had the right to kill these specials and Paisleyites if they attacked nationalist areas. Politically, Republicans argued that the call for the abolition of Stormont made by the Labour Party and some civil rights leaders was a mistake. 
Direct rule from London would only increase British control over Ireland. Less Westminster rule is required, not more. Instead, a democratic Irish structure at Stormont could be utilized to bring about an all-Ireland settlement. The United Irishmen warned that the movement should not lose its identity, and that activity on ground rents, public ownership of resources and the anti-EEC campaign should be kept up. In practice this was very difficult. The upsurge in nationalist feeling created opportunities for Sinn Féin but also caused problems. Membership was growing as application forms were given out at many of the demonstrations, but activity was disorganized and the United Irishman was not being properly utilized. Sinn Féin bemoaned the lack of a competent spokesman for TV or radio while Costello pushed for Sinn Féin to open its offices full-time, appoint new organizers and publish a weekly bulletin to keep the membership up to date on campaigns. But in Connacht, local agitations were more or less abandoned after the August crisis, and in Dublin rumors were current among the Labour left that Sinn Féin had brokered a secret deal with Fianna failed to abandon the housing campaign. Sean Dunn agrees that in practice that is what happened, we abandoned the homeless and ran up to the border. Some of those who had dropped out of the movement were reporting back. Liam O'Comain had asked Cork border campaign veteran David O'Connell, working as a teacher in Donegal, to become active again during 1968, but was rebuffed. But Golding appointed O'Connell O.C. in the Northwest during late 1969 despite Eddie Williams already having been given that position. Williams was loyal to the leadership while O'Connell would soon prove to be an ally of Golding's critics. Bobby McKnight had been gathering weapons and setting up a route for moving them from Dundalk for Newry, while Ryan was searching the country high and low for more. At one stage ITGWU General Secretary Michael Mullen was going to transport arms to Belfast by boat. Mullen, who had been an IRA internee during the 1940s and later a Labour TD, was close. To both Golding and Elements in Fianna fail. Eventually nearly everything the IRA could get their hands on was sent north, about 96 assorted weapons and 12,000 rounds of ammunition in the immediate aftermath of August. IRA members in the north believed that southern politicians had supplied some of the weapons. Neil Blaney would later claim that up to 25 TDs and senators had made privately held arms available during 1969. Republicans in Tyrone also received guns from Fine Gael or Blueshirt sources. All manner of weaponry was assembled. There were 303s, 22s, shotguns, Webleys, Peter the Painters, Mauser automatics, and a pair of gold-plated automatics, like something out of Patton. In Dublin a Chinese-made Alaska 47 turned up, battered and looking like it had come down the Ho Chi Minh Trail. Republicans argued for maintaining the barricades in Belfast and Derry, Costello stressing that the potential existed for the formation of a new radical civil organization in these areas. Mac Giola visited the Bogside and found enthusiasm for this idea. In late August the Liberation Fleet was held in the Bogside featuring the Dubliners, Tommy Makem, Shay Healy and Eugene Lambert of Arte's Wanderley Wagon. Young radicals like student Liz McManus were drawn to the atmosphere of free dairy. By early September Republicans had lost control of the leadership of the Dairy Citizens Defense Association, due to the co-option of large numbers of non-aligned nationalists, but arms training for young Republicans and members of the left-wing groups was provided behind the barricades by IRA members from Cork. In Belfast Jim Sullivan became chairman of the Central Citizens Defense Committee, CCDC, on the Falls. The British Army described him as head of Nagoland Committee, and a known IRA leader. The CCDC was an amalgamation of dozens of local defense and relief committees that had sprung up behind the barricades. It included IRA members as well as a cross-section of Belfast nationalism. Paddy Devlin was its secretary, Father Padraig Murphy and fruit importer Tom Connady were also committee members. The committees organized vigilante patrols and set up rotas for food distribution and transport in and out of barricaded areas. Space above a shoe repair shop behind the long bar was utilized as the HQ. Groups would meet there before patrols to receive their arms and ammunition, and Radio Free Belfast, a pirate radio station, was broadcast from there. The sight of armed IRA members at barricades no longer raised eyebrows. Indeed, Sullivan admitted to the Belfast Telegraph that automatic weapons, revolvers and rifles were being held for defense. Despite the British being aware that the IRA was moving in weapons, Sullivan met British GOC General Freeland on several occasions in late August. He was also part of a delegation that traveled to Westminster in September. However, Home Secretary Jim Callahan refused to meet Sullivan because he knew he was an IRA officer. So Sullivan stayed in an anteroom while Callahan met Devlin, Fitt, Connady and Father Murphy. In Belfast recruits flooded into the IRA, you could have filled Falls Park with the amount of people who wanted to volunteer. There were recruiting classes every night in Billy Sullivan's house. Auxiliaries were set up to cater for older men and those who only wanted to take part in vigilante activity. 
While the nationalist community now had high expectations of the IRA, they had not supported the organization in real terms for 40 years, and some Republicans resented the fact that people who would have spit on you and refused to put money in your collection box before August 1969 now expected to be provided with guns. There was also some contempt for the re-emergence of those, such as Jimmy Drum, Seamus Twomey, Billy McKee and Joe Cahill, who had dropped out of the movement during the 1960s or even earlier, they thought the Republic was going to be got without them, and they were afraid to be left out of it. Soon these veterans were suggesting that the IRA leadership had failed to defend nationalists. Jerry Adams later recounted that he was perturbed and perplexed to find that extreme criticism of the Belfast leadership was being expressed most of all by Republicans whom I didn't know or had only recently met. Jim Sullivan reflected. I don't think these people should have been accepted. I think they should have been chased, but it is very easy to say that now. I was part and parcel of the decision to allow them back, they blamed everyone from Dublin right down to Belfast Republicans, said they had been lax in providing means to defend people. I pointed out to them on many occasions that if things had been left to them there wouldn't have been a shortage of things to defend the people, there would have been nothing. Remembering the IRA's popularity, veterans find the idea that, I ran away, became a common slogan on Belfast walls ludicrous. The earliest reference to the slogan dates from April 1970, when Father Gillespie from Ardoyne told the British government's Scarman Tribunal that some men in his parish had told him the IRA were being called the, I ran away, after August. I never saw it written on a wall, recalls Sean O'Hare. That wasn't the attitude, people fell in behind the IRA, people stood behind them 100%. That, was not painted on a wall in West Belfast, it, would have been the talk of the place. Sean Curry believes that the slogan comes from a taunt used by B-Specials during the border campaign. If anyone wrote it, it was Protestants, people on the ground at the time, some were a bit angry, but most praised people who did defend the area. They knew that if the men weren't there the area wouldn't have been defended. But dissensions that predated August had been given a powerful emotional focus and were growing with the return of the older men to the IRA. In late August this group met and decided to take over. The IRA leadership in Belfast. On the 22nd of September they burst into a meeting in Cypress Street and demanded that Macmillan and the Belfast IRA sever their ties with Dublin until four army council members were replaced, and that several of their number be added to brigade staff. Macmillan, just out of jail, was in a difficult position, as several of the group had arrived armed. He agreed to break links with Dublin, to abstain from attending the forthcoming IRA convention and to bring several of the dissidents on to his staff. However, he had no intention of breaking with the leadership. Golding sent Max Steofen to Belfast to find out what was going on. But Max Steofen was already in touch with Leo Martin, the Belfast intelligence officer who had allied himself with the leadership's critics. The dissidents discovered Macmillan was still in touch with Dublin and began setting up their own command structure. Meanwhile contacts had been established between Republicans and representatives of the Irish government. During August the Irish government had established a cabinet subcommittee to deal with the Northern Crisis, made up of Neil Blaney, Padraig Faulkner, Charles Hahi and Joe Brennan. They had £100,000 at their disposal to supply humanitarian aid to nationalists, which Blaney and Hahi effectively controlled. Golding had been told that an individual in London was interested in supplying weapons. He travelled there and met Padraig, Jock, Hahi, brother of the Minister for Finance Charles Hahi, at the Irish Centre. Jock Hahi told him that money was available and Golding suggested that at least £50,000 would be necessary. Hahi gave the IRA leader £1,500 in cash and told him more was to come. In Dundalk Bobby McKnight was approached by a local businessman and Fianna Fail supporter, who informed him that £150,000 would be available for arms purchases provided the IRA stopped their activities in the South and abandoned left-wing policies. McKnight had instructions to play along and get as much out of them as you can. He satisfied the businessman by telling him that all we're interested in is defence. The IRA leadership was aware that feelers had been put out before the trouble erupted in Belfast. A co. Derry businessman and friend of Neil Blaney had approached Francie Donnelly, the South Derry IRA commander, and inquired whether he was interested in equipment. Donnelly reported this to Dublin and was told to continue discussions with the contact, but there was no renewal of the approach until September. Then the man arrived with Captain James Kelly of Irish Army Intelligence, who had been working inside Northern Ireland since August and had made contact with Sean Keenan, Johnny White and Eamon McCann in Derry. To White he offered army instruction for volunteers in Donegal with the proviso that independent training would cease. The IRA leadership accepted the offer for reasons of morale and in the hope of acquiring new weaponry, and during September IRA volunteers from Derry were trained at Dunry Fort in Donegal by Irish army officers. Captain Kelly was active in Belfast and spoke to numerous Republicans including many of those who had returned after the August events. 
he was able to tell them that the Irish government was willing to provide arms and finance to members of the IRA and the defense committees. He was articulate and convincing, and even his IRA critics acknowledged his sincerity. However, in reports to his superiors Kelly made clear that in his view thus far, arms and support seemed to have got into the wrong hands in Belfast, meaning elements hostile to the southern government. Kelly favored working with Hugh Kennedy of Board Bain, the Irish semi-state company, who was public relations officer for the Central Citizens Defense Committee, and Tom Connady. The special branch believed that Charles Hahi had met senior IRA men during September and promised that arms shipments to the north would not be interfered with, if the IRA ceased their attacks in the Republic. The Guardi believed Hahi had facilitated shipments through Dublin Airport and Dublin Port. On one occasion Jock Hahi assisted with smuggling, as McKnight remembers, two of us went down, and, Charlie's brother brought us into the airport, we'd a wee pickup truck we got a loan of, and, he brought us in, and they put these big boxes on the truck, we had to take it away, the truck was fucking swaying from side to side, but, we had the right of way. The men were not stopped or questioned before leaving the airport and they drove to a rendezvous nearby where Golding had assembled a team who divided up the cargo, handguns and automatic weapons, and moved them to separate dumps. During late September a meeting was organized in Lurgan to coordinate the defense committees. Considerable dissatisfaction with the IRA leadership was expressed. Rory O. Bradye was present without Golding's knowledge, as were several of the Belfast dissidents. Jim Sullivan, Paddy Devlin and Hugh Kennedy arrived at the meeting and made it clear that they were traveling to Dublin to see a government minister who was prepared to supply support. The three men met Charles Hahi at his home in Kinsealy, which Sullivan remembered as, a massive house. Two big steps up to it, a statue of a lion on either side of the door. Hahi agreed that a bank account would be opened in clones for funds for the defense committees. Money from the account was supposed to be paid weekly to the IRA and defense committees in Belfast. Realizing they were unlikely to receive their fair share, Golding's supporters demanded access to the account at gunpoint. During October 1969 a Belfast IRA officer, who supported the Dublin leadership, was able to withdraw £4,000 from the account for the defense committees, while the dissidents also drew money from the fund. It was becoming clear, however, that the money and arms were not going to be supplied willingly. To those who supported the Dublin leadership, Donnelly was visited again by Captain Kelly and Seamus Brady, a former speechwriter for Blaney, and it was spelled out to him that four members of the IRA leadership, Golding, Costello, Ryan and Johnston, would have to go before more money became available, and a separate northern command would need to be established. The IRA leadership ordered units to accept guns if offered, keep them in dumps, follow the non-sectarian strife policy, and refuse political promise. As Captain Kelly later explained, how do you expect a government in the South to give you arms and support if you are going to overthrow it? It's just not on. After attending a meeting in Dublin's Shelburne Hotel in October, Donnelly was not contacted again. The IRA leadership decided to go public on the affair. On 30 October a press conference was held in Dublin at which Seamus O'Tuothale outlined the plot to take over the civil rights movement. Blaney, Hahi and Boland were named as the promoters of the plan to buy off Republicans and divert them from the real struggle, North and South. The United Irishmen warned readers to beware these men and their Fianna fail gold, reminding its readers that, twice in the past, prior to 1932 and again in 1957, Fianna fail climbed to power on the back of Republicans on the pretext that they were sincerely trying to reunite Ireland. Relations quickly soured. In early December Sinn Féin picketed an appearance by Blaney at the Golden Grill in Letterkenny. Fianna Fáil Senator Bernard McGlinchey emerged with a group of men and physically fought with them. The promise of arms and money had the biggest effect in Belfast. Most of the new IRA recruits there had not been active in any form of politics before and large numbers of them were motivated only by a desire to defend their areas, or indeed to gain revenge for the attacks on their localities. They knew little and cared less about the history of Fianna Fáil repression of Republicans in the South. Belfast buzzed with rumors of a shipment of weapons coming in on an airplane, enough to fill a hay barn. The promise of arms and finance gave confidence to those opposing the Dublin leadership that they would be able to set up a viable alternative organization. But there were many new recruits to their ranks anyway. Many of those loyal to Golding were also eager to take up offers of money or weapons, believing that Fianna Fail could be outmaneuvered. Left-wing volunteers were also swept up in the raw emotion, your streets were getting burnt, there was no time for doctrinaire talk. However, most of those who had been active before August 1969 including Macmillan, Sullivan, McKnight, Mal McBurney and Dennis Toner as well as the younger activists such as Dornan, Joe McCann, Seamus Lynch, Sean Mateer, Sean O'Hare, Sean Curry and Jim Hargy, remained loyal to Dublin. Jerry Adams was a notable exception, though his sister Margaret remained loyal too. Golding, 
as did her husband Michael McCory. Initially the divide was not set in stone. One of those who stood guard while the dissidents confronted Macmillan in Cypress Street later went back to Macmillan's side. The August events had greatly accelerated the potential for a split and added new elements to it. As it became clear that a split was on the cards a major meeting of IRA officers was held in Billy Wright's gym where Golding outlined the offer of finance from Fianna Fail. Part of the purpose of the meeting was to determine who had been privately dealing with Captain Kelly or anyone else. Both Max Steofen and O'Bradi were restrained in their criticism. Only David O'Connell lost his temper, shouting, we want guns. It was clear to a fellow delegate that he didn't care how he was getting them. Whoever got them first was going to have a big advantage. The race for weapons was on and any and every source was utilized. Anything that the IRA in Britain had was sent to Ireland. An arms dealer in Huddersfield was approached about providing substantial amounts of SLR rifles and sterlings, and a meeting was organized with Costello and Jerry Doherty during November. In the event, Costello was unable to make it and Eamon Smullen, a London-based veteran who had rejoined the Republican movement in 1969, went instead. The meeting was a police trap and Doherty and Smullen were arrested. During their trial, conducted under heavy security, Smullen's 1940s IRA record was recounted, as was a recent visit to Cuba. Smullen was sentenced to eight years and Doherty five. In a separate case a Belfast-born Protestant and member of the Communist Party, Barry Bruden, was sentenced to four years for persuading a friend to give him a rifle. In Belfast weapons were bought from Ted Pavis, a Protestant arms dealer who used his connections with a show band to smuggle guns from Europe. Golding and Costello approached Mick O'Reardon and asked if the Soviet Union would provide weapons. Costello was to organize a trawler crewed by select and reliable IRA members who would pick up the shipment in neutral waters. During November O'Reardon informed the Soviets that the IRA's combat potential had been weakened by its concentration on social protests and educational activity. It needed weapons urgently. O'Reardon optimistically requested 2,000 Alaska 47 assault rifles and 150 machine guns along with over a million rounds of ammunition. But the Soviets were not inclined to supply arms at short notice to an unknown quantity like the IRA. KGB chief Yuri Andropov insisted that if arms were to be supplied then the secret of their source of supply had to be preserved. Meanwhile the United Irishmen launched a dynamite fund aimed at Irish America, arguing, bandages are not enough, defense is needed. The violence had created huge interest in the US but as yet it was unclear in which direction the new support would flow. Local clan Na Gael activists found Irish American army. Veterans turning up on their doorsteps with handguns to send to Ireland. Bernadette Devlin's August speaking tour had attracted intense coverage, though her socialism alienated many. Golding went to the US in November to try to secure the loyalty of Klan. He also sought allies elsewhere. Dominic Bean was working for the IRA on the East Coast and was not reticent about their objective. In one address to a Philadelphia gathering he declared, we are over here looking for money to buy guns to spread the revolution. Golding was introduced to the actor Gene Kelly, who made it clear he would make a financial contribution as long as it was for arms. Golding also raised money from the National Association for Irish Justice. A number of important figures on the Republican scene in New York, all of them Irish and several of them 1919-23 veterans, had already raised their own funds. National Association for Irish Justice activist Joan McKiernan recalled a meeting in the autumn of 1969 when many of the old guard made it clear that, we don't want any money going over there until we know who is going to get it. They were highly suspicious of the left. Golding had met some of the older group including Liam Kelly, the former Sor Ulad leader, who eventually gave him his backing. However, in December Sean Keenan and John Kelly, a representative of the Belfast dissidents, arrived in America on a trip paid for by Irish government money. Initially the New York Republicans were wary of Keenan and Kelly but the two men made useful contacts. Small donations aside, weapons were going to cost money, and the only way to get the kind of money required to buy them was to steal it. Armed robberies were now back on the agenda. Costello appointed several officers whose job was to suss out info, intelligence, to get money to get guns. The word was out, we have to get guns. The IRA robbed banks in Belfast and Oma during October, and there were further robberies in Dublin and Belfast during December. Later that month an IRA man was arrested and a shot fired in an attempted armed raid on Wynn's Hotel in Dublin. IRA training was intensified as recruitment increased. Recruits came down from the north almost every weekend, as a Dublin activist recalls. Every Friday you met at 4 o'clock. You were in the deep of the fucking country at 10 p.m. You set up camp by 12, up at 6 next morning and then bang, bang, bang all day long. The Dublin Republican Splinter Group had decided to develop their own political program. On the 15th of August they had taken 800 pounds in a raid in Bolton Glass. 
Afterwards some of the raiders sat listening to radio reports of the Battle of the Bogside and decided time was ripe for a new organization. During September they robbed 8,000 pounds from banks in Dublin and in Kells, claiming the raids in the name of the Soar Eyer Action Group. Jim Lane and his Cork comrades had also gone to Northern Ireland during August and, despite past differences, spent some time with Eddie Williams and several IRA activists along the border. Lane and the Cork group were less than impressed when the Dublin gang adopted the Soar Eyer title, causing a great deal of confusion not to mention drawing Garda attention to their organization. In November the IRA complained to Sinn Féin that gossip about political divisions was circulating freely in its ranks. Arguments about the IRA's performance were also becoming more public. The United Irishmen reacted angrily to a critical article in the current affairs magazine news site entitled, Where Were the IRA? Claiming a more sympathetic piece by Anne Harris had been rewritten by editors Vincent Brown and John Feeney. But Golding's position during August was defended by Padraig O'Snodi in the Irish language monthly Comhar. News of the divisions in Belfast appeared in the press in early December. Dick Walsh reported in the Irish Times that a majority of the IRA in the city had severed contact with Dublin and details of the September meetings were publicised later that month. Sporadic sectarian clashes continued and people in Belfast were still regularly forced from their homes. Thousands of loyalists had rallied on the Shankill in early September and threatened to march on Unity Flats, only to be stopped by British troops. Five Catholic homes were burnt out in late September and the IRA had fired on loyalists at Unity Flats. A Protestant vigilante was shot dead after an argument with Catholics at a barricade in the same month, and another Protestant man died after a clash with Catholics in Derry. In mid-September the British Army had removed most of the barricades in West Belfast despite some opposition. In early October loyalists outraged by the abolition of the B-Specials rioted on the Shankill and again tried to reach the falls but British troops dispersed them violently. The Ulster Volunteer Force opened fire, killing an RUC man, while British soldiers killed two loyalists and injured 60. Loyalists complained bitterly about army brutality. A UVF member was killed planting a bomb at a power station in Ballyshannon, County Donegal. Even though the IRA in the city was effectively split, both sides still cooperated in defensive work. Malachy McGurran was released from jail in early December and set about work, a clear thinker, who had been badly missed by the leadership over the previous three months. Also missing for much of the time was Sean Garland, who was now living in Glasgow, though travelling extensively on IRA business. Preparation was taking place for both the extraordinary IRA convention to be held in December and the Shin Fine Ard face to follow in January. There were now strong indications that a formal split was inevitable. Many of the younger IRA and Shin Fine members were happy at the prospect. Owen Omer Chu remembers that he, naively and wrongly thought a split would be a good thing. Mac Giola, on the other hand, was much more cautious, while Golding and his allies would later blame Costello, who was more determined than ever to get rid of abstentionism, for pushing people into the other camp. Golding claimed that Costello left a battalion convention in Leitrim to watch Bernadette Devlin being interviewed on television and also suggested that another officer had alienated local units in Clare and Kerry by his dismissive attitude. O'Bradi also noted what he called Costello's arrogant manner at this time. However, Costello was expressing views widely held among the younger membership that those who disagreed with the movement's direction should just leave. Mick Ryan was fearful about the prospect of a violent split and armed a number of volunteers for security at the convention. They were told to watch Max Steofen and to take action if he looked like producing a weapon. The convention took place in late December at Knockvicker House, in Boyle, Co. Riscommon. The leadership motion on the National Liberation Front was passed. This was followed by a debate on abstentionism. This too was passed by 28 votes to 12. There were accusations about opposition delegates not being transported to the meeting, but the leadership would have won the vote anyway. Because of the situation in Belfast neither group from the city was represented at the convention. The units in rural Ulster, Armagh, Tyrone, Co. Derry, South Down and Derry City supported the leadership. So did the majority in Dublin, Wicklow, Waterford, South Kilkenny, Mayo, Cork and South Kerry. Max Steofen and O'Bradi had the support of Louth, Meath and Longford, Roscommon as well as the dissident North Kerry organization. While most of Dublin remained with the leadership, the active service unit split down the middle and some of the most experienced military activists left to support Max Steofen. Despite Ryan's fears, the convention was not acrimonious. Mac Tomey, who voted against the leadership, gave Sean Dunn and a number of other Golding supporters a lift back to Dublin. Later that night O'Bradi and Max Steofen held their own meeting and set up a new army council and established a new organization, the Provisional IRA. Their existence became public knowledge on 28 December, with a statement claiming the support of the majority of IRA volunteers. 
This was not the case, except in Belfast. Joe Cahill proposed they drop the claim to the IRA's name and use a new title instead, but his proposal was rejected. There were now two IRAs but still one Sinn Féin, which was to have its ARD face in January. There was now a frantic scramble to secure dumps and the control of arms locally, and to bulk up support. Golding's IRA moved to undercut support for the provisionals by setting up a separate Northern Command in early January. McGurran was made its commander and it publicly promised to place a special emphasis on the defense of those areas vulnerable to attack by government-inspired pogromists. Describing the provisionals as totally unrepresentative of the IRA in general, a Northern Command statement asked that disgruntled volunteers return to the movement and pursue their grievances through its structure. The IRA outlined its policy in a major statement in the January United Irishman, explaining that it was no longer an elitist force, divorced from the struggles of the people, but a revolutionary army, whose role was to assist the people in what is their liberation struggle. The Sinn Féin Ard Thais took place in the Intercontinental Hotel in Dublin's Ballsbridge on the weekend of the 11th to the 12th of January 1970. It coincided with a rugby match at nearby Lansdowne Road between Ireland and South Africa. Costello had led pickets on the South African team's hotel in Bray, and on the first day of the Ard Thais some of the 295 delegates joined the 10,000-strong demonstration at Lansdowne Road. The debate concerning the National Liberation Front went on for four hours and finally ended at 11 p.m. in a majority accepting the concept. The issue of entering Parliament was discussed all day Sunday, and when a vote was finally taken at 5.30 p.m. there were 257 present. The motion needed 172 votes to gain the necessary two-thirds majority but received 153. Abstentionism was safe for another year. Dennis Kassin proposed a resolution pledging Sinn Féin's continued support to the IRA. Max Steofen retorted that he owed allegiance to the Provisional Army Council, at which point he, O. Braddy and a number of supporters began to walk out. Joe Clark got on to his crutches and followed them as a supporter grabbed the microphone, shouting, Joe Clark, the hero of 1916, is leaving. There were scuffles during which Max Steofen was punched. The Provisionals went to a prearranged meeting in Parnell Square where they announced the setting up of a caretaker executive of Sinn Féin. The formal split was complete. The Provisionals' reasons for splitting away were listed as Golding's organization's recognition of foreign parliaments, their cooperation with radical groups, the NLF policy, their adoption of extreme socialism, undemocratic internal methods, the let down of the North, and the opposition to abolishing Stormont. The split produced mixed emotions. In Dublin Margaret O'Leary had no close friends among those who left and felt the division was inevitable, we were leaving the conservative rear guard behind and moving on. Tony Gregory recalled that young activists didn't even think of the provost as an option. De Burka was delighted. I went home the day of the split walking on air. On the other hand Mac Giola conceded that some of those who had walked out had been involved in social agitation and felt, very sincerely that abstentionism is the heart of republicanism. His close friend Mac Tame was one of those who left. Most of those who had joined since the mid-1960s were enthusiastic about the NLF concept and had no problem with TDs taking seats if elected though the split was not simply generational. The Golding leadership retained the support of IRA veterans like Liam Leddy and Paddy Fleming, both 1940s chiefs of staff, Charles McLeanan, the former abstentionist MP for South Armagh, Jerry Dunlop, a Belfast man who had been sentenced to 20 years for involvement in the 1940s bombing campaign, and Nouri's Joe Campbell. Golding also retained substantial rural support including the majority of the movement in Northern Ireland. One man who later became a leading provisional in Tyrone estimated that the overwhelming majority of the local organization there remained loyal to Dublin. There was, however, considerable unwillingness to split at all in many areas, both north and south, with Wexford Sinn Féin asking for a meeting so both sides could go about patching up their differences. Some individuals would take a long time to make up their minds which side they should take. But in Belfast, where the split was already several months old, and in Dublin to a lesser extent, the division was becoming bitter. An ominous sign for Mick Ryan was that his car had been stolen on the weekend of the Ard Thais and was found on the Dublin mountains riddled with bullets. He felt the atmosphere at the Intercontinental had been terrible, reminding him of a civil war, and his former comrades were like a family member who knew everything about you. Golding seemed to be more blasé, commenting that splits had never really worked in the past. In fact, the split was to dominate Republican politics for the next decade. 5. Defense and Retaliation The Official IRA and the Northern Troubles, 1970-1974. The War on the People Will Be Turned into a People's War. Official IRA, Belfast, August 1971 Cathal Golding and his supporters continued to refer to themselves as the IRA, despite Sean Max Steofane's group also claiming the title. By the end of 1970 the terms, 
official IRA, and regular IRA, were introduced by the press to differentiate Golding's organization from the provisionals. Golding remained chief of staff, Costello was director of operations and Maliki McGurin became northern commander. Sean Garland was abroad for most of 1970, still concerned about the possibility of Gardy arresting him in connection with the Dublin airport heist. Tomas MacGiola chaired the leadership body with Mick Ryan initially quartermaster general. Billy McMillan represented Belfast while Sean O'Chanath, Owen Omer Chu and several other local commanders were members of the extended army council. There were now also two rival Sinn Féin organizations, also labeled either official or provisional, according to their military wings, or Gardiner Place, or Kevin Street, after the addresses of their headquarters. To confuse matters further the officials continued to call their political organization in Northern Ireland the Republican Clubs. The official leadership did not believe that a revolutionary situation yet existed or that an armed offensive against the British was realistic. The role of the official IRA within Northern Ireland was primarily defensive, a backup to social agitation on both sides of the border, but it was recognized that rearming was vital, and the official leadership publicly appealed at Easter 1970 for help so that the IRA could equip itself with modern weapons, to ensure that it will never again ask men to face armored cars with short arms. The British were aware that the OIRA had been seeking aid from both Cuba and the Soviet Union. The Soviets were extremely concerned about security and were alarmed by stories in the British press about Eastern Bloc arms finding their way to the North. They wanted assurances that there would be no leaks before they acted. Other sources were sought. Golding had a contact in the military police at the Kura camp who informed him about the possibility of stealing a quantity of FN rifles. The raid was planned for the 17th of May 1970, and a unit led by Golding set off to the Kura. However, at the last minute the raid was aborted and Gardy stopped the stolen lorry in which Golding was traveling. He was arrested and charged, but the IRA put pressure on the lorry owner to withdraw his statement and the case collapsed. The incident led to questions as to why the chief of staff was personally leading an armed raid. Some saw it as an attempt to upstage Costello, who was himself taking part in robberies. Some of Golding's earlier efforts in the United States were beginning to bear fruit. McGurin visited America during March and several lines of supply were opened up. Weapons bought as far south as North Carolina were being moved through Baltimore, Toronto and Montreal en route to Dublin. The Irish supporters in Dublin port were able to have the weapons, sometimes marked, agricultural machinery, picked up safely. By the spring of 1970 small quantities of Garand and Springfield rifles, M1 carbines and .38 revolvers had begun to arrive from contacts in the US. British sources continued to supply ammunition, as did loyalist gun dealers. Golding claimed during 1970 that the accusation that his supporters had gone soft had been a big help to rearmament as state attention had been focused elsewhere. At Easter the division within the IRA was displayed publicly, with rival commemorations held in Dublin, Belfast, Derry and Cork. The official IRA now admitted that there had been a shortage of weapons in Belfast the previous August. They claimed, however, that the fault for this lay mainly with those who had deserted the Republican army during the 1960s and only returned after August, when they became free with their criticism. The provisionals blamed the IRA's lack of preparation on infiltration by supporters of Marx, Mao and Castro, who had introduced foreign socialism under the cover of republicanism. It was after Easter that the provisionals began to taunt their rivals for adopting an adhesive lily, nicknaming them stickybacks, a term soon shortened to sticks or stickies. The provisionals were christened the pinheads after reverting to using a pin to attach their lilies, but the name never caught on, most people referring to them as provosts. In much of rural Ulster there was still only one Easter commemoration. Bernadette Devlin confirmed that in many such areas there was no split as the movement had remained almost completely behind Golding. Intelligence sources at the U.S. Embassy in Dublin concluded that most of those associated with the Republican movement since 1962 remained with the officials who have retained most of the movement's brains, trained men, money and arms as well as much of the movement's Dublin and Cork bases. In Derry City several thousand attended the official parade in the city centre while the provisional event held after Easter in the Bogside attracted only a few hundred. In Belfast, however, the provisionals had turned out the larger numbers, reflecting their predominance, and it was in this city that the rivalry soon became bitter and violent. This was partly because those involved came from the same streets, had gone to the same schools, had worked together or were from the same families. During April Jim Sullivan was punched during a pub row with a provo. The officials responded immediately, Macmillan kneecapping the provisional involved outside the Celtic bar on the Falls Road. A few days later the provost ambushed Macmillan, firing on him while he was driving his Volkswagen Beetle through Finnehy. The wee man 
was unhurt but clashes escalated and a familiar pattern emerged. Supporters of either group who were a minority in their own areas were victimized by their rivals. A truce was announced in early May after clergy had facilitated talks between Macmillan and provisional Billy McKee, but tension remained. Some members of the OIRA discussed the possibility of a preemptive strike against the provost, but Macmillan later explained that, it would have been virtually impossible for us to explain in political terms. Why, we had felt it necessary to kill 12 or 13 Republicans, after all these people had been our comrades in arms, it just wasn't on. The clandestine contacts between the Southern government and those who became the provisionals were brought to public attention during 1970. By May Charles Hahi, Neil Blaney and Kevin Boland had either resigned or been sacked from government for their part in the scheme. Hahi along with military intelligence officer Captain James Kelly, Belfast provisional John Kelly and Flemish businessman Albert Lukes eventually faced trial for their part in the operation. A jury, unconvinced that the men had not been working with official sanction, and caught up in the wave of sympathy for Northern Catholics, acquitted the four in Dublin's High Court. The provisional IRA, stung by the allegations of connivance with Fianna Fáil and the Free State Military, issued a statement that dismissed press allegations of assistance, in the form of finance, arms and training facilities as completely untrue. Outside the Lower Falls the main area of official strength in Belfast was the markets, though in reality, no area belonged to anybody, and there were members of both organizations in every nationalist district. With the influx of new members the division of the city's brigade into three battalion areas, which were further subdivided into companies, was re-established. The 3rd Battalion area stretched the length of the Falls Road from the Devis Flats to Ballymurphy, with support concentrated in the Lower Falls, D Company, Beachmount, B Company, and Devis. The 2nd Battalion covered the rest of West Belfast, with Turf Lodge the center of its strength. The 1st Battalion's area was centered in the markets but spread over the rest of mainly Protestant East Belfast, with companies located in the Catholic enclaves of Short Strand and the Ormo Road. Although the smaller group in the city, the officials regarded themselves as the authentic IRA, better disciplined and organized than the breakaway group. Many had a contemptuous attitude towards the provost, seeing them as armed Celtic football club supporters, most of whom would never have been recruited into the IRA before August 1969. Sullivan was particularly dismissive, predicting in Dublin that the provo organization would disintegrate within a few weeks. Another result of the August 1969 upheaval had been the setting up of shabines in residential areas, as many pubs had been burnt down and people were avoiding drinking in the city center. Among the first official shabines were the Cracked Cup in Leeson Street and the Liam Mellows Club in Verner Street in the markets. Members also continued to frequent pubs such as the Long Bar and the Old House on the Falls, as well as the National Club in Queen Street. Away from the tinderbox atmosphere of Belfast, conflict was mainly verbal, though there was sporadic violence in Dublin. Shortly after the split a group of provisionals carried out an armed raid on an official meeting in Ringsend. The raid became somewhat farcical after a female official who knew the raiders personally lectured them on how ashamed of themselves they should be. The officials claimed to have, no fear, of such violence escalating, as they were the stronger organization in Dublin. During another confrontation outside Mars Pub in Moore Street, guns were drawn, but two old friends from the pre-1969 active service unit, now on different sides, managed to defuse the situation. The Dublin Fianna remained largely official though a few did join the rival group, resulting in occasional clashes. At Dublin's GPO official Fianna members selling the United Irishmen were told to fuck off to Vietnam, by their Provo rivals. The political atmosphere in the South had shifted somewhat from the heady days of August 1969, partially because of the activities of the Soar Ayer Action Group. In February, they had carried out a robbery in Rathdrum, Co., Wicklow. In early April they attempted a raid on Dublin's Aaron Key, but Gardy arrived on the scene and there was a struggle during which Garda Richard Fallon was shot dead. This was the first killing of a Garda since 1943 and it caused outrage. The officials Nuoc Nesunda deplored the orgy of sentimental twaddle and calls for repressive retaliatory legislation. That followed this incident, contrasting it with the lack of outcry over violence in police custody, during evictions and towards travelers. The United Irishmen went further, claiming that a special branch officer, rather than the bank robbers, had accidentally shot Fallon. Cathal Golding later gave evidence to court in support of Frank Keane, who was charged with the murder, claiming that Keane was a man of very high character, inspired by a desire to do the best for his country. A major hunt was launched for the raiders and the names of seven Soar Iyer suspects were published in the national press. The group's ambitions of becoming an urban guerrilla organization were severely damaged, but the group remained in existence, receiving some support from the Trotskyist Fourth International, which was also backing urban guerrilla groups in South America. Peter Graham, the young socialist leader, became Soar Ayer's quartermaster. 
The group continued to carry out robberies, although with most of its members on the run it was already splintering and it lost an important member when Liam Walsh was killed while attempting to defuse an explosive device left near Dublin's McKee Barracks in October 1970. The consequences of the Irish split were quickly overshadowed by the deterioration of the relationship between Northern Catholics and the British Army. There had been rioting in Derry following the official's Easter commemoration, followed by complaints about army brutality. The official IRA in the city warned that action would be taken against collaborators with the British. In Belfast there were serious clashes between young nationalists and the British army during April. General Freeland announced that henceforth petrol bombers would be shot by his men. The officials responded by threatening to kill British soldiers if civilians were shot. During rioting in Ballymurphy a group of OIRA men were driven into the area by the Northern Ireland Labour MP Paddy Devlin. They chose an ambush position and had orders to open fire if British troops used live ammunition. Devlin was cooperating closely behind the scenes with the OIRA, even offering to become a volunteer himself. Golding advised him that he could be of better use in his political role, though some Belfast officials suspected that Devlin was actually working on behalf of the Dublin government. Street clashes became worse as the build-up to the 1970 Orange marching season began. The officials advised their volunteers and supporters to exercise utmost discipline and self-control, and avoid sectarian strife. Units were put on alert to defend areas against loyalist attack but also to prevent Catholics engaging in attacks on Protestants. Sullivan and others, armed with Hurleys, had stood between rival crowds on the Grosvenor Road during April. The officials suspected the provosts were using the sectarian rioting to build up their own base. At Bowdenstown during June Malachy McBurney told the crowd of several thousand, nearly half of whom had travelled from the north, that the OIRA welcomed arms in the hands of Irishmen, not for use against the Protestant workers in the north, but for use against the British Army of Occupation. But later that month Belfast saw the worst sectarian violence since August 1969. Major rioting broke out during Orange Parades on 27 June and the Provisionals opened fire on Loyalist crowds, killing three men. Later that evening mobs attacked the Short Strand and the provost killed three more Protestants during gun battles in the vicinity of St. Matthew's Catholic Church. One Catholic vigilante was killed by fire from his own side. The defense of the Short Strand became a powerful recruiting tool for the provisional IRA, and sectarian feeling intensified. 500 Catholic workers were forced out of the shipyards in the aftermath of the shootings. The officials argued that, the hatred and bitterness engendered by the killing of six Protestant civilians can only increase the likelihood of further pogroms. On the ground, however, many felt that the short strand had been defended well, and the local OIRA unit had also been on defensive duty that night. More violence was expected and all official units were put on alert. A large number of weapons, many of which had just arrived in Belfast, were brought into the lower falls for cataloging and distribution. On the 3rd of July British troops raided 24 Balkan Street in the lower falls, having received a tip-off that weapons were being stored there. They found one submachine gun, one rifle, 15 pistols and some ammunition. As they withdrew locals tried to obstruct them. Stones were thrown and the troops replied with CS gas. As the confrontation escalated, rumors spread that a man had been killed by an armored car. The officials were desperate to avoid their arms being captured. A decision was made very hastily to move out the bulk of the weapons that was in the area in case they decided to raid larger scale. In doing so some of the weapons became visible and the guys that had the weapons decided to fire a few shots. As more troops were sent into the area the officials realized they would have to fight. Barricades were thrown up in Raglan Street, Culling Tree Road and Leeson Street and armed OIRA members were sent to take up positions. Buses were hijacked and used to block off Albert Street Junction. Jim Sullivan gave orders to confront the army. About 6 o'clock that night the order was given that the weapons and the area must be defended. About 60 to 70 men were armed, local. IRA volunteers, D Company. Each man was given a rifle. Some people had two revolvers, and some people had three revolvers. Some people had two rifles and two revolvers, there was that much about then, at the same time we were trying to get the weapons out of the area. Many of the guns were just out of their packaging and there was a rush to assemble them, one carbine falling apart when it was fired. British troops initially withdrew under heavy gunfire. At 10 p.m. General Freeland issued orders to curfew the lower falls, threatening to shoot anyone who remained on the streets. Minutes after the curfew was imposed three soldiers were shot in Omar Street. It was purely coincidental, they were in the right streets at the right time, they knew the streets, the backyard walls came in very handy. It said there was 2,000 Brits, I don't know if there was, there was a lot anyway. You tried to pick a target. At one point weapons had to be cooled down. 
As CS gas poured into the area British soldiers reported coming under, heavy and extremely accurate sniper fire, in Plevna Street. By midnight 3,000 troops were surrounding the area and they entered in armored cars, which eventually made firing futile. As the battle raged, young lads in the area were still throwing stones, petrol bombs and bottles, they were actually pushing the volunteers out of the way at one stage. Over 36 hours the British admitted firing 1,454 live rounds, 1,385 CS canisters and 218 CS cartridges, killing three local civilians and a freelance photographer. 18 soldiers were wounded, 15 by gunfire. As the army entered the area they began extensive house searches. Men and teenagers were beaten and women abused. Dozens of homes were wrecked. To add insult to injury, two Unionist MPs were brought on a tour of the subdued area in the back of an army Land Rover. Trapped in a house near Sultan Street as troops approached, one official consoled some younger volunteers that they were in, a bad house. We're in a bad fucking area, was their reply. The curfew was eventually lifted on Sunday morning, after women marched down the Falls Road, pushing prams and chanting, and broke through the British lines. The British knew that most of the, more attractive, armaments had been spirited away, before the cordon was fully effective. Some of these weapons ended up in the hands of the provisionals. Five or six local provisionals had been in the area at the beginning of the trouble and fired on the army but had then withdrawn. In the curfew's aftermath, after the streets had quietened down and arms had been dumped, a group of volunteers met up in Lincoln Street and, allowed alcohol for the first time in days, proceeded to, get full. They composed a song. The provost never showed that night, they would rather sleep and leave us to fight, but with hand grenades and carbine guns, we put the wind up Britannia's sons. The British army had no doubt that what they described as, determined and organized. Armed resistance, had been spearheaded by the, Golding faction. Macmillan was one of 337 people arrested in the curfew's aftermath and his home in Tun Street was ransacked by troops. The Falls curfew was a key moment in the general alienation of Catholics from the British Army. For the officials it led to increased recruitment and a new sense of confidence. Their publicity declared that it had been the single biggest engagement between the IRA and British Crown Fosses since 1916. This Week magazine noted approvingly that it was the regular IRA, which for the first time since 1921 engaged in open combat. Not with Orangemen, not with fellow Irishmen, but with the naked and overwhelming power of the Imperial Fosses. There was a strong desire for revenge among local OIRA members. Some of their mothers and fathers had been hurt, their homes had been wrecked. They, had got the buzz, they, were out to cause harm to the army. But the official leadership did not believe that a military campaign was in the offing, instead volunteers were given permission for a limited number of retaliatory attacks on the British army. The problem for Golding's organization was that in Northern Ireland reasons for retaliation were multiplying. In late July another Catholic civilian in Belfast was shot dead by troops. Approval was given for a retaliatory mine attack in Derry but then withdrawn, causing some local dissension. At an army council meeting held in Dublin's Dominican Friary, courtesy of radical priest Father Austin Flannery, Macmillan asked for permission to kill three soldiers in response. The IRA men sat around a long table in a room dominated by a crucifix and a religious painting. One participant found the scene surreal. There we were under a large cross, someone dying on a rock over there, and then any other business, and Billy Macmillan. Says we want permission for an operation, we want to execute three soldiers, we had a vote, we were like the Last Supper, and the Big Cross, and we all voting for the death of three fucking men, it couldn't happen anywhere else except Ireland. Two gun and bomb attacks on the army followed, though no soldiers were killed. By winter 1970 both IRA groups were carrying out gun and bomb attacks without claiming them. The provisionals' bombings came to light only when one of their members was killed in a premature explosion in September. To ensure official volunteers did not carry out unauthorized operations, weapons were not readily available to anyone. You had only two or three weapons floating about on the surface, the rest were in dumps that only two or three people could access. Very few people were able to take weapons without sanction. In Belfast Fianna members, boys and girls, learned a variety of bomb-making techniques. A basic nail bomb was developed, as Macmillan explained to a reporter, you just wrap a couple of ounces of jelly around 30 or 40 nails and stick a fuse in it. Grenades were tested inside a brick kiln in Beechmount, while there was a small shooting range in an Osman Street entry. Intelligence was built up on the British Army, the routes they traveled, their favorite resting places and the usual spots for their checkpoints. A support organization, the Auxiliaries, existed in every area where the officials were organized. Sometimes these were men who would not have been recruited into the OIRA, though the Lower Falls Oxies were a serious team, led by 1940s IRA veterans. 
In Belfast both the officials and the provisionals also had to contend with a large group of non-aligned vigilantes, the Catholic Ex-Servicemen's Association, which had access to its own armed supplies. With one or two exceptions OIRA members were forbidden to join British ex-servicemen's groups, but the two organizations occasionally created joint vigilante groups. Following the fall's curfew a number of defense committee vigilantes had been recruited into the officials. One evening Joe McCann, OIRA leader in the markets, asked Harry McEwen to wait near the Black Bull pub for a young man. The man turned out to be unionist hardliner Major Ronald Bunting's son Ronnie, a former student and People's Democracy member. Recruits from Queen's University were attached to the markets unit and McCann, as local O.C., was happy to recruit them. Some of his comrades were less sure, McEwen warning that, those students are not like us, once they get their degree it will be up you and your politics. McCann also encountered some disapproval for his recruitment of men with criminal backgrounds. Despite not hailing himself from the notoriously clannish markets, McCann was accepted locally. Harry McEwen himself did not formally join the OIRA, as he now ran his own building firm, employing McCann, when he turned up, and other OIRA members. He also allowed members to use his bungalow for billets and ferried people on active service in his Jaguar. Most official recruits in Belfast were working-class Catholic teenagers. Harry Donaghy, who joined the FIANA in 1970 at the age of 13, while aware of the difference between the officials and provisionals, felt that had he come from somewhere other than the Lower Falls he might have ended up in the other group. Volunteers were expected to be active in their local Republican clubs, and Joe McCann himself was education officer of the Liam Mellows Club in the markets. The OIRA also backed up clubs' campaigns such as that for lower bus fares in Belfast. During November 1970 buses on the falls were taken over by men who ordered conductors not to collect any fares and announced that people's buses were in operation. The OIRA also continued fundraising operations, stealing £4,600 from a bank in Straban in September and £15,000 in what British intelligence described as a well-planned wages robbery in the markets in November, shooting two security men in the process. During November, 15 OIRA members were arrested in Louth in possession of weapons and explosives, and a Dublin ASU member was sentenced to seven years in jail for the Wynn's Hotel robbery. In December Tasha Jack Lynch mooted the introduction of internment to deal with the threat of subversion. This was ostensibly in reaction to Garda intelligence that Sor Iyer were planning to kidnap politicians, but the officials claimed they were the real targets. Gardi carried out raids on officials in Kilkenny, Cork and Kerry. Meanwhile relations with the provost continued to deteriorate. As Golding drank with supporters in Dundalk after the Edentubber commemoration, shots were fired into Mark's bar, narrowly missing him. The provisionals were blamed, though it was felt that the shooting was not authorized by their leadership. In Belfast the provost kept up a steady stream of abuse over the officials' communist politics. Describing them as the National Liberation Front, they complained about the evil threat posed by trained agents sent out by Marxist masterminds to brainwash young Republicans. The rhetoric was accompanied by a renewal of physical clashes, particularly around rival paper sales. During December several officials were taken from their homes at gunpoint in Ardoin, held overnight and warned not to operate in the area. After this 150 officials, many of them armed, carried out a mass paper sale on the White Rock Road, in the face of local provisionals. The provisionals, meanwhile, complained that their supporters in the Lower Falls were being beaten up. Ironically, it was action against the British Army that led to a fatal escalation of these clashes. Confrontations between young nationalists and the army in Belfast were now daily occurrences and the brutality of the troops alienated more and more Catholics. The OIRA carried out a number of attacks in response in Ardoin and Ballymurphy. The provosts were upset about the officials' action on what they considered their turf in Ballymurphy and tried to force an official auxiliary, John McGuinness, to give them information about the whereabouts of arms. He was held down and shot in the neck, leaving him paralyzed. The shooting was seen as a dirty, obscene act and many wanted to retaliate for it. In Ballymurphy the OIRA continued to attack the Henry Taggart army base. Shortly afterwards a Ballymurphy official was pistol-whipped by provisionals and in retaliation the OIRA shot a local provo in the arms and legs. Trouble spread to the falls and two young officials were kidnapped and beaten by a group of provisionals in a disused chemist shop in Albert Street. Two young provosts were then kidnapped by the OIRA and beaten. The provisionals raided the officials' burning embers bar, where Sullivan was drinking with Paddy Devlin, and tried to burn it down. An emergency meeting of the OIRA command staff was being held in the cracked cup when the meeting place was hit with machine gun bullets, Thompson submachine guns both ends of the street, the place we were in, it was like raindrops falling on a tin roof.
Afterwards young OIRA members confronted provisionals in Leeson Street and shot dead 26-year-old Charlie Hughes. Talks between the two sides produced a truce. Seven hours later, however, a group of OIRA men who had spent the night on the mountains overlooking Belfast were coming down into Ballymurphy when they spotted Tom Cahill, a milkman and brother of leading Provo Joe Cahill, on his rounds. They shot and badly wounded him. The OIRA claimed that their men hadn't heard about the truce and it held, uneasily. An observer described the atmosphere as, literally eerie. Knots of young and old men were gathered at all street corners, and even in broad daylight silent eye-to-eye -eye confrontations seemed to be taking place. The officials claimed to greatly regret the death of Hughes and offered condolences to his family. But privately they felt the provost had, got their lesson. One official felt the provost had been, so naive, to think you can just walk in and fire bullets at somebody and then they'll run away crying, it just doesn't happen, it's sad, he was a good kid, Charlie Hughes, he, should never have been put in that position. There were echoes of the Belfast violence elsewhere. In Bray, Costello led a group armed with iron bars in an attack on provisional supporters. In some areas of rural Ulster, by contrast, relations remained relatively friendly even after the shootings in Belfast. In Tyrone both sides were, neighborly and polite, though not, cordial, and in Lurgan and Portadown there was an uneasy, mutual understanding. During the spring there was a confrontation with the UVF after they raided an OIRA arms dump being stored in a house off the Antrim Road. The officials kidnapped three loyalists from Sandy Row and threatened to shoot them if the weapons were not returned. The men were terrified, literally wetting themselves, but Joe McCann decided to release them. For one of the officials present, talking to the prisoners was a road to Damascus experience, as he discovered that the loyalists were working-class men like yourself. Street clashes continued between troops and nationalists, and the provisionals killed a soldier in February 1971. From that point deadly violence escalated to a degree previously unseen. In Belfast the officials carried out several attacks on troops, without claiming them. Macmillan intimated to journalists that the officials had killed one soldier in Ardoyne during February and another in Derry in early March. In April the OIRA sank a British naval motor launch, the Stork, off Baltimore, Co. Cork. They also blew up the British Ministry of Pensions office on Cork's South Mall, claiming it was used for British Army recruitment. During May Fianna members stoned a Land Rover and drew troops into a chase. This culminated in an ambush in the markets in which Corporal Robert Bankier was fatally wounded. The OIRA found that they had, kind of stumbled into, an armed campaign with. No great strategy, the Brits were coming in and causing havoc, and, you couldn't have sat and done nothing. In early July an open-air sailie was held by the officials to commemorate the Falls curfew. Thousands of, Ogli na Aran, Battle of the Falls 1970 feet badges were distributed. The event was also marked with violence. Two soldiers were shot on the Falls, there was an attack on the army post at Tyrone House on the Malone Road, and the Fianna carried out dozens of nail bomb attacks on troops. Significantly, the official IRA claimed these attacks and promised more, though the consensus among the organization's leadership was still that a revolutionary situation had not yet developed. In a magazine interview Golding outlined his thoughts on urban guerrilla warfare, drawing upon examples ranging from Black Hugh O'Neill's defense of Clonmel in the 17th century to the tactics of the Israeli Irgun and the Tupamaros in Uruguay. From his studies he had drawn a number of lessons. Firstly, there was a need to have at least passive support from the urban population, though through trade union activity this could be developed into a more active factor. It is not the same to attack a state with its full force intact as a state half paralyzed with strikes. Secondly, pointing to a failure of Connolly's Irish Citizen Army and the success of the IRA in Dublin during the War of Independence, he felt it was absurd for the guerrilla to don a uniform out of a misplaced sense of chivalry. Instead, units should be disguised, mobile, and attack without warning. Finally, he claimed that the helicopter in Ireland's Bear Hills ruled out a successful rural guerrilla campaign. In late July there were police raids directed at the officials across the north, with 48 arrested including McGurran, Sullivan and Macmillan. In early August the OIRA's Tyrone O.C. Peter John Monaghan was also jailed. Among documents captured by the RUC during the raids was material relating to Britain, where the officials were attempting to revamp their military structure. There were several new recruits through Clan Na Aran, including some who had been active on the British left. Intelligence was also being gathered on the very lax security at army bases in England. One new recruit was Jim Flynn, a 26-year-old building worker from Crossmaglen. Flynn had contacted Republicans in the Bristol area and met the official's main British organizer in Exeter Railway Station, where he offered his services to the movement. The officials were recruiting from smaller left-wing organizations at home as well.
In Derry the young socialists were generally on good terms with the local OIRA, and during 1971 several of their activists joined the officials. Young socialist Terry Robson had become convinced that tiny groups of people scattered around the place was madness, if we are going to do anything, we will do it within an organization that has the capability of doing something. Within months much of the official organization in Derry was led by these new recruits. During July two men were shot dead by troops in Derry and the local OIRA were pressing for permission to retaliate. In order to maintain control over a growing unit, McGurran was moved up to Derry as a full-time organizer. In early August, with the tempo of violence increasing, the OIRA claimed to have inflicted three fatalities on troops since May. As far as they were concerned the British could only blame themselves for the deaths of their soldiers. Unlike the provosts, who were involved in much more widespread violence, the officials reaffirmed that they were not engaging in an offensive campaign and were fully supporting the civil rights call to get back to the streets in mass mobilizations. Such slogans became increasingly abstract after the night of Monday the 9th of August, when internment without trial was introduced in Northern Ireland. Hundreds of Catholic homes were raided and over 300 men arrested. The ghettos exploded and within four days 23 people were dead and hundreds injured as the North was engulfed in the worst violence since 1920. There were hijackings, burnings, bomb attacks and shootings, and thousands once again fled south. Five people were killed by the army in Ballymurphy alone on the 9th of August. Reports soon emerged of beatings and worse for those who had been interned. On the ground, everyone just said fuck them, get into them, them bastards won't do that to our areas. One of the biggest battles took place on Tuesday the 10th of August in the markets, where Joe McCann and other volunteers occupied the Inglis Bakery and engaged in gunfire with a large force of troops. At one point the British announced that the gunmen had been trapped and killed, only to be embarrassed when it was discovered all had escaped. Loyalists had joined in the fighting, attacking nationalist areas. On the night of the 12th of August there were gun battles between the officials and the UVF on the Grosvenor Road. On Friday morning the British Army reoccupied the Lower Falls in strength after severe gun battles with the OIRA. The officials broadcast warnings of Army and Loyalist movements on Radio Free Belfast, which was being run from a variety of locations across the city. The ferocity of the fighting saw the officials and provisionals thrown into ad hoc cooperation in Belfast. On internment night both officials and provosts were engaged in almost continuous exchanges of fire with the UVF in the Springhill, Springmartin area. Members warned each other of troop movements and, pitched in, when the other organization was engaging the enemy. The first British soldier killed in Tyrone died in a joint official, provisional ambush. On occasion both organizations there swapped ammunition and explosives. Internment also marked the point when both Republican groups turned into substantial organizations. Recruitment to the officials soared, especially in areas where they were already the main organization, and even in weaker areas like Ballymurphy there was a substantial influx. Thousands of Catholics and Protestants left or were forced from their homes and it became almost impossible to work any longer in the wrong area. Contacts between the two communities broke down almost totally. In the aftermath of internment Costello oversaw the setting up of a small active service unit composed of McCann, Anthony Dornan and another Belfast official. McCann's legend was growing, with a photograph of him during the Inglis Bakery battle published on the cover of Life magazine and also featured as an iconic United Irishman front page. McCann and several other OIRA members who were on the run were living in the Omeath area of Co. Louth, a traditional holiday destination for Belfast Catholics. After internment the officials were given access to caravans there and McCann's wife and children moved to the area, but McCann regularly returned to Belfast. He dyed his hair blonde and wore glasses, but still took risks, on one occasion walking his pet wolfhound around an army base near Albert Street to boost local morale. His attitude was evident when he and a comrade were going to see the movie Soldier Blue. While his friend studied opening times, McCann drew a handgun and opened fire on a nearby army checkpoint. Plans of movie watching were abandoned as McCann ran off laughing, his comrade roaring, You mad bastard, what are you doing? Many who met McCann concurred with Padraig Yates that he was an incredible character, the only genuine hero I ever met out of the Northern Troubles. But some felt he lacked discipline and wasn't a team player. In the months after internment gun and bomb attacks were general across the North. In late August the OIRA claimed to have killed four soldiers in attacks in Ardoin, Albert Street and on the Springfield Road. Volunteers remembered, things got a bit haywire, there was open warfare, weapons were left on street corners, in cars overnight, easily accessed, 24 hours a day, people driving and walking about looking for targets. Teams of teenage boys and girls operating in couples left dozens of small incendiary devices in shops, bars and restaurants in Belfast city center. 
The Fianna also carried weapons and scouted ahead of attacks. Targets for OIRA bombs included council offices, customs posts, pubs and shops that served soldiers, police stations and army bases. The OIRA killed a soldier in a landmine attack near Nuri on 6 September. On 21 September they killed another in a sniping attack on Bly's Lane Army Base in Derry. Off-duty soldiers were ambushed in pubs in Belfast city center. For those involved there was little time for reflection on politics. Strategy didn't come into it, it was a day-by-day -day thing, you, didn't have time to stop and think. Activists on the run, used to meet in the morning, decide what was going to happen, just what you were going to do that day and where you were going to sleep that night, all. Up and go every morning. On the 22nd of September two official Fianna members, 18-year-old Rose Curry and 17-year-old Gerard O'Hare, were blown up while preparing a mine in a house on Marion Street. Curry's brother Sean remembered, I had just left my mother's home, my girlfriend Eileen had come in and I was on the run so I wasn't at home much. We were going for a drink in the old house, maybe a five-minute walk. We were just in the bar when we heard the explosion going up the stairs and we thought Jesus, I wonder who that was. There was so many explosions going on then. We had sat down and a friend of mine came in, Harry Highland, and he was ashen, and he called me up and said you'd better get down to your house I think that's your Rose and Gerard O'Hare. Then it came to me, I had passed them 15 minutes before, she was pushing a pram, and she waved and said see you later. Curry, whose father John had been interned in August, was the first female Republican to be killed in Northern Ireland. Gerard O'Hare also came from a Republican family, his father Jimmy, skewbald, O'Hare having been interned during the 1940s. 8,000 people followed their cortege after a Fianna color party had fired volleys over the coffins. On 5 October OIRA volunteers disguised as workmen delivered building materials to an army post on Cooper Street, which was being rebuilt following a bomb attack. The men were searched but after nothing was found they were given access to the post. Once inside they placed a bomb under the building material and left. It exploded, bringing the building down on the soldiers, killing one, and injuring several. OIRA training was intensified with a semi-permanent camp in Kerry and others in Dunlear, the Galti Mountains, Wicklow and Galway. The development and storage of weapons was a dangerous business with the new Munster-based quartermaster losing a hand in an accidental explosion. There was increasing pressure on finance, with men on the run and in prison. At least £600 a week was needed for prisoners' dependents alone, and there was a huge increase in armed crime. During August the OIRA had taken £4,900 in a bank raid on the Ormo Road and £15,000 in a raid on a dairy in Dublin. Banks and post offices had only rudimentary security, and were targeted for substantial sums, while bookmakers were usually handier when you wanted money in a hurry. As a Southern volunteer recalls, this activity had attractions beyond the purely practical. It's impossible to describe the buzz that people actually get from it, okay, you're doing it for a cause, but still, to be in a car, come out of the bank pick up the people, have a police car coming after you, you're speeding, relying on one driver to get you through. Leading officials publicly offered the view that bank robbery was justified if the money was going to further the aims of socialism. The resurgence of nationalist feeling in the South meant that on occasion people carrying out robberies for the North were actually applauded by customers. This attitude was also present in the Irish security forces. When a GHQ member was moving some rifles from Derry to Donegal he was stopped at a Garda checkpoint. The Garda looked in the boot and, couldn't have missed, the rifles, but still waved the OIRA man on. Life on the run brought various kinds of pressure for those involved. A Belfast activist recalls having to lie to his own family about the date of his wedding. It also brought problems for their organizations. As more men came south the pressure to find them work and billets increased. Transport union leader Michael Mullen assisted the officials with this, though he often found that the men failed to show up for the work he'd arrange. Some volunteers drank heavily and caused trouble and there was always the danger that they would dip into robbery proceeds for personal use. Dundalk's proximity to the border and the fact that many Northern Republicans settled there meant that it developed a wild reputation, being nicknamed, El Paso. Mark's bar in the town was an important rendezvous for the OIRA, used extensively by those on the run from the north. Dundalk-born British soldier Private Robert Benner was picked up by the officials when he was visiting his fiancée during November 1971, he was shot dead and his body dumped near the border. There was shock in left-wing circles in Dublin when young socialist Peter Graham was murdered in late October by Soar IR members who were demanding he reveal the whereabouts of money and weapons. In fact most of the arms under his control had already been given to the provisionals. It was not known at the time who killed Graham and his funeral saw a provocative speech from the British-Pakistani Trotskyist Tariq Ali, who warned that there would be revenge for Graham's death. 
In reality Graham's comrades had no way of retaliating against his killers. The officials, who were being blamed by some, met one of Graham's friends to assure him they were not involved in the killing. During October the officials were embarrassed when they held a press conference in Dublin featuring David Seaman, a former British paratrooper who claimed to be a spy with information on British undercover activities in the South. It transpired that Seaman was a psychiatric patient and a fantasist. Internment was taking its toll on the OIRA. In early October Jim Sullivan was captured in Belfast. Seamus Lynch was caught later that month and arrived in Long Kesh having been beaten, black and blue. Over 100 OIRA members had been interned and the British considered that they had been, particularly hard hit. With Macmillan in Dublin, Bobby McKnight took over as O.C. in Belfast, living a precarious life on the run. Paddy Devlin, now an MP for the new Social Democratic and Labour Party, SDLP, drove McKnight around Belfast, using his status as a politician to get him through roadblocks. During the winter life in most northern towns was overshadowed by the intensifying provisional economic bombing campaign. The officials condemned irresponsible bombing of public buildings during working hours, which they predicted would lead to civilian deaths. Sectarian tension meanwhile grew more intense. After provisional bombs killed two people on the Shankle, workers fought each other in Gallagher's tobacco factory. Fifteen Catholics were killed in a loyalist bomb attack on McGurk's Bar in North Queen Street in early December. A week later four Protestants, including two children, were killed by a provisional bomb at a furniture shop on the Shankle. OIRA attitudes to their rivals hardened again, with Seamus Costello stating publicly that, we have no common ground, good, bad or indifferent, with the provisionals. In contrast to the provost, the officials tried to target the property of establishment figures. The homes of businessmen on Belfast's exclusive Malone Road were burnt down by the OIRA while their families were held at gunpoint. During December the officials blew up or burnt down property owned by unionists in Belfast, Derry and Newry. They also shot dead 65-year-old Senator Jack Barnhill at his home in Straban, before destroying his home with a bomb. It was the first killing of a politician in Northern Ireland since 1922. The official leadership declared that, while workers are subject to British military atrocities, the leading proponents of that policy must expect reprisals against them. The impossibility of waging a clean campaign was apparent, however, when an attack on Royal Marines in Newry saw one soldier badly wounded but several local women also hit by OIRA gunfire. So as the new year began the official leadership faced a dilemma. Unlike the provisionals, who declared that 1972 would be the year of victory, the OIRA made clear that a military victory was impossible. But the military situation made it difficult to achieve progress on other fronts. As a GHQ member recalls, there was so much to retaliate for, there was so much defense, we couldn't keep up, we were effectively in an unplanned chaotic armed struggle without having decided to be in one. The idea of using military attacks strictly as backup to a political campaign of civil disobedience, what one official supporter described as mass civilian agitation, tempered with selective and non-sectarian military action, was unrealistic. A document captured by the British also pointed towards increased concerns within the OIRA over the impact of security measures. The entire security of our organization is in danger. This emphasizes that we cannot survive for much longer with present losses of men and stuff. Only the ending of internment and repression will work here. Another cause for concern was the loyalist backlash. The UVF and local paramilitary groups were growing rapidly. Thousands of Protestant youths were becoming part of Tartan gangs that clashed with nationalists and carried out sectarian attacks on Catholics. There was increasing violence in towns like Lurgan, where the family home of OIRA internee Martin O'Hagan was burnt out in early 1972. A local Tartan gang member was kneecapped by the OIRA in retaliation for attacks on Catholics. There was undeniable support for wider anti-Protestant attacks. In Straban the killing of Barnhill had been seen as sectarian and was very popular as a result. But Macmillan and his staff are recalled as having been intensely concerned that anything they did could not be construed as an attack on the Protestant people. There was a strong perception in some areas that Dublin was not supplying adequate arms and equipment. Many units were still operating with Lee Enfields, Thompsons and Sten guns. One estimate of the OIRA's armament in Derry City was two M1 carbines, two Thompsons, one Sten, two Lee Enfields, a Garand, a .303 hunting rifle, an SLR and a few handguns. Joe McCann complained that not enough gear was being moved north, on one occasion getting into a shouting match with the official's quartermaster general in Gardiner Street. His militancy led to him being the subject of numerous disciplinary hearings, which he often ignored. In North Armagh and Tyrone, Units began raiding the homes of soldiers in the Ulster Defence Regiment, UDR, to capture SLRs and Stirlings. 
However, some older volunteers in these areas were happier with a more restrained policy. A Tyrone provisional recalled that, the typical provo in 1971 or 72 was 18, 19, 20 years of age while at the same time the typical official, in Tyrone, was maybe, 35 or 36 feet. Age and having families made a marked difference to most people's willingness to take risks. In Derry the violence had developed a distinctive momentum of its own, with crowds of young men and teenagers known as the Derry Young Hooligans ritually fighting battles with soldiers on the edge of the bogside. One member of the Derry command staff recalled, it used to remind me of the Zulu warriors, standing up at the roundabout in the Cregan. We could see the troops fighting down in William Street. Saturday at three o'clock like clockwork, you'd have Martin McGuinness and the boys over there, and the Stickies, which were in the majority at the time up on the hill. They'd be setting up operations, so we're standing there, do this and do that, move them in etc. The existence of the no-go area of free dairy gave the OIRA considerable leeway. The local OIRA usually patrolled Cregan in cars and kept weapons in these or in a dump behind a local chemist's shop. In January 1972 a 21-year-old British soldier visiting his fiancée was captured by the officials in the bogside. After questioning him they let him go unharmed and issued a statement explaining that killing the soldier would have served no purpose. The provisionals responded by denouncing the officials for their diabolical action and accusing them of letting down the people of Free Dairy. On the 22nd of January a civil rights protest at nearby McGilligan Strand had seen serious army violence and Nicra had called another march for Sunday the 30th of January in Derry. Malachy McGurran assured civil rights activist Bridget Bond that there would be no OIRA activity before or during the march. On the day of the march almost all the OIRA's weapons were left in Cregan because there were fears that the British might attempt an incursion there. Most members went on the demonstration unarmed. However, at an early stage two people were shot and wounded by troops and OIRA members took a .303 rifle from a car in Columcal Court and fired one shot in response. Later paratroopers burst into Rossville Street and opened fire, killing 13 people and fatally wounding another. In Rossville Flats Courtyard an OIRA man lost his temper after seeing people shot and fired at troops using a handgun. Later that evening OIRA volunteer Mickey Doherty was slightly wounded in an exchange of fire with soldiers. Across nationalist Ireland the response to Bloody Sunday was ferocious, with three days of strikes, marches and rallies. At a demonstration outside the British Embassy in Dublin's Marion Square, Seamus Costello announced that notice to quit was being served on the occupants of the building. There were baton charges and attempts to rush the building with McGurran warning the marchers that the Guardi would perform the same role as the Paris if the power of the establishment in Dublin was threatened. OIRA members tried to blow down the embassy door. One remembered. We were in Omeath and Costello phoned us to go down to Dublin and organize a bit of turmoil. Students told us that they were going to carry coffins, it was decided to try and put something inside one of the coffins, get as close to the embassy door as we could, it took a bit of doing, the coffin came back and forward to us a few times. A few, coffins, were placed against the door, Joe, McCann myself and two other guys put it up. It ignited, but the crowd had already attacked the guards and everybody started to scatter. We hadn't planned our getaway too well and I ran back to the Shelburne, and, into the arms of the guards, who battered the crap out of me. After two more days of marches and rioting the building was finally burnt down. Shortly after Bloody Sunday the OIRA killed former para-David Seaman and dumped his body in Armagh. They also killed Thomas McCann, a 19-year-old British soldier from Drimna in Dublin who had been home on leave. His body was found near the monaghan fermanagh border. Not surprisingly, Bloody Sunday led to further recruitment to the officials. As one recruit explained, Bloody Sunday did it for me. I was the right age at the wrong time. Weighing up the option of joining the officials or the provost he reasoned that he wanted to defend his local area but not destroy Belfast city centre. For his first operation he was given an M1 carbine and told to have a bladder at an army post. Defense of their localities was a strong motivation for many OIRA recruits. When one official prisoner was told to go to an education class, he responded, education for fucking what? I joined to defend my area and you told me I could. After the officials in Belfast's Unity Flats fired on loyalist rioters they explained that while they wished to avoid sectarian conflict, they had to protect the people of the area. Other young recruits in this period were also swayed by day-to-day -day experience. One Newry teenager remembered, getting the odd dig from the Brits, you can't go into town if you're with a girlfriend, or you're humiliated, you're getting stopped going to school and your lunchbox is being checked and they drop it, there was this build up all the time of an anger. Joining the OIRA offered him a sense of defiance and strength and power. 
The official leadership had decided prior to Bloody Sunday that retaliatory action must be extended to include the assassination of top political personnel, the kidnapping of same and the destruction of property. In Lurgan the officials raided the home of a former unionist mayor of the town and shot him while he was in his bath. He was dragged outside while his house was burnt down. The army council gave the go-ahead for an attack on the headquarters of the Paris at Aldershot in Hampshire. On the morning of Tuesday the 22nd of February a blue Ford Cortina car, its boot packed with 200 pounds of explosives stolen from a quarry in Somerset, was driven into the base and parked outside the office's mess. At 12.45 p.m. it exploded, flattening the front of the building and killing five women cleaners, a gardener and an army padre. The officials initially claimed that they had killed at least 12 officers. They expressed regret for the civilian dead but argued that responsibility lay totally with the British authorities while the attack showed the capacity of the IRA to strike back at the very hearts of those who impose a reign of terror on the Irish people. Back in Dublin the Guardi moved quickly, arresting Golding, Ryan, Garland and Tony Heffernan, among others. But just three days after Aldershot, John Taylor, the Unionist Minister for Home Affairs, was shot six times in the head and body as he sat in his car in Armagh, miraculously he survived. The officials were unapologetic about the shooting of the arch bigot, Taylor. Golding later reflected that Prime Minister Brian Faulkner might have been an even more enticing target, but that availability of target matters too. The OIRA planned both prestige type operations to illustrate the effectiveness of their targeted reprisals. On the day Taylor was shot, the officials bombed an army post in Dungiven, Co. Derry and claimed to have killed a soldier. At the end of the month, the OIRA shot dead police sergeant Thomas Morrow in Newry after he responded to a hoax call. Mistakes, such as Aldershot, could not be dwelt on, a volunteer recalls. You couldn't step back, it was a dangerous thing. To introduce doubt, if you introduce doubt then where the fuck do you end up? In early March British police arrested Noel Jenkinson, Finbar Kisson and Michael Dignan in London in connection with the Aldershot bombing. Jenkinson, 42 years of age from a Protestant background in Co. Meath, was identified as the key suspect. He had emigrated in the 1950s and been involved in communist and Maoist politics. During 1969 he joined the IRA in London. The police had traced the three men's involvement through the engine number of the Ford Cortina used in the attack. The men had been instructed to steal a car but had instead used a false driving license to hire one. The same license had been used in a case involving a car accident during 1971, and once the engine number was known the police were able to trace those who hired the car. Jenkinson was sentenced to 30 years in jail for the Aldershot bombing, with his co-defendants receiving lesser terms. By late 1972 there were 10 OIRA men in jail in Britain. One response to the upsurge of violence after Bloody Sunday was the abolition of Stormont by the British government and its replacement by direct rule, a move which, the officials argued, simply consolidated British control. After the abolition of Stormont the provisional IRA declared a 72-hour ceasefire, but the officials continued attacks, shooting soldiers in Newry, Derry and Belfast. During an attack on troops in Leeson Street, a 24-year-old mother of one, Bernadette Hindman, was shot dead. She had stepped out of her doorway as a gunman opened fire and was hit twice. During late February in Derry 16-year-old official Fianna member Jerry Doherty was killed accidentally while using a defective weapon. In early March the OIRA in the city killed UDR officer Marcus McCausland. In areas where they were strong the OIRA had also been carrying out punishment attacks on antisocial elements. There was controversy when a 15-year-old girl had her head shaved and was tarred and feathered on the lower falls after being accused by the officials of informing. In response to the criticism they declared that, she was lucky, that they had not shot her. Better publicity was derived from actions such as the hijacking of coal trucks near Newry. Most of the coal was emptied out onto the road for locals to collect, an OIRA statement saying the action was in support of the striking coal miners of England, and warning, strike breakers, that similar treatment will be meted out to them unless they cease these activities immediately. This and similar OIRA actions led British Prime Minister Ted Heath to inquire if that organization had schemes to promote industrial action in Northern Ireland along the lines of the recent miners' strike. He was reassured that the sectarian divisions among workers made Republican-inspired strike action of that scale unlikely. In early April the officials carried out an attack on a UDR patrol near Cookstown in an action designed to teach these bully boys a lesson. On the 10th of April they killed two soldiers with a booby trap bomb in Derry. In Belfast, however, there was a gradual reduction in offensive activities, the aim being to scale down activities in areas where there was relative calm, in the hope that peaceful, mass civil disobedience could be revived. Any hope of this was soon shattered. 
Joe McCann's status as one of the most wanted men in the North had not stopped him regularly returning to Belfast. As one of his comrades recalls, he was an accident waiting to happen. He attended the wedding of a close friend, who was also on the run, on the falls in early April. Shortly afterwards McCann and a comrade had a narrow escape from the special branch in Belfast city center. At 3.15 p.m. on 15 April British Army radios buzzed with reports that in Joy Street, Hamilton Street man shot maybe Joe McCann details later, confirmation soon followed that McCann was indeed dead. He had been due to meet a comrade in Kelly's Cellars pub but was spotted by detectives walking through the markets. They called in paratroopers who shot McCann several times as he tried to escape. As news of his death emerged, Belfast exploded with the worst violence since internment night. The British Army claimed that they were attacked on 84 separate occasions in the Davis Flats area alone in the two days after McCann's death. The officials patrolled openly in Turf Lodge, driving around the area in a Land Rover bearing the legend, Official IRA, Mobile Patrol. A soldier was killed by the OIRA at Durham Street, and in Derry two soldiers were killed by the OIRA in separate sniping attacks. In Newry a detective was shot five times in the head and body after being lured by the OIRA into an ambush. McCann's funeral was one of the biggest Republican events in Belfast to that date. Over 5,000 people walked behind the cortege led by 21 OIRA companies marching in formation. In his oration Golding warned that, those who are responsible for the terrorism that is Britain's age-old reaction to Irish demands will be the victims of that terrorism, paying richly in their own red blood for their crimes and the crimes of their imperial masters. Four MPs, Paddy Devlin, Paddy Kennedy, Paddy O'Hanlon and Bernadette Devlin, attended the funeral. Imprisoned UVF leader Gusty Spence offered, deepest and profoundest sympathy, to McCann's widow, he was a soldier of the Republic and I a volunteer of Ulster and we made no apology for what we are. Joe once did a good turn indirectly and I never forgot him for his humanity. Spence was referring to the release of the three men captured in Sandy Row during 1971. Despite Golding's threats the OIRA leadership was seriously considering calling a halt to offensive activities. They had already stated that RUC and UDR officers were not to be targeted except in clear cases of retaliation. Events in Derry in May 1972 brought this question to a head. Ranger William Best, a 19-year-old soldier, had returned home to Derry on leave from Germany. He ignored a warning from the officials that he should leave Cregan. The OIRA had released a captured soldier in January but after Bloody Sunday this was unlikely to happen again. On the 19th of May Manus Deary, a 15-year-old, was killed by a British soldier. Deary's death sealed Ranger Best's fate, he was picked up the next day and shot dead. The killing sparked a major controversy in Derry, with angry protest marches to the officials' headquarters and a mass meeting of 2,000 people at which Johnny White was shouted down when he attempted to explain the official position. Some of the reaction to Best's death was genuine shock at the killing of a local youth who had taken no part in British operations in Northern Ireland, but it was also politically driven, especially by the Catholic Church. Local priests stated that the OIRA were being used by international communism and were not welcome in Derry. The officials responded that they were not a Catholic organization. The provisionals jumped on the bandwagon, demanding that Marxist officials get out of Derry. Better dead than red, graffiti appeared in the bogside. Johnny White was summoned south to answer charges over the killing and was surprised to find real aggression directed towards him. While those in Derry felt that they had been fighting a clean war, it was as against the state rather than against the guys on the other side of the fence. Others had a more dubious view, seeing them as the wild bunch, who were even at the best of times likely to do anything. Some at GHQ felt that McGurran had become the spokesperson for Derry, and his judgment had been marred as a result. A meeting of local OCs and members of GHQ was called to discuss a possible ceasefire at Mornington on the weekend of the 27th to the 28th of May. The fallout from the best killing was one factor. It was seen as reflecting a decline in nationalist tolerance for violence, while Aldershot highlighted the political pitfalls of military actions. But the growth of sectarianism was the major issue. The loyalist vanguard movement led by James Craig was leading a general strike in protest at Stormont's suspension. The strike had won mass support among Protestants but was also accompanied by widespread intimidation. The Ulster Defence Association, UDA, which had emerged from various loyalist vigilante groups and was not illegal, had held its first mass rallies during May, at which thousands of masked men paraded in military fashion. The number of Catholic victims of sectarian assassination was rising. 40 people would die during May alone. Despite their condemnations the officials felt they were being tarred by association with the provost bombs, which killed 14 civilians during the spring. Within the Dublin OIRA the view that any continuance of the campaign necessitated getting rid of the provost, 
otherwise you were going to get involved in a war that you had no control over, amounted to an argument. In favor of cessation, Omer Chu recalls supporting the proposed ceasefire because the thing had gone completely overboard, defense and retaliation had meant that there was no stop to military action, there was no strategy, it was continually reactive. At a very sullen gathering only Johnny White argued completely against a ceasefire, while Costello was felt to be less enthusiastic he was not vocal in his opposition. Frustration was expressed by J.P. Mullen from Tyrone, who asked, who can we shoot? The answer was special branch officers, who would not be covered by the ceasefire terms. On the 29th of May the OIRA publicly announced an indefinite ceasefire, and stated that this step had been taken to avoid dissent into full-scale sectarian civil war. They claimed that the move had come following representations by the Republican clubs. The statement demanded that all internees be released, that there be an amnesty for all political prisoners and that troops be withdrawn from the streets. The ceasefire was conditional and the OIRA maintained the right to defend any area under aggressive attack by the British military or by sectarian forces from either side. In Belfast the ceasefire went down like a lead balloon. Many felt that we were going to look like wimps in the face of the Brits and cowards in the face of the provosts. One official prisoner remembers arguing against the ceasefire because he thought it was coming at the wrong time, and in some respects for the wrong reasons. We had allowed the provost to set the agenda, we had become a bit inward looking, and at the same time, their sectarianism was a reason for our ceasefire. A further problem was that there was practically no consultation with us as prisoners. Is. A myriad of arguments were used to sell the ceasefire, many of which presented it as a purely tactical move to gain a breathing space and win prisoner releases. As an OIRA officer recalls, I was in Long Kesh at the time. It was more or less accepted. It was put across mostly as a tactic, that we would carry on with whatever activities we wanted to carry on with but this was a tactic to give us time to reorganize. It was reckoned that the official movement had never been at war and to call a ceasefire was just an exercise. As long as the Brits kept doing stuff we could keep doing stuff back against them. Most people accepted it and a lot of stuff did go on afterwards. One of the desired effects of the ceasefire took place. 75 official internees were released in early June and the rest by the autumn. There was a view that the provosts were going to run themselves into the ground and that the OIRA, better organized and disciplined, would then renew the struggle. A number of volunteers who opposed the ceasefire left the OIRA. Most who were unhappy simply dropped out, while a few, such as Francis Hughes in South Derry, eventually joined the provisionals. There was particular dissatisfaction among the Belfast Fianna, the official Fianna, had their own dumps, were carrying out their own operations and gained a reputation as a third army. A meeting was organized in Dundalk between the officials GHQ and Belfast Fianna to discuss widespread rumors of unauthorized robberies and a feuding with provosts. The GHQ officers didn't want operations that led to young fellas getting shot, because while for a brief period the victim might be a hero, in ten years' time there's nobody that'll want to know about them. GHQ staff also counseled restraint in dealing with their rivals, because though it might be tempting to hit some stupid troublesome bastard, a row with a provo is doing nothing to free Ireland. The Fianna representatives expressed frustration that they were being criticized for doing things that the OIRA were also doing. One officer felt that the OIRA were happy enough to use the youngsters, but if they were caught, it's them Fianna again. In fact very little changed in terms of OIRA operations for some time. In Belfast particularly the OIRA was more active militarily than it had been in the month before the ceasefire. But after the ceasefire many officials reported an increase in petty harassment by provosts who were calling them rusty guns and accusing them of surrender. On the 19th of June provisionals raided the cracked cup and in a scuffle 37-year-old Desmond Mackin was shot in the legs with a machine gun. Witnesses alleged that the provost prevented aid from reaching Mackin, who bled to death. Mackin was not a member of the OIRA but was from a well-known Republican family. His brother Brendan, an official, had just taken part in a hunger strike in Crumlin Road and his son Desi was a member of the provost. His death led to considerable bitterness, and low-level confrontations between the rival groups continued on a day-to-day -day basis. You couldn't let anything go. The officials felt that some provosts, such as the Lower Falls O. C. Brendan Hughes, did their best to avoid conflict, but they regarded many of the other provosts in that area as low-life types. The provisionals called their own ceasefire on the 26th of June and several of their leaders were flown to talks with the British government. The OIRA criticized the provost for dealing with the British and argued the talks were useless and irrelevant. For a fortnight there was relative peace on the streets until the provost resumed their campaign after confrontations in Lenadoon. The breakdown of the ceasefire led to intense violence, with over 70 people killed in the next month. In Belfast OIRA units were involved in dozens of shootings. 
On the night of the 10th of July they were involved in a three-hour gun battle with the UDA in the Lower Falls. The OIRA also killed two loyalists on the Grosvenor Road after they had stopped them at one of their roadblocks. The loyalists mistook the officials for fellow Protestant paramilitaries and boasted that they had just killed a Catholic, whose body was dumped in the boot of their car. On the 25th of July the OIRA shot dead a Protestant, Arthur Kenna, who was part of a mob trying to invade Roden Street. The officials also suffered several losses. 14-year-old Fianna member David McCafferty was killed by the British Army in Springhill while trying to drag a local priest to safety after he'd been shot, and two days later 17-year-old official Gerald Gibson was shot dead by troops in Andersonstown. On the 14th of July Ted Brady, an officer in the Beachmount unit, was shot dead by soldiers during a battle in Old Park. In Straban 18-year-old Tobias Malloy, an official Fianna member, died after being struck by a rubber bullet during a confrontation with troops. During his funeral, which featured an OIRA firing party, soldiers fired rubber bullets at the cortege and rioting broke out. Later that night the OIRA shot a soldier in Straban. Billy McBurney was shot by loyalists in an assassination attempt, targeted because the British Army had alleged publicly that he was the OIRA's finance officer. Joseph Rosado, father of official activist Tony Rosado, was shot dead in North Belfast. Initially the officials blamed loyalists but suspicion soon fell on the provisionals, who had perhaps been intending an attack on his son. Responding to the deaths of five of its supporters, the OIRA warned that, retribution, would be exacted, but without civilian casualties. But the month would be remembered for the deaths of nine people, seven of them civilians, and the injuries to 130 others caused by the provisional IRA on the 21st of July, which became known as, Bloody Friday. Standing on the falls that morning a group of officials speculated on the number of familiar faces driving by and commented that something big was up. Twenty bombs detonated within an hour, bringing havoc to Belfast city centre. The officials argued that while the flame of sectarianism had originally been lit by the British government and maintained by Orangism, it was now being fanned by every bomb. The officials still claimed to respect the courage and sincerity of ordinary provisionals, but they warned that the inevitable outcome of the bombing campaign would be civil war. Bloody Friday gave the excuse that the British needed to penetrate Belfast and Derry's no-go areas. On the 31st of July, Operation Motorman took place, with 1,500 troops backed up by 300 armoured vehicles reoccupying Free Derry. Neither the officials nor the provisionals attempted to resist militarily. The Derry officials instead tried to launch a campaign of civil disobedience. On the day of Motorman nine people were killed by a provisional IRA bomb in the village of Cloudy in Co. Derry. The officials lamented that the people of Cloudy were lost for many, many years to the Republican cause. There were still contradictions in local attitudes. Nine more people died in a premature bomb explosion at Newry Customs Station. Three of the dead were provisional IRA members, one of whom, Oliver Rountree, had left the officials earlier in the year. His brother Coleman had remained with the OIRA, and as a result Rountree's funeral had both official and provisional firing parties and an OIRA statement praised the brave volunteers, who had died in the explosion. But in Belfast confrontation continued after the killing of a Protestant man, James Neal. Neal and another man had been involved in a car crash on the Springfield Road. They were picked up by rival IRA patrols, with each organization taking a prisoner. The provost decided Neal was a loyalist spy and killed him. The OIRA questioned their prisoner, judged him innocent and let him go, arguing there was absolutely no reason to kill this man. The provost then accused the officials of cowardice and the OIRA responded that they would not take life in such an inane cowboy fashion. Around this period the manner in which some units of the OIRA were operating began to worry Belfast members. From early 1972 an English criminal, Kenneth Littlejohn, had been active with a group of officials in the South Down area. Littlejohn had been introduced through an OIRA member's relative as a guy who arranges bank robberies. He took part in a number of raids in the area during the spring and his brother Keith also became involved. The group carried out a robbery at the Hillgrove Hotel in Monaghan, after which Gardy discovered an arms dump and made arrests. One volunteer became very suspicious of Littlejohn, who incessantly argued for robberies in Dublin, as if he wanted to make a few waves. He noticed that Littlejohn and his colleagues were wearing new clothes and socializing a lot. He refused to go on robberies with them, but other local officials continued to vouch for the Englishman. Little John constantly sought information about OIRA operations and often brought people on drinking sessions while not imbibing himself. On the 18th of September 32-year-old Edmund Woolsey, the owner of the Ulster Hotel in Warren Point, was killed by a car bomb. Woolsey was a supporter of the OIRA and his death set alarm bells ringing. 
Woolsey's car had been stolen and the RUC informed him that it had been found and he could pick it up at Glass Drummond. When Woolsey went to collect his car he was killed and several of his companions injured by a booby trap bomb. The suspicion grew that Littlejohn had set up Woolsey in the hope of killing members of the officials. During October the Littlejohn gang robbed £67,000 from the AIB in Dublin's Grafton Street, the biggest robbery in the state's history, but their triumph was short-lived as they were caught within a few weeks. At their trial the Littlejohns claimed that they had been sent to Ireland to infiltrate the OIRA, which, after Aldershot, British intelligence services had decided was the most dangerous paramilitary organization. They also claimed that they were asked to kill Garland, Costello and Sean Max Steofen. The official who first suspected Littlejohn still doubts this account. I think, Littlejohn, was a bank robber, an opportunist, who got involved with the IRA and realized he got kudos back home by reporting this, to get himself out of trouble. But British intelligence knew that the Littlejohns were coming to Ireland and did not inform the Irish authorities, which suggests some pre-planning. In late September 20-year-old Patricia McKay, an OIRA member from Devis Flats, was involved in a major gun battle on the falls, during which a soldier and a provisional were killed. Provo leader Brendan Hughes remembered, during the fighting I ended up in the same small house as her. The Brits had us pinned down with heavy gunfire from the direction of Conway Mill. She insisted on moving out and making a break for it, my only regret at her being in the official IRA was that I could not order her to sit tight. As McKay broke cover she was gunned down. The officials warned that there would be, merciless reprisals. However, the scope for such action was becoming much narrower. Very tight control was being exercised over the ability of local units to carry out attacks, one volunteer recalling, you couldn't lift a screwdriver without the permission of the staff. One of McKay's friends joined the provisionals as a result. The leadership policy was not applied uniformly on the ground. On one occasion a local O.C. was approached in a pub by volunteers who wanted permission to open fire on an army patrol. He argued that a preemptive attack was not justified and refused to sanction it. The men were leaving disappointed when a member of the IRA executive arrived and they asked his view. Ah, oh, go on and give him a bladder, was the response. On the 16th of October the British Army shot dead the officials Tyrone O. C. John Pat Mullen and another volunteer, Hugh Heron, near Coag. At Mullen's funeral Golding warned that the men's deaths would not go unavenged. When there was no major retaliation, frustration increased. There was also irritation over the policy of not claiming attacks, which simply allowed the provisionals to take the credit for them. As an OIRA member recalled, when somebody in one area did a job and it wasn't claimed, nobody in other areas knew who did it. There was a general feeling that nothing much was being done. Opposition to the ceasefire began to coalesce around Costello and was expressed at the IRA convention held in a seafront mansion in Dalkey, Co. Dublin, in October 1972. While much of the criticism was based around military policy, some members, like Ronnie Bunting, now O.C. of Turf Lodge, whose unit included a particularly active group known as the Dirty Dozen, were also hostile to the political direction of the movement. In Derry, despite the appointment of an O.C. who was loyal to the leadership, there was no support for the ceasefire at all. The provosts were continuing the war and we weren't and I suppose our egos took a fair knock at the time because we still felt we had the capability of continuing. Costello and Garland argued that the national question should now become the primary focus. They were opposed by Golding and Maggiola, who urged continued concentration on civil rights and attempts to win Protestant support. The competing positions were presented and after protracted discussions it was decided that both documents be submitted to general meetings of each command area to assess their opinion. Each command would then instruct its delegates on the attitude to adopt at a reconvened convention. Delegates also heard Costello report that over the two years since the last convention the movement's income had been £92,000, £70,000 came as the direct result of operations and £22,000 from USA etc. Of this £22,378 had been spent on weapons. The question of the OIRA's political direction came to a head at a second convention held in the lead-up to the 1972 Sinn Féin Ard Thais. From 10.30 p.m. on 9 December until the meeting's conclusion at 6 the next morning, 41 delegates debated the movement's direction. With 25 proxy votes allowed for those units whose representatives had failed to attend but whose mandated position was known, Garland and Costello's document seeking a return to the high road to the Republic was approved by 48 votes to 18. Costello then proposed a new strategy document, The Way Forward, which outlined how the new policy might be implemented, including a return to more aggressive military activity. These proposals were supported by the majority of Northern delegates, but it was decided the document should be discussed by OIRA units before any changes in strategy were endorsed. Owen Omer Chu, who had strongly opposed the policy change, was dismayed at Garland's approach. 
Basically Garland was saying one day it's civil rights and another it's republican-ism, and because we are not talking about the republic we are leaving that ground to the provost. Then the whole confidence went out of the civil rights movement, if you accepted Garland's position, it was logical to support Costello. If you wanted to compete for the republican high ground and civil rights was only a tactic, then you had to have an armed struggle, in cooperation with the provost or not. Despite the ceasefire the OIRA was continuing to seek arms supplies. During the summer of 1972 Omer Chu was in Beirut, meeting representatives of the PLO to discuss shipments. With his pockets, stuffed full of cash, he met Abu Jihad, the Fatah military commander, with promising results. There were two more meetings in Lebanon, which Golding also attended, when Golding began to emphasize the potential for conflict with the provisionals, a subject the PLO were not interested in, the deal fell through. There were still no arms forthcoming from the Soviets. KGB agent Oleg Lylan, who had defected to Britain during 1971, informed the intelligence services about talks between the Irish communists and Moscow regarding aid for the officials. In 1972 Mick O'Reardon made another request, pointing out that there had been no leak of information over the previous two years. He suggested that if the Soviets were still worried then the connection could be made through Cuba instead. During the autumn the OIRA did receive a shipment of Swedish Lungman automatic rifles from their Canadian contacts. A small number of Armalite Arkansas 18 rifles also arrived from U.S. sources. In New York, an OIRA supporter, Patrick Purcell, was arrested on gun-running charges, having personally bought 56 weapons between June and December 1971 but the main organizer of the American shipments was an experienced and cautious man who avoided attention. During September, loyalist Ted Pavis, who had supplied arms and explosives to the OIRA, was killed by the UVF, who suspected him of stealing weapons from their dumps. The British Prime Minister had been apprised in late August of what his intelligence services thought OIRA intentions were. Information derived from a delicate source outlined the officials' interest in penetrating the trade union movement and in industrial action and their aim of cooperating with working-class Protestants. The British believed that the military potential of the OIRA was unimpaired, despite their ceasefire but that while the organization had the capacity to resume they feared touching off widespread sectarian fighting. The officials were also trying to professionalize their own intelligence gathering. In October all command intelligence officers were circulated with a document instructing them to collate information on members of rival political groups the security forces and journalists and to tighten their own structures against infiltration. Units were asked, do you have members in the state services, the post office, state companies, local government, and do your members have friends or acquaintances in the government forces? In December the official leadership responded to internal pressure by sanctioning several attacks on army bases with mortars that had been developed and tested at camps in the south. The results were mixed, with a number of mortars missing their targets and others failing to explode. A soldier was killed in Lurgan when a shell detonated while he was examining one of the abandoned mortars in Kitchen Hill. The attacks were unclaimed. On the 15th of December the officials in Lurgan were waiting to carry out a robbery when an RUC patrol arrived on the scene. The police were delivering Christmas presents to a local child who had been injured by one of their vehicles earlier in the year. The OIRA attacked the patrol, shot dead Constable George Chambers and stole his machine gun. On the same day a part-time UDR man, Frederick Greaves, was killed by the OIRA leaving his workplace in Armagh. In response to these attacks the provisional IRA issued a statement querying the status of the NLF ceasefire, citing the Kitchen Hill attack and the Santa Claus killing of Constable Chambers. By 1973 the issue of sectarian violence was to the fore in Northern Ireland. During 1973 over 40 Catholics were killed by loyalists in Belfast alone. The community in which the officials were based was under almost constant attack. In at least two cases loyalists killed the fiancés of OIRA members. Officials conducted patrols in areas like Bonmore and the Ormo Road to counter loyalist assassins. For some members of the OIRA, under siege, in South Belfast, loyalists were the main enemy. During April, Robert Scruff Millen, a Protestant member of the officials, was shot dead by the UVF while on vigilante duty in McClure Street. The officials shot a loyalist in South Belfast in retaliation but there was disagreement as to whether this was the best way to respond to sectarianism. Some thought that, if retaliation took place it would stop it, it was just emotion, emotion ruled everything in the areas at that time, logical thought didn't come into it. The other response was to try to convince at least some of the loyalist paramilitaries that these killings were counterproductive. Both the UDA and UVF at various stages claimed to be against sectarian assassinations, and there was talk among the officials of joint patrols with the UDA in West Belfast. 
In Belfast a line of communication was established whereby Protestants or Catholics who found themselves in the Rom Long Bar, there being two pubs of that name, one on the Shankle and one on the Falls, were escorted to Northumberland Street and handed over. Some officials involved in retaliatory attacks on loyalists were also involved in talks with them. Pressure also remained for attacks on the British Army. As Ballymurphy official Mary McMahon recalls, units tried to assert themselves by having a shot at a soldier and it was always covered by the terms of the ceasefire, because there was never a day in the week when the soldiers didn't do something that didn't warrant retaliation, you know, if that was your thinking. For example in early March 1973, 12-year-old Kevin Heatley was shot and killed by the army in Newry. The OIRA responded with over a dozen attacks and a soldier was killed by a booby trap bomb after being lured to a cottage at Mullabon. In Armagh the officials attacked a patrol in Ogle Street but as they made their withdrawal British soldiers in concealed positions opened fire, killing 18-year-old Peter James, Jake, McGarrigan and wounding a comrade. Local people ensured that all the forensics and the guns and that were got away, as were the combat fatigues. The officials would strenuously deny the young men had been armed and on active service when they were shot. A day later the local OIRA quartermaster, 19-year-old Tony Hughes, was shot dead while moving weapons for a retaliatory attack. The Army Council gave permission for general attacks in response. During April operations were carried out in Armagh, Newry, Lurgan, Derry and Belfast. A bomb was placed in the car of a UDR mechanic who worked at Goff Barracks and he unwittingly drove it. Inside, it exploded at lunchtime, injuring nine people. Several activists were captured during the operations, among them Martin O'Hagan after a gun battle in Lurgan. The officials claimed that they had killed seven soldiers and wounded twenty more and warned that they would continue to retaliate for murderous attacks. In reality, this was the last general use of the retaliation policy. The one thing that never stopped, a Belfast volunteer recalls, was the robberies. During August the OIRA stole several thousand pounds from the Central Postal Sorting Office in Belfast. An OIRA volunteer dressed in a postman's uniform took a taxi to the office where he jumped into the back of a delivery van and asked for a lift. Once the van had passed an army post the man pulled a gun and demanded to be taken to the falls. The OIRA were waiting for the van and its contents were robbed. The amount stolen was a pleasant surprise, one participant recalling, we didn't know what to do with it. The volunteers involved got five pounds each for their efforts. In early June loyalists carried out a number of killings in West Belfast. In response the OIRA picked up David Walker, a 16-year-old mentally retarded Protestant boy, on suspicion of being a loyalist spy. He was taken to the Lower Falls, questioned about recent murders, then shot dead and his body dumped in O'Neill Street. The officials said nothing about Walker's death, but two OIRA men were arrested and one was jailed for life. In the days after Walker's death the UDA stabbed Catholic Senator Paddy Wilson and his girlfriend Irene Andrews to death. They claimed it was in response to the killing of Walker and later asserted that Wilson and Andrews had supplied information to the officials. One of the OIRA's supply lines was disrupted during July 1973 when Canadian police raided a flat in Toronto and found sub-machine guns. This led to Gardy searching a ship at Dublin port and discovering a ton of arms and ammunition, including armalites. They then arrested a Monaghan man at Dublin airport arriving on a flight from Canada. During the same month OIRA officer Pat Bracken, a 28-year-old joiner, was shot dead by the UVF in the Lower Falls. Trouble also flared again with the provisionals in Belfast. Tension had been growing in Ballymurphy, where leading Provo Jim Bryson was harassing officials. Bryson had acquired a legendary status within the provisionals, though many officials saw him as little more than a bully. Ronnie Bunting and others wanted action and a decision was taken to kill Bryson. Armed officials were searching for him but he had been alerted and was also driving around in a car looking for them when he was ambushed by British troops. Bryson was fatally wounded and a comrade, Patrick Mulvena, killed outright. The provisionals immediately assumed that the officials were responsible and widespread violence was predicted. In Crumlin Road Jail, official prisoners were attacked by provisionals. An emergency meeting was organized in Dublin between the leaderships of both organizations. Golding, Garland, Ryan and Macmillan met with Dathy O'Connell and Brian Keenan in the Dominican Friary. During the meeting Costello arrived uninvited and with different priorities, as Garland recalls. We just wanted to get the incident stopped and to get on with our own thing. Dave O'Connell's attitude was we don't want anything to do with these incidents, we want to get on with the war. Our attitude was you get on with your war but you have to stop intimidating or wounding our members but for Costello it didn't matter that that was happening, he wanted a joint campaign. Costello's attitude at the meeting was in marked contrast to his earlier position as one of the most outspoken critics of the provost within the official leadership. 
The result of the talks was a joint statement in which the provisionals accepted that Bryson and Mulvena had been killed by soldiers. It was also stated that, differences between the two organizations had been exploited by the British, and that machinery was being established so that in future, friction and hostility, would be eased. Macmillan returned to Belfast seeking information on Keenan, who had risen rapidly in the provost ranks but was unknown to the official leader. During August 1973 Kenneth Littlejohn and Anuri Man were convicted for the Grafton Street Bank robbery. The affair continued to have repercussions in Co. Down, where the OIRA sought out an ex-member, Paul Tinnelly, who had remained active despite being expelled from the organization. Tinnelly came from one of the most prominent business families in South Down, had been involved in the border campaign and claimed to be proud to have served the cause of Ireland rather than international communism. The OIRA accused Tinnelly of having teamed up with British agents who had played on his greed and desire for easy money. As they tracked Tinnelly they also killed Seamus Larkin, a former member whom they had previously kneecapped and banished from Newry. His body was found dumped near Omeath. The family of another murder victim in Belfast, 24-year-old Owen Devine, also claimed that he had been killed by the OIRA. Devine died after being shot in a derelict house off the Ormo Road in August. It was alleged that the officials had abducted him after he stole keys belonging to one of their clubs. Later that year the OIRA executed Sean M. Kastocker in the markets after they discovered he was part of a gang that had carried out several brutal killings. The OIRA also routinely kneecapped or similarly punished petty criminals in Belfast, Newry and Armagh. Sometimes beatings were administered with hurleys or the victim's limbs smashed by breeze blocks. The OIRA leadership made it clear they did not rule out military action either for short-term objectives or in the struggle for the Socialist Republic. However, they still argued that such a campaign was not realistic. There were serious disagreements about this on the Army Council. Costello felt that the defense and retaliation policy had been effectively abandoned. Some of those who agreed with Costello on the need for armed activity had little time for the provisionals. Indeed, many of those who wanted action against the British were also eager to respond to provisional provocation. But they felt that they would be left in the shadows unless OIRA activity was stepped up. Disillusioned members continued to drift out of the organization. Nevertheless efforts were made to solidify internal structures. During 1973 Mick Ryan, inspired by 19th-century Fenian infiltration strategies, had produced a manual, entitled A Reporter's Guide to Ireland, dealing with counter-interrogation techniques and intelligence gathering. It advised arrested volunteers to simply deny everything. You are not a member of the IRA, never have been and don't intend to be. You know nothing about the IRA except what you read in the papers, the special branch will know you are lying for all you are worth but that does not matter. They cannot prove that in a courtroom so you just deny everything. The guide asserted that IRA business should not be discussed in pubs or anywhere else where it could be overheard. Intelligence officers should build up knowledge on individuals by collecting birth certificates, passports and ID cards. Emphasis was put on developing contacts with sympathetic members of the Guardi and the Irish Army. The guide stressed that the state saw the OIRA as a much greater danger than, say, the provisionals, in the long term, because we are committed to the overthrow of all that the army is paid to protect. The Guardi seemed to have shared the officials' view of their potential. In early 1974 an Irish government inquiry into internal security concluded that the greatest long-term danger to the security of the institutions of the state comes from the activities of the official IRA and of political groups or associations connected with it. Young volunteers had already begun to join mainstream political parties. One infiltrator was appointed to a position in the SDLP's Belfast head office and the officials were able to gain access to that party's entire membership lists and much of its internal correspondence. In Derry approval was granted for a retaliatory attack in January 1974 and Ebrington Barracks was chosen as a target. An OIRA volunteer from Armagh supervised the operation. A bomb was taped underneath the car of John Dunn, a 46-year-old Cregan man who worked as a cleaner in the base. It was time to explode at lunchtime, but Dunn had been giving driving lessons on his lunch break to a fellow cleaner, 51-year-old Cecilia Byrne, and as they drove along Lamavity Road the bomb exploded, killing them both. The OIRA denied any involvement in the bombing. That year saw the tempo of sectarian killings increase. During November 1973 the OIRA in Belfast had announced that it was setting up auxiliary defense groups to check all strange cars and persons in areas where sectarian attacks had taken place. In Porta Down the officials opened fire on a loyalist mob trying to storm Oban Street. During February the OIRA sealed off Bonmore Estate in response to three loyalist killings. Many died in bomb attacks on pubs, with five killed in the Rose and Crown on the Ormo Road in May. 
There were authorized and unauthorized responses by the OIRA. A squad was formed which had permission to carry out retaliation attacks on pubs frequented by the UVF or UDA. These operations were kept secret, even from fellow members, and were never claimed. After one attack on a loyalist pub in South Belfast a suspicious quartermaster inspected weapons belonging to the local OIRA unit to see if they had been fired. The OIRA were also blamed in early 1974 for the killing of Christopher Daly, an ex-internee who was involved in gun dealing. In 1974, the Soviets finally authorized a limited shipment to the OIRA of captured Western weapons. The guns, in waterproof wrapping, were submerged off the coast of Ireland and were then picked up by a trawler. Among the cargo were silenced American M3 submachine guns, usually called grease guns, in Belfast they were nicknamed spitting dummies. In May, while preparing a landmine for an attack on the army in Newry, Coleman Rountree and a comrade, Martin McClendon, were surprised by soldiers and shot dead. Immediately after the funerals of the two men the OIRA shot a British soldier in William Street and carried out five more attacks on troops over the coming week. They claimed to have inflicted fatalities, though the British army denied this. In early June the OIRA finally caught up with Paul Tinnelly when he returned to Rostrever for a relative's funeral and killed him in a machine gun attack. His family angrily denied the OIRA's allegations that he had been an informer. Tinnelly's brother met with a member of the Army Council to demand, unsuccessfully, that the claim be withdrawn. Finance continued to be needed both for maintaining the army and for intervention in politics. The Republican clubs and Sinn Féin were involved in three major election campaigns during 1974, for local councils in the South and two Westminster polls. During March the OIRA had taken £17,000 from the AIB in Newry. In July £4,400 was taken from the Hotel Blarney in Cork after four OIRA members booked in as two couples. At five o'clock in the morning they held up staff and emptied the safe. During August the OIRA stole £6,400 from a post office on the Falls Road. Late in the year several officials were caught after a series of robberies in Belfast. In an effort to prevent robberies the army had begun escorting post office vans. The officials contacted a post office driver and threatened to shoot his family unless he made sure an extra £40,000 was left in Grosvenor Road post office. After the van had made its delivery and driven off with its escort, the OIRA raided the post office and took the £40,000. The perception that the OIRA was being downgraded to a political fundraising operation caused disquiet among some volunteers. The leadership stressed the importance of involvement in political activity, and indeed most leading Republican club figures were also OIRA members. As one activist put it, if the O.C. of the IRA was talking to the chairman of the Republican clubs, he would be talking into a mirror. But many were still unhappy. In July 1974, Seamus Trainer, an Armagh IRA veteran of 42 years, resigned from the movement, complaining of OIRA military inaction. There were several reasons for discontent. Some people wanted operations to let the Brits know you still existed, while others wanted operations against the Brits to let the provost know you still existed, and many volunteers questioned the effort being put into electoral campaigns. Sectarian attacks also continued to take their toll. During September a car driven by Tartan gang members ran down and killed official Fianna member Noel Beckett off the Ormo Road. The gang had made repeated sorties into the area trying to kidnap people off the street. Another official Fianna boy, 16-year-old Pat McGreevy, was shot dead by the UVF in Clifton Street. In November 20-year-old official supporter Geraldine Macklin was shot dead by the UDA at a shop on the Springfield Road. Many of those disillusioned with the lack of military activity were eager to retaliate against loyalists. Efforts to reorient the Fianna into other political activities had mixed results. In November a group of masked Fianna members took over a secondary school on the Glen Road to demand integrated education. They locked the teachers in a staff room and addressed an assembly of largely bewildered students. Some within the movement in Dublin thought that Fianna had become a joke. There were suggestions from Fianna members in Dublin and Cork to reorganize with a more political focus. Unlike most other areas of the North, where Republican allegiance had drifted to the provisionals, the officials in South Down had maintained support. During August 1974 soldiers were shot in response to army harassment of local people. In October the OIRA in Newry carried out more gun attacks on British soldiers following the killing of a 16-year-old by the army. Relations between the officials and the provisionals in the town were increasingly tense. The local official O.C. recalled, The provost's attitude was don't do what we ask, do as we tell you, and we would have had people coming to us because of that. After widespread violence over the weekend marking the third anniversary of internment in early August, the OIRA accused the provisionals of using young boys, to hijack and burn cars belonging to civilians.
Two teenagers were kneecapped by the officials as a result. In response the provisionals warned that they would not allow their men to be assaulted or molested by the OIRA. There was more bad feeling in Belfast when provisional Martin Skillen was killed. Skillen, a former OIRA volunteer himself, had been in a fight with some officials and had retrieved a gun from a dump and gone looking for them when he was spotted by troops and shot. During August the OIRA took £50,000 in a wages raid at Klondalkin paper mills in Dublin. But in Galway an attempted robbery saw a clerk, 60-year-old Jeremiah O'Connor, shot dead. The killing was a major embarrassment to the official leadership, who told supporters those involved were dissidents, though the same people had been involved in official activities shortly before the killing. In Belfast the OIRA were involved in a gun battle with British troops in Ardoin during which 66-year-old Maura Lavery was killed. In response to the killing of another civilian by the army the officials shot dead a soldier, Private Philip Drake, near Craghaven on 26 August. In early September the OIRA robbed a bank in North Belfast, as the raiders made their getaway RUC Inspector William Elliott was killed in an exchange of fire. On 5 November the OIRA shot a loyalist in Bonmore. A few days later a gun battle erupted on the estate between the OIRA and the provisionals, sparked off by a punch-up in the boundary bar. Despite this, the two Republican groups still occasionally cooperated in actions against loyalists in the area. The British Army noted increased OIRA activity across Belfast during the winter. In part, this was a result of the growing internal tension and a desire to keep volunteers loyal and active. Between 1970 and 1974 1,270 lives were lost as a result of political violence in Ireland. Of these approximately 600 deaths were caused by the provisional IRA, 350 by loyalists and 190 by state forces. The official IRA had killed over 50 people, and the official Republican movement had lost 20 members in the same period. What was also lost was any illusion on the part of the official leadership that they held the initiative in provoking a revolutionary situation in the short term. They had not wanted the war that had developed, which, as they had predicted, had blown off course any hopes of united working class action. 6. Civil rights not civil war. We stand not on the brink of victory, but on the brink of sectarian disaster. Billy McMillan, Bowdenstown, 1973 During the first five, intensely violent, years of the Troubles, the official IRA in Northern Ireland struggled to maintain social agitation amid the growing violence. Their members fought elections, intervened in housing disputes, ran local cooperatives and were the backbone of the Northern Ireland Civil Rights Association, NICRA. Numerous members of the movement were jailed or interned and intervention in prison politics was another focus of activity. They competed with their provisional rivals in the media as well as on the streets. But disagreements about the nature of their struggle soon divided the official movement and would eventually lead to another split. Prior to the Falls Road curfew the Belfast Republican clubs were at the forefront of a widely supported rent strike, while in Derry they were prominent in unemployment protests. Kevin Smith, who had helped set up a club in Andersonstown, viewed the barricades as an extension of the whole civil rights struggle and the street demonstrations and he and his colleagues took the view that it could not be allowed to develop into a purely military struggle between the IRA and the British Army. Despite growing military commitments OIRA members continued with their Republican club's roles. Malachy McGurin combined his role as Northern OIRA commander with that of chairman of the Republican clubs, while Billy McMillan was vice chair for most of 1970. This was not lost on the authorities, who maintained their ban on both the clubs and the United Irishmen, sales of which were periodically disrupted by the security forces. The continued commitment to the civil rights campaign resulted in growing official influence within NICRA, but only as the latter organization's importance declined. In 1971 NICRA's 14-person executive contained six Republican clubs representatives, including McGurin and McMillan. The officials within NICRA could also count on the support of Communist Party members and some independents such as Tyrone's Paddy Joe McLean. This bloc argued for NICRA to place greater emphasis on economic issues and demand the adoption of a Northern Ireland Bill of Rights which would outlaw all forms of discrimination. They pushed for the civil rights demand of one man, one vote, to be developed into one family one house, one man, one job. In Belfast and elsewhere the officials were now the mainstay of local NICRA groups. In some areas it became difficult to tell the difference between the local Republican clubs and the civil rights branch. NICRA policy, such as opposition to the setting up of the Ulster Defense Regiment, began to mirror that of the Republican clubs. Relationships with the other main NICRA factions had become increasingly fraught. Complaining of a left-wing takeover, several moderates had resigned from the executive in early 1970. On the other hand, the mainly student-based people's democracy was angry that NICRA refused to take a more stridently left-wing approach, such as condemning the influence of the Catholic Church in the South. 
Provisional supporters withdrew from NICRA, many bitterly dismissive of its attempts to seek British rights. By early 1971 the last remaining provisional supporter on the NICRA executive, Kevin Agnew, had been replaced as chair by communist Andy Barr. The emergence of civil conflict had a distinct social impact within Belfast's working-class communities. In areas of new housing, built to cater for the city's growing population, paramilitary activity became knitted into the social fabric. Official activist Martin Lynch would recall that prior to the violence of 1969, Turf Lodge, people did not know one another very well, neighbors didn't know neighbors in many cases. It wasn't until 1969, that, people came together in large numbers and vigilante groups were formed and people talked to each other. In May 1970 the Belfast Republican Clubs organized a false fleet with music and sports events. Among the bands that performed were the Dubliners, whose new best-selling album Revolution included several left-wing ballads. However, the success of the false fleet would not be repeated. The 1971 event faced local objections because of street trouble the previous year and the provisionals condemned its organizers for having allowed, known and professed communists to address young people. That year's event ended in tragedy, with the murder of an elderly woman and recriminations about drunkenness and rowdy behavior. As Day O'Hagan recalled, there were only two opinions on the fleet, a unique urban people's festival or else a drunken orgy. The politically charged atmosphere could also have a detrimental impact on social agitation. Mary McMahon recalled feeling that her local area, Ballymurphy, which was largely bereft of facilities, was a time bomb waiting to explode. The deteriorating relationship with the British Army meant that local energy was deflected away from social campaigns and towards violence. The political conflict between the rival Sinn Féin's was played out in the press. In public statements the officials referred to their rivals as the Provisional Alliance, attempting to portray a loose coalition of traditionalists, Belfast Catholic defenders and Fianna Fáil manipulators. Conversely the provost used the term NLF, to refer to the OIRA and what was now called official Sinn Féin. The provisionals adopted the plan drawn up by Roy Johnston and Sean O'Bradi in 1966, but shelved at the time by the leadership, as their core social and economic policy document. This, Ayer Nua, New Ireland, document sought to remake Irish society along cooperative and federalist lines. Away from the factionalism of Belfast the officials, for a period, publicly adopted a conciliatory approach to their former comrades. As late as December 1970 Mac Giola walked out of an RTE interview when Rory O'Bradi was not allowed to take part in the discussion. There were still attempts to bring the rival factions together. In early 1970 the Irish Workers' Party and the CPNI had unified to form the Communist Party of Ireland, CPI, the first orthodox 32-county communist movement since the 1940s, and the new party's general secretary, Mick O'Reardon, was adamant that unity was also key for Republicans. Throughout 1970 he was in contact with the leaderships of both groups seeking to organize a compromise, but both sides refused to send speakers to a unity meeting in Dublin. This was unsurprising on the part of the anti-communist provisionals, who publicly proclaimed they would never come to terms with the Golding IRA, which is now Marxist and Socialist. In contrast their aim was a free Ireland, based on Christian principles. With delegates at the official Sinn Féin Ard Thais overwhelmingly voting to end abstentionism in January 1971 any faint hopes of a reunion came to an end. The Liberty Hall Conference also saw the National Liberation Front strategy reaffirmed, and while the escalating northern conflict loomed large, debates focused on southern campaigns. McGurran was the only leadership figure to express reservations about abandoning abstentionism at that point, though a few official activists had remained supporters of the policy. In some areas there was still unease that the split had occurred at all. Easter 1971 saw several commemorations in the North take place under a unified banner and some who had taken the provisional side still sought an understanding, with Kevin Agnew, speaking in Swatra, calling for the movement to reunite. In the United States former IRA chief of staff Sean Cronin echoed these sentiments. Despite the large number of potential recruits now being drawn to the provost, the Republican clubs continued to grow in number. A number of young activists, most of whom had joined after the split, were becoming prominent, among them Margot Collins, a teacher based in Newry who was briefly dubbed, the New Bernadette. The Willie Orr, Betsy Gray Republican Club in Bally Murphy is recalled as, quite an intriguing mix, of local people and ex-students. We were going to have the revolution the next day. Well, people who had been around a bit longer thought it mightn't happen tomorrow, you know. With provisional Shin Fine only marginally active beyond acting as a military support group, to outsiders the clubs continued to be the public face of Republican politics. On his return to Ireland in early 1971, Sean Garland demanded a harder public line be taken with the provisionals. At GHQ he had a strong supporter in Owen Omer Chu, who recalled, 
after the split a decision was made that we wouldn't exacerbate it by engaging in argument, which was a big mistake. It meant all the arguments against us, all the crap about 1969, was left unanswered, every dishonest comment was given maximum coverage and we were fighting the split, particularly in rural areas, with one hand tied behind our backs. The Army Council replaced the moderate Seamus O'Tuothale as United Irishman editor with Elmer Chu in May 1971. There followed a notable hardening of the paper's stance. Garland replied to appeals for Republican unity by ruling out agreements with the elements who had derided left-wing policies. At that summer's Bowdenstown observances, McGurran contrasted the words of leading Provo Dathy O'Connell, who the previous year had warned that British forces would never again run riot in Irish streets, with the Belfast Provisional's behaviour during the Falls curfew, when they had stood aside while the OIRA had defended the area. The first two major studies of the IRA were published in 1970. The officials gave a warm reception to J. Bowyer Bell's The Secret Army. Golding was effusive when describing Bell's work as, not just a book about the IRA, but a book for the IRA. In contrast, Tim Pat Coogan's The IRA was damned by Golding for its patronizing pseudo-objectivity. The United Irishman claimed that Coogan's cook-in was riddled with factual error, misleading comment and ill-judgment. The officials also felt Coogan had given excess publicity to the provisionals and was fanning the flames of division in his role as editor of the Irish press. Certainly the paper was dismissive of the officials, an editorial claiming that it was silly, eyes elsewhere, socialist policies that had left Belfast Catholics undefended in 1969. After an unsatisfactory meeting between Coogan, de Burka and Maggiola to discuss the newspaper's coverage, official Sinn Féin called for a boycott of the publication. The U.S. Embassy, for their part, felt that on political matters the Irish press speaks for the Irish government. In contrast the Irish Times was seen as broadly sympathetic to the officials. The paper's political reporter, Dick Walsh, socialized with members of the official leadership, giving them background assistance and advice. Then Sinn Féin General Secretary Tony Heffernan recalled, Walsh's views were sought out and respected, not just for the political ideas but the presentation of ideas. The journalist helped write several important speeches, including Golding's funeral oration for Joe McCann. Hibernia magazine regularly featured articles by leading officials, with supporter Ann Harris writing a regular backpage column. The United Irishman criticized student magazine Newsite and its young editor Vincent Brown, as aiming to titillate rather than activate a cozy, middle-class liberal readership. The Northern newspapers were in the main pro-unionist or, in the case of the nationalist Irish news, decidedly wary of the officials. However, the Belfast Sunday News on occasion featured sympathetic articles. The paper's news editor, Jim Campbell, had been on good terms with leading OIRA figures since his involvement in Republican politics as a teenager. While the officials' political sophistication won them friends in the media, on the ground selling such nuanced positions as opposing the abolition of the Stormont Parliament, while demanding its wholesale reform, was a harder sell. The officials stated that it was preferable for Northern Ireland to be administered by an Irish institution than succumb to unelected rule from London. This was felt to be consistent with the need to weaken imperial control as a prerequisite to unifying the country. In contrast, the provisionals and a large swathe of nationalist opinion had a simple message, the Northern Parliament should be abolished immediately. In the face of this, Republican clubs activist Brian Brennan recalls that attempting to explain official policy was like trench warfare in every Catholic street in West Belfast. Unionism, meanwhile, was divided between Unionist Party leader Brian Faulkner, who became Northern Prime Minister in early 1971, and hardliners such as William Craig and Ian Paisley. Paisley had won seats at Stormont and Westminster in 1970. The officials generally saw the fracturing of unionism as a sign of the civil rights strategy's success. Realignment had also taken place within nationalism, the major development being the launch of the Social Democratic and Labour Party in August 1970. The SDLP included people from labour backgrounds, such as Jerry Fitt and Patty Devlin, alongside younger nationalists who had become prominent through the civil rights campaign, including John Hume and Austin Curry. On the left, People's Democracy, with Michael Farrell its dominant figure, had adopted a more structured Marxist ethos and was initially critical of the officials for concentrating too much on the national question to the detriment of uniting Catholic and Protestant workers. However, in many areas there was a friendly relationship between the two organizations. In Armagh several Fianna members had their first introduction to the pamphlets of Mao and Lenin in the PD shop which adjoined the town's Republican club premises. After internment, the PD line shifted dramatically to support for the provisional armed campaign and criticism of NICRA's reformism. People's democracy began to argue that the Protestants represented a reactionary colonizing bloc, like the French in Algeria. 
By late 1971 the fracture was complete, with the PD pulling out of Nicra and helping establish the Provo supporting Northern Resistance Movement. The much smaller Irish Communist organization was also challenging official policies, taking the view that responsibility for the Northern conflict lay at the door of the Southern ruling class and that the choice was between a secular social democratic British state and a reactionary 26 county Catholic state. Claiming to be applying Stalin's writings to the national question, the group now argued that there were two historic nations in Ireland, Protestant and Catholic, each entitled to self determination. The organization accordingly changed its name to the British and Irish Communist Organization, BICO. They argued that the officials were chiefly responsible for the troubles, having led NICRA into a policy of sectarian confrontation. Some official strategists also delved into Marxist ideas on cultural identity and revolutionary theory, but came to different conclusions from BICOs. In 1971, Sinn Fein published Owen Omer Chu's pamphlet Culture and Revolution in Ireland, in which he accused the British of historically conducting a campaign practically amounting to genocide, in Ireland, leading to the near destruction of Irish culture. The material values of Anglo-American imperialism were being fostered through the education system and the mass media. This process could be countered by looking to a Gaelic past that, Omer Chu stated, underlay not only native Irish but also the Anglo-Irish and Orange cultures. From a fostering of these roots Republicans could conduct a cultural revolution, which would see imperialism overthrown by the culture of the Irish working class. This meant support for the Irish-speaking regions of the Gaeltacht and the promotion of Irish language and culture. Some were worried by the Maoist influences in Omer Chu's work, and its dissemination at official education seminars met resistance, but Golding was a strong supporter. In January 1971 at the Ard Thace, his defense of working with young people who offered extreme solutions to an extreme situation, was at least partly in reference to Omer Chu. Billy McMillan was among those who argued that, without the Irish language there could be no revolution. In 1970, when the noted Irish language writer and former IRA interne Mertan O'Cadane died, the OIRA provided the color party at his funeral, and the officials would name a new drinking club in Gardiner Place after him. There were differences within the movement on cultural issues. At the 1971 Ard Thace Belfast activist Tony Rosado questioned the widespread use of Irish in speeches, as many northern delegates could not understand it. By 1971 OIRA color parties featured men with long hair and flared trousers, while Fianna activists in the north often dressed in the bootboy style of half-mast jeans, suede head, or longish hair and bomber jackets. In Armagh's Drumarga state members of the rival Fianna's were distinguished by different color bomber jackets, green for the officials and black for the provosts. The Catholic Church, an institution that had underpinned nationalist culture for over a century, was seen by many officials as having taken sides in the Republican split. Belfast priest Father Day Wilson would publicly admit that some clergy and bishops felt that the provisionals were much less dangerous than the officials. Bernadette Devlin concurred, stating that during 1970 many rural northern clergymen were falling over themselves to endorse the provisionals in preference to the officials. Nonetheless at least one cleric, Father Vincent Ford from South Down, joined the official movement and British intelligence feared the possibility of an official alliance with radical socialist priests in the South. The November 1971 Sinn Féin Ard outlined a series of demands aimed at ending religious control of education. It also called for equal pay for women and backed the legalization of contraception and an end to the ban on divorce. Sean Mulready, who had been victimized by the church while working as a teacher during the 1950s, congratulated Sinn Féin on moving far ahead of all other Irish political parties, including the Communist Party, on matters of social reform. To more cautious members official Sinn Féin stressed that, no one, would be forced, to divorce. The 1971 Dublin Easter commemoration was notable for the absence of the rosary, though the prayer was still said at most local official commemorations elsewhere. Labour's Conor Cruz O'Brien was seen by many as the serious intellectual force on the left of Irish politics. As trouble in the North intensified, his views became more stridently anti-nationalist. In October 1971 Mac Giola accepted O'Brien's challenge to a public debate in University College Dublin. O'Brien charged that Sinn Féin was only the public expression of a secret and illegal army. However, the officials might protest the difference between themselves and the provisionals, the outcome of all their activities would be fascism. O'Brien contended that the Protestants of the North had the right to a separate state and were not settlers, like the French Algerian colons. Mac Giola argued that no Republican ever regarded the Protestant workers as colons, and that the only colons were the ascendancy class, the horse Protestants. He stated that, there are not two nations but two classes in Ireland, the exploited and the exploiters. 
The Sinn Féin president maintained that Republicans wanted unity between Protestant and Catholic but no section of the nation had a right to secede from it. The following year Cruz O'Brien's influential deconstruction of nationalism, States of Ireland, was described by Mac Giola as pro-unionist and pro-imperialist. For most official activists, let alone the ordinary population, these debates were inaudible due to the sound of gunfire that engulfed the North after August 1971. Substantial numbers of local activists, many of them not IRA members, were rounded up when the British launched internment. On the 9th of August Seamus O'Tuothale had been staying in Billy McMillan's house, having cycled to Belfast that day. Despite being warned that a roundup of Republicans was on the cards, O'Tuothale decided he needed a rest and was arrested by a party of British soldiers in the early hours of that morning. By late August he was giving Irish classes in Crumlin Road Jail and smuggling out articles on conditions there for the Irish Times. Following the roundup, Mickey Montgomery and Paddy Joe McLean were among a number of prisoners singled out for special interrogation techniques. McLean remembered being forced to stand spread-eagled until he collapsed and was beaten, being choked, handcuffed and hung up off the ground. He heard mock firing squads, executing people and death marches being played. He was convinced he was to be killed, because the authorities would surely not allow anyone to survive and expose what was happening. Early in September 10,000 people rallied against internment at Belfast's Casement Park. Republican clubs called for the ostracizing of British troops, and for a national rent and rates strike, to hit the Unionist government, where it hurts. In Derry the development of the, no-go, areas gave the officials an opportunity to put their policies into action behind the barricades. Street committees were set up and local people were encouraged to elect representatives to oversee the running of their areas, ensuring rubbish was collected, barricades maintained and crime kept under control. The provisionals denounced the idea as, Moscow-style communism. In contrast Golding, on a visit to Free Dairy, stated that behind the barricades the saplings of freedom were being planted in an area where there were no Gestapo, no RUC, and no Free State Special Branch. Scores of people attached to the official movement were being detained between Crumlin Road Jail, Long Kesh and the Maidstone Prison Ship in Belfast Harbour. By Christmas 1971 there were enough OIRA internees to form five Republican clubs in Long Kesh internment camp. They were still outnumbered by several hundred provisional internees. As a non-aligned prisoner P.J. McLean was made secretary of the Long Kesh Camp Council, and in an illustration of the widespread support for the internees he was elected as a delegate to the GAA's annual congress. The makeshift huts that housed prisoners in Long Kesh were in poor condition, leaking, permanently wet, and overrun with mice. In October there had been an escape attempt and in response the authorities had cut food supplies. Some of the internees burnt the canteen in protest and, in the ensuing riot, troops severely beat several prisoners. Most prisoners, internees and sentenced, were initially held in Crumlin Road Jail. There the rival Republican O. C.'s Seamus Lynch and Martin Meehan knew each other from work as dockers and agreed to coordinate escape plans. Unlike their official colleagues, all the provisional prisoners on the Maidstone went to mass, with the exception of Ted Howell, who was nicknamed, Ted the Red, the Sticky Provo. The official prisoners started several riots on the ship to demand transfer to Long Kesh, eventually succeeding, but when they arrived at the rundown huts, one recalls, we were sorry we fucking left the Maidstone. In Long Kesh the prisoners established command structures that replicated those of their organizations outside. Lynch was elected Camp O, C of the official internees. He encouraged the setting up of education classes and reading, making a public appeal for donations of books, while the provisional prisoners mainly engaged in drilling and weapons classes. The officials' greater emphasis on political education was apparent when provisional internees approached OIRA education officer Art McMillan to ask him to lecture them on their IR NUA policy. Lynch ran a strict regime, arguing that it was very important to maintain discipline in the cages to keep people from getting depressed. One threat to morale was the worry that girlfriends or wives were having affairs, and a number of men on the outside were given punishment beatings by the OIRA on suspicion of this. Among the sentenced official prisoners in Crumlin, Road, Peter John Monaghan of Tyrone was elected O.C. with Brendan Mackin of Belfast his second in command, the view being that a rural O.C. and an urban adjutant would be a good mixture. Monaghan had been interned with provisional leader Billy McKee during the border campaign and Mackin knew McKee from childhood. The rival sides fielded teams in soccer and Gaelic football matches, and there was also cooperation over the issue of political status. During May 1972 a hunger strike for recognition as political prisoners began. Monaghan and Mackin taking part for the officials alongside McKee and Frank McKirk for the provisionals. The OIRA officers in the prison had decided on taking part in the strike, which lasted until mid-June, despite the wariness of the outside leadership. 
It was in Crumlin Road that initial contact was made between the officials and UVF leader Gusty Spence. During 1970 Billy McMillan had introduced himself to Spence when he was briefly jailed after the fall's curfew, but it was with Monaghan that Spence had his first, in-depth, conversations about politics. During 1972 paramilitary structures in the prison were modified to accommodate the new UDA prisoners. This group were led by Jimmy Craig, recalled by official prisoners as a criminal not overly concerned with politics, and a totally different kettle of fish, to Spence. During 1972 the officials established Sertia as a new campaign for prisoners' rights. It demanded education, regular visits, civilian clothes and productive work for political prisoners. Sertia also campaigned for general penal reform, with many in the official movement endorsing the view that ordinary prisoners are unconscious political prisoners. In Dublin the officials set up a national anti-extradition committee to protest at attempts to extradite Michael Willis back to Northern Ireland, where he faced 10 years in jail. Willis, an OIRA prisoner, had escaped from Crumlin Road in May by hanging on to the underside of a bin lorry. Prison life was substantially different for Republicans in the South and for a period they benefited from the upsurge in nationalist feeling. IRA prisoners had access to alcohol in Mountjoy Prison, with one official recalling that his cell was like a brewery. There was little tension between officials and provisionals in the prison initially. The factions shared drink and reading material including a well-thumbed copy of the Secret Army signed by inmates from both factions. Both sets of IRA prisoners took part in a major riot in Mountjoy in May 1972. An official prisoner remembers that the focus on a list of prisoners' demands came as an afterthought, the riot having been provoked by the sacking of a sympathetic warder who had allowed some Provo prisoners to visit a pub while being transferred to court. There was no plan, even though the papers claimed there was. Al Ryan, a Waterford provisional, leapt up on the back of one of the screws and roared, Give me the fucking keys. You bollocks! The prison was gone up in 25 seconds. Martin Cahill, a young Dublin criminal later to become known as the General, was running around wearing these white Arab robes, like Lawrence of Arabia. He had this big iron bar and he was going around smashing all the pipes and there was steam coming out of them and water and he was smashing the radiators as well. The ordinary prisoners let out some real madsers from the hospital wing. The politicos had to try to get these other real loo loss back in their cells. Following the riot Republican prisoners began to be transferred in greater numbers to Port Lawas prison. There during the summer of 1972 three OIRA men went on hunger strike in protest at restricted visits. By late 1972 the officials in Mountjoy were a small minority and relations with the provisionals worsened. While on remand 19-year-old official Tony Moriarty found one group of provisionals, extremely hostile, and was physically threatened, though an older group took him, under their wing. In the military prison at the Kura, Official and provisional prisoners collaborated on an escape during October 1972, though they were soon recaptured. Over the following years, however, the growing tension between the rival Republican factions was mirrored in the prisons. By 1973 the numbers were now decisively in favor of the provisionals, who had several hundred prisoners compared with 52 OIRA men in Long Kesh, 5 in the Kura, 6 in Mountjoy and 14 in England. There were several clashes between the outnumbered officials and the provisionals in both Mountjoy and Port Lawas. The worst trouble arose when the official prisoners in Mountjoy dissociated themselves from a campaign by the provisionals for segregation of political prisoners. The officials O. C. Ronnie Dean argued that it was their duty to spread Republican political ideas among ordinary prisoners and not take a holier-than-thou attitude to them. Several official prisoners were attacked as a result, and Provo Eamon McTomey had to intervene to try to guarantee their safety. Despite increasing trouble between the officials and provisionals on the streets, Mackin and others managed to maintain a mainly peaceful relationship in Long Kesh. There was an unwritten rule that inside Long Kesh we shouldn't be bringing in the whole thing of what was going on outside. Emphasis was also placed on nurturing contacts with loyalists. In Long Kesh this occurred through the education process in classes conducted by the Open University. Several OIRA prisoners were taking degrees along with loyalists during 1974. During 1973 the officials in Long Kesh had began producing a journal, an EO chair, the key featuring articles, poems and songs smuggled out of jail. The prisoners used an EO chair to link the northern conflict to struggles in places like South Africa and Palestine and to the Indian people of the USA. Another issue dealt with was feminism, with the men advised that use of language like chick and bird contributed to the oppression of women. The Irish conflict was a source of curiosity to the international left, with growing numbers of foreign groups making contact with the officials. An American radical recalled that Sinn Féin had a huge profile internationally and it was part of the revolutionary world tour that every left-wing backpacker that managed to find their way to Ireland would go to. 
In late 1970 new leftists Jerry Rubin and Stu Albert, who had been defendants in the famous Chicago 7 trial that followed the 1968 riots in that city, were invited to Ireland by the People's Democracy and shown around Belfast by the officials, before being deported. Bob Purdy, a Scottish member of the International Marxist Group, ended up staying with Macmillan in the Lower Falls shortly after the curfew. He recalls the area having sandbagged army posts, armored cars and foot patrols everywhere. The differences in approach between the international radicals and the Republicans could lead to confusion, as Purdy recalls. Billy had been in jail and released only two or three days before I met him. We were walking past the sandbagged post in Culling Tree Road, which was manned by a black soldier. I asked if they had tried to get at the soldiers, meaning trying to propagandize them as the U.S. anti-war movement was doing with GIs. He immediately became very evasive and said, I'm only out of jail and I haven't got myself turned round yet. Anyway they always go around in patrols. I realized he had misunderstood, get it, and explained my meaning. He stopped dead and said, that's a good idea. In Belfast during 1971 the OIRA did distribute a letter to British soldiers calling on them to desert, warning that they would soon be used to police the working class of Britain on behalf of the rich. In the immediate aftermath of Bloody Sunday, two members of the Queen's Lancashire Regiment, Colin Demet and Michael Hawkins, deserted and handed over their SLRs and uniforms to the OIRA. Demet and Hawkins were then produced by the officials at a press conference in Dublin, where they outlined their disgust at the army's tactics in Belfast. Both men had an uncomfortable time in Dublin and they eventually returned to Britain and gave themselves up, enduring harsh imprisonment as a result. The officials also sought out their own international political links. In late 1970 and early 1971 Myron de Burka attended conferences in Jordan and Kuwait organized to discuss the Palestinian issue. The Amman event was described as a guerrilla Disneyland, with leftists from all over the world attending. Official visits abroad were monitored closely by the authorities. Maliki McGurin was particularly well-traveled, undertaking extensive speaking tours of the US and Europe. British Prime Minister Edward Heath personally intervened in an attempt to halt a 1972 McGurin tour of Sweden. Among the complaints British officials raised with their Scandinavian counterparts was that this senior official IRA officer active in the North had affiliations with the Trotskyist Fourth International and his main contribution to IRA policies is his international outlook. Guevara is one of his heroes. Nonetheless, McGurin was allowed to undertake the tour. Contacts were not exclusively with the Marxist left. In late 1971 the British young liberals contacted Sinn Féin to say that their chairman Peter Hayne was visiting Dublin and wished to meet representatives of the political and or military wings of the movement. With many Republican supporters in America having defected to the provisionals, the officials had to develop a new U.S. network that incorporated traditional and left-wing support. In mid-1971 the Irish Republican clubs of the U.S. and Canada were launched. The IRC comprised Irish-born Republicans, older Irish left-wing emigrants, younger Irish Americans, some of whom had been active in the new left, and American leftists with no Irish connections. Some of the officials' efforts were geared towards winning support away from the provost. They published a statement in the New York Irish Echo outlining official military actions during August 1971, claiming that the OIRA had inflicted at least six fatalities on the UVF and also killed several soldiers. During the winter of 1971 Maggiola undertook a major U.S. speaking tour, appearing alongside veteran, labor, priest father Charles Owen Rice in Pittsburgh. In Boston he gatecrashed a press conference by former British Prime Minister Harold Wilson. After Bloody Sunday the IRC helped form a broad anti-internment coalition in New York, leading large protests outside British airline offices. John Lennon and Yoko Ono were among those who took part. Macmillan visited America the same month, drawing a large crowd for a speech in Philadelphia during which the organizers made a point of referring to him as commander. He also led the IRC contingent in New York's Street Patrick's Day Parade. Though de Burka was refused a visa to visit the U.S. that autumn, O2Othale was able to carry out a coast-to-coast -coast speaking tour that raised over $12,000. The IRC also took part in several demonstrations against the Vietnam War, demanding U.S. out of Vietnam, Britain out of Ireland. However, the official leadership were anxious the IRC should not confine itself to the far left, instructing their American supporters that they must avoid hard-line doctrinaire positions. The IRC's function was to strengthen the base in America in support of the Irish anti-imperialist struggle. This would be done, not in terms of Vietnam or the blacks, because an overemphasis on your role in American radical politics can weaken your base among the Irish working class in America. By late 1972 there were Irish Republican clubs in 15 North American cities. In Britain Clan Na Aran was also reorganized after the split. 
The Klan had preempted Sinn Fein's abandonment of abstentionism, members voting in early 1970 for seats to be taken in all three parliaments. Birmingham and the English Midlands remained the group's most active area. Emigrant advice centers, modeled on Sinn Fein Citizens Advice Bureau, were set up, activists often dealing with the problems of Asian immigrants as well as those of the Irish. In late 1969 Padraig Yates had helped set up Site Action Press, a paper for building workers that exposed dangerous conditions and low wages in the industry. A protest campaign calling for the freeing of Republican prisoners in British jails included the occupation of Aer Lingus offices in Birmingham. Following the fall's curfew in July 1970, Yates met Bose Egan, who had stood unsuccessfully as a PD candidate for Stormont. Egan asked Yates to accompany Frank, Butch, Roche, a sore ire supporter, in an attack on the House of Commons during a debate on UK accession to the EEC. Roche and Yates made it into the Strangers' Gallery, Yates recalls, as Anthony Barber, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, rose to speak. Roche, waited for a few minutes and I thought he might have lost his bottle and I was wondering would I be up to it, when he stood up, pulled the release on the first canister and threw it, shouting. Here's a present from the falls, you bastards. It landed right in front of Barber. Roche then threw the second canister, which was another superb shot and landed beside Barbara Castle on the labor front bench. At first nothing much happened, except Roche was dragged away, and then the canisters started to spurt gas and pandemonium broke out. Some of the MPs thought it was a bomb and rushed for the doors. Castle was first out, I never saw a woman in high heels move so fast. People in the strangers gallery thought it was great fun. Although I had told nobody in Dublin about the incident beforehand, in case they tried to stop it as a piece of left-wing adventurism, there were no repercussions. Roche received a one-year prison sentence for his part in the incident. Klan's political profile was aided by the MP Bernadette Devlin, who contributed half the costs towards Yates going full-time as Klan organizer in 1971. As Klan grew, Relations with the Connolly Association worsened, both groups aware they were fishing in the same very small pond, for members and influence. The older organization secretly blocked the Republicans from hiring halls for meetings. Relations with Irish associations and county associations were also problematic, with Klan members barred from selling papers in some Irish community centers. In the aftermath of the Aldershot bombing the police clamped down on Klan, with dozens arrested and their homes raided. Seamus Collins lost his job after being featured in hostile press reports while a few members left, disgusted at the carnage. However, the impact was not all negative, Collins recalls. For a long time afterwards I was paid compliments over Aldershot because I got up at an Easter commemoration and refused to condemn it. I remember Provo elements being hostile to me in a club and a man saying no, no, that man had the guts to stand by Aldershot. It made me uncomfortable that Aldershot got me out of a tight situation. One consequence of internment and the violent atmosphere in Northern Ireland was that previously less prominent activists came to the fore. Margaret McNulty, whose husband Trevor, a leading new lodge official, was interned, recalls that, with the men, either on the run or inside, women took a more prominent role, organizing groups, protesting, picketing, then looking at facilities in the areas, seeing what was needed, and different things were set up. The official leadership hoped that, returning to the streets by breaking the ban on illegal marches might provide a new focus for agitation. Their ambitions were buoyed by what seemed to be a rising appetite for mass political campaigning. Several thousand people marched outside Belfast in early January 1972 and six more demonstrations were held that month, culminating in Derry on the 30th. After the bloody Sunday massacre in Derry the focus was on a huge turnout in Nuri a week later, with an estimated 25,000 taking part in this protest, many were satisfied that the British Army had failed to drive the movement off the streets. Following the OIRA's ceasefire and the release of internees there were major efforts to revive open Republican club activity in Belfast. By August there were 25 clubs organized in the city, with approximately 600 members, selling 6,000 copies of the United Irishman a month. Five cooperative, people's shops sold basic foodstuffs at reduced prices. The shops also became a target of loyalists, and a woman was killed in a bomb attack outside the Leeson Street Co-op in October 1972. Activists also ran children's play centers and film shows, and organized a Paris Out campaign in Ballymurphy in a Festival of the Oppressed folk concert. Another major effort was to get education classes up and running. It was felt that former internees had already attained a level of political education and that efforts should be concentrated on other members. As part of the post-ceasefire re-evaluation, education documents examined the difference between elitist military action and mass revolutionary violence. Among the questions discussed at education meetings was, did Aldershot enable the British to say, now we are quits for Derry? 
One IRA OC was shocked when he first heard a member of the leadership denouncing terrorism. The link between political and military activities sometimes created problems. In August 1972, 15 members of the Warren Point Republican Club resigned, informing the Dublin leadership that local OIRA militarists looked down on them. They also claimed that the Cross Maglin OC was a gangster, and that another local unit were a gang of criminals. Many northern activists were beginning to feel that some in the movement's southern leadership were divorced from the reality of the conflict. In Armagh John Nixon recalls being upset when de Burka lectured a group of young volunteers on how ordinary British soldiers were victims of the system as well. I said hang on a minute, these people are shooting us right, left, and center and raiding our homes and beating our people, and you're coming up here to preach to us and then heading back down to fucking Dublin. What the fuck do you know about? Differences were also evident to Sean Kelly from Waterford when he addressed the 1972 Easter commemoration at Carrickmore, Co. Tyrone. He found that people didn't give a shit, they didn't want to hear it, the helicopters came down and drowned it out. Now if you were up there and had the Brits up your back morning noon and night, you wouldn't want to hear it either. I was a tourist. Within the movement in the South, attitudes to the violence varied. Some felt that the OIRA was engaged in a race to the bottom, with the provisionals, which could only lead to more disasters. Others quietly cheered when a soldier was killed, even by the provisionals. Many Southern members had little idea of the extent of the OIRA's activities in the North. The Aldershot bombing and the killing of Ranger Best caused soul-searching for some but were defended vigorously by others. Anne Harris, writing in Hibernia two weeks after Aldershot, described the negative reaction to the bomb in the South as the most nauseating show of hypocrisy from the Irish middle class to date. It was quite clear that it took courage and determination to enter the headquarters of the technological savages who are maintained for colonial repression by the Crown. In Ireland the three political parties help keep the natives quiet, but if that should fail there is always the refined gentleman standing at the bar of the offices mess in Aldershot. In the last analysis the Irish poor face the Paris. That is why, although I'm depressed about the deaths of the five waitresses, I am also sickened by the hypocrisy of the establishment reaction. The Aldershot bombing was just one of many incidents that inspired growing ideological division among the officials. Many of these debates were colored by the use of concepts drawn from the international left. Two major competing views emerged. One, based on Marxist, stagist, theory, held that a revolutionary situation could be brought about only by achieving a series of goals equality, then national freedom, then social freedom, and eventually socialism. Those who held this view prioritized the rebuilding of the civil rights campaign and the push for reform within Northern Ireland. They tended to place a great emphasis on the need to split unionism and win Protestant working class support. Premature military action only increased sectarianism and gave the British the excuse to introduce more repression. Once sectarianism had been overcome new political alliances built around a united working class. North and South would push for a united Ireland. Only then would the movement concentrate its entire energies on achieving socialist revolution. This, broadly, was the view of Golding and Mac Giola, among the leadership of the official movement, and of some of its leading intellectuals, such as Owen Omer Chu and Owen Harris. Others believe the outbreak of violence in the North had resulted in the civil rights struggle being replaced by a direct confrontation with British imperialism. This analysis held that it was possible to push towards a revolutionary situation in the immediate term by political action combined with armed struggle. Adherents of this analysis, most prominently Seamus Costello, stressed that Republican Socialism's greatest icon, James Connolly, had concluded that British state interference in Ireland must be removed as a prerequisite to wider social change. Winning Protestant support was not considered likely as long as loyalism held sway over that section of the working class. While critics denounced this as sectarian, ultra-leftism, its supporters held that the national question could not be ignored. On both sides there were those who saw the question in terms of international left-wing conflicts. Omer Chu recalls he, rather romantically, looked upon the divide between the stagism of Golding and Mac Giola and the more urgent militarism of Costello as Stalinism versus Trotskyism. Some in the movement happily adopted such labels while others were repelled by them. Many activists remained eclectic in their ideological approach, Padraig Yates recalls. You took what you thought was useful and left the rest. While division over the merits of a stagist approach would come to dominate internal official politics, other related arguments also rage. These included whether Ireland's economic, political and cultural situation was that of a colonized country or a developed capitalist society. In 1970 a United Irishman article linking the political situations in Ireland and Palestine concluded that, it is difficult to see how strategies of the third world, which have invariably consisted of national liberation campaigns, can fail to apply in Ireland. 
Some officials, such as Sean Garland, were reading the works of third world liberation theorists, particularly Franz Fanon, whose The Wretched of the Earth drew upon his experiences as an FLN operative during the Algerian War of Independence. Fanon's thesis held that the poorest among the rural and urban masses, dismissed in traditional Marxist theory as the reactionary Lumen proletariat, could become a revolutionary vanguard if properly mobilized. Although these debates were arguably at their most intense among the movement's Dublin-based leaders and ideologues, they also impacted on the North. The Derry OIRA, some of whose members had a background in organizations such as the Young Socialists, came in for particular scrutiny for ultra-left tendencies. During a short sojourn from Derry, Terry Robson had become education officer for the Co. Antrim Clubs, but was suspended for urging his unit to refuse to sell the September 1972 United Irishman. That issue carried an article by Owen Omer Chu which described Bernadette Devlin, Eamon McCann and Michael Farrell as provo-trots who had helped turn civil rights into civil war. Omer Chu charged that the provost insane bombing campaign had been urged on by the parasitic sub-life of the Trotskyist movement. The article drew much criticism and the official leadership discussed whether Harris might have partly written it. The OIRA Army Council minutes for the 8th of October noted, it was further agreed that we advise B. Devlin that the article attacking her in the Sept UI did not in any way reflect the opinions of the editorial com, it, or the leadership. The writer alone was responsible. In Belfast there were also those concerned with instilling a distinct brand of pro-Soviet Marxism within the movement. After his release from internment, Day O'Hagan had become an increasingly influential figure. A member of the IRA and then Sor Ulad during the 1950s, the Belfast man had emigrated to England after serving time during the border campaign. There he studied at the London School of Economics and joined the Communist Party. Active as an official auxiliary in the Lower Falls, he was nicknamed, The Devil, after a run-in with local clergymen. O'Hagan attained public recognition during his imprisonment, authoring a series of letters from Long Kesh, published in the Irish Times. On his release the Dublin leadership recommended that he be given greater authority in Belfast, and he was elected on to the army executive in late 1972. O'Hagan was unashamedly supportive of the USSR and hostile to Trotskyism. This Soviet orthodoxy was opposed by Belfast clubs members such as Ronnie Bunting and new recruit Ed Maloney, who had backgrounds in people's democracy. After the May 1972 ceasefire the leadership was intent on renewing efforts at reaching out to the northern Protestant working class, emphasizing the role of the Provo campaign in intensifying sectarian division. Within the leadership McGurran voiced a note of concern, warning, there is always the danger that you would concentrate all your efforts, in getting through to the Protestant working class, and find the Catholic working class has been led astray behind your back. At Carrickmore in July 1972 Mac Giola made a major speech, partly written by Dick Walsh, in which he stated that the Provisional's military activity had destroyed the momentum of the civil rights campaign. In doing this they had played into the hands of the forces of imperialism. According to the Sinn Féin president, the key task was to prevent a sectarian civil war and to enlist Protestant workers' support for the Republican cause. People have talked about the Provisionals trying to bomb one million Protestants into a republic, but they would not. Could not, and no one can, and no one as far as we are concerned would try, to bomb them into a socialist republic. That would be the ultimate contradiction and the ultimate stupidity. We need those million Protestant working people on the workers' side in the Irish Revolution. The speech had a significant impact within the movement. In Derry it was decided to resume efforts to contact loyalists despite the fact that a previous attempt ended in near disaster. In March 1973 the clubs began a major campaign against sectarianism, taking out an ad in the Irish news declaring, sectarianism kills workers and distributing leaflets on the theme that republicanism is secular, socialist, separatist. During the same period British civil servants were discussing how they might draw the sting from groups such as the officials wavering between political activity and violence. They considered, the extent to which the officials could be weaned from violence, by concessions, such as the legalizing of the Republican clubs, while noting that the group's new supporters are more politically orientated than the old supporters. Secretary of State for Northern Ireland William Whitelaw was wary of such an approach, asserting that some gunmen are pathological killers. Those seeking rapprochement won out, however, and the Republican clubs were made legal in April 1973. In response the officials announced plans to contest the forthcoming district council elections. All 83 candidates took a people's pledge that they would not take their seats while internment existed. Despite their legal status the clubs faced security force harassment, with several candidates arrested and their homes raided during the campaign. Neither South Derry's Francie Donnelly nor Armagh's Tommy McGleanan could campaign openly because of threats from the army. In Belfast there were clashes with the provisionals, who were running a boycott campaign. 
In the end the clubs gained just 3% of the vote, winning 10 seats. There were some encouraging signs. In Newry they took 11% of the vote, and in Belfast Jim Sullivan and Ray O'Hagan were elected in a substantial vote of 9,500 first preferences taken in the Falls area. In Derry the clubs received 6% overall but took 16% in Cregan where Mickey Montgomery became the first Republican to win a seat in the city since 1921. Claims that the Ranger best killing had ended support for the officials in Derry were obviously mistaken. A few weeks later a separate election was held to choose representatives to negotiate new power-sharing governmental structures for Northern Ireland that would include an Irish dimension. The clubs fielded fewer candidates and saw their vote fall to 1.8%. Rural constituencies provided the most support, with James McDade taking 2,923 votes in Fermanagh South Tyrone while four Belfast candidates mustered only 3,728 between them. The officials did receive a morale boost when Francie Donnelly, having been disqualified from the South Derry Council for refusing to take his seat, was returned in the subsequent by-election, beating an SDLP challenger. His campaign was supported by local MP Bernadette Devlin, who had recently married a Tyrone official, Michael Michalowski. At a meeting in late July the lessons of the elections were considered. Widespread intimidation of voters by the provisionals was reported from parts of Belfast and especially in Crossmaglen. Their accusation that the officials were collaborators was also thought to have hurt the Republican club's vote. It was felt the officials' anti-sectarian statements were seen as too accommodating to unionists by some voters. Others felt the clubs were too closely associated with violence, and that the OIRA's claim to have killed seven soldiers during the spring had actually lost its votes. Internal problems had also created difficulties. In Armagh City the official director of elections did not even agree with contesting them and made no effort to organize the area. After the council elections the clubs had found it difficult to motivate activists to canvass for the assembly poll. More problematically it was noted that some voters did not take the clubs seriously as a political party. They regarded us more as a mixture of social workers and militarists. It was admitted that the officials' use of voter impersonation had helped up the total poll, particularly in the Belfast area. The Belfast director of elections recalled, umpteen dud votes, people weren't interested in voting so we voted for them. Vote early and vote often. The official leadership believed that getting involved in a campaign against the building of an orbital road in Belfast had potential to bridge the sectarian divide. Up to 14,000 people were to be uprooted for the huge project which would pass through parts of the Lower Falls, Short Strand, Sandy Row and the markets, and the officials believed that both Catholics and Protestants could be mobilized on the issue. A great deal of time and energy was spent on pickets and road blockades over the next two years. The OIRA announced that they had built up dossiers of information on the various companies involved in the project and offered their services to the campaign. Attempts at cross-community cooperation were also made by NICRA, which began to campaign for the release of all political prisoners, loyalist and republican. But Kevin McCory reported a lack of interest among club members towards NICRA, with even executive members not turning up for meetings. In Derry the majority of the local membership had decided that involvement with NICRA had shackled the movement. The officials were already noting that even many of our own members doubt the credibility of our anti-sectarian stand. Even more contentious were efforts to engage with loyalist paramilitaries. In late 1972 the UVF dismissed appeals from the Sinn Féin president by sneering, Mac. Giola, get your priorities right. You are no more interested in the working class Protestant than the man in the moon. The officials recognized that the leadership of loyalism was overwhelmingly reactionary, but maintained that the UDA and the UVF represented a new factor, an effort by the loyalist working class to set up their own organizations and a very faint flicker of hope. Golding was very anxious for contacts to be established. Harry McEwen already had some connections to men who had joined loyalist groups through his construction business. Encouraged by Golding, McEwen set about organizing a meeting for the official leadership and the UVF. In this he sought the assistance of his friend Kevin Myers, a young journalist. Myers socialized with members of the OIRA, who found him very left-wing and anti-British in his attitudes. On the UVF side there was also interest in talks, leading Belfast UVF man Billy Mitchell recalls that his organization's leadership were interested in seeing face to face what made their enemy tick. Mitchell had also read Rosita Sweetman's strongly pro-official On Our Knees, published in 1972. Sweetman's twin sister Sue was an activist in official Sinn Féin in Dublin. In early 1974 the OIRA leadership wrote to the UVF leadership. It is our belief that ultimately the solution can only be found in the 32-county context of a socialist republic. If our organizations were to cooperate in any way, we would retain the right to try to persuade you of our point of view but we renounce the use of force to push anyone into a united Ireland. 
We only accept the use of force in defense of working class homes or communities. Make no mistake, we may well need that force in defense of working class demands. Recent experience has shown that we are all, natives, to the British army when we oppose the policies of a British Tory government. Shortly after this letter was sent, a delegation from the UVF including Mitchell, Jim Hanna and another of the organization's senior figures were met in Monaghan and brought to Dublin. At a hotel in Chapelizod they spent several hours in discussion with Golding and Garland, Mac Giola also entered the talks briefly. As Mitchell recalls, we got the impression they were people we could do business with. Most of the talk was social and economic stuff, not the constitutional stuff. On the Saturday night the loyalists and their wives accompanied the officials, including Billy McMillan and Day O'Hagan, to Slattery's pub in Cable Street. The UVF men were unsure what to do when, Amran na BHFI Ann, was played at closing time. They began to stand up, but O'Hagan made a point of not standing and McMillan told the UVF men they didn't have to either. A level of contact was maintained, but when news of the meetings began to seep into the press the loyalists furiously denied that there had been any contacts, while the officials confirmed talks had occurred. During this period the UVF men had also met members of the provisional leadership, a fact that caused outrage when news of it also leaked out. The talks led to internal ructions in the UVF and were a factor in the killing of Jim Hanna by members of his own organization in April 1974. During this loyalist feud, Billy Mitchell hid out in McEwen's home. Some of the official leadership saw the internal disputes within loyalism as indicating a left-right divide. The official press enthused whenever the UVF's combat quoted an article from the United Irishman or used left-wing rhetoric. Day O'Hagan contributed an article to the UVF journal on internment under a pseudonym, Long Beard. The officials also saw evidence of new thinking within the UDA, after two of its leading members, Tommy Heron and Ernie, Duke, Elliot, were killed during internal feuds, the officials speculated that they had been, working against fascism in loyalist ranks. However, Mitchell felt that the officials were, probably looking at the UVF through rose-tinted glasses and that the loyalists who had met the official leadership were, not representative of the UVF or the loyalist community. Despite its occasional leftist rhetoric, combat also stressed opposition to, communism, the enemy of the working class as well as featuring an article supportive of the British National Front and white rule in Rhodesia. It reiterated that the UVF was equally opposed to both the Papist Provisional Alliance and the Marxist Republican movement. A powerful reminder of the strength of a mobilized Protestant working class came in May 1974. Since the beginning of that year, after agreement at a conference at Sunningdale, some unionists, the SDLP and the Cross Community, but mainly middle class Alliance Party had been operating a power sharing government. In opposition to this arrangement, many grassroots unionists, the DUP, Vanguard and the Orange Order had come together under the umbrella of the United Ulster Unionist Council. This group both reflected and fueled widespread Protestant unease with the Irish dimension of the Sunningdale Agreement. Behind the scenes contacts between the UUUC, loyalist trade unionists and paramilitaries culminated in a general strike organized by the newly created Ulster Workers' Council. Two days into the stoppage, on the 17th of May, UVF car bombs in Dublin and Monaghan killed 33 people. After 13 days, with all essential services threatened with closure and loyalist paramilitaries openly on the streets, the power-sharing assembly collapsed. During the strike the OIRA helped coordinate relief efforts within nationalist areas, bringing in supplies of food and fuel. On the ground in Belfast many officials feared pogroms or even a loyalist coup. Extra weapons were moved into areas in preparation for attacks, and plans were drawn up for barricading and holding nationalist districts. The OIRA made it clear that it was prepared to cooperate with other groups in defense of areas but would not participate in offensive activities of a sectarian nature. Preparations were made in South Belfast for cooperation between officials and provisionals to hold the Lagan Bridge and evacuate local Catholics down the railway line into the markets. At a meeting of the official leadership to assess the impact of the strike, Macmillan reported that the organization had responded very well in Belfast. While many Catholics were frustrated that the Brits were not moving against the Loyalists they seemed to have confidence that the movement would protect them in the event of sectarian clashes. In Armagh, however, fear of sectarian attack had led many Catholics to accept the British army in areas where they would have normally met a hostile reception. In Derry, Catholic workers were attacked when they tried to go to work and some families were also forced out. In the US the momentum of the Irish Republican clubs had faltered and in 1973 just $8,448 was sent back to Ireland. The organization was riven by disputes between the more traditionalist Irish-American activists and young left-wingers who wanted support for issues such as abortion and gay rights. The official leadership were concerned about the flow of money and counseled compromise. 
The most successful fundraisers were a club composed of New York transport workers led by Liam Kelly. As part of a longer-term plan, the movement opened a pub in Berkeley, California, during 1974. Several American supporters of the officials emigrated to Ireland during the early 1970s including Helena Sheehan and Ellen Hazelcorn. There was some suspicion of their motives and the OIRA carried out investigations into the backgrounds of these emigrants. Clan Na Aran also had to take stock of the new situation after 1972 as the worsening violence saw enthusiasm and interest fall away. The organization faced constant police attention and attempts at infiltration. At various stages Mac Giola, McGurran and Sean O'Chanath were also served with exclusion orders from Britain. Clan tried to build a wider base, setting up an emigrants' campaign, demanding the vote for emigrants and protection for Irish workers from unscrupulous landlords and employers. But the turnout for Clan protests began to dwindle as the British left shifted its focus away from the Northern Irish conflict and towards other causes such as anti-racism. There was an emotional response to former Clan activist Michael Gawen's death on hunger strike in May 1974. The Klan newspaper Rosk Katha admonished the Irish community by asking, Where were you? Rightly or wrongly, this 24-year-old boy died for you. Klan members hoisted a tricolor over Lambeth Town Hall and flew it at half-mast to mark Gawen's death. On many occasions Klan members were raided after provisional bombings. Klan condemned these bombings not for moral or pacifist reasons but because they were politically and strategically wrong. After 21 people were killed in the Provo bombings of Birmingham, Pubs in November 1974 Klan denounced the disgusting outrage and, in an atmosphere of rising hysteria, distributed leaflets in Irish bars and clubs arguing, you didn't do it, you didn't plant bombs, don't put your heads down, hold them up. However, the bombs had a major impact in alienating British people from the Irish cause and led to a police crackdown on all Irish Republican groups. Jim Flynn was among the officials arrested and held for 18 days in solitary confinement before being deported to Ireland. Eventually three more officials, Jerry Doherty, Danny Ryan and Brendan Phelan, were also sent back to Ireland. During this period the officials identified a new source of funding. The inland revenue allowed building contractors to settle their tax affairs at the conclusion of the year. Rather than pay tax on a weekly basis the subcontractors were granted tax exemption certificates, which enabled the main contractor to pay in gross without income tax being deducted. Harry McEwen was one of the first to realize the potential of the scheme. If false certificates were produced then contractors could present a figure to the authorities and pay a percentage to the OIRA. An anarchist group and BICO were recruited to help print the first false certificates. As the official certificates became more sophisticated the OIRA devised new ways of obtaining plates from which to forge them. With major building work starting to take place in areas like the Lower Falls and the markets, the tax exemption rapidly became a major source of funding for the officials. They expanded the operation to the British Midlands and to Bristol, also providing security on sites there. Another source of income came from the local drinking clubs, which were becoming much more professionalized. Clubs now operated in the Lower Falls, the Markets, Turf Lodge, Beachmount, New Lodge, White Rock and Bally Murphy. In Twinbrook the OIRA were asked to intervene in a row between two factions of the ex-servicemen's organization over the running of their drinking club. The officials took the opportunity to gain a say in the running of this club themselves. There were two British general elections during 1974 and the Republican clubs contested both, again complaining of widespread harassment. The Irish government's assessment of political developments in the North suggested that the SDLP would lose support to Republicans and that the officials would benefit, because they were not as closely identified with the atrocities and violence of recent years and were in general more active politically than militarily. However, the clubs polled just 2.1% of the vote in February. In the October Westminster poll the club's vote rose slightly to 3.1%. The SDLP's Jerry Fitt accused the clubs of costing his party seats by only standing in nationalist areas. Tension had been growing in Long Kesh over the conditions for the more than 1,000 Republican and Loyalist prisoners held there. There, were complaints about the quality of food, visiting rights and cutbacks on parcels from outside. The clubs helped establish the Belfast United Workers Group to organize industrial action on the issue. In September it was decided to stage marches and block roads across Belfast, involving supporters of all paramilitary groups. The officials optimistically stated that for the first time since the 1932 outdoor relief riots there would be cross-community protests on the streets of Belfast. At the last moment the loyalists called off their participation and only nationalist areas saw protests. In Long Kesh the cages were pretty boiling, after several incidents and the provisional prisoners had decided to burn their huts in protest. The officials agreed to participate, while the UVF and UDA declined. 
The Provo O.C. Davy Morley assured officials that his men were not interested in having a battle with the Loyalists, and that their prisoners would be left alone. On the 20th of October P.J. Monahan called the officials to emergency drill, and told them that the huts were to be destroyed. The men set fire to Cage 21, grabbing their coats and jackets and tearing off pieces of wood for weapons. Within five minutes, the place was ablaze, as large parts of the camp were set alight and fences knocked down, the place all burned down around us. As the prisoners retreated onto the football pitches hundreds of soldiers entered the camp backed up by dog units, firing CS gas and rubber bullets. A helicopter came in low over the prisoners, spraying CR gas. There was vicious hand-to-hand -hand fighting, as John Nixon recalls, it was the first time ever that I had seen mass fighting on an open scale, 18 years of age, it scared the heart clean out of me. Sean Curry was hit in the face by a rubber bullet and awoke in the UVF compound having been dragged in by loyalist prisoners for his own safety. Many prisoners were seriously injured and denied medical treatment. Nixon got a heavy beating, they told me it was for my own good. Once the camp was secured the men were forced to stand for hours spread-eagled and then had to sleep outside for four weeks. Soldiers destroyed the officials' prison library and many of their possessions. During this period loyalist prisoners threw tobacco and food into the Republican prisoners' cages. A 5,000-strong march in support of the prisoners by the Belfast United Workers ended in rioting on the falls. By the end of 1974 the official leadership was aware that their position was making little advance in the north. While 3,000 people attended a May unveiling of a monument dedicated to OIRA volunteers Tony Hughes and Jake McGarrigan in Armagh, the performance of Republican clubs' candidates in the area illustrated how little support had been gained beyond this active base. The Unionist Party had split but, rather than move to supporting Republicanism or the left, the Protestant working class had been drawn towards the Democratic Unionist Party. Dup, and Loyalist Paramilitaries The crisis in the North had dominated official political considerations since late 1969. However, the movement had also set its sights on radically changing Southern society. 7. Towards the Revolutionary Party, in world revolutionary history only one form of organization has proved itself capable of organizing the people to achieve victory. This was the Bolshevik Party of Lenin. If we accept that we need and must have the support of the mass of the Irish people, the working class, and if we accept that we will not be able to develop the political consciousness of all the people then the way forward is through the development of a cadre of leaders in a conscious disciplined political revolutionary vanguard organization. Sean Garland, 1973 events in Northern Ireland overshadowed Southern political life in the early 1970s, and much OIRA activity in the South was focused on providing military, political and financial support for comrades in the North. Sinn Féin in Dublin experienced dramatic growth, from just nine Cumain in 1969 to 23 by early 1973, and the picture was similar elsewhere in the South. The party was also successfully reorganizing in areas severely affected by the split. By mid-1971 the North Kerry Cumann had enough members to set about establishing a new branch in the west of the county. Many new recruits dropped out of activity after a short period, however, Golding commenting, that from every ten that come, maybe we retain anything from three to five. Overt conflict with the provost was relatively rare in the south. Most among the official leadership were keen to maintain this situation, even ordering members to refrain from heckling at their rivals' events. But contact between the former comrades was inevitable. The Felons Club, a shabine run in the basement of the Kevin Barry Hall in Dublin's Parnell Square, remained a late-night drinking venue for both wings. One official recalled that in the club current politics, were not meant to be discussed, but you sang your songs and you drank your drinks. Some officials were prone to dismissing the smaller faction in the city as politically naive, cowboys, and of little long-term consequence. As in the North, however, the split intruded on families and friendships. Dublin activist Nuala Monaghan remained with the officials while her husband Jim joined the provost, Mick and Pygin Doyle, son and daughter of 1930s Dublin Ira Man Archie, took the provisional and official sides respectively. An interested observer of the ructions within republicanism was the U.S. ambassador to Ireland John D.J. Moore. In his communiques to Washington on the high-priority subject of an increasingly active left wing in Ireland, the ambassador argued that the communists were attempting to capitalize on the lingering sentimental affection felt for the IRA among the Irish public. In early 1970 Ambassador Moore sent a rundown of communist and communist front organizations. In Ireland, to Washington, this communique noted the observation of a highly placed official in the Irish police, that communism has made more progress in Ireland in the last two or three years than it made in the previous 30 or 40 years. But the actual numbers involved were still small, 
Moore quoting estimates that the Communist Party had around 200 members plus about 100 fellow travelers, that there were 100 Maoist internationalists and around 40 in the Irish Communist Organization. The Trotskyist League for a Workers' Republic, LWR, which was active within the Irish Labour Party, was estimated to have a membership of only 30. The Irish Voice on Vietnam, the Irish Campaign for Peace and the Ireland USSR Society, groups, more noted, that had been central to several anti-war demonstrations at the embassy, were classified as mere front organizations for communist subversion. In order to counter such agitation, funds were requested for a publicity campaign promoting President Richard Nixon's administration. The British were less troubled by the potential of the Irish Republican left wing. A Foreign Office intelligence report stated that the officials' attempts to create a National Liberation Front were extremely unlikely to succeed. Although overdue for social reform, Ireland is markedly stony ground for communism. In the first place, extremists and malcontents have an anti-communist safety value in traditional republicanism. The republic is the antithesis of the classical communist society, it is rural, bourgeois and clerical. The church especially has great influence on opinion and most Irish, educated by the church, regard even pink socialism as atheistic dynamite. The Russians and their fellows are the legions of hell. Nevertheless official Sinn Féin activists were increasingly to the fore in demonstrations against America's war in Vietnam. The party's vice president Myron de Burka was prominent in many such protests, eventually spending several weeks in prison during 1971 following an incident in which cow's blood was thrown onto the U.S. Embassy's facade. The officials also reinvigorated the campaign demanding public ownership of Ireland's fisheries. A new wave of fish-ins were planned, aimed not only at the remnants of the Anglo-Irish aristocracy but also the new rich of Fianna Fáil, whose interests the National Waters Restoration League felt Minister Neil Blaney was most concerned to safeguard. Fish-ins occurred around the country, Loch Ree, Waterford and the Boyne Valley seeing particularly intense activity. The protests also reached Donegal, with activists conducting salmon drift net fishing in privately owned sections of Inver Bay. In May 1970 the Starry Plough flew over the battlements of Lismore Castle, Waterford, after a group of officials barged their way into the Irish demean of the Duke of Devonshire. A July occupation of Slane Castle led by Donchad Mac Rignale, chairman of the Boyne National Waters. Restoration League, resulted in Gardy storming the building and making arrests. The class rather than nationalist aspect of the campaign was emphasized in County Cork when Joe Sherlock led a fish in on a section of the Blackwater owned by Fianna Fáil Senator Kevin O'Callaghan. Protesting about this infringement of his property rights, the senator stated that his father had bought back these, dispossessed, O'Callaghan lands in the 1930s, adding that his family had taken the Jacobite side in the 1641 rebellion. The National Waters Restoration League was not impressed, replying that prior to the Cromwellian conquest fisheries were not the property of clan chiefs but were held in common by the people under native law, adding that its campaign would continue, whether the owner be a senator or an absentee landlord, a Duke of Devonshire or a native aristocrat. Seamus O'Tuothale's Stolen Waters, a pamphlet collection of the Poacher's Guide articles, was one of the official movement's fastest-selling publications. Addressing a Donegal Fish Inn, Myron de Burka stated that there was a unity in the struggles of such outwardly disparate groups as the fishermen of Inver, the cement strikers of Drogheda and Limerick and the oppressed of the Falls and Bogside. The official IRA remained committed to backing up these protests, blowing up a salmon weir at Ballancolig during one dispute. With an eye on stemming the growth of the provisionals the officials stepped up activity throughout rural Ireland. In Galway the Connemara civil rights movement was active on issues of emigration and rural development. Although not a creation of the Republicans, the Connemara civil rights movement had applied to join the NLF. Owen O'Murchu was appointed full-time organizer for the Gaeltacht, the movement supplying him with radio transmission equipment that enabled SOAR Radio Chonamara to begin broadcasting in May 1970. A small farmers' defense association was set up to help generate rural agitation, with Ard Chomherly member Tom Kilroy appointed organizing secretary. Elsewhere Republicans had become involved in a dispute between the small community of Montpelier, O'Brien's Bridge, straddling the Clare Limerick border, and the government. Ignoring local protests, the Department of Education had announced it was closing the community's primary school. Shen Fine arranged for it to remain open without departmental funding, with Brian Patterson, former chairman of the Queen's Republican Club, taking over teaching responsibilities in early 1970. Several other Republican teachers followed over the next year until the school was finally closed. In County Galway agitation against the construction of a golf course at Otterard reached its height in the first months of 1971. Local activists picketed the developers' businesses, demanding that the land be divided up among local small farmers. Meanwhile the OIRA sabotaged building machinery and warned that the developers would be held. 
personally responsible for depriving people of their natural right to live in Ireland without fear of unemployment and emigration. Later that year the OIRA again destroyed machinery on the site, firing shots over the heads of Gardaí who disturbed them. The housing action campaign, by contrast, was now in decline, due to a combination of activists' concentration on northern issues and the Gardaí's adoption of a more belligerent approach. As the officials rearmed, squats were increasingly used to store weapons, a situation that precipitated a large-scale confrontation in 1970. During 1969 housing activists had occupied two empty four-story houses on Pembroke Road in the leafy South Dublin suburbs. The properties, owned by a leading Dublin jeweller and by property developer Matt Gallagher, had been used by the Dublin Housing Action Committee, DHAC, to house several homeless families. In late May 1970 workmen forcibly evicted squatters from the Gallagher property. A frantic call was received in Gardiner Place. Sean Dunn immediately gathered together a dozen activists, who rushed over to Pembroke Road only to find the house deserted. Unbeknown to them, a homeless man from the adjacent squat had produced a gun and frightened the evictors off. Within minutes of the activists taking repossession of the property a voice, amplified by megaphone, was heard demanding, throw out the gun. Gardy had surrounded the area and began to move in, Dunn recalls. We threw everything we had at them, plates, dirty nappies. We lost each floor as the police came in, we went up, and up and up, and we got stuck up in the kitchen, fronting out on to where the American embassy was and we were all singing. We shall overcome, and I was holding the door and next minute an axe came through the door and the door swung open and I was caught behind the door, lucky for me because the police came in with crowbars and they made ten kinds of shite out of everybody. Injuries included broken ribs and a fractured skull. Those protesters not hospitalized were produced at the high court, where it was demanded they give an undertaking to stay out of the property. But, as Dunn remembers, the minute we got out we ran back into it. He oversaw defensive preparations. We, barricaded, it, we put railway sleepers against the door, we dug trenches, we put nails in cement, we made petrol bombs, of course, in the IRA we learned how to do this. We put acid in it, of course the CP didn't want that violence, so we had an argument and we stashed them up on the roof. We were prepared for war on this one. Well over 100 Gardaí surrounded the barricaded building and after a week of preparations launched a pre-dawn raid. Riot shields were deployed for the first time in the force's history and, under specially constructed corrugated iron shelters, the Gardaí advanced into a hail of bottles, bricks and smoke bombs. They attempted to gain entry using power saws but met with a sustained shower of missiles. After hours of violent confrontation the protesters surrendered. That night, as the squatting families were being removed from the 2nd Pembroke Street house, the OIRA's Dublin Active Service Unit was in action, burning down offices owned by the Gallaghers on Bagot Street, causing an estimated £250,000 worth of damage. Although housing protests would continue, for many activists the Pembroke Road siege marked the last hurrah of the squatter. An internal Sinn Féin report stated that after the siege the DHAC disintegrated as attention was focused on events in the north. The housing action committees also had to accept there was growing disquiet that squatters, particularly in council properties, were merely queue jumpers. Concerned by the campaign's decline, de Burka had called a special meeting of leading housing activists, including Sean Dunn and Proinches de Rosa, in December 1970. Little was agreed upon and during 1971 the campaign reverted to opposing evictions and finding housing for those fleeing the northern violence. There was also decisive action by government, with the Forcible Entry Bill becoming law in September 1971. It increased both Garda powers and the penalties on those who transgressed property rights. The new law clearly targeted housing action committees and the activities of the National Waters Restoration League, with Minister for Justice Michael O. Moraine referring to fish-ins as a form of intimidation when proposing the new legislation. The summer of 1971 would see the last major fish-ins. As the arrest of activists became more frequent, Sinn Féin sought to develop less confrontational forms of agitation. In September 1970 the party called upon people to stop paying ground rents, publishing a pamphlet called Ground Rent is Robbery. O2 Othale was central to the formulation of this new agitation, making clear at the campaign's public launch that means that might be considered by some illegal would be used when deemed necessary. During early 1971 Kumain in Dublin and Waterford began forming flat dweller associations to represent people living in privately rented accommodation. The initial aim was to pressurize the government into establishing a rents tribunal, similar to the one operating in England, to enforce a statutory scale of rents and minimum conditions of maintenance. This campaign drew some students and young white-collar workers into the party. While most activists turned their energies towards the north, de Burka was increasing her involvement with the fledgling Irish women's liberation movement. 
De Burka argued for Sinn Féin to adopt a feminist agenda, though she found her male comrades, with the exception of Mac Giola, largely uninterested. Nonetheless, the party did distribute the women's liberation movement booklet Irishwomen, Chains Are Change, and the internal Sinn Féin newsletter Nuak Nesunda recommended it to every woman in the movement and all men who really know what socialism is all about. Internal unease at the perceived primacy of nationalist politics over social agitation resulted in several Dublin activists resigning from Sinn Féin in the aftermath of the 1971 Ard Face. Among those who left to set up the Socialist Party of Ireland, SPI, were former leading figures in the Dublin Housing Action Committee. Most were also OIRA members who had already left following disputes over the movement's political direction that surrounded the 1970 IRA General Army Convention. In order to help fund the new party, SPI supporters robbed £1,000 from a post office in Ballymun. Despite some allegations of intimidation, relations between SPI members and their former comrades remained relatively good, with several rejoining Sinn Féin within a few months. The new group would eventually adopt a view on the national question, strongly influenced by the British and Irish communist organizations, Two Nations Theory. It was openly pro-Soviet and unashamedly adopted communist iconography. But outside of Ballymun, where it campaigned consistently on local issues, the SPI failed to make a discernible impact and never numbered much more than a few dozen activists. The Wolf Tone Society had been severely affected by the split, with many members attempting to steer a neutral course between the rival wings. Anthony Coghlan remained prominent within the group although his perceived influence with the Republican leadership was now causing problems. A disgruntled Sinn Féin activist had to be assured, Tony Coghlan was not a member of the Republican movement, in order to prevent him resigning. The perceived threat of EEC membership now dominated the society's concerns. Most of the left and the trade unions opposed entry, while Fianna Fáil, Fine Gael, business and farmers groups supported it. Republican anti-EEC rhetoric made appeals to cultural nationalism while predicting that membership would have dire consequences for the Irish economy. It proved difficult to motivate members on this issue, Nuak Nesunda accepting that the EEC was probably the subject best calculated to raise a yawn. But with factory closures and unemployment rising, claims that membership would lead to fierce competition for jobs between locals, dispossessed small farmers and continentals with work permits had some resonance. Kumain were instructed to form broad-based anti-EEC action groups. Golding hoped the campaign could be used to reinvigorate the National Liberation Front strategy. At all levels members were encouraged to work closely with the Communist Party. Some young activists held dual membership of Sinn Féin and the Connolly Youth Movement. Attempts were also made to enlist left-wing labor dissidents. Sinn Féin supported a Socialist Unity conference during March 1971, from which a new grouping, the Socialist Labor Alliance, emerged. The officials did not wish, however, to build a movement that was confined to the left. Golding proposed that the party write to organizations catering for small shopkeepers, pointing out to them the dangers of the EEC and the threat of supermarket takeovers in the hope that they may become part of the opposition to the European community. After Mac Giola had criticized left-wing organizations a request from de Burka to have this thrashed out was dismissed by her colleagues, who felt that Sinn Féin should not get involved in the internal doctrinaire wranglings of various left groups. Even so, the importance of developing an understanding of left-wing politics was still the primary purpose of the movement's internal education. Among the guest speakers at a major seminar held at Loch Sheelan in Cavan in late 1970 was Ruth First of the African National Congress, who spoke on the Cuban Revolution. A lively level of critical debate was encouraged at educational meetings. Dublin activist Tony Gregory recalled asking Roy Johnston why a middle-class person was lecturing about the working class. Johnston responded that, it's not what class you're from that matters but the one you're allied with. Despite the desire to gain influence with organized labor, evident as far back as the IRA's 1966 strategy document, little progress had been made. Sinn Féin helped organize protests against the 1970 trade union bill that sought to regulate unions and curtail strike activity, and in the same year, active support was also provided to striking workers during a long-running cement strike. The OIRA destroyed premises, machinery and vehicles belonging to two Dublin building companies that were supporting strikebreaking. There was also a firebomb attack on a strike-bound haulage company in Dublin. During 1971 the official leadership decided to put their trade union activities on a more solid footing, setting up a Republican trade union group with ITGWU official Day Gerardy as its key figure. This new arm of the movement would soon make an impact within RTE. At the station Owen Harris was chairman of the Workers' Union of Ireland branch as well as producer of Irish language program Feech. He had already raised hackles among the RTE authorities for appearing on the Late Late Show passionately denouncing the EEC, 
as well as for helping produce the station's internal left-wing journal feedback. The 1969 controversy that led to the resignation of three producers had politicized many at the station, with RTE employees feeling they had to take sides in the wider political debate. Harris and his allies John Caden, Oliver Donahue and Fergal Costello were among a group of station employees suspended for taking part in an April 1971 anti-redundancy picket of the Eurovision Song Contest in Dublin. Donahue, an active trade unionist who had joined the Labour Party while a student in UCD, was invited by Gerardy to a meeting in the North Star Hotel, which he recalls turned out to be a meeting of those sympathetic to or members of official Sinn Féin. Among those in attendance was Paddy Whelan, leader of the Bricklayers Union Badu and a long-term Republican activist. Donahue recalls being impressed by Whelan, who made a passionate speech welcoming this move of Republicans into the trade union movement, he also talked about getting away from the gun. Violence in support of union militancy remained an OIRA tactic, however. In July 1971, during a strike at the silver mines in Co. Tipperary, armed men held up security guards and placed bombs on the electricity transformers. These exploded, causing extensive damage. While planting the devices, 20-year-old Cork OIRA member Martin O'Leary was electrocuted and suffered extensive burns. His comrades drove him to hospital in Limerick, where he died a few days later. Golding gave the oration at O'Leary's funeral, describing him as a prototype of the modern revolutionary. Golding warned that, if the forces of imperialism repress, coerce and deny ordinary people their God-given rights, then it is our duty to reply, in the language that brings these vultures to their senses most effectively the language of the bomb and the bullet. With the OIRA increasingly active in the North there were fears that Golding's speech heralded a new phase of armed action in the South. As a result of his speech Golding was arrested and charged with incitement to cause explosions. The case was adjourned several times as the OIRA made a concerted effort to intimidate the jury, getting the addresses of several members through tenants' association contacts and visiting them at their homes. An RTE tape of Golding's speech was found to be blank and ten jurors failed to show up for Golding's trial, at which the historian John A. Murphy gave evidence on the official leader's behalf. Golding was eventually acquitted. In December 1971 the Sinn Féin leadership decided to intensify their involvement within the unions. The leadership adopted a Seamus Costello proposal that an industrial subcommittee be appointed to coordinate the activities of a Republican Industrial Development Division. Lar Malone, a prominent member of the Dublin OIRA, would become RIDD's leading organizer. Malone envisaged the new organization having the dual purpose of conducting policy research and providing a support network for Northern OIRA members in the South. At an initial RID meeting Malone was happy to see a number of people he had not known to be involved in Republican activity. Malone, Oliver Donahue, De Gerardy, John Caden and Fergal Costello, a CPI member, were elected from the floor onto a committee to draw up a document outlining the department's goals. Owen Harris also attended some of the early meetings. Malone had met Harris once previously, when appearing on Feech to discuss credit unions. Malone recalled Harris as a capable fellow, very clever, if a little egotistic. Other official activists were also instructed by the movement to involve themselves in RID, among them Sean Dunn. He recalls how involvement was sold to OIRA members. This is an army operation, it's going to be run like a fucking army cell. Now we're not going to be shooting anyone, but we will if we have to. We are going to be involved in our trade unions and get people into committees. We're going to do industrial espionage to lean on people. We're going to do whatever it takes to be in there with the working class and the trade unions. Fergus Whelan, son of Batu leader Paddy, recalls sometimes being called by his army section to attend meetings that turned out to be rid events. It was in no way military, but there was a crossover of personnel. Some of the ways we would meet in secret was also based on the paramilitary system. It certainly was covert, but not illegal. Despite the escalating violence in the North, debate at the October 1971 Ard Thais had been preoccupied with the forthcoming referendum on Ireland's membership of the EEC. In his presidential speech Mac Giola stated, The government in Dublin cannot be regarded as pro-Irish. It is an anti-Irish government, preoccupied with an attempt to sell out to another empire, the new empire of monopoly capitalism, the common market. Galway delegate Liz McManus proposed an amendment that any anti-EEC alliance with business interests should be ruled out with a clear alternative of a socialist workers' republic being offered instead. Speaking as a guest, Bernadette Devlin supported this position, but Seamus Costello came out strongly against it. A rousing speaker, he argued, if we lose this referendum, we can pack up as revolutionaries and that applies whether we are socialists, Trotskyites, Communist Party or anything else. McManus's amendment was defeated by an overwhelming majority. Although the party's mood was confident, 
the leadership was unhappy with the continued sapping of movement energies by the northern conflict. Mac Giola bemoaned to his fellow party leaders, the complete inactivity on social issues in most of the country. On 30 January 1972, while Ireland was transfixed by Bloody Sunday in Derry, de Burka was aiding a woman who'd been arrested after being evicted, along with her child, from their home. She recalls. Everybody was of course upset but I just thought the Brits aren't down here and this woman is in jail because she put a roof over her own head and the head of her child and the Brits have nothing to do with this. The days were gone that I could get very exercised about the North except in terms of social attitudes and social problems. Nonetheless de Burka took part in the protest outside the British Embassy a day later and was among several demonstrators injured in baton charges. One of those disillusioned by the rising mood was Roy Johnston, who resigned from Sinn Féin and the OIRA during January 1972 the killing of Senator Barnhill having confirmed to him that the movement had gone too far in its reversion to militarism. He informed Golding first, and they parted, on relatively good standing, on talking terms. Johnston would eventually join the CPI, hoping that there might be some sense to be found there. The departure from the Republican movement of a man once dubbed a dangerous communist infiltrator was regretted by British officials, senior diplomat David Blatherwick noting, a pity. Communist influence was a force for good, i.e. less versus, islands, more scribbling in Ireland. The official IRA's May 1972 tarring and feathering of a 15-year-old girl in Belfast for fraternizing with British soldiers also had repercussions. The feminist activist Dr. Moira Woods shaved her head in protest and picketed Gardiner Place. What gave her protest added significance was that Woods was living with Cathal Golding. Trinity educated, Woods had been married twice by the time she met the OIRA leader. Her previous husband, Bobby Woods, had died in 1970 leaving substantial property interests in Dublin, including the building that housed the British Embassy on Marion Square. During 1971 Golding had moved into Woods's home in the exclusive Aylesbury Road area. The relationship caused considerable unease among some in the OIRA leadership. In spite of internal tensions, Sinn Féin was presenting a more dynamic image than its main rival on the left, the Labour Party, which had been convulsed by infighting. Left-winger Jim Kemmy resigned from the party and set up the Limerick Socialist Organization, which adopted a two-nations perspective in relation to Northern Ireland. Within Labour the Young Socialists faction angrily complained of the party's inactivity, with Una Claffey stating that the Republican movement had been the only organization to consistently oppose the EEC while the Labour Party had passed pious resolution after pious resolution and done nothing. Many young socialists drifted towards membership of Sinn Féin, as did several former Maoists when the campus craze for Mao's Little Red Book began to wane. The officials' innovative use of media was an added attraction for left wingers looking for a new political home. Utilizing RIDD's connections within RTE, the movement had established an anti EEC radio station in Dublin. The first words broadcast were those of United Irishman Henry Joy McCracken The rich always betray the poor. The party also funded propaganda films about the anti golf course protests in Otterard and the threat of the EEC made by playwright John Arden and his wife Margareta Darcy both Sinn Féin members. However, neither an influx of members nor cutting-edge propaganda could persuade the Irish public to back the Republican approach to the EEC. On the 10th of May the Irish electorate voted to join by nearly 5 to 1. Despite the movement's radical politics and often bohemian social life, its leadership could not ignore the conservative mores of wider Irish society. When on the country's most popular light entertainment show, The Late Late Show, celebrity priest father Michael Cleary explicitly claimed that the provisionals represented the authentic IRA while the OIRA were communist-inspired and controlled, the officials felt they had to react. Sinn Féin General Secretary Tony Heffernan wrote to Archbishop McQuaid of Dublin to complain. Father Cleary's remarks have been a source of great distress to our members, the majority of whom are practicing Catholics. Indeed, Golding had been at pains to stress on occasion that the officials were not Reds. In late December 1971 he and Mac Giola visited McQuaid, and according to the Archbishop a very relaxed and cordial discussion took place. Afterwards McQuaid declared that the Marxist label should not be applied loosely to the officials, as they were chiefly interested in social justice. Nonetheless, the officials' growth in the Republic resulted in British intelligence reassessing the threat posed by a group which, in their view, had attracted a large number of habitual protesters to themselves. A 1972 security assessment of the Republic of Ireland stated, they are worse armed and numerically fewer than the provisionals, but more vocal and politically sophisticated. The officials have a considerable following in the universities and a number of sympathizers in the press and radio. In general they attract the left-wingers present in most Western societies. They represent the greatest internal subversive threat at present, 
the energy of the provisionals is turned to the north, and in the longer term. But this threat is not yet a real danger to the state. However, British Ambassador John Peck in Dublin feared the worst if a long road to a peaceful settlement was not taken. At the end of the other long road, for the Republic there will be a gradual erosion of the democratic and economic structure of the nation and the dominance of two rival factions of violent men, the one aiming at the creation of a Marxist Republic of Ireland, the other at a state founded upon Irish nationalism but in structure probably not so different. Even if they have to fight it out, the end of the road is another Cuba. Jimmy Jordan, a building worker and former Maoist who joined the party during 1972, found Orthodox Shinners, Republican Socialists, people who were close to the Communist Party's thinking, Trotskyists and those interested in the two nations idea, all included among the membership. Increasingly, however, there was division between those broadly supporting Seamus Costello and a hardline Marxist grouping led by Owen Omer Chu. Many of the arguments between these groups were fought out at monthly Dublin members' meetings where up to 200 activists would observe and participate in debate. For Omer Chu, the reality was a choice between a serious, tightly disciplined party operating along the lines of art based decisions, or a constant state of flux. The often bitter internal debates enthused some but disheartened others. One of the Dublin members who dropped out during the early 1970s remembers. I couldn't take any more of this infighting, there was an awful lot of personality clashes, nothing was clear anymore. Disputes with other left groups could go beyond polemic. In early 1972 the Connolly Youth Movement rode to Gardiner Place to complain of the fascist tactics employed by Sligo Sinn Féin activists and the party's conic organizer Bressel O'Kaili. These related to alleged physical threats against Declan Bree, who was attempting to reorganize the Connolly Youth Movement in Connacht. This was not the only problem in the West. In May 1972 the Dublin leadership called for the expulsion of John Arden and Margareta Darcy. According to a letter to the Dublin Comherley Seantair they had made remarks after a performance of one of their plays at UCD in which they attacked everything for which the movement stands, including its maintenance of an illegal nationalistic army. Specifically they accused the OIRAOC in Galway of giving gelignite to a local contractor so that he could carry out an action. Darcy was expelled later in the year and Arden resigned. His resignation letter included a stinging condemnation of the University College Galway Republican Club over their cowardly failure to support an elderly Otterard woman who faced eviction. It concluded, I would not wish any further to impede you in your political careers. You have good work yet to do, talking big and keeping quiet and there are many masters of your craft already seated in the dale ready and willing to instruct your apprentice legislators when, in due course, they creep into Leinster House. Adding to head office's headaches about the state of the movement in Galway were contacts between local members and Socialist Workers' Movement SWM, activists, and the participation of other members in freelance robberies, the latter activity leading to two expulsions. By 1973 both the city's Kumain and the area's Comherley Seantair had been disbanded, leaving only the UCG Republican Club in operation. The influx into Sinn Féin of members with a diverse range of views necessitated a re-examination of the movement's ideological direction during 1972. Derry Kelleher, who temporarily replaced Johnston as director of party education, is recalled as a bit like a bumbling professor, promoting an esoteric mix of republicanism, Christianity and Marxism. After the OIRA ceasefire, however, it was Sean Garland, combining his roles of party national organizer and OIRA adjutant general, who became the driving force behind internal education. Garland was an avid reader, and attempted to encourage his army council colleagues to read Marxist texts, with varying degrees of success. Garland was drawn to Lenin's concept of a revolutionary party, views forcibly presented in a May 1971 United Irishman article, Building Revolution. In this he clearly defined that, revolution, for him meant, the change of state power from one class to another, and that the official movement was still a work in progress. At this point in history our movement must have a national liberation and socialist character, but its central goal was political power for the working class. He returned to this theme at Bodenstown in June 1972, telling the crowd of several thousand that the Republican movement sought to build a revolutionary party based on the reality of the principle of tone, which would lead a revolution against the imperialist, the capitalist, the foreign gangster and his native lackey. Those who stood in their way included, the man who helps a tottering regime by his appeals to sectarian violence, the sniper of the ultra-left, the social democrat intellectual or opportunist, who pretends to socialism, but once scratched by reality reveals his desire only for power. In Garland's view a revolutionary party would be built, not by emotional appeal but hard argument and long debate. However, the IRA was still central. Let no one take, any suggestion or even hint, that, the army of the people will not be used and when necessary fully employed to defend the interests of the working people. 
Key to the building of such a party was the education of party cadres. During 1971, the officials had acquired farm cottages in Mornington near Drahada, Co. Louth. The buildings were renovated into a complex of small lecture rooms and sleeping huts that could accommodate 28 people. This, Mornington School, was to serve as a training center in revolutionary theory. It was put into immediate use, holding lectures for OIRA and party education officers. Work began on drawing up a movement-wide education program. By August 1972 John McManus was the Education Committee Chairman and Podrick Yates its Secretary. McManus was a Wicklow GP and former Labour Party member who had joined Sinn Féin in Galway, where his wife Liz was a party activist. Other committee members included Dubliners Tony Gregory and Andy Smith, Nuri's Sam Dowling, and Garland. Some of the lecturers had particular expertise, such as De Gerardy, who spoke on industrial organization, by contrast. Helena Sheehan recalls that she learned everything in her lectures just before I gave them. The Education Committee recognized that for new and young members, many from the North, with little formal education and probably even lacking in basic academic discipline like reading a book or making notes from reading, the need was to gain familiarity with the habit of study and confidence, but not overconfidence, in expressing their ideas to others. Mornington had its own library, which included the works of Marx, Lenin and Connolly along with numerous Irish and international works including Bowyer Bell's The Secret Army. International reading material ranged from Ho Chi Minh and Mao to Machiavelli. Education officers were instructed to use copies of Education Committee lectures in order to conduct courses at branch level. To oversee the Education Committee and the Mornington School, Day O'Hagan was employed as a full-time party director of education. Maintaining a regime that lent itself to an appreciation of Marxist theory proved difficult. O'Hagan reported, Negative attitudes, with some members having to be reminded the school was not a rest home for tired revolutionaries. The director of education drew up a set of house rules that allowed for time to relax on the beach or play football between lectures, but rowdyism was banned and it was stressed that Mornington was not a holiday camp. In theory there was to be no drink brought to the school, no gambling, no dancing after the pub closes and all were to be in bed by a reasonable hour. Those transgressing were liable to be sent home. These stern rules were not always enforced, as Mary McMahon recalls, it was great to get out of Belfast and get away from all the hassle and shite, it was our butlins, you know, it was fabulous, but for most people you went through it in an alcoholic haze. I mean some people went to the pub on Friday night and didn't emerge again until Saturday night. Some lectures are recalled as, just fucking nonsense, with O'Hagan bewildering and boring many a student with his lecture on the theory of dialectical materialism. But many activists who attended Mornington, or the School for Terrorism, as some jokingly called the venue after it appeared in a British tabloid scare story, found it a rewarding experience. Largely due to Mornington, a greater degree of ideological cohesiveness developed in the movement. The message was driven home to activists that theory without action was pointless while lack of theory led to malpractice, the cost of which was dramatically outlined in the Education Committee's publication Foblogging. Erroneous theory for us is different than for example, a left faction, their mistakes don't finish in a cemetery. Garland and Costello had emerged from the OIRA's internal debates as the leading proponents of a major re-examination of movement strategy. Costello was hugely popular among the membership of Sinn Féin's Five North Wicklow Kumain, and had been active in the North, mixing with OIRA volunteers eager to return to full-scale operations against the British. Having personally combined successful political and military activity himself, he remained a prominent figure in Wicklow local politics, sometimes packing the county council chamber's public gallery with supporters he saw no contradiction in openly pursuing both. Garland had spent much of the preceding two years abroad and now sought to reverse the trend that was seeing the officials losing ground to provisional militancy. Golding would recall Garland as, depressed, during this period. Sean had an idea that we went too fast with the ceasefire. He was deeply affected by the Provo split. Garland and Costello produced an IRA policy document entitled, A Brief Examination of the Republican Position, an attempt to formulate the correct demands and methods of struggle. It sought to re-emphasize the officials' commitment to the national struggle. In this country more and more events of the past few years demonstrate that the struggle for democracy is also the national struggle since it is British power and influence that maintains the undemocratic structures and it is the nationalist population that suffers under this system. The document suggested the movement's current policy was possibly leading to a departure from core Republican values and was dangerously close to accepting arguments made by Conor Cruz O'Brien and those who propagated the two-nation theory. To accept such a position, it argued, even in part, leads one inevitably to the position where, we expect and look to the British Army to play a progressive role in Ireland. What a position for Republicans. In fact, it argued, 
The national question remains central and this was one of the reasons why the provosts are still a force today and why they will not fade away for a long time yet. During this period Garland was involved in numerous discussions with the American Trotskyist Jerry Foley. Recalled as an intense, small, solemn-looking owl of a man, with large glasses, Foley spoke several languages, including Irish. He developed friendships with McGurn and Garland, and later with Costello. Foley recalled Garland as the most interested in socialist theory of the official leadership and as a complex personality, a sort of Hamlet, very much tied to Golding and Mac Geola personally, but unsure about their strategy. In Foley's opinion the debate within the officials in late 1972 was between support for a Castroist national liberation struggle and a Stalinist stages approach. At the time debate was raging among Trotskyists globally on the use of armed struggle. Much of the British far left took a position of unconditional support for violence carried out by national liberation movements. Foley adhered to another strand of thought, which placed emphasis on the building of mass revolutionary parties. Garland found the concept of building a mass revolutionary party particularly appealing, seeing the concept as a way to move beyond the increasingly bitter debate between those espousing the stages theory and others seeking to dispense with it. Meanwhile Owen Harris had asserted himself as the main intellectual force within RID. His winning charm and sharp polemic gained him many admirers and a nickname, the Thin Blue Flame. However, even among fellow adherents there was some amusement at the leather jacket wearing Harris' regular declarations that he was a Stalinist. RID had grown to include dozens of active trade unionists, leading members continuing to meet as an ad hoc executive. This group had begun to develop a role in researching movement policy. Developing this role brought Harris and other RID figures into increased contact with the Republican Club at Trinity College Dublin. Paul Sweeney joined the club during 1972, having been recruited by Owen Harris, and convinced that the revolution might actually happen. He was impressed by Harris' tremendous ability to get young people up and going and doing intellectual work, getting it discussed and disseminated around. Even though RID contained a substantial number of OIRA members, Harris and others with a Labour Party background were shaping the movement's big debate, what was the national question. As leading member Oliver Donoghue puts it, to still talk of the British imperialism as the enemy of Ireland was outdated and simply not accurate because at that stage, it was American monopoly capitalism that was ruling the world. If you look at what was happening in Ireland, the surplus value of the Irish working class was not being used to line the pockets of the British aristocracy. The acceptance of this analysis within RID provoked a cultural shift within the movement in Dublin, as Sean Dunn recalls. All of a sudden everyone is talking about Owen Harris and we're singing. American wobbly songs, Joe Hill, and all. The culture had changed from, the boys of Kilmichael, to, Casey Jones. Golding was generally supportive of the RID view of how the Republican struggle should be redefined. The OIRA chief of staff also developed a close friendship with Harris, and told others that the Corkman was a genius. The thinking emanating from RID was evident in a May 1972 memorandum outlining the group's views on the two great current problems facing the movement, the loss of the EEC referendum and the sectarian pogrom which the Provisional Alliance seemed determined to provoke. The document argued that all cooperation with the Provisionals should be ruled out as they were entering their mad dog last convulsions. Instead it called on contact to be made with loyalist vanguard leaders. The Derry OIRA, whose perceived Trotskyist connections were a source of concern to RID, were also a target. An outlandish proposal for a mass temporary evacuation of the Bogside and Cregan, to Donegal, in the tradition of the great ghetto evacuations concluded that the logistical problems are great, but not as great as the problem of leadership. Two sentences at the end of the four-page document dealt perfunctorily with the possibility of setting up a national anti-redundancy campaign the main issue that the official leadership hoped the trade union group was pursuing. A 1972 draft internal party report on the Small Farmers Defense Association also illustrated RID thinking. Farmers' disregard of Sinn Féin turned to hate due to the EEC campaign and the apparent increase in prices obtained by farmers, following the referendum. The farming community is getting smaller. This move from the land may be a good development from the revolutionary movement's point of view, in approximately 10 years there will be no such thing as a small farmer. When that stage comes, it might be found necessary, by the revolutionary movement of the time, to organize worker against farmer. As there is a long-standing ill feeling between workers and farmers, this friction could be very easily developed. However in the meantime, it is the job of a revolutionary movement to try and organize these discontented people now into an organization which will oppose the plans of the capitalist system. By late 1972 a perceived lack of activity by RID was a cause of concern for the official leadership. RID members were also accused of overstepping their authority. While honeymooning in England, 
Oliver Donahue had approached Klan activists, inquiring about United Irishmen's sales and political affiliations of their membership. This prompted the leadership to remind RID members that until the group's position was formalized, they did not represent the movement and merely had an advisory capacity. Following a meeting between party leaders and RID it was agreed, after some difficulties that the group's activities would be organized through the movement. These strictures prompted a short-lived resignation by Harris and Donahue. Eventually a compromise was reached whereby the relationship between the two organizations was held to be one of full mutual cooperation. Alongside RID, Owen Omer Chu and those aligned with him also strongly espoused a stagist approach. Several of the activists identified with this tendency, including Tony Moriarty, Sean Dunn and Helena Sheehan, shared a house on Dublin's north side. Sheehan recalls that among this group the history of the Albanian Party of Labour and Mervyn Jones's biography of Stalin. Joseph had a cult status, Omer Chu's use of the United Irishman to propagate his views was widely criticized. Obscure political jargon, personal attacks and the inclusion of a poem in Irish dedicated to Sheehan prompted a number of Kumain to complain to head office. Sales had also fallen greatly from the average 50,000 a month in 1970. Other activists recall being perturbed by what they saw as the English-born Omer Chu's attempts to be more Irish than the Irish themselves. In late 1972 the leadership eventually replaced Omer Chu as United Irishman editor with the Dairy Starry Plough, S. Jackie Ward. The Ridd and Omer Chu groupings shared a fear that, trots, were attempting to infiltrate the movement. Harris, in a black leather coat, and, looking terribly fierce, is recalled lecturing one Galway meeting on, our Trotskyite deviations and social democratic instincts, which, had to be purged out of us if we were to become true revolutionaries. O'Hagan, no fan of Trotskyism himself, recalls meeting Harris and Donahue in De Garrity's house, where Harris started to rant about the trots. I looked at him in stark raving fucking amazement. I said to Gerardy, is he mad? Gerardy replied, he just goes on like that. On one occasion Golding requested that a number of Dublin Comherley Cientair members meet Harris. On arriving, at the meeting Harris let it be known that he wished to talk to IRA members only, necessitating Liz Doyle's exit. She recalls Garland laconically asking, are you feeling harassed? Garland also took to describing meetings between Golding, Harris and other RID members as the army council in exile. One RID member suggests that, if Harris had been allowed to sit in Sean Garland's company for two fucking seconds the game would have been up. In order to avoid such confrontations Harris sometimes waited in an adjacent room to give advice to his allies when OIRA meetings were taking place. On the Army Council, Golding, Mac Giola and Ryan were now identified with the stagist approach, with Garland and Costello on the other side of the debate. McGurran was torn between the two, while Macmillan was loyal to Golding's position but aware of the demands for greater militancy from those under his command. By the time of the December 1972 Ard Thace the OIRA convention had endorsed the Garland-Costello position. This directive was delivered to the Ard Chomherley, with non-OIRA members not even seeing the political motion they were proposing till the morning of the Ard face. At the conference the impact of the ceasefire and debates within the OIRA was clear. Golding did not make a speech and no statement from the OIRA was read out. Garland's oration dwelt on the organizing of a revolutionary party rather than on Northern Ireland. It had been decided not to distribute the competing Garland, Costello and Golding, Maggiola documents, but Costello took it upon himself to hand out a document outlining the position, that the ending of partition was essential to the fight against imperialism. Delegates supported the key political motion, which stated, the main obstacle confronting us in this struggle is the stranglehold of British imperialism, any final settlement must be on the basis of a total withdrawal of all British military, political and economic control from Ireland. Other motions called on the British to commit to total withdrawal at an early specified date, with a full implementation of a Bill of Rights during the interim period. The removal of all sectarian elements in the Southern Constitution was also demanded. The Derry delegates were particularly vocal in their support for the reassertion of the national struggle, in traditional Republican terms. In the polarized atmosphere even the appearance of Derry's Terry Robson, making a speech with his long hair, combat jacket and Shea mustache, was enough to provoke revulsion in some Dublin delegates. The Garland-Costello alliance broke down very quickly. A leaflet on northern policy based on the Ard Thace resolution was drawn up, but then shelved. Jerry Foley recalls feeling the divide as due to Costello wanting to go for armed struggle full stop, a position the Wicklowman felt the resolution endorsed, but which Garland opposed. Garland was still close to Golding and Ryan, and Costello's behavior since winning the internal OIRA debate had rekindled concerns about his arrogance. Golding, now 51, was coming under increased pressure from his colleagues to either abandon his painting business or step aside as chief of staff. 
There was no clear agreement on who might replace him, with Costello, Garland and Ryan all potential candidates. Ryan, known as the Bald Eagle in Belfast, was seen as someone who took the struggle in Northern Ireland very seriously. Costello had a definite following but his support among Southern OIRA officers was limited. Garland was seen as having tremendous integrity and great authority, but as being a hard man to get on with. For many OIRA members he was the movement's leading political figure and Golding's obvious replacement. However, Garland's insistence that the movement abandon titles such as Chief of Staff, his loyalty to Golding and his belief that policy could be directed from his present position meant there would be no immediate change at the top. A priority for Garland was establishing a weekly paper for the Republican Voice to be heard on the day-to-day -day issues. He had planned to launch such an enterprise in early 1972. But it was mid-1973 before the first issue of the tabloid Irish People appeared. Seamus O'Tuothale was hired to edit the publication, named after its Fenian predecessor of the 1860s. Among its early scoops were exposés of corruption in the Irish hospital sweepstake and naming the developers responsible for poorly built council houses. The December 1973 Christmas special bore the headline, Exploited for Christ, and detailed the conditions endured by those working for the Catholic Church in its colleges and laundries. O'Tuothale's independent editorial line provoked complaints, and circulation was poor with only around 5,000 copies sold per week. In contrast, United Irishmen sales had stabilized at 45,000 per month. With most of the official leadership not envisaging a return to large-scale military action in the near future, Costello was becoming more isolated. His supporters blamed a Golden Garland Ryan alliance for keeping him out of the movement in the capital and they recall him becoming fed up with his one-man battle. On top of the political problems, rifts were also emerging between Costello and senior comrades over fundraising and the definition of legitimate targets. Party General Secretary Tony Heffernan recalled being uneasy when Costello expressed the view that shooting unionists, if you shoot them because they are unionists, is not sectarianism. The Dublin OIRA leadership were also angry at the Director of Operations' unwillingness to authorize robberies. Speculation was rife that he was putting jobs in his back pocket to do later, and then informing Northern OIRA units that those fellas in Dublin was doing nothing. There were also rumors Costello was going bogey and retaining funds for himself. By March 1973 the differences were such that Costello threatened to resign as Sinn Féin vice president, until mid-1972 the Dublin OIRA, with Jerry Parker as O.C., had continued to regularly back up social and political agitation with military activity. In the summer of 1971 Gardy arrested a number of Dublin officials in connection with arson attacks on British property. Later that year in Dunleary a bomb exploded at Cumbria Flats, property targeted by housing action protesters. In early 1972 three activists were arrested trying to set fire to a landlord's property after he had evicted a pregnant woman. Cooperation between industrial and IRA activists saw a haulage company owner, who was involved in a strike in Co. Kilkenny, shot in Armagh and his supermarket blown up. Recruitment into the OIRA had continued after the ceasefire. After a few months in Shin Fine one young woman was asked to join the IRA, and despite having no interest in guns but a romantic new left thing about armed struggle, she accepted. A very ritualistic reading of the army constitution, which included offenses punishable by death, was conducted at a class for new recruits held in a council house in Finglas. It was made clear to all recruits that, if they wanted to join the IRA they had to be involved politically. One member recalled that they were to be the iron fist within the movement. At OIRA meetings the politics of new Sinn Féin members were discussed and decisions made on whose progress in the party should be halted. Another post-ceasefire Sinn Féin member recalls being approached in 1973 by a leading party figure, not notably associated with militarism, and asked if he was prepared to join the OIRA. When the recruit argued that an armed campaign in the North was of no interest to him, he was assured that his role would be in providing funding for political activity through robberies. Dublin OIRA political education now carried a new emphasis. One activist who attended an education meeting in Billy Wright's boxing club remembers the message of the evening as, Lads, there is no more military training on assault weapons or any of that stuff. If there is going to be military training it will be with short arms. We are not going to fight a conventional war with the British Army. If we are going to fight a war it is going to be a class war on the streets of Dublin. For Southern activists the priorities of the Northern membership could surprise. In the North young people usually joined the OIRA first and were then instructed to join their local Republican club. Tony Gregory recalls a trip to Belfast to give an education lecture as an eye-opener. They wanted guns. There was a difference between what they were at and what we were told they were at. 
In February 1973 Sinn Féin contested its first southern general election in 12 years, fielding 10 candidates. The party manifesto put, people before profit, and advanced a program described as, unambiguously socialist, undeniably republican. A feature of the campaign was the prominent role played by Ridd and newer party members, among them former young socialist Charlie Byrd, who managed the Sinn Féin campaign in Dublin South Central. If elected, candidates pledged to sign their salaries over to the movement, but none were successful. Seamus Rogers in Donegal received the party's highest first preference vote of 2,436, or 8.65%. No candidate in Dublin broke the 5% barrier. Costello came second last in Wicklow with 1,966 votes. Overall, Fianna Fáil gained votes but lost seats and a Fine Gael Labour coalition emerged victorious, with Liam Cosgrave of Fine Gael becoming Taisha. It was the first time in 16 years that Fianna Fáil was out of office. The United Irishmen attempted to put the best gloss on the poor Sinn Féin performance, declaring the party's 15,000 votes had come despite the bans of RTE and bias of bourgeois commentators. For many, the lesson was that the party needed to define itself more clearly as socialist and to professionalize campaigning techniques. Discussion also centered on the adverse impact of OIRA activity, with internal election analysis pointing to canvassing by Northern members as counterproductive. Discussion on how electoral performance could be improved fed into an ongoing debate on the need to reorganize the movement. Following the December 1972 Ard Thesa, Structural Commission, including Costello, Macmillan, Heffernan, Tony Moriarty and John McManus, there to give a non-OIRA perspective, had been established with a remit to examine the organizational structure of the movement. Although not directly involved in the commission's deliberations, Garland was the main motor behind the push for wholesale changes. The possibility of establishing a formal alliance with the Communist Party of Ireland, consistent with the National Liberation Front concept, had foundered because Northern CPI members feared that a direct link with republicanism would be disastrous for party support among Protestant workers. Omer Chu recalls that this pushed Garland to decide that this avenue was closed so the movement would go alone to become the revolutionary party of the working class. Garland argued during this period that the movement should be primarily political and any military activity should be strictly subordinate. Debate now centered on whether Sinn Féin or the OIRA should be the superior organization. The Commission's discussions drew upon international models. One proposal was that Sinn Féin be developed as a mass movement with the OIRA an inner revolutionary party, similar to the position of the South African Communist Party within the ANC. After seven months the Commission, without reaching an agreement, presented discussion documents on organization and structure, for circulation among the membership. In the documents Sinn Féin was referred to as Group A, and the OIRA as Group B, to circumvent the legal implications of using the term IRA. Document number one set out the case for the building of a single structure, revolutionary party type organization. It argued that in world revolutionary history, only the concept of the revolutionary party, a tightly organized vanguard of conscious revolutionaries, had proved successful. This party had to subscribe to the doctrine of democratic centralism which meant once policy was decided it had to be enforced without compromise throughout the organization. In the pursuit of ideological clarity and unity, members would be expelled rather than be allowed to compromise policy. Highlighting the differing views within the commission, a critique of document number one followed. It pointed to the communist states, where revolutionary parties of this type are in control, in warning that adopting a tightly knit revolutionary party model would lead to the emergence of a guiding elitist type intellectual vanguard who feel that only they know the true road to socialism and who therefore must direct the movement. The critique argued that the revolutionary genius of the Irish people could produce its own methods of organization. In the light of this critique of the revolutionary party model, document number two looked to make improvements without changing the fundamental structure of either organization. However, a number of disadvantages in the present structure were outlined. These included that some members of Group A complained of an elitist and a scornful attitude being displayed to them by members of Group B, and that decisions were taken outside of Group A. It was felt that the advantages of the present system included the attraction Group B had to militant young people, and ending it as a separate entity could create a vacuum which possibly would be filled by the provost or some other such group. Maintaining two separate organizations was also seen as conferring advantages in terms of security and deniability. Finally, document No. 3 Feed outlined a suggested model for a revolutionary party. There would be a division of labor within the party whereby some members were required for technical operations, whatever they may be, while others would concentrate on civil rights work, trade unions and research. Ideological unity and clarity was to be promoted through the insistence in the educational program on one policy. 
Determination was to be shown by the leadership in insisting on unity and the need to overcome and expose elements, no matter how high they may be in the party organization, who refuse to carry out the policies. The Ard Chomherly would have overall direction and control of the policy and work of all branches of the movement, including Group B. The discussion documents were distributed on a strictly confidential basis, a covering page carrying the warning that, on no account, were they to be shown to or discussed with those outside of the movement. However, the documents were accidentally distributed to people on a mailing list of prospective clan Na Aran members in the UK. Even more embarrassingly the British Army came into possession of a copy and leaked it to the Belfast Telegraph. Meetings to discuss the documents were held throughout the country in October 1973. Costello came out against many of the aspects of the Revolutionary Party concept, including democratic centralism. He used a meeting in Derry to renew his rapport with activists there, highlighting to them his problems with the proposals and with some members of the leadership. Many activists feared that the proposals would lead to a running down of the OIRA's structure and authority within the movement. The debate reached no definitive agreement but by late 1973 a process of reorganization had begun. Prior to this Garland had presented a paper on the organization of the proletariat's armed forces for discussion at an army council meeting in Co. Kilkenny. This was a communist document dating from the 1930s about how political and military organizations could be merged. Largely at Garland's instigation the army council passed a resolution committing it to transforming the movement into a Marxist party run on Leninist principles. In Dublin the reorganization debate coincided with a crisis of leadership within RID. Through RID Lar Malone had also been attempting to forge a formal alliance between the CPI and Sinn Féin at a Dublin level. Malone recalls that as well as the political benefits of an alliance he also hoped to eventually get money and weapons from Russia. To promote these aims he lobbied for the co-option of CPI member Fergal Costello onto the Dublin Comherley Seantair as an observer. Having felt he had secured endorsement for such a move, Malone recalls being shocked when it was voted down at a Comherley Seantair meeting. I said that's it, I'm finished with that, I was raging. Malone and several other like-minded members of the Dublin OIRA resigned. Some of this group were among a 13-man unit that undertook a £14,000 robbery of Houston Station in Dublin in September 1973. Barber Billy Wright was arrested by Gardy, having provided a car and disguises for the robbers. During questioning Wright broke down and told Gardy that assisting them meant he was a dead man. There were conflicting accounts of who planned the Houston heist, and when Mick Ryan attempted to investigate the background to it, some of his comrades stymied the inquiry. Whatever its origins, the robbery's proceeds were handed over to Golding. Gardy sought Malone for the robbery but with the help of the movement he fled to Holland. With Malone gone RID members' dogmatic approach was causing increased problems at Dublin members' monthly meetings, leading some activists to demand, get rid of RID. Golding's answer to this problem came in the form of Eamon Smullen, who had been released from prison in England in February 1973. Aged 48, he had extensive trade union experience after years of agitation on the building sites of London. He was also a firm believer in Soviet communism, taking pride in having joined the British Communist Party after the invasion of Hungary in 1956. Golding initially appointed Smullen as the new director of RID. After Jerry Parker, who was wanted for a robbery in July, went on the run to the continent, Golding appointed a new Dublin O.C. who was widely seen as ineffectual and resigned the position after only a few months. Golding turned to Smullen again, appointing him Dublin O.C. around the same time as he received the formal title of Sinn Féin Director of Economic and Industrial Research. Smullen oversaw a restructuring of RIDD's relationship with Sinn Féin. All RID activists were now to become party members, but many wished to maintain political anonymity. There was a long history of Republicans losing jobs because of their political affiliation, while in RTE and other sectors of the civil service employees were contractually barred from party political membership. It was decided that such persons could be issued with party cards without being publicly active, and would be responsible directly to Eamon Smullen on behalf of the Ard Chomherly. Attempts by the officials to link up with international communism were a source of concern for the British and Irish governments. In a secret internal communique the British Foreign Office noted, the Irish government are increasingly worried by the long-term threat of the official IRA which is penetrated and supported by international communism and its helpers. It was decided that Edward Heath should play upon this fear in an attempt to persuade Jack Lynch to think again about allowing the Soviets to establish a diplomatic mission in Dublin. The British Prime Minister sent a telegram to his Irish counterpart, which stated, we now have proof that Soviet officials posted to this country were engaged on preparing contingency plans of sabotage and subversion to be implemented in times of crisis. I am sure that this latter aspect of Russian activity will be in the forefront of your mind, not least because the Soviet journal, New Times, 
recently remarked approvingly upon the aims of the official IRA, which they defined as the overthrow of reactionary governments in the north and south of the country. In this connection you should know that a recent defector has told us that the KGB are taking a close interest in the Irish situation. The setting up of official Soviet representation in Ireland would be a significant indicator that the Russians intended to exploit the situation. If they did establish an office at least half the Soviet staff would be KGB officers. Nonetheless, with the Irish government eager to promote international trade, within two years the Soviets would have an embassy in Dublin. In October 1973 official Sinn Féin secured an invitation to send delegates to the Congress of International Peace Forces to be held in Moscow. The trip was seen as critical to building relations directly with the Soviet Union. In Moscow nearly 3,000 delegates, representing communist and national liberation organizations from 144 countries, met under the shadow of events in Chile, where the military, with CIA backing, had overthrown the left-wing government of Salvador Allende on the 11th of September. Allende took his own life rather than fall prisoner as planes bombed the presidential palace. Over the following month an estimated 2,000 trade unionists and left-wingers were killed as the military regime set about enforcing its authority. As South America's first democratically elected Marxist president, Allende's radical policies had been the international left's leading example of how much reform could be achieved without a resort to revolutionary violence. This ideal was now shattered. October's United Irishmen carried Golding's view. At what point in history was it ever possible to say to the power-hungry and the rich, Stop, you have had enough. One cannot ask the tiger for mercy. Chile has established beyond contradiction that the path to revolution through mass action and politics must be backed by the determination of those involved to use physical force to achieve political power. The Irish delegation in Moscow included not only Mac Giola, Garland and O'Hagan representing Sinn Féin but also CPI members, journalists and students. Particular importance was placed on meetings with officials of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, Garland recalling. Once you got them to talk to you, then others would follow. At one of the conference's fringe meetings Mac Giola addressed an audience that included representatives of the ANC and other guerrilla organizations. He stated that Ireland had for centuries been oppressed by the world's greatest imperialist power, but had never surrendered. However, the country now had less economic independence than the neocolonial countries of Africa and South America, with most industry and natural resources, in the hands of Anglo-American and other foreign monopolies and multinational companies. O'Hagan recalls discussing with Soviet, South American experts the damage they believed the Chilean Trotskyists had done in undermining the Allende government. Mick O'Reardon was also with the Irish delegation, the CPI general secretary insisting on attending a meeting where Sinn Féin papers were presented to Moscow University, causing resentment from Mac Giola and O'Hagan. The Soviet peace movement acted as a cover for the work of the state intelligence services, the KGB undoubtedly using the event to consider how effective the official Republican movement, with its trained military cadre, might be as a Cold War ally. Many of Garland's comrades felt he was politically influenced by his visit to Moscow. Padraig Yates recalls feeling that Garland had seen the system working. Until then he would have seen a lot of merit in the Trotskyist thing. In sections of the OIRA, a knees at the ceasefire was festering. Northern volunteers, on the run, conveyed to southern comrades their displeasure at the lack of action. The malcontents were increasingly drawn to areas such as Bray and North Munster, where support for Costello was strong. At leadership level Omer Chu's militant opposition to Costello was a growing problem. At one GHQ meeting Costello lashed out at Omer Chu, denouncing him as nothing more than a blue-nose, wine-drinking trinity shit. Golding and Garland felt it necessary to ask their younger comrade to tone down his criticism of Costello. While Costello longed to reopen full hostilities with the British, most of his fellow leaders wanted to focus on southern agitations, Golding writing in the international newsletter Eolas that, the most vital thing, we believe, is to develop a popular struggle in the south to complement the struggle in the north, to safeguard the struggle in the north it is therefore essential to mount a massive campaign in the south to oust the collaborationists. By the time of the 1973 Ard Thais Costello was reduced to a minority of one on the army council on many issues, but he could still depend on a sizable reservoir of support among both the Sinn Féin and OIRA membership. The fault lines within the movement were starkly visible among the 360 delegates who gathered in the basement of Liberty Hall for the November 1973 Ard Thais. In his presidential address Mac Giola called for a union of the forces of the left, which would strictly exclude those who are more interested in mouthing slogans or scoring debating points than doing solid work. In the South this union could fill the vacuum created by Labour's coalition with the class enemies, Fine Gale. He still hoped the provisionals might yet be persuaded to halt their campaign and thus allow the people once more to impose their authority on the situation. 
but he also made clear where he stood on the debate over the national question. We must continuously re-emphasize what is the national question and what is the national struggle. It is all about the ownership of the wealth of the country. While British intelligence's impression of the Ard face was a, a gathering of hairy academics in woolly sweaters with an average age of no more than 30 feet who partook in level-headed, orderly and articulate debate, behind closed doors the discussions turned bitter. In a prearranged move, Costello supporters from Donegal put forward an amendment to the political motion seeking to replace the primacy of the stagist approach with calls for national unity and revolutionary demands. Delegates from Derry and North Munster supported the amendment, Johnny White disparaging the leadership's attempts to replace working class demands with bourgeois reform, Omer Chu hit back, decrying his opponent's inability to see that seeking reform was central to the revolutionary struggle, and Mac Giola condemned the amendment's supporters, failed. Tactics, turning on the Northwestern delegates who, he claimed, had been unable to organize the people of Free Dairy and now wished to leave the homeless homeless and the unemployed unemployed while they waited for the instant revolution of the international socialists. Ironically, the movement's organizer in Dairy during the period in question had been Malachi McGurran, who supported the leadership position. The Donegal Amendment was defeated. John McManus had voted against the amendment but now tabled his own, seeking the removal of a line in the political motion linking Sinn Fein's aims to the socialism, presently being built in the socialist countries. Others also attacked this endorsement of bureaucratically imposed state capitalism, Johnny White denouncing the leadership as simply another facet of the CPI. O'Hagan and Garland both came out strongly for retention of the line and the amendment was voted down. Rid influence was evident in a walkout by some delegates as the agriculture debate began. From the platform Dermot Nolan condemned the Rid approach, dismissing the idea that small farmers would be driven off the land in a few years and arguing that it was impossible to have a revolution in this country without a united workers and small farmers movement. On the contentious issue of whether Republicans could accept a reformed Northern Irish police force, Costello overwhelmingly carried the day. His amendment ruling this out was carried by 181 votes to 41. His popularity also saw him head the poll for the Ard Chomherly and be elected vice president. Crucially, however, he could not stop delegates voting to approve the implementation of the principle of democratic centralism as the party's new core organizational principle. A radical policy platform emerged from the Ard face in which total opposition to the EEC was reiterated and proposals on economy-wide agreements between government, unions and employers were dismissed, as an attempt, to induce the working classes to substitute their fight for political and social emancipation with a vaguely defined concept known as social partnership. Outside the Ard face Hall Omer Chu received serious threats from Costello supporters, and in the immediate aftermath of the event the North Munster Comherley Cientair passed a resolution condemning certain members of the Ard Chomherley for an Ard face speech criticizing the provost, which in some people's mind can be looked upon as informing. Other Kumain now called for decisive action against perceived internal enemies. Dublin's McKee Cummin passed a motion demanding the party refuse membership to Trotskyites and militarists. The Robert Millen Cummin complained that the party bookshop sold Trotsky's writings but didn't stock Stalin's selected works. On the other side of the debate it was Dunn Leary's Markievicz Cummin which led the way in confronting the leadership position. Contrary to instructions, it provided names of possible local election candidates to newspapers. Worse still, the three prospective candidates, Mick Plunkett, Dan O'Reardon and Osgore Briatnock, were Costello supporters. A belief among some activists that the leadership had rigged the Ard face votes fed into the growing unease that had emerged during the debate over the Group A and B documents. This led to activists dropping out of the movement, among them Dublin OIRA members Tony Gregory, Noel and Marie Murray and early RID member Bill O'Brien. The hardening attitudes also saw Seamus O'Tuothale, who had attempted to remain neutral in the leadership arguments, replaced by O'Hagan as Irish People Editor. Others were thrown out as the leadership began to move against Costello. Derry's Terry Robson, who had seconded the controversial Donegal Ardface Amendment, was one of those summarily dismissed. Costello, however, would be afforded the full rigor of IRA law. The first days of 1974 saw the instigation of both an OIRA committee of investigation and a party inquiry into Ardface vote rigging. Leading figures traveled around the country to compile evidence of Costello's contraventions. OIRA units received lectures on all, volume. Clancy's, Costello's codename, offenses throughout his service, while members were told privately that Costello had stolen money and connived in allowing volunteers who opposed him to be captured by Guardi. One volunteer recalled feeling that, if they had all that on him going back to the 50s how come he was in a position of power now? On 21 February 1974 an IRA court of inquiry dismissed Costello, also taking his car and wages. He requested a full court-martial hearing. 
On the 5th of April witnesses were escorted at short notice to Mornington for Costello's court-martial. Bridget Makovsky, a Costello defense witness, would later recall being frisked as she entered Mornington while armed volunteers with walkie-talkies patrolled the area. The IRA court and prosecution witnesses, among them Golding, Garland, MacGiola, Ryan, O'Hagan, Ochenath and McGurran, gathered in one schoolhouse, in another house were Costello and those aiding his defense. When the hearing commenced, McGurran, who had replaced Costello as Sinn Féin vice president, formally read the charges. Costello was accused of engaging in conduct that undermined the IRA, misappropriating army funds and faction building. Part of Costello's defense was that his accusers had undermined him by their own vote rigging. Without even calling most of the defense witnesses, the three IRA judges found Costello guilty of all charges and he was summarily dismissed, with ignominy. In the opinion of his supporters, Costello hadn't stood a chance, Makovsky later stating, Jesus could have testified on Costello's behalf and it wouldn't have changed the verdict. The former chief of staff and his supporters left immediately. It was a dramatic end to over 20 years of IRA membership, during which Costello had been at the forefront in pushing for the organization to adopt left-wing policies and immerse itself in politics. But he was now breaking with his former comrades, believing they were shirking their duty to conduct an armed struggle against the British. Costello was still a member of Sinn Féin and faced a separate party inquiry, relating to his general unsuitability, in late April. Costello had appealed, by letter, against the composition of the panel, Seamus Lynch, Jimmy McEwen and Bert Kwame, who had been selected to hear the case. He argued that, at least two of them are members of Group B, and, could be instructed, or, feel obliged to uphold whatever case is made by Group B at the inquiry. Costello had been provided with a, written summary, of the IRA investigation but was not aware of the specifics of the Sinn Féin case. Northerners Larry Carragher and Ivan Barr were ordered to give testimony that they had received voting lists of who, would constitute a good militant Ard Chomherly, directly from Costello. The Ard Chomherly found Costello guilty and decided by 17 votes to 3 that he should be suspended for 6 months, during which time he could not seek re-election or attend meetings of Wicklow Council or Bray Urban District Council. Letters supporting Costello began arriving in head office, while the Rockfield Park Tenants Association in Bray called for him to be allowed to stand in the upcoming election. Costello himself publicly called for an extraordinary Ard face to debate his situation. The prospect of losing the political base he had created was unthinkable. On the 21st of May he announced that, in accordance with the wishes of the people, he would contest the council elections as an independent Sinn Féin candidate. The press release publicizing his decision appealed to, the people of Wicklow, to support other Sinn Féin candidates and stated that he intended to resume his party activities at the end of his suspension. In the June local elections Costello topped the poll in Bray and was re-elected to both the Urban District Council and County Council. Supporters from around the country had worked for him and his election literature had prominently supported Sinn Féin. Sinn Féin ran 75 candidates nationally and won 14 seats, most of them in rural towns. Joe Sherlock topped the poll in Mallow, as did Liam Ahern in Clonakilty and Paddy Gallagher in Waterford's Ward 3. In Waterford the three Sinn Féin candidates gained 1,376 votes between them, 10.3% of the poll, and narrowly missed out on two extra seats. None of the four candidates in Dublin got more than 1,000 votes, however, and outside of Waterford the Sinn Féin vote remained overwhelmingly rural. At a discussion on the results in Mornington, Waterford's Sean Kelly was dismayed to find more concern over internal movement politics than election analysis. He would recall that for many activists parliamentary politics was, not what the party was about. The Ard Chomherly dismissed Costello. On 13 July, citing his continued attendance at Wicklow County Council, his re-election campaign and lobbying for an extraordinary Ard face. At the same time the Army Council ordered volunteers, not to associate, with Costello and stated that they were, duty-bound, to report any communications from him or face, instant dismissal. Moves were made to dismiss any remaining Costello supporters, with Ronnie Bunting among those expelled, while many others left of their own accord. However, a small band of Costello supporters fought a rearguard action within the party up until the 1974 Ard face. Costello's problems allowed the Omer Chu faction to seize control of party organization and education within Dublin. For Omer Chu and his comrades, control of recruitment allowed them to fully indulge their obsession with the threat of Trotskyist infiltration of the movement. Prospective members' previous involvement in left-wing politics was a cause of serious concern. Introductory lectures on Irish history, the Republican movement and socialism could be unfriendly affairs with many members rejected before the end of a six-month probationary period. New recruit Paddy Woodworth, who had been inspired to join Sinn Féin in part by the bloody events in Chile, recalls classes in Gardiner Place delivered by Dublin education officer Tony Moriarty. 
He used to sit and singe a cigarette packet with a lit cigarette, talked constantly about the danger of Trotskyism. They, fellow prospective members, were the unfriendliest, coldest. I don't remember ever going for pints with them afterwards. We all went our separate ways. There was a very cloak and dagger feeling about the Gardener Place building at the time because stuff was going on in other rooms, other groups were meeting in other rooms, and even if people weren't, they liked to give that impression. Since not all those seeking membership were successful, activists remember feeling privileged if you were accepted. Once in, a very high level of commitment was expected. In late 1973 Moriarty had instituted a compulsory lecture series for Dublin Kumain education officers. The almost year-long course was to be an experiment in revolutionary political education that sought to create solid hardcore conscious revolutionaries in Dublin. Lectures were to be conducted on the Russian, Chinese, Vietnamese, Cuban and Albanian revolutions as well as Irish and European history. It was the compulsory essay aspect of the course that raised most concern. That many of the essays were on subjects of controversy within the movement led to fears that members were really being tested on, where you were on the Stalinist spectrum, and after heated debate these concerns eventually caused the course to be terminated. Argument over the direction of the movement was fierce among the up to 300 members in Dublin, and was conducted in the language of the communist purges of the 1930s. Omer Chu's group decried their opponents as Trotskyite. Ultra-leftists, dilettantes, or right-wing militarist Castelloidas, while they in turn were described as Stalinists, reformists, and agents of Moscow. Some members recall an intense atmosphere of mutual suspicion, which was exacerbated by the claustrophobic nature of the movement. Members often lived in shared movement houses, and their little spare time not taken up with political activity was often spent socializing together. Summary arrests and house raids were common, as were special branch visits to members' employers. But many also recall feeling a sense of belonging and the many occasions when the crack was marvelous. However, despite attempts by the leadership to rein in Omer Chu's group, by the end of 1974 the infighting and departure of Costello supporters had made its mark. The number of Kumain operating in Dublin declined from 25 to 19, with nearly 50 members leaving during this period. Out of 103 people who had applied for membership that year only around 30 had become active. The Omer Chu faction was unrepentant, their 1974 Dublin AGM report stating, Our direction was meant to shock, some of us could benefit from a course on how to win friends and influence people, but anyone who cannot distinguish between political ideas and the personalities through which they are expressed cannot be described as a revolutionary. Their strategy document did contain some important ideas. It admitted that the movement had little or no contact with the mass of the Dublin working class and that this had to be remedied. Kumain in working class areas were urged to intensify their involvement in tenants' organizations. In South Finglas a golden opportunity to intervene on the issue of the disgraceful condition of newly built houses was pointed out. The South Side Flat Dweller Belt was also to be the subject of a major campaign by the Flat Dwellers Associations. There was a need to reorient the movement to systematic local work. Omer Chu's faction was not the only grouping rising to increased prominence. In the months after the 1973 Ard Thace the several dozen RID activists had been restructured into an industrial department that comprised specialist Kumain, whose memberships were based on particular groups of trade unions. The September 1974 OIRA General Army Convention received a report that seven such Kumain had been established in Dublin, one in Limerick and one in Cork, with an organizing committee in Belfast to oversee the activity of specialist clubs. Among the new secret Kumain were Dublin's William Thompson Cummin, named after the 19th century Irish socialist pioneer, and the Ned Stapleton Cummin, named after the communist activist and friend of Smullen who had died in January 1973. A third was named after Joe O'Connor, another wartime comrade of Smullen's who had also died that year. The Thompson mainly comprised members of the ITGWU, with Day Gerardy its leading figure, while the Stapleton was mainly based on the Workers' Union of Ireland and included Harris and Donahue. Many university Republican club graduates, several of whom had taken up posts in the civil service and semi-state companies, were absorbed into the special research groups. According to the General Army Convention Report, research groups were operating in Dublin, Belfast and Limerick and had aided workers in a number of disputes. The covert nature of RID was maintained. All Dublin OIRA members were now ordered to join these new secret Kumain. Most of these men were manual laborers whose unions the Thompson catered for, while clerical staff joined the Stapleton. This led to some seeing the demarcation between the two Kumain as being one for OIRA members and the other for new movement intellectuals. There was some confusion over whether they fitted into the movement's structure as part of Group A or Group B, with one leading member of the industrial department recalling seeing them as the real Group B. However, 
the leadership had decided that the industrial department was attached to the party. As both the operations of the OIRA Dublin Brigade and industrial department were the direct responsibility of Smullen, who took the position vacated by Costello on the Army Council, their exact relationship to the leadership was largely academic. During 1974 the department published The Great Oil and Gas Robbery, which outlined how the Irish Gombean class was selling off Ireland's human and natural resources. In the longer run the department's research section ambitiously aimed to know more about the economy of this country than any political or economic organization, and use this information as a weapon in the battle to give the ownership of Ireland to the people of Ireland. The tactics of the industrial department were outlined by Smullen. As most unions had rules forbidding factional activity, the department's covert operation was tightened up. Smullen authored a document on how groups within unions were to work. Members should endeavor to take a leading part in workplace politics, becoming shop stewards. Knowledge that such a machine existed but that they could not prove that it exists could be used to coerce union officials. In the workplace there were to be constant endeavors to raise the political consciousness of workmates. However, policies which are perhaps correct in principle but which do not attract the active support of a substantial number of workers must be examined very carefully. Connection to a research department was seen as a great asset in terms of the workplace. A member who wishes to know what profit a boss made last year, if the boss is the director of other companies, is usually supplied with this information very quickly. As a result, Workers soon understand that the party member can be depended on to supply all sorts of information not readily available. All sorts of information can be supplied on all questions touching working class. Lives. The industrial department constantly sought new recruits by targeting people that were coming up through the trade union movement. However, their ability to forego normal party work provoked some resentment of secret members, Dublin activist Margaret O'Leary recalling. I wasn't interested in a second layer of so-called intellectuals. It was seen as, sort of all right for the people in the Cummins to go out and do the slogging work while the other people made the decisions. Fears were also expressed about the possibility of some members having votes in both geographical and specialist Cummins. The industrial department's views were expressed through the Irish People S. Anne Devlin column. It sparked a major debate when it attacked feminism for downgrading class struggle. In a published reply, de Burka provocatively responded that the article was the usual Trotskyite bullshit knowing its author would be irritated by the term. She decried the idea that everything must wait for victory in the class struggle, which was of little use to a woman with broken bones or worse, broken spirit from a brutal husband. Industrial department members were unconcerned by the criticism, one activist recalling that they saw themselves as modernist, untraditional or unemotional, pragmatic people who were clearly trying to break with the past. For some party activists farmers were part of that past. There remained a dedicated group who attempted to keep the Small Farmers Defense Association's rural agitation going, but by late 1974 an internal report stated that, as an organization the FDA is defunct, with the few branches that still existed operating independently. Nonetheless in the rural constituency of Cork Northeast, Joe Sherlock received 5,363 votes in a November 1974 by-election. Many of these votes were gained in the small town of Mallow with Sherlock's key role in a successful campaign to maintain the local hospital proving to be crucial. It was a positive return for the ITGWU shop steward at the Mallow Beat Factory, who had been assiduously building a base of support in the area since 1967. The performance came despite Labor Minister Michael O'Leary stating during the campaign that Sherlock was a subversive. August 1974 saw Sinn Féin welcome over 200 of its international allies to Ireland for an anti-imperialist festival held over two weeks in Dublin and Belfast. Government concerns about the event fed into tabloid outrage, with headlines branding the event a Festival of Terror and an IRA Terror Summit. Interpol was reported to be on high alert and several delegates were refused entry to the country. Among those who did make it were representatives of ZANU guerrillas from southern Rhodesia, Basque, Welsh, Breton, Quebecois, Puerto Rican and Scots nationalists, and left-wingers from across Europe. Speaking from a Liberty Hall platform draped with a banner declaring, Our fight is your fight, Tony Heffernan told them they would. See, not just the Ireland of the tourist brochure, but the Ireland where 5% of the people own 75% of the wealth. In the north they would encounter all the repressive apparatus of imperialism while in the south they would see a classic neo-colonial state. For the next two weeks delegates were treated to lectures in both cities, historical tours and late-night drinking sessions. Day O'Hagan told delegates that the preservation of the Irish language was part of the struggle against an Atlantic culture, fostered by barbarous Hollywood. Guest speakers included figures from the wider left, such as John de Courcy Ireland, Matt Merrigan and Padraig O'Snodi. 
However, not all leftists were happy with the event. The British and Irish Communist Organization picketed Liberty Hall, declaring that official Sinn Féin was a sectarian nationalist body, while the Provisionals organized their own lecture for festival delegates. Despite their animosity to the officials, BICO's theories were having an impact. The group's theoretical literature was eagerly read by many activists, particularly those attached to the industrial department. John McManus recalled Biko as, tremendous intellectually, lobbing bombs into all our assumptions about things. We opposed them very often but at the same time a lot of their ideas became our currency as well. Republicanism of all shades was also being subjected to savage criticism by Connor Cruz O'Brien, the minister with responsibility for broadcasting. His 1974 Labour Party conference speech had placed responsibility for the continuation of internment in the North squarely with the provisionals. Soon after taking office, Cruz O'Brien had set about tightening Section 31 of the Broadcasting Act, which outlawed interviews with members of paramilitary organizations and their supporters. This caused resentment within RTE. Rodney Rice, a journalist at the station who was close to the officials, contacted De Burka about the possibility of taking legal action against Section 31. However, it was Harris as a producer of the station's current affairs flagship Seven Days who publicly confronted the minister. A special program dealing with internment was broadcast in October 1974, and featured interviews with three ex-internees and footage of British troops violently dispersing rioters. Cruz O'Brien felt that Section 31 had been breached and personally took the matter up with the head of RTE Current Affairs. After an internal RTE inquiry Harris was transferred out of Current Affairs and the program editor was reprimanded. Newspapers gave the controversy much attention, as they did concerns over the degree of control Cruz O'Brien was attempting to exert on all programming. Despite the tougher government line, RTE continued to attract radicals as employees, several of them with backgrounds in the official movement. Among those joining the station during 1974 were Patrick Kinsella, a former Dublin Comherley Cientair member, and Charlie Bird, who was told about a research job with Seven Days by Harris. As 1974 drew to a close Costello's supporters saw their last faint hopes of salvaging their leader's position within the officials disappear. The 1974 Ard Thais saw 700 people pack the town and country club in Dublin's Parnell Square on the 29th to the 30th of November. The starry plough hung behind a speaker's platform, from which for the first time in over a decade Costello would be absent. Only two minutes walk away in the Gresham Hotel he awaited the outcome of his final attempt to be reinstated. Some of his supporters were turned away at the door. In the hall, Nikki Kelly put forward a Wicklow motion that Costello be reinstated. Meliosa Costello made an impassioned speech on behalf of her husband. Omer Chu followed with a strong denunciation that he recalls may have gone, over the top. The motion to reinstate Costello was defeated by 197 votes to 15. It was left to Garland to reiterate a warning against Costello's attempts to subvert the movement. He cautioned that Costello's line would vary. If, for instance, he thinks that you want only political activity, he will tailor his approach to this, and if on the other hand he thinks that you are primarily interested in bombs and bullets he will tell you of what should be done in this field promising all the time he will be able to supply all needs. He, has gathered to himself a collection of individuals who are either past members of our organization or the provisionals are sore ire. We are confident that such a combination will not go anywhere but will, because of the motley crew that makes it up, finish up eating each other as all such unprincipled combinations do. We are a revolutionary organization, and we will not shrink from taking whatever action, popular or unpopular, to assist on the road towards revolution. 8. Brothers Fighting Brothers, A.R. Locke, A.R.G. Karai, A.R. Shoth Kogod, Ta Se A.R. Lar. C. Siamese and Fod Mar Sin, A.R. Na Ilays and Sean Namhod, C. E. Go B. H. Fool Gadher Na Embrathadori Ag T. Again Fawan A.R.G. C. O. S. A. I. B. H. Our hero, our champion, our shield in battle has fallen. Let us stand our ground nonetheless, facing our ancient enemy although the traitor dogs snap at our heels. Cathal Golding, 30 April 1975 For over a year Costello had been preparing for a leadership coup within the official Republican movement, or, failing that, for the establishment of a new organization. As the leadership of the Dublin OIRA alleged, Costello had been allowing volunteers to research possible heists for the purpose of funding his own schemes, and several of these men were caught carrying out robberies in Dublin and Limerick during the autumn of 1974. He also attempted to utilize the official's U.S. arms network for his own project. By August Costello was having detailed discussions with supporters at the Fairways Hotel in Louth on the breakdown of OIRA loyalties area by area in the event of a split. He proposed a greater emphasis on the national question, a more proactive military policy and the maintenance of the traditional dual military political structure rather than the creation of a unified vanguard party, as proposed by Garland. 
It was only in December 1974, during the week after the Ard face, that his plans emerged into public view. The entire Wicklow Comherley Cientair, three Kumain in North Munster, and members in Dunleary and Dublin announced their resignation from official Sinn Féin, all airing similar complaints. A lack of democracy within the movement, the abandonment of the pledge not to take seats in the Northern Assembly and the alleged rigging of the Ard face. Over 100 Southern members left during this period, although many had not been active for months. In Wicklow Sinn Féin was reduced to just one Cumann, in Bray, chaired by John McManus, and the local OIRA was left with the county O, C and one volunteer. The official leadership dismissed talk of mass resignations as a paper war to confuse the general public, and there was an element of truth in this. Outside of Wicklow, North Munster, Dunleary and Ballymun, Costello's supporters were a small minority. Northern volunteers, on the run, comprised a substantial chunk of his active support in the capital, along with a few others including border campaign veteran Tony Hayde. About 25 Costello supporters defected or were expelled in Dublin, and these people formed the core of the new Irish Republican Socialist Party, IRSP, launched on 8 December in a spa hotel in Lucan. Around 80 activists from across Ireland were present. Earlier at the same location Costello had secretly set up a new military organization at a meeting of around 45 people. Among those attending the military meeting, according to the OIRA's intelligence, were Ronnie Bunting, Seamus O'Kane, Johnny White and Teresa Gallagher. Costello was elected Chief of Staff, with White as Adjutant General, of an organization that would eventually be known as the Irish National Liberation Army, INLA, though that title was not announced until 1976. Meetings to organize the IRSP followed in Dublin, Belfast and Derry. The driving force behind the IRSP was a desire for a more active military policy. There was also frustration at the official leadership's stressing of the need to build cross-community support, ring-road socialism, as Costello dismissively termed it. This was allied to a desire to respond to loyalist attacks. Many officials were not satisfied with the limited, unclaimed operations undertaken by the OIRA and at least some wanted to respond indiscriminately. Come with us, lads, one IRSP member is recalled telling his former comrades in South Belfast, and you can shoot as many prods as you want. One official argued that the IRSP were going to differentiate themselves from the provost on the basis that they were left-wing but they were going to shoot prods, whereas the provost were right-wing and were going to shoot prods. Opinions differed on Costello's hopes for the new army. Some felt that he would have been happy with a more proactive version of the OIRA's defense and retaliation policy, but many in the IRSP clearly desired a campaign to rival that of the provisionals. Northern support for the IRSP was concentrated in Belfast and the Northwest. Costello's supporters were clearly the majority in Derry City and most of the local OIRA followed him into the new organization. A small number of local activists, including Mickey Montgomery, remained loyal to the official leadership and a much depleted OIRA structure was maintained in the city. Co. Derry saw a number of important defections and the IRSP split had a bigger impact locally than the provisional split had done. In Straban, Local leader Ivan Barr refused Costello's overtures, despite some sympathy for his position. In Belfast Costello had been popular with most of the organization. He had visited the city on a regular basis and, unlike many of the national leadership, personally took part in Republican Club's activity. Costello made a point of eliciting information about conditions on the ground. He didn't tell you what he was thinking but he really listened to what we were thinking, in retrospect maybe he was canvassing for support. However, when it came to the crunch he attracted only a minority of the official organization in the city. Davis Flats was the only unit to defect en masse, after a combative meeting with Seamus Lynch representing the Belfast command staff. The important Beachmount unit, numbering about 30 volunteers, saw only four leave. Among those in Belfast who did leave for the IRSP were some of the OIRA's most experienced operators, including Anthony Dornan and Sean and Harry Flynn. Former volunteers from Valley Murphy, White Rock, the Upper Springfield and Turf Lodge, including some of the Dirty Dozen, helped form the backbone of the IRSP in Belfast. In many cases they had not only taken on the security forces but had been to the fore in confronting loyalists and the provisionals. The official leadership's barrack room, discipline, including threats and punishment beatings to keep people in line, in fact, drove some people away when Costello's alternative presented itself. Many pro-Costello dissidents accused Macmillan of having not relayed to the Army Council the level of disaffection in Belfast with the ceasefire restrictions, but loyalty to the wee man was extremely strong and the core areas of the lower falls and the markets remained with the officials. In total the OIRA estimated defections in the city at about 40 volunteers. In Long Kesh over 20 men, including Thomas Ta Power, Hugh Torney, 
John Nixon and Robbie McConville, announced their loyalty to the IRSP on 12 December. McConville was an OIRA member from Davis Flats whose mother Jean had been abducted and killed by the provost two years previously. Nixon felt there was a sense of tragedy about the split, as the officials were a small minority in the camp and had built up a unique camaraderie. The IRSP supporters initially occupied a section of the OIRA compound, but tension soon built up over access to food and water and eventually the IRSP supporters had to be moved to a separate cage, away from the 70 or so officials. There was suspicion that some OIRA members who had shifted their loyalty to Costello were continuing to operate within the officials and, as the IRSP tried to expand, persons loyal to the official leadership infiltrated meetings. This bred further paranoia. In Belfast Mary McMahon was among those thought to be a possible Costello supporter, and the officials had to issue a statement pointing out that Belfast's Kitty O'Kane was not the same person as the dairy woman affiliated to the IRSP. By late February Costello was claiming that his new party had 700 members. Bernadette Michalowski, who had aligned herself with the group, privately and more realistically estimated the IRSP's strength as between 200 and 300. The officials launched a propaganda offensive against the new group, describing it as comprising three elements, a criminal sectarian gang, a few willing to be guided by latter-day messiahs, and those imbued or manipulated by the principal distraction of our time, violent ultra-leftism. Many officials were dismissive of the political understanding of those who followed Costello and tended to stress the role of articulate, educated ultra-leftists like Ed Maloney and Terry Robson in influencing impressionable younger volunteers. The far left were enthused by the emergence of the IRSP, seeing it as having the potential to become a mass revolutionary party. In February 1975 the socialist workers' movement's Brian Trench helped prepare a speech for Costello at a Dublin public meeting, and the SWM later narrowly rejected a suggestion to merge with the new party. People's Democracy also welcomed the formation of the IRSP, and some of its members joined it. Those alienated by the officials' increasing embrace of Eastern Europe saw the IRSP as potentially anti-Stalinist. Others hoped it would provide an open forum for various tendencies to cooperate. But few within the IRSP, beyond those with a background in the leftist groups, had any knowledge of Marxist ideology. Costello was wary of over-reliance on such theory, with his political reading largely restricted to the United Irishman and Connolly's pamphlets. Within a month of its foundation the IRSP declared, we're not Trotskyite. Connolly, Lalor, DeWitt and Pierce are good enough for us. Some suggested that the far left saw the IRSP as a shortcut to a working class base and to an armed wing, which their own organizations wanted but lacked. From early 1975 the provisional IRA had been observing a ceasefire after talks with Protestant clerics and contacts with the British government. This had caused unease among some of its members, a few of whom joined the IRSP. The official Army Council welcomed their rivals' curtailing of hostilities and called for the British to respond by releasing all internees. The British and the Provisionals cooperated in the setting up of local incident centers to monitor the ceasefire in nationalist areas. The prospect of provisional talks with the British alarmed unionists and, fearing a sellout, loyalists upped the pace of sectarian killing. The Provisional IRA claimed the right to respond and the ceasefire became more honored in the breach than in the observance. The year 1975 saw 206 people killed, 174 of them civilians. The officials and their new rivals contributed to the violence, starting a few days after the IRSP was set up, when a meeting of its supporters in New Lodge was broken up by OIRA members who pistol whipped a number of those present. Across Belfast IRSP supporters were being threatened and beaten up by early January. Ronnie Bunting, by now a West Belfast schoolteacher, and five others had been taken into custody by the OIRA and questioned about stealing weapons. Claim and counterclaim followed, with the OIRA alleging that IRSP members had committed robberies using the official's name and were attempting to embezzle movement funds. In Newry the OIRA carried out a punishment shooting on a Costello supporter who was planning to raid an arms dump. An internal OIRA report circulated in March 1975 stated that the situation in Belfast had steadily deteriorated from polemics to shootings as the IRSP commenced a systematic campaign of seizing weapons from the IRA. It also claimed that IRSP members carried out a number of sectarian attacks in the first months of 1975, leaving two Protestant civilians dead. For the OIRA this provided an ideologically sound reason to take offensive action. These attacks have led in turn to Protestant extremist attacks which have claimed the lives of four Catholics. It is here that the Costello aim of provoking virtual civil war, in order to break the overall ceasefire position, is seen in its clearest light. Some in the official leadership thought the smaller group, could be wiped out. Those who had witnessed the birth of the provisionals at first hand were particularly adamant that the same mistakes should not be made again. 
Worries over further defections and the membership's resolve were provoked by Donegal Sinn Féin's condemnation of the movement's attitude towards the IRSP. The officials therefore had to convince sections of their own membership of the IRSP's malevolence, a task aided by an IRSP statement lauding the provisionals as a genuinely anti-imperialist force, whose army council made principled efforts to secure peace with justice. For many this confirmed the treacherous nature of the new group. For others there was a sense that once again, brothers, were fighting brothers as personal friendships and family relationships were sundered. Men who had been interned and on active service together were now threatening to shoot one another. On 20 February a three-man OIRA squad attacked Hugh Ferguson as he worked on a building site in the White Rock area, where he was the local IRSP leader. They had been ordered to wound the 19-year-old, but in the altercation that unfolded Ferguson was shot four times and died. The three-year-old son of Republican Club's counselor Bernie McDonough, who was playing nearby, was also hit by gunfire. McMillan was upset about the death but realistic. Unfortunately he was a game kid and wouldn't take it lying down. He put up a fight and was killed by accident. Publicly, however, the OIRA denied they were responsible. Costello gave Ferguson's funeral oration to a crowd of only 200, mainly young boys with a sprinkling of older men and women, who dispersed, rapidly, after the burial. In his oration Costello denied that the IRSP had a military wing, but his organization responded to Ferguson's death by launching a series of revenge attacks. The official's Turf Lodge Social Club was firebombed. A number of OIRA members were wounded and on 25 February Belfast OIRA quartermaster Sean Fox was killed by a sniper near Davis Flats. The funeral of the 32-year-old former internee, attended by 2,000 people, was turned into a show of strength, with over 800 men and youths marching in formation behind the coffin. In his oration Golding warned that, the threats of a few misguided and confused malcontents will not stop us now. Anger was intensified later that day by a bomb attack on the Bush Bar in Leeson Street which had been packed with OIRA members including Golding and Mick Ryan. Although the UVF claimed the attack two weeks later, in the immediate aftermath it was blamed on Costello's supporters. As trouble escalated Macmillan gave orders for full-time men to guard the officials HQ at Cypress Street, bringing soft shoes and bedding with them. Entrances to local areas were to be watched 24 hours a day. It was stressed that there was to be no drinking by the guards. Intelligence was desperately needed, according to Macmillan's notes, on where members of the new organization lived and which pubs they frequented. A squad was organized to raid certain houses, but Macmillan was unsure whether to create a special unit to deal specifically with the IRSP or just mobilize every area full-time. What was clear was that there was now going to be an all-out effort to destroy this group. Tension was also growing in Dublin. Those prominent in the debates leading to the split feared for their own security. Helena Sheehan, Owen Omer Chu's wife, recalls going to bed every night fearing that they would be coming for him and worrying about the kids, locking them in, and having kitchen knives in the bedroom. On the other side of the divide, Tony Gregory slept with a hatchet under his mattress. Then the feud reached the capital. At 10 p.m. on Saturday the 1st of March Costello and Malachi McGurran were in the RTE studios debating the ongoing violence. Less than an hour after the debate's conclusion, on the other side of the city, Garland and his wife Mary were returning home to Ballymun from a night at the theater. They had married only four months previously, Dominic Bean officiating as best man. As the couple walked to their front door two hooded gunmen emerged. As Garland remembers. When I realized what was happening I turned and ran but then. I was shot in the leg and I fell. The OIRA leader had been shot six times and was thought unlikely to survive. Tony Heffernan, who was working at a by-election in Galway, remembers the sense of shock such a thing could happen down here, in the south. Another activist recalled. Garland had a lot of loyalty. When he got shot even people in the trade unions were saying could they do anything to help, people you wouldn't think knew him. Costello's condemnation of the attack as the work of enemy agents was dismissed by the officials. They accused him of rallying these elements under his bloodstained flag. Garland's survival and his alleged response when asked if he wished to see a priest as he lay wounded, I need a doctor, not a fucking witch doctor, added to the Iron Man image that had first become attached to him after Brookborough. The attitude of his assailants, he thought, was. Just kill the cunt and that will fucking do it, he's finished therefore the whole lot's finished. But, they, had no conception of what was involved, it wasn't just an individual. During his convalescence he was visited for the last time by Jerry Foley, whose Trotskyism was now anathema to the officials. Whatever his would-be assassins thought about the possibility of Garland's death hastening the end of the feud, Foley felt otherwise, arguing that the death of this, sincere revolutionist, would not only, evoke a strong reaction but also remove the leader, 
most likely to have the stature and objectivity to rise above the factional frenzy that has gripped the officials. Only hours after the gunman struck in Ballymun, Paddy McAllister was shot and critically wounded in the officials' Twin Brook Social Club in Belfast. Two days later, on 3 March, an IRSP member was seriously injured in Turf Lodge. On the 5th, in the same area, Ronnie Bunting was driving a car with an armed IRSP member when he was shot at by a sniper. Bunting received a slight neck wound. This was followed on the 6th by an attack in Beachmount that left two officials wounded and a five-year-old boy injured. Shin Fine claimed that the IRSP had formed an assassination group to kill members of its leadership. Many IRSP members sought refuge in the Divas Flats, which became known as the Planet of the Earps. The violence, and also internal pressure from Mikalski and others, seemed to be having an impact when on 7 March the IRSP announced the stand down of its organization in Belfast. On BBC television, Mikalski described how the party had attracted every twopenny, a penny gangster in Belfast, a remark that provoked much resentment. There were elements among the officials who felt that the IRSP were on the run and should be finished off. In one incident Harry McEwen was informed by IRSP members that they wished to return stolen weapons to the officials. He offered to stay with the IRSP members in order to ensure the safety of one of their comrades, who would be in the custody of officials while the weapons were handed over. But McEwen withdrew his offer when he was warned by an official that they had no intention of returning their hostage alive. The two organizations agreed that union leader Michael Mullen would act as a mediator. On 10 March the officials announced an amnesty for IRSP members who dissociated themselves from that party. Although the IRSP dismissed the amnesty as sick, there was a feeling among the officials that the strategy of violence twinned with conciliatory gestures in public was working. An internal official report claimed that over 20 members of the IRSP had renounced their involvement, including National Executive Members Teresa Gallagher and Joe Sweeney. Both organizations were also feeling pressure from the hard-pressed Catholic ghetto communities. In the previous month 19 people had been killed, the majority of them Catholic victims of sectarian attacks. A group called the Turf Lodge Peace Women had been founded to lobby for a halt to the violence. Initially their peace calls were welcomed by the officials and Golding met with the women. On 15 March Mullen announced he had successfully negotiated a truce in order for talks to begin. The days leading up to Easter were somewhat calmer with the officials only recording failed attacks against Seamus Lynch and Tony, Tonto, Maxwell. The IRSP claimed there were at least six attacks on its members in the same period. That year's Easter commemorations at Dublin's Glasnevin Cemetery hosted three separate Republican observances, by the Provisionals, the officials and the IRSP. In contrast 250 people attended a rare joint official provisional commemoration in Ballymacnab, Co. Armagh. The official commemorations heard militant speeches decrying the IRSP and its assassins. Costello had earlier announced that due to official intransigence no talks had begun and the IRSP was to reform in Belfast on 1 April, with members returning to their homes and workplaces after accepting assurances of protection from several groups. The stage had been set for another violent cycle. On 2 April an IRSP member was seriously wounded in what the officials claimed was an act of self-defense by two of their volunteers and the tit-for-tat attacks began again. A group calling itself the People's Liberation Army claimed responsibility for firebombing Andersonstown Republican Club on 3 April. The PLA was the armed wing of the IRSP, though the party denied it had such a wing. On the night of 5 April Danny Lauren, a 20-year-old IRSP member, was shot dead near Davis Flats. Lauren had been with his wife, who heard the four attackers shout, official IRA, before opening fire with a machine gun. Within hours an attempt had been made on the life of Day O'Hagan in which he was slightly injured. On 12 April 23-year-old Paul, Cheesy, Crawford was shot dead by men in a passing car as he sold the United Irishman on the corner of the Falls and Springfield Roads. As Crawford's coffin left his home a volley of shots was fired by OIRA volunteers. At his graveside O'Hagan warned, The people who direct and organize these killer squads cannot expect to continue with their crimes. Two days after Crawford's death Seamus Lynch was fired on as he drove to hand in his application papers for forthcoming convention elections. A few days later Lynch's friend, IRSP member Sean Flynn, was shot and wounded by the OIRA. Even at the height of the conflict some people on both sides managed to maintain amicable relations. In early April the provost launched an attack on OIRA members in the markets. Official Robbie Elliman, who came from a Protestant background, was wounded in the attack on Mooney's Bar as was his drinking partner Anthony Dornan, by then a leading member of the IRSP. When three members of the Ormo Road OIRA decided to defect to the IRSP, 
The local OIRA unit ignored urgings from the leadership to punish their former comrades, even going as far as warning them of planned attacks. In the midst of the fighting the officials were trying to run an election campaign. A constitutional convention had been established to ascertain what system of government would be most acceptable to Northern Ireland's population, and an election to the convention was held on the 1st of May. The Irish Times commented that the feud could not have come at a worse time for the Republican clubs, whose key demand was an end to violence. It would be difficult for the clubs to take the two or three convention seats they might have hoped for. The IRSP and provisionals, meanwhile, called for a boycott of the election. A proposal for the replacement of the RUC by a new civic police service was central to the club's platform. Entitled, The Police and You, and unveiled on the day Hugh Ferguson was shot, the plans envisaged a force that would be unarmed, full-time, unionized and answerable to civilian control bodies comprising trade unionists, community representatives and police union representatives. Contrary to the demand of some nationalist politicians, recruits would be selected on the basis of suitability rather than to achieve religious balance within the force. It was stressed that the RUC's sectarian record made it unacceptable. The officials were increasingly exercised by the provisional's use of the new incident centers to coordinate their local activities. It was felt that the British Army was allowing the provisional IRA to take over the policing of the ghettos in place of the RUC. The officials denounced the Royal Ulster provisionals and stated that an unreformed RUC was totally unacceptable, whether accompanied by former anti-civilian bombers or not. During the ceasefire some provisionals were being allowed to carry personal weapons, and two Lurgan officials were arrested by armed provosts in February. One Belfast OIRAO C recalls a visit from the local major from the barracks who asked him, have you a list of men for me? The official asked what for, and the officer replied, but you're the O, C of the area. The OIRA man demurred, while the soldier reiterated, we need a list of people who will be policing the area. The OIRA man recalled, I thought he was crazy. Only afterwards I realized he had gone to the wrong group. The election campaign was marked by more sectarian violence, with pubs a favored target. Several of those attacked were official haunts. A man was fatally injured in another attack on the bush bar and four injured in an attack on the oak in March. Jim Sullivan was in the bush bar during the second attack when the OIRA fired shots at the fleeing gunmen after they wounded two people standing outside. On the 11th of April the Jubilee bar was sprayed with machine gun fire, but a bomb left inside by a UVF gang was disposed of by an OIRA volunteer, who carried it outside and threw it onto a railway line. A British Army patrol then came upon the scene, shooting a loyalist gunman dead. Although diplomatic contact had been maintained between OIRA and UVF leaders, the loyalists had come to the conclusion that the officials were a major threat. This view was made explicit in a UVF document released to journalists, which stated that although the number one short-term enemy of Ulster was the provisional IRA, the most dangerous and deadly enemy long-term will be the official IRA and its Marxist-Leninist associates. The officials in UVF could agree that the IRSP's militancy and ultra-leftism were an immediate threat to both. The March edition of the UVF magazine Combat carried an article denouncing the IRSP's sectarian activities, and directed particular vitriol at the renegade Protestant Ronnie Bunting. The officials were described as non-sectarian, and it was concluded that the provost would probably end up backing the IRSP. The analysis mirrored that of the officials, and indeed had origins in the United Irishmen and UVF official contacts. The combat article provoked praise and a front-page headline in the Irish people. UVF names the killers. The IRSP claimed collusion had gone further, announcing the officials had given 16 of their members' names and addresses to the UVF. On the 8th of March UVF members entered a house in North Belfast and shot 23-year-old student Michael Adamson dead. Justifying the murder, Combat claimed Adamson was a former Markets OIRA member who had defected to the IRSP. Adamson was not claimed by the IRSP, but he had been an OIRA member until 1974. Both the officials and the IRSP claimed that their enemies had security force backing. In reality there were numerous arrests on both sides. Seven OIRA members were caught with weapons and charged with offenses including attempted murder in late April alone. Meanwhile the UVF undertook attacks that raised tension at crucial periods. The violence contributed to a disappointing last place showing for Sinn Féin's 22-year-old candidate René Prendergast in the Galway West by election of early March. Tony Heffernan recalls being worried by the long-term consequences of the officials being seen by the public as some sort of fucking cowboys going around shooting one another. People that otherwise might have joined said they were not getting involved in that sort of thing. The leadership decided that the feud had to end. Garland recalled coming to this conclusion while recovering from his injuries. 
we had to stop it in order to preserve ourselves, because we were going down the road where it was just a gang fight. Nobody was winning. Pressure was also being felt from the participants' own communities. After the officials refused to send a representative to a meeting on the feud, the Turf Lodge peace women criticized their callous indifference to the sufferings of the working-class people. The IRSP attempted to capitalize on the changing atmosphere, announcing their support groups had been asked to halt attacks, resulting in the People's Liberation Army declaring a four-day truce. The officials continued to refuse direct talks with Costello, but the number of attacks from both sides decreased. There was meanwhile a spate of official provisional violence in the border area. In February leading Nuri official Eugene Tremors was shot outside his home. A week later provisional Michael McEvitt and a colleague were kneecapped by the officials in Dundalk. In April a bomb injured 17 people near the officials' newly opened club at Trevor Hill, and senior official Larry Carragher was wounded in a gun attack in Nuri. In response the OIRA abducted five provisionals, beating and kneecapping them. The dispute could easily have escalated, as the local OIRAO, C. recalls. There was 14 people shot in that particular period but nobody was killed. Some boys called to me and said, look, do we shoot them in the head or what? I said, there is nobody dead yet, so shoot them in the legs, but if we had wanted them dead they would have done it as simple as that. After more incidents on both sides of the border the provisionals approached a local priest to mediate an end to the violence. He helped establish a liaison process that lasted for a number of years, ensuring disputes between the local factions were sorted out before the guns came out. This violence was a further embarrassment for the Republican club's election campaign, as were accusations by Ivan Cooper of, mafia-style, official intimidation of SDLP members in Straban. Cooper blamed the OIRA for beating up James Hume, brother of SDLP leader John Hume. On Monday 28 April 1975 Billy McMillan visited the Cypress Street HQ. There he instructed Seamus Lynch to contact the IRSP and inform them the officials were halting all attacks in order to allow peace talks to progress. The news was quickly relayed to local OIRAO, C's. Macmillan then drove with his young wife Mary to a hardware shop on Spinner Street. They had been married just eight weeks before and were decorating their new home. The couple were spotted by two armed IRSP men, Brendan McNamee, a former provisional, and Gerard Steenson, a teenage former Fianna member. As the Macmillans returned to their van, Steenson approached and shot Macmillan a number of times at close range. A woman who worked in the hardware shop described to a newspaper how Macmillan was lying on the pavement with his feet in the van. There was a hole the size of a two-pea piece in his neck. I saw him trying to breathe and as he breathed his neck caved in. A few minutes later a woman came into the shop and said, I'll have six rolls of purple wallpaper, please. I felt sick. I felt like smashing her face in and throwing her out of the shop. He was still lying out there on the pavement outside. Although Macmillan's killers fled in a black taxi, a rumor that their getaway vehicle was a yellow cortina spread quickly among the numerous armed OIRA men in the Lower Falls area. This led to the shooting of an innocent Armagh man driving such a vehicle. On hearing of the killing, Costello hurried out a statement in the name of the IRSP National Executive condemning the shooting, without reservation, and placing the blame with the British intelligence services and possibly other sources with a vested interest in a continuation of the conflict. The idea of British involvement found a ready audience among some sections of the left, but not in Belfast. The following day's Irish Times led with the killing, while the Irish News carried five columns and several large notices of condolences for the fallen, O.C. Belfast Brigade official IRA. Two days later several thousand people walked behind Macmillan's coffin as it processed up the falls, flanked by a ten-man OIRA colour party wearing black leather jackets and berets. Most of the official leadership were present, along with Mick O'Reardon of the CPI and representatives from a variety of organizations, including UCG Students Union. In Milltown Cemetery Golding's oration alternated between heroic rhetoric and rage, speaking in Irish, which many of the audience would have barely understood, he proclaimed, Our hero, our champion, our shield in battle has fallen. Let us stand our ground nonetheless, facing our ancient enemy although the traitor dogs snap at our heels. Soldiers and people of Belfast, the task now is yours. Our hope is in you. Not soft or easy the task before you without Liam MacMowlin as chief over you. You are now like children without a father, like the Fianna without Fionn. Continuing in English, his comments were more direct. An orange junta sent Liam, Billy, Macmillan. To prison because he fought for separation. The Provisional Alliance attempted to assassinate him because he held socialist principles and fought for civil rights. The RUC and the British Army of Occupation harassed and hounded him because he was a socialist republican. A small, mad band of fanatical malcontents, the sewer rats of Costello, finally laid him low. 
In Belfast the immediate impulse was to get the people responsible. The night of Macmillan's killing three OIRA members were arrested after forcing their way into the home of leading IRSP member Jim McCory. In Dublin a massive escalation was planned, as a senior Dublin brigade member recalled. Billy Macmillan was shot and after that it was, Costello's, whole team has to go. We're going to take out about 12 men in Dublin in two houses, arrangements are made, dates are picked, the weapons are secured, then it's called off at the last minute. Golding says that's called off but Seamus has to go. The Army Council had decided that rather than widespread killing, there was two people that were going to go instead, Costello and Larry White. White was a sore Ayer member from Cork who had been implicated in the Garland attack and violent confrontations with local OIRA members. But even in the emotionally charged aftermath of Macmillan's death the official leadership was adamant that paramilitary activity would remain subsidiary to politics. Rather than select the militant Jim Sullivan or another OIRA member of his generation as the new Belfast O.C., Golding turned to a younger man, Seamus Lynch, the Constitutional Convention candidate for the North Belfast seat, who was felt to be a safe pair of hands. Golding approached Lynch on the day of Macmillan's funeral about assuming command responsibilities. After a week of discussions, during which Golding and Garland assured Lynch that the movement intended to prioritize political development in Belfast, he accepted. The political damage that the feud inflicted was starkly illustrated in the disappointing performance of the Republican clubs at the Constitutional Convention election. Their 17 candidates received only 14,515 votes in total, winning no seats. Unrealistic hopes of an electoral breakthrough, held by many in the movement, were dashed. The Ard Chomherly concluded that, a combination of apathy among the people, provo intimidation and the conflict with the IRSP had adversely affected our vote. The Unionist Party and the SDLP emerged from the election as the biggest blocs. They would now attempt to hammer out a new constitutional settlement in Northern Ireland. The issue of abstentionism from Northern Council chambers now re-emerged as an issue for the clubs. The leadership wanted elected councillors to take their seats, but met strong opposition from Northern councillors and members. However, McGurran attended a meeting with the Ministry of Home Affairs on prisoner issues in June, and the club's two Belfast councillors were given permission to attend corporation transport planning meetings, although it was decided not to publicize this. By late October the party leadership privately succeeded in persuading all the Northern councillors, bar Barney McEwen in South Armagh, to take their seats. Although sporadic clashes between the officials and the IRSP dragged on into the summer, the violence would not again reach the ferocity of the spring. Instead the officials targeted Costello himself. Just after midnight on 7 May Costello and Seamus O'Kane were driving two Waterford SWM members home after a public meeting in the city. A motorbike pulled up alongside and the pillion passenger raked the car with machine gun fire. The IRSP leader managed to outmaneuver his attackers, escaping with only a slight injury to his hand. The officials denied any role in the attack, claiming that Costello's accusations were an attempt to discredit them. The officials were now talking peace. Mac Giola issued a statement the following week stating that the feud was only serving British interests and allowing for the harassment of political activists. An uneasy truce was now in place between the two organizations and talks would drag on for several weeks. The IRSP had succeeded, despite the OIRA's efforts, in establishing a position for itself within the paramilitary subculture. When the IRSP's Brendan McNamee was shot dead in early June it did not spark off another bout of violence, despite accusations of OIRA involvement. In fact the IRSP man had been killed by his former comrades in the provisionals. The killing was not over. At 12.15 am on 10 June, Larry White was walking down Mount Eden Road in Cork City eating chips and drinking a bottle of lemonade. As he ambled along an OIRA man, disguised in a wig and false mustache, opened fire with a silenced M3 submachine gun. White was hit several times, and was dead within an hour, aged 26. The event provoked outrage in Cork, which had not witnessed a politically motivated killing in decades. White was given a paramilitary funeral at which his brother condemned media speculation over Republican involvement, instead blaming Gardy. However, within days five officials had been arrested, believing that the case against them was insubstantial and likely to collapse. Some of the suspects turned down the movement's offer of evacuation to Cuba. But four of the five were convicted of murder and sentenced to life imprisonment. There were allegations of Garda brutality and of confessions being forced under duress during questioning lasting until the early hours of the morning. One of those sentenced to life, Bernard Lynch, a leading Cork Sinn Féin member, was later freed on appeal. At least one local Sinn Féin member who had felt assured that the OIRA had been retired, resigned over the killing. On the 22nd of June a device planted near the railway line in Salins, Co. Kildare, 
exploded 25 minutes after a special train carrying 300 official supporters had passed en route to Bowdoin's town. While planting the device a UVF gang had been disturbed by a local man, Christopher Phelan, whom they stabbed to death. Gardy initially suspected the IRSP, arresting six members including Costello. The IRSP were also initially blamed by the officials, creating even more hostility towards the gangster from Bray and his trendy lefty support. The numbers at the competing Bowdoinstown ceremonies showed that the officials had not disintegrated as Costello had rashly predicted. 300 had attended the IRSP event in early June, while an estimated 5,000 took part in the official commemoration. The official leadership were in no mood to compromise with Costello. Despite the OIRA's denials, the Waterford assassination attempt had been carried out by its recently restructured operations department. Volunteers were selected who could be brought together at short notice from various brigade areas to operate directly under the command of the director of operations. In the Waterford attack the logistics were organized locally and the SWM public meeting chosen as a likely opportunity to kill Costello, but the would-be assassins were northern operatives. A week later in Dublin a group of OIRA members were arrested in possession of weapons and charged with conspiracy to commit armed robbery. The group of young men from Dublin, Armagh and Down were typical of the units that would become the hallmark of OIRA operations in the south. Most were jailed, though one of the men left the country while out on bail while another served his sentence under an assumed name. Embarrassingly for Shin Fine, Sue Sweetman, education officer of the Jemmy Hope Cummin, found herself charged with perjury when attempting to post bail for the men. Shortly after the men's arrival in Portlaoise they and other OIRA prisoners were involved in a violent confrontation with warders and guardy. In bringing together the new non-geographically based active service units the OIRA leadership was acting on the recommendations of an operations department report, which stated, it is a fact that there has been no effort made to plan a department. We can talk about the other aspects of ops, but if we don't see the need to set up a proper department we will always fail. Finance must be made available to not only hire transport etc., but to buy it, it can be garaged and only used when needed. When it becomes known it can be sold and new transport bought, most of the ops in the south are of a specialist nature yet nothing has been done to train vols in this field, or very little. There has been a reluctance to involve new blood on ops, which leaves at this moment a vacuum, due to arrests etc. Research into police methods has been almost nil. More use of police radios might have helped here. Note. The most important deciding factor in selecting volume for training for this department should be their political status and loyalty to the movement. Too often men are selected because they are supposed to be hard men. Operations in the South were to be authorized by GHQ, with close attention paid to possible political impact. Many activists in Waterford had expressed concern at how the killing of Costello would have affected Shin Fine's progress locally. Trusted Fianna activists, some as young as 15 years of age, were recruited to replenish the ranks. In early 1975 Golding had appointed a new OIRA organizer in Dublin and discussed with him the need for a tight loyal unit in the city. Another key figure in the reorganization of the operations department was Jim Flynn, who had joined Shin Fine's Lalor Cummin in Dublin after being deported from England. Operatives were paid nominal amounts of between £5 and £10 per mission. The director of operations, a Belfast man referred to as McLaren, in OIRA documents, was on a weekly wage of £30 and had his rent paid. Meticulous planning went into each operation, with robberies only authorized if the funds to be raised were considerable. It was believed that inside intelligence was always the best, and funds were available to pay for it. A contact in Dublin's Sheriff Street Postal Sorting Office allowed the OIRA to simply walk out with a bag of money orders before anyone realized that they had been robbed. The new GHQ strategy created some dissension among Dublin OIRA members. Omer Chu felt that by 1975 the Dublin Brigade had no role to play. He recalls that, in a sense there was two Dublin units one about 50 to 60 strong and a tighter one of about 20 feet. Under democratic centralism, all discussions on policy were supposed to take place within specified party and IRA structures, and once decisions had been made by a democratic vote of the leadership, or at Ard Thaciana, they were to be adhered to at all levels with clandestine promotion of policy changes banned. Despite the acceptance of these rules throughout the movement, early 1975 had seen rifts intensify again within Dublin Sinn Féin. The new Comherley Cientair chairman Jim Sherry and his supporters were vying with the Omer Chu grouping for control of the executive. Both groups were also contending with the growing influence of the industrial department. Despite the ban on factions, a Dublin activist recalls a meeting of all the supposed communists or Marxists in the movement, with Harris on one hand and Omer Chu and Moriarty on the other, to debate the movement's direction. There was 30 or 40 people there, or more, 
and I can still see this argument there in the hall with Moriarty and Omer Chu arguing in support of Republican socialism on one hand, and on the other hand Harris and Donahue, a kind of two nationism. The internal arguments were complicated by activists overlapping membership of various sections of the movement. Some were members of OIRA units and secret industrial branches as well as party kumain. Fierce debate was accompanied by whispering campaigns accusing rivals of everything from sexual deviance to being Garda informers. Accusations that Padraig Yates was an ultra-leftist and Trotskyist led to the leadership taking the extraordinary action of issuing a statement to all Dublin Kumain stating, Padraig is and has been a loyal member of the Republican movement. Anyone using these kinds of smear tactics in future will be severely reprimanded. Owen Harris displayed particular panache in manipulating debate among the competing groupings. The Corkman's personal persuasiveness as well as his closeness to Golding and Smullen aided his growing influence, which caused resentment among some. All these things that were getting voted on in the party, and the army even, were just getting overlooked. Democratic centralist decisions were being taken on things and they were getting overrode the next morning by Harris. It was Jim Sherry's group that ultimately brought about Omer Chu's departure. During March, Sherry and Dermot Nolan reported to the leadership comments made by Omer Chu in a Mornington lecture to Dublin education officers. Omer Chu alleged that there had been inept handling of the IRSP issue by the leadership due to their petite bourgeois backgrounds which resulted in a natural reaction against working-class politics. When questioned on his assertions, Omer Chu had stated that the leadership contained only about four Marxists. He highlighted the fact that Cork's Joe Sherlock was a practicing Catholic and argued that such people would balk at full Marxist politics. He also complained that if £3,000 could be allocated by the Ard Chomherly for arms, then a similar sum should be allocated for the training of education officers at the Leningrad Institute. The leadership launched an investigation and, despite a tape recording of the controversial Mornington lecture, malfunctioning, Omer Chu resigned from Sinn Féin in early April and joined the Communist Party. A number of other Dublin members left with him. Sherry had less success curtailing the influence of the industrial department. Within the industrial Kumain, those members who were critical of the political line defined by Harris and Donahue were being sidelined. Some members were simply no longer informed when meetings were taking place. Alan Maximon, a Thompson Cummins member, stated in a resignation letter to the leadership that he found the movement's new policies incompatible with his libertarian communist views. During this period industrial department operation was also becoming even more clandestine. Meeting venues were kept secret and some went to great lengths to hide their membership, to the point of absurdity. As Dublin member Eric Byrne recalled, there would have been dramatics about hiding membership cards under the carpet and that, an awful lot of that bollocksology didn't ring true to me. As head of economic research, Eamon Smullen had become a central figure in policy formation. He was seen as having been tested in the fire during his imprisonment in Port Lawas, and led an ascetic, frugal lifestyle that won him respect from those with IRA backgrounds and admiration from younger industrial common activists. His critique of Costello's organization, What is the IRSP, was distributed to members. In it Smullen dismissed the defectors as stooges of the establishment who had undermined the movement through their support for Trotskyite infiltrators. He argued that Costello's supporters in Derry had strutted about behind the barricades and devised one daft scheme after another, always ideas which did not involve long, consistent, serious work. In contrast Smullen counterposed those involved in industrial trade unionism among the working class, which was the breeding ground for revolutionary ideas, for serious political organization. Harris, by now a close confidant of Smullen, was looking for new internal targets in his drive for ideological purity. One party activist recalls Harris stating, we have got rid of the militarists, we have got rid of the Trotskyites, and, next thing, we get rid of the Social Democrats. Along with another ally from the industrial department, Eugene Murray, Harris addressed an education seminar in Trinity College at which Nolan and Sherry were present. They had made no secret of their dislike of the industrial department ideologues approach, we turned up and sat at the back and Harris said, the topic of today is, and then suddenly started shouting, no, 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 get those chairs out of there, get those chairs out of there, you are too comfortable. We were sitting there breaking our fucking hearts laughing, all his little minions were running around with the chairs. Go outside and bring in the hard chairs. While some found such dramatics ridiculous, for others Harris was the driving force in the party, pushing the industrial department to question Sinn Féin's approach to issues like the EEC and multinational investment. Smullen introduced discussion on some of these concepts to a meeting of northern delegates at Mornington in late June. The Economic Affairs Department published the public sector and the profit makers during 1975, outlining the case for the extension of the state sector in the areas of energy, oil, gas and mines, 
the establishment of a state construction company and expansion of the state into food technology, processing and marketing. The basis for making all these demands possible was the nationalization of the banks. The Resources Protection Campaign, launched in late 1973, had become a key area of Sinn Féin agitation. The RPC had emerged from a Sinn Féin initiative to bring together groups on the left in a broad campaign demanding the nationalization of mining and energy rights, which were mainly being sold to U.S. multinationals. The campaign initially drew heavily upon the work of the Trinity College Resources Study Group which had called for nationalization without compensation of the Irish mines under the slogan, Chile took it back. So will Ireland. In Galway the local RPC was particularly active under the chairmanship of UCG Republican Club member Eamon Gilmore, and several trade union leaders now endorsed the RPC's aims. Sinn Féin sought to gain influence in the wider left milieu via the RPC, supporting sympathizers like Labour's Una Claffey for election as the campaign's organizing secretary. Meetings had also begun between Sinn Féin, the Communist Party and the Labour Party's liaison of the left group. Initially these meetings had been organized through the Wolf Tone Society, but the official leadership decided to remove this group from involvement in these contacts, instead putting them under control of the industrial department. One area of concern was the involvement of Seamus Costello in the local resources campaign in Bray. Given the balance of forces in the town, Sinn Féin could not have barred the IRSP from involvement even if they had wanted to. This led to the surreal situation whereby, while the organizations were feuding in Belfast, Sinn Féin and IRSP members were attending fundraising socials together in Bray. The leadership ordered the Bray officials to exclude Costello's supporters, and Paddy Woodworth was summoned to Gardiner Place to explain why they would not. There he found himself in a room full of glowering strangers, and after he explained the Bray position he was told forcefully by Smullen that, it is people like you who don't realize the necessity of taking tough decisions and when necessary taking up arms, it's people like you who are going to end up in the stadium in Chile. The feud with the IRSP was also fought out in the press. In his oration at the grave of Paul Crawford, Day O'Hagan had drawn attention to journalists, motivated solely by hate, of the officials. The Sunday World, to which Eamon McCann and Jerry Lawless were contributors, had reported early in the feud that officials were leaving in droves with Costello. In contrast the Belfast Sunday News told its readers that only a few activists had left the officials, that many of these had already been expelled for gangsterism, and the officials were better off without them. The officials were particularly angered by the coverage of the feud in Hibernia, whose assistant editor, Brian Trench, was a member of the SWM. He had already been informed during 1974 that he was persona non grata at official events. De Burka protested to Hibernia that its assistant editor belongs to an organization which is in open association with the IRSP. During this period Trench was told that the officials were going to take physical action against me and believed that he was being followed. McCann had also been warned by McGurran that the official leadership had discussed taking action against him. Most of Hibernia's reports from Belfast were penned by Jack Holland, who had family and social contacts with the officials, and a concrete reason to dislike them. His cousin Paul Tinnelly had been shot dead by the OIRA the previous year. Holland was informed by a leading official that his career as a journalist in Dublin would be quickly brought to an end if he continued to write critical reports. During the feud Connor Oakley of the Irish Times described how two of the paper's reporters had received phone calls from OIRA members. They informed them that journalists might expect a visit from the boys, and that a close eye was being kept on their coverage. Leading officials met Irish Times editor Fergus Pyle to complain about Northern reporter Fanuela O'Connor's coverage of the feud, but Pyle defended his journalists' independence. The belief that the media was biased against them led the officials to emphasize the importance of their own press. An internal document on propaganda was produced, its stated purpose to underline the importance of propaganda in the struggle against imperialism. A highly effective propaganda machine operates in Ireland on behalf of imperialism, an equally effective machine must be constructed to operate against it. The document asserted that, no matter how liberal or objective any newspaper is, it will in the final analysis be true to its class. The Sunday World and the Irish Press and Sunday Press gave a distorted version of republicanism. Socialism was also obstructed by the provisional Trotskyite press which is objectively in alliance with the Protestant supremacist presses. To counter this it was the task of the republican movement to expose the lies, name the liars and tell the truth. This was to be achieved by acquiring the equipment necessary for the movement to print its own publications, and by establishing a republican propaganda department. The movement's press was to take a thorough investigative approach, presenting stories in a manner understandable to the working class while offering space to opponents, who wished to debate. It concluded that, the techniques of the soft sell, 
have no place in the selling of hard politics. The party's press had become explicitly pro-Soviet. In late 1974 the United Irishmen began a series of articles praising communist states, such as Romania, where, poverty, was, only a memory. This provoked some members, like Frank Gallagher from the fishing town of Killybegs in Donegal, to refuse to sell the paper. Gallagher had earlier raised questions as to how Soviet super trawlers putting Irish fishermen out of work could be progressive. Other members were uneasy about the United Irishmen's defense of the crushing of the 1956 revolution in Hungary. In response to such criticism the propaganda documents stressed that in future the positive achievements of the socialist countries should be related, in a matter-of-fact way, free of hysteria or exaggeration. Great interest was also shown in developments in Portugal, where a revolution, led by left-wing army officers, had overthrown the dictatorship. Sinn Féin members visited Portugal as guests of the armed forces movement and met communist and trade union activists. In the autumn of 1975, after continued squabbling, the faction led by Jim Sherry was expelled from Sinn Féin for breach of party discipline. There was a period of trepidation after their exit, as Dermot Nolan, who was part of the Sherry faction, recalls. We were looking under cars in the morning. Sherry and Nolan soon joined their former adversary Omer Chu in the CPI. The dissidents' fears were not without foundation. In early October former OIRA member Billy Wright was shot in a machine gun attack at his barbershop in Cabra. The gunman escaped by hijacking a passing coal truck, and Wright died 17 days later. The attack was carried out by OIRA members who accused Wright of being a Garda informer. In September an off-duty Garda was shot dead while giving chase to armed robbers in Dublin. A number of officials were arrested in the aftermath of the shooting but it was two ex-members, Noel and Marie Murray, who were charged with the killing. In June Sinn Féin issued its first major pamphlet on women's issues, the rights of women in Ireland. Members such as Myrene de Burka and Pat McCartan were also increasing their involvement in the prisoners' rights organization, picketing the homes of Department of Justice officials to draw attention to conditions in Ireland's jails. The OIRA Easter Statement had highlighted what it saw as an attack on Irish culture through TV and radio to saturate the minds of our people with an alien capitalist ideology and an equally alien Anglo-American culture. To counter this officials were active in organizing cultural events, notably the Easter Week non-stop Connolly show performed in Liberty Hall. This was a 24-hour play written by ex-member John Arden that dramatized the life of James Connolly. The cast included Jim Sheridan, who had been involved with RID, and Ger O'Leary, while those who helped organize the event included Gerardy, Harris and Golding. Some members of the movement found such endeavors invigorating, though one recalls feeling that dying for Ireland in the GPO would have been less painful than sitting through some of that stuff. The most ambitious cultural project was Sinn Féin's commissioning of director Bob Quinn to produce the feature-length film Caonidaire Dui Leary, Lament for Arthur O'Leary. Filmed in Connemara, the film's plot followed a group of actors rehearsing a play based on an 18th-century poem recounting the tale of an Irish aristocrat, Art O'Leary, who returns from service with the wild geese. Filmed in Irish and English and avant-garde in style, it was seen as an educational tool as well as entertainment. Mac Giola praised the film as, not being, another exercise in futile probing of myths, but essentially a comment upon reality in the present Ireland of 1975. Courageous campaigns of resistance, however noble their inspiration, will fail like the gesture of Art O'Leary if they ignore realities. Romantic acts of heroism or defiance may inspire people but will never organize them. The censor gave the film a general certificate for viewing in its Irish version but not in the English. It was shown by Sinn Féin Cúmain throughout the country. In the north the year had seen an intensification of the sectarian slaughter, with 70 Catholics and 41 Protestants killed in sectarian attacks between February and September. In June an off-duty UDR man and two Protestant civilians were shot dead by the provisional IRA at Killeen on the border. Loyalists killed a youth in Rathfurland, claiming he was an OIRA member. On 31 July three members of the popular Miami show band were murdered as they crossed the border by a UVF unit that included serving UDR men. The provisional IRA in Belfast openly attacked Protestant civilians in retaliation for attacks on Catholics. On the weekend of 14 August, eight Protestants were killed in Belfast including four in a gun and bomb attack on the Bayardo Bar. Two days later a loyalist car bomb injured 35 people on the falls. In its aftermath the Citizens Defense Committee asked Belfast Corporation for help in housing repairs and workmen began deliveries almost immediately. 1. Sammy Llewellyn, was bringing in hardboard when he was stopped by provisionals and asked for identification. When they discovered he was a Protestant he was beaten and shot dead. The so-called, Good Samaritan, killing caused widespread revulsion on the falls. It also angered the local OIRA, 
who clashed with the provost shortly afterwards. By mid-1975 the official leadership had concluded at a meeting in Mornington that while civil war was not inevitable, and the British government still had no intention of pulling out of Northern Ireland, London was willing to tolerate and, in some cases, even encourage a terror situation that would force nationalist and unionist politicians into power sharing. This would aid the overall fundamental British and USA intention, the safe incorporation of Ireland within the Western Bloc. However, as elements within the provost and the loyalists were hell-bent on provoking civil war, there were four pragmatic considerations that were paramount for the officials if this occurred. Not to appear in the 69 light no matter how erroneous the PA provisional alliance line on this is. B. To save as many lives as possible. C. To save our personnel and the movement. D. To ensure the continuity of our political line. It was stressed that while the movement recognized the current attitudes of Northern Protestants, we, as Republicans, cannot at any time regard them as enemies, unity of the working class is a prerequisite for the Socialist Republic. By August the Republican clubs had organized anti-sectarian meetings in Darien Armagh and were distributing thousands of sectarianism kills workers leaflets. Ironically these activities were often curtailed by the threat of sectarian attacks. Defense and retaliation was still OIRA policy but permission to launch attacks was rarely forthcoming. One exception was the shooting of a soldier in Newry in May, retaliation for the injuring of two people by the British Army during a street protest. In July the OIRA launched a series of attacks on the Green Howard's regiment, wounding three soldiers. Following these incidents the Newry O.C. received an unusual house call. My door knocks and there was the commanding officer of the Green Howard's at the door and he handed me this envelope. He said, that's for you, I don't want any more of my soldiers shot. I said, I'm political, but, he said, now read that. It said, we would like to have a chat. I had to laugh but I showed it to Mick, Ryan, and he said, well, go along and see what they have to say. I took Joe Campbell and we met them in Bally Edmund Castle, Hotel. We actually came to an agreement that they would leave us alone if we would leave them alone. They never bothered us at all, no searches, roadblocks or that at all. However, the OIRA still felt it appropriate to back a Republican club's campaign against the blocking of border roads with a 20-minute gun attack on an army observation post at Karakastikan Road. In Belfast there was also the occasional retaliatory attack. After a Fianna member was badly beaten up by soldiers, the OIRA attacked troops in the south of the city with a grenade and one soldier lost a leg. In June the OIRA had confronted an undercover unit after a car crash on the falls and shots were exchanged. The OIRA made off with documents and weapons from the crashed car. The documents contained detailed descriptions of local officials, provisionals and IRSP members. The officials put the material on display at a press conference, and a photograph of two OIRA volunteers brandishing a captured Ingram machine pistol appeared in the United Irishman. Robberies continued even during the feud, with £1,400 taken from the Royal Victoria Hospital in January and £7,050 in two raids in Coal Island in March. Numerous robberies were carried out by the OIRA in South Armagh, South Down and Louth, with targets including local banks, post offices, building sites, labor exchanges, and Dundalk train station. Criticism of the OIRA's robberies by the local provost was met by a rebuttal stating that while bombings of pubs are anti-working class and anti-social, the robbing of banks and wealthy establishments is a well-established time-honored revolutionary tradition practiced by the Fenians and revolutionary groups throughout the world. It hurts none but the wealthy and establishment. In Dublin Jim Flynn was proving to be an imaginative operator. Tipped off by a porter about the sums held in the Gresham Hotel's safe on weekends, he booked in under a false name. At midnight he held up staff at gunpoint and stole £5,000 in jewellery and cash. Hotel staff gave a false description of the raider to Guardi, as the OIRA operative had demanded. The OIRA continued to carry out punishment attacks, with shootings and beatings in Derry, Straban and Newry. One victim in Newry was warned that he was lucky he was not executed. Local reaction was often based on political rivalry. In Straban the provisional IRA condemned the officials kneecapping of five local criminals. As tension mounted the OIRA shot two Provo supporters, and the provisionals tried to shoot an official in response in late September. There was also simmering hostility in Derry over an incident in which the OIRA had lost handguns to the provost while preparing for a department store robbery. During May both sides had abducted each other's members at gunpoint until a truce was worked out. In Belfast a 17-year-old provisional, Martin McMenemy, was killed accidentally by his own side during an altercation with officials in New Lodge on the 8th of August. The frequency of such confrontations was increasing in the city. A 15-year-old official Fianna boy,
Patrick Crawford, was fatally wounded in one of these incidents, in mysterious circumstances. Crawford's mother Martha had been accidentally shot and killed by the provisional IRA in 1972. Late summer saw two Catholics, who were returning from the All-Ireland semi-final, shot dead in Armagh, while the provisionals killed five Orangemen in a rural hall in Tullyvallon. The OIRA in Newry argued that there was security force collusion in local loyalist attacks, including one on a volunteer in Warrenpoint. But they also stressed that those who carried out attacks on Protestants could not absolve themselves of responsibility for recurring attacks on Catholics. The OIRA proposed talks between all paramilitary groups in an effort to end what they saw as the slide to civil war, a call rejected immediately by the UDA. While the sectarian killings continued, the OIRA publicly ruled out revenge attacks, arguing that, invariably the totally innocent, were, the random victims. Armed OIRA members did mount roadblocks in Belfast and Newry in an effort to halt the attacks, warning they would, get the sectarian killers, no matter what side of the community they come from. Photographs of an Oira gun girl, covering colleagues with an armalite appeared in the press. Unionist politicians complained that the OIRA had set up roadblocks openly in Newry. But there was less welcome publicity on the 10th of October when, during a wages robbery at a building firm in West Belfast, OIRA members shot and killed 24-year-old Sean McNamee. Tension between the officials and the provisionals remained high. The larger organization was suffering demoralization in the ranks due to the lack of concrete gains brought about by its ceasefire and was stung by official taunts about being the Queen's own provost. A measure of the hostility was expressed in the contemporary statement of one provo that, if I had a gun with one bullet and I had to choose between a stick and a brit, I'd blitz the stick. Internally, the official leadership informed members. There can be no doubt that in the present period of defeat the provisional membership must re-examine their politics and the more thoughtful and principled elements within them realize the need for socialist politics. For their current and past leaderships however there is no positive way forward. 9. The pogrom, the Catholic nationalist xenophobics were going to do to us what they planned to do with one million of our Protestant fellow countrymen. But we survived. Myron de Burka, Bodenstown, June 1976 As darkness fell in Belfast on Wednesday 29 October 1975 many officials were returning home from work, while others settled down to their tea in a night in front of the television. In the Cypress Street Club Day O'Hagan was setting up a projector for the showing of Keonid Air Gui Leary, to be introduced by Eamon Smullen. In McKenna's bar in the markets, Robbie Elliman and two comrades were among the regulars enjoying a pint. Suddenly one of the group, Jim Millen, saw three masked men burst in through the front door. One of the gunmen shouted, freeze. He had an armalite. He was aiming at Robbie Elliman's chest. He fired six or seven shots and then the three men ran out. I was lying on the floor and I told the barmaid to call an ambulance. I knew Robbie was dead. Elliman's killing was the beginning of an hour-long onslaught. Approximately 100 gunmen attacked members of the officials across Belfast. In Beachmount Sean O'Hare was pursued by gunmen who fired at him as he made a dash for safety into a house. The British army soon arrived, and when O'Hare told them that his life was in danger he was advised to fuck off. The householders called for help and O'Hare made his escape to a waiting car, through a crowd that included the gunmen. Around the same time in New Lodge, a wounded Dan O'Hara was desperately trying to push his children to safety after answering his door to a gunman. Some recognized their attackers as provisionals but in general confusion reigned. In New Lodge Margaret McNulty thought the gunmen were IRSP members as there had been trouble with the ERPS earlier that month. Kevin Smith, wounded in his living room, thought that loyalists had attacked him. Many of those who had escaped injury hurried to Cypress Street and other official social clubs. There the scale of the assault began to emerge. Ellis McKnight using her body to shield her husband Bobby after he was shot in the hallway of their house. Carol and Davy McGranahan shot at their home. Alec McManus wounded when he answered his door. Dan Mulvena shot six times. In total 31 people had been attacked in just an hour, in locations from Andersonstown to Turf Lodge and Ballymurphy to the Ormo Road. Robbie Elliman was dead, 19 were wounded, and Catholic Belfast was convulsed with shock. Many officials felt there had been an unusually sparse troop presence that evening. Tommy Flanagan had been taken from his home in Ardoin by armed. Provost and transported in a car that was stopped at an army checkpoint. While searching the passengers, soldiers noticed he was barefoot but showed no interest. Flanagan managed to run away as the car was waved on. Seamus Lynch, a prime target for the provost, was missed because he had been in Dublin and was on his way back to Belfast when the attacks occurred. When it was ascertained that the attackers were provosts, the implications of retribution were discussed at an emergency meeting in Cypress Street. O'Hagan called for widespread retaliation to show the OIRA were willing to be equally as ruthless as their attackers. McGurran, 
the most senior OIRA member present, counseled caution. He argued for confining retaliation to Belfast and for launching a propaganda offensive. A Republican club's press statement issued that night condemned the provisionals for allowing their madmen to let off steam by shooting Republicans but asked that there be no senseless retaliation. The provisional IRA issued their own statement shortly afterwards, justifying their action against a criminal group, who they accused of murder, arson, and gangsterism, and of bringing terror to the nationalist community. So began a pattern of allegation and counter-allegation that would continue throughout the following days of bloodshed. The official leadership advised their Belfast members to stay away from their homes and workplaces. Provo volunteers similarly withdrew from areas such as the Lower Ormo Road, Markets and Lower Falls. These precautions proved justified when attacks resumed the following evening. Gunmen burst into the home of John Kelly in Beachmount and opened fire, killing his six-year-old daughter Eileen. The provisionals apologized for the killing, saying that their intended target was the girl's father. Six other men were shot and wounded that night, five of them associated with the officials. The OIRA were also looking for targets. They kneecapped an 18-year-old female provisional at her workplace on the Ormo Road. She was one of a number of young women targeted. On Friday afternoon they killed one of the men they held responsible for the attacks. Seamus McCusker, the provisional IRA's northern director of intelligence, was gunned down as he left the artillery flats complex on the New Lodge Road, but the OIRA did not claim the killing and the Republican clubs actually condemned it. That evening an attempt was made on McGurn's life by gunmen traveling in a black cab, while the gem bar was machine gunned. Tom Barry was shot dead during a clash outside Sean Martin's GAA club in the short strand. The 26-year-old OIRA member, who came from a Protestant background, was preparing to ambush provisionals when his gun jammed. Despite the fear that tightened its grip on the Catholic ghettos, journalists noted that children still continued to walk the streets in Halloween costumes. Attacks continued over the weekend, with officials supporting families forced out of their homes in several areas. Some houses were daubed with white paint, marking them out for attack. Many of the displaced sought refuge in the relative safety of the Lower Falls, while others traveled south. There were similar forced evictions of provisional supporters in Twinbrook, Bonmore and the Lower Falls. The war of words continued. At press conferences McGurran alleged a dirty deal between the provost, the British Army and elements of Fianna Fáil. Northern Secretary Merlin Reese's explanation of the violence as a battle for military control of areas caused by the officials moving into Provo territory was described as ludicrous. The strong stance on national reunification taken at that week's Fianna Fáil Ard Thace was considered significant an interpretation supported by the Unionist Belfast newsletter, which commented that, it is a grim coincidence, and perhaps more than a coincidence, that the Provo Frankenstein was, the same night, as the Fianna Fáil Ard Thace, launched against left-wing Republicans, who are feared as the greatest long-term threat to the whole political and financial setup in the Gombeen, southern state. Some journalists reported that Provo attacks had been launched from incident centers while troops were stationed nearby, seemingly unconcerned. The main thrust of the provisional's justification for the assault was that the officials had been targeting small businesses in nationalist areas. They claimed the OIRA had carried out over 20 robberies of the Andersonstown post office, robbed that area's Ulster Bank into closure, and raided the Falls Road post office 14 times in six months. At a Belfast press conference, provisional Shin Fine President Rory O'Bradi accused the officials of acting like communists all over the world in attempting to gain control of the streets towards the aim of establishing a totalitarian Marxist social republic. Kevin Smith had recovered enough to watch TV from his hospital bed and saw O'Bradi's interview, I think that annoyed me more than being shot. Other provisional leaders openly announced that their aim was to get rid of the NLF. Seamus O'Tuothale felt that the Belfast provisional leader Billy McKee was seeking to take advantage of the IRSP split and Macmillan's death to enforce control of the Catholic ghettos but suggests that McKee made the mistake of thinking the officials had nothing left. The officials tried to step up the media war. A delegation of women traveled to Dublin to picket the provisional Sinn Féin offices, and in short strand women marched protesting that Republicans were killing one another while their area was under loyalist threat. By the end of the week nerves in Catholic Belfast were shredded. Pubs and clubs frequented by either group's supporters were targeted daily for arson attacks and bombings. On the 3rd of November former official internee Jim Fogarty was shot dead, aged 22, in front of his wife in their White Rock home. According to Fogarty's brother, when troops arrived, they just laughed at his dead body. In a move reminiscent of the OIRA's offer to IRSP members earlier that year, the provost announced a three-day amnesty for those willing to formally dissociate themselves from the Republican clubs. But there was no let-up in attacks, with OIRA member John Mario 
Kelly shot dead in Newington on the 9th of November. OIRA members were determined to hit back, burning down the Provisional's Green Cross office on the Springfield Road and attempting to kill Provo spokesman Seamus Lowren. 19-year-old Provisional Paul Best was shot and critically wounded in Andersonstown. The provost accused the NLF of a wave of terror, which included shootings, bombings, beatings and the eviction of opponents' families from their homes. On the 11th of November the violence dramatically escalated. John Brown, a well-liked 25-year-old OIRA member and former boxing champion, was shot dead on his mother's doorstep on the Ormo Road. He had returned there, against orders, to see his pregnant wife, and was spotted by local provosts. They alerted others from Short Strand, who shot Brown 15 times with a machine gun at close range. A few hours earlier provisionals had entered a workshop on the Falls Road, where they singled out 19-year-old apprentice joiner Comgal Casey. He was forced to kneel down and, although he pleaded that he was not a member of the officials, he was shot in the head. That afternoon another 19-year-old, Jackie McAllister, was gunned down while waiting for a bus on the Springfield Road. McAllister's mother Ethel had been among the women who picketed the provisional office in Dublin. The OIRA also claimed a victim, armed men bursting into a house on the Falls Road and shooting Owen McVeigh dead. The 28-year-old had no connection with either Republican group and his killer is reported to have exclaimed. Christ I'm in the wrong house, as he made his escape. With their members under severe pressure the OIRA sought to up the ante. They believed that the Falls Taxi Association, whose black cabs offered a cheap alternative to public transport in West Belfast, was closely connected to the provost and had carried gunmen involved in provisional attacks. On the 12th of November OIRA gunmen entered the Hawthorne Street Social Club and shot dead Michael Duggan, the director of the FTA, as he played billiards. The killing shocked taxi drivers, who announced a strike until after Duggan's funeral and called for an immediate end to the killings. The Clonard-based redemptorist father Alec Reed had been working hard to bring about a truce. At an early stage Reed had approached officials in Cypress Street and, despite being told to fuck off, followed one of them to Beachmount and made some headway in impressing upon him that he was genuinely trying to bring the conflict to an end. Other Catholic churchmen had voiced their fears that the British army was allowing civil war in the Catholic community to continue. The officials, so often the target of the clergy's ire, had been scathing of the clerical response. Jim Sullivan attacked the deafening silence of the clergy who had condemned lesser things from the pulpit. When in the wake of Duggan's killing Reed and fellow cleric Father Day Wilson visited Cypress Street with news that the provisionals sought a truce, O'Hagan recalled thinking, you would not be here unless the Falls Taxi Association head had been shot. Eventually a meeting was set up in Wilson's home in Springhill. Three representatives of each organization sat at either side of a table, the Provo delegation a generation older than their OIRA counterparts. For an hour both sides spoke only through the priests, never directly to each other. Eventually, during a break for tea, provisional Jimmy Drum asked Sean O'Hare how his father John, a 40s man, was keeping. O'Hare responded, and slowly dialogue developed. A ceasefire to end what the Irish Times called the bloodiest fighting between Republicans since the Civil War came into effect at 4 p.m. on the 13th of November. Behind the scenes a formal mediation scheme was established. This would develop into a system whereby complaints concerning members of both organizations were dealt with in writing. The clergymen oversaw regular meetings between the rival group's representatives. They aimed to deal with serious incidents on the day they occurred, and to respond to lesser infringements within three days. Each side had to agree to discipline the members concerned and, if admitting blame, to express regret. Both groups also had to ensure that complaints and replies contain no words which the side to whom they are addressed would deem disrespectful. The mediators would then file copies of the complaints. The 16 days of what the officials labeled a pogrom had seen over 100 armed attacks, 11 deaths and some 50 injuries. The officials had been on the receiving end in the majority of incidents, losing seven members or supporters, along with little Eileen Kelly. 24 people faced charges directly resulting from the feud. During arms raids and arrests the OIRA had lost a number of weapons, including the Ingram they had captured from a soldier in June. At John Brown's funeral Frank McGlade accused the Royal Ulster Provisionals of carving out a niche in history alongside the Free State Army of the Twenties. It soon became an article of faith for the officials that the provosts were in cahoots with the Brits, who had given them permission to carry out housekeeping during their ceasefire. Some linked the provo attacks to the counterinsurgency tactics promoted by Brigadier Frank Kitson previously used in Kenya and Aden, which involved backing one enemy faction against another. The officials would increasingly see the pogrom as evidence of the counter-revolutionary nature of the provost, and other observers noted that the violence had helped the authorities in some ways. The Irish Times suggested, 
that there were spin-offs in the feud for the British administration, because the organization they fear most in the long term, because of its Marxism, was under attack, while the energies of the provisionals are absorbed. The provost incident centers had operated throughout most of the violence, but the officials also benefited from the army's laissez-faire attitude. An OIRA operative recalled, going around pieced up, while being waved through checkpoints. The feud also played into British assertions that the violence was motivated not by politics but by rival criminal gangs. Seven days into the attacks Reese announced that he was withdrawing special category status for paramilitary prisoners. With Republicans sidetracked by what most outsiders saw as gang warfare, little heed was given to voices raised in opposition. On the day Michael Duggan was shot, Reese announced the closing of the Provisionals Incident Centers. The events defined the officials in Belfast for years to come. Everybody thinks the 29th of October lasted for three weeks, says one activist. It lasted five years, it lasted five years, every weekend. Remaining friendships between individual provosts and officials broke down, replaced in some cases by pure hatred. Family relations were also damaged, some irrevocably, with relatives unable to sit together in the same room. OIRA strategy was redefined. Defense and retaliation took on a whole new concept, says Mary McMahon. Up till then it was against the Brits. Post-1975 it was against the provosts. Now OIRA intelligence was directed to find out where local provisionals signed on for social welfare, so they could be targeted there, and where their aunts and grandmothers lived, as that was where they were likely to hide during feuds. Internally the OIRA lauded the very effective military response of their units and claimed their willingness to target non-military operatives had helped force the provosts into talks. Tension between the rival organizations remained high in the feud's aftermath and a single punch-up would have a ripple effect that threatened to reignite the fighting. In February 1976 Paul Best died of wounds received in an OIRA gun attack the previous November. The officials Tony Maxwell was shot and badly wounded on the falls. The clerical mediators declared themselves disturbed by the trend of recent events, noting several serious breaches of the truce. They recommended that weekly meetings of the leaders of both organizations take place and that local representatives also meet with them. A particular feud resolution etiquette had developed. The side that had been the victim of an attack did not take part in mediation until after they had first responded in kind. Nonetheless, the process did help ensure that that year's Easter commemorations passed largely peacefully. But vandalism and breaking of windows continued to be routine. When you look back on it you wonder how your family lived with it, what my wife had to put up with, she was attacked physically in the street and she wasn't interested in politics. My kids were attacked, my sitting room window broken maybe six times with bricks when my children were young. For Kevin Smith it was a very peculiar existence, constantly on alert, always expecting something. In Andersonstown party activity invariably meant, there was constant ongoing fights. Every time you tried to sell the United Irishman, every time you gave out leaflets, there was pushing and shoving, almost soccer hooligan style bang-ups, not always caused by the provost I must say. People stuck even more rigidly to their own drinking clubs, and a claustrophobic situation developed. Within days of the truce, Pogrom, a Republican club's pamphlet outlining the course of the violence, was being distributed. Written from an unashamedly partisan perspective, it carried no mention at all of OIRA activities. In New York, the officials' American supporters had taken out an ad in the Irish Echo demanding that the provost stop murdering Irish Republicans, and the officials believed that the intense pressure on the provisional leadership from the United States contributed substantially to ending the attacks. In Belfast, however, Smullen's assertion that the officials were winning the propaganda war had cut little ice with those on the receiving end of the violence. For the most part the violence did not spread south, though an argument between a Dublin official and a relative who supported the provost resulted in OIRA members bursting into the provisional south side home and shooting him in the leg. A Dublin OIRA man was arrested moving weapons for Belfast outside Drogheda, though a colleague managed to escape. While the association with violence may have been off-putting to some, it reassured others of the importance of their political affiliation. A Dublin member recalling, it was scary but it was exciting. You felt this was something you could be really committed to. People were willing to give up not only parts of their lives but their whole lives, they were that committed to it. The scars left by the feuds were reflected in speeches at the January Sinn Féin Ard Thace. Seamus Costello was described as a traitor who had tried for years to subvert or destroy the movement, but the officials had rid themselves of the opportunists, the instant revolutionaries, the sectarian bigots as well as the cowards who fled, not to greener but to safer pastures. The leadership expressed frustration that there were still some members who saw the events of 1975 as a quarrel between Irishmen. 
Instead, it was reiterated that the provosts were a counter-revolutionary force, the creation of Fianna Fáil, set up to derail progressive politics in Ireland. Mac Giola warned that any member with latent sympathy for acts of terrorism would be ruthlessly dealt with. Fifty-five people, mostly civilians, were killed in Northern Ireland in the first six weeks of 1976 as a result of the continuing provisional and loyalist campaigns. The most shocking sequence of events occurred in Armagh, where five Catholic brothers from two families were killed by the UVF on 4 January. A day later provisional IRA members stopped a bus carrying workers at Kingsmills. The men were lined up and asked if there were any Catholics present. They instinctively tried to shield their one Catholic workmate, assuming that the gunmen were loyalists, but the Catholic was told to leave and the eleven Protestants were gunned down at close range, only one surviving. The attack was claimed by the South Armagh Action Force. In Nuri the officials stated, there is no SAAF, just the sectarian killers of the Provisional Alliance. 2,000 people attended a protest against sectarianism organized by Newry Trades Council, whose president was Republican club leader Tom Moore. During the summer a mass movement briefly emerged after three young children were killed when a Provisional IRA man, fatally wounded by troops, crashed his getaway car into them. Thousands of protesters, mainly women, both Catholic and Protestant, demonstrated for an end to violence. Official Sinn Féin joined the protest marches in Dublin though the organization was equivocal about the movement. Mac Giola warned that, middle-class do-gooders would kill the movement, stone dead, by aligning it with the authorities. Though it illustrated that many people were weary of the violence, their religious tone and failure to criticize the state forces made the, peace people, a short-lived phenomenon. Sinn Féin still lacked a strong electoral base in the South, and in order to change this the 15 Kumain in Dublin had to be motivated into systematic local activity. Dennis Foley was appointed as full-time coordinator of elections in an effort to professionalize local organization. An opportunity arose with a by-election in Dublin southwest during June. The constituency contained Ballyfermot, described as Dublin's most concentrated working-class area. Tomás MacGiola received 1,679 votes, or 7%, which was double the Sinn Féin total in 1973. It was decided that he would remain active in the constituency and prepare for future elections. Among new recruits in the area was Noel McFarlane, who had ridden the well-received down the corner, a look at Valley Fermat from the perspective of a local teenager. In Finglas the problem of substandard housing was leading to increased activity at the party's new permanent office in the area. The area maintained a strong official IRA tradition and the party's advice center was subject to constant special branch surveillance. In late 1976 Smullen was chosen by Finglas members as area candidate for the next general election, but declined, as did Garland both men preferring behind-the-scenes organization to public office, Proinches de Rosa was selected instead. The Sinn Féin leadership were eager to reorient the party to southern political work, feeling there was growing disillusionment at the Labour Party's role in government amidst high levels of unemployment and inflation. The chairman of the Resources Protection Campaign's trade union group, Pat Rabbit, accused Labour of betrayal of its principles and objectives and argued that the capitalist system cannot fulfill the needs of the working class. Discussions between Sinn Féin, the Communist Party and the Labour Party's liaison of the left resulted in a joint policy document, The Economic Crisis, The Left Alternative. It argued that, private enterprise, had, totally failed, to provide for the needs of the majority of Irish people. In early February 1,000 people attended the public launch of the, Left Alternative, an ad hoc alliance of the three groups, at Dublin's Mansion House. There were speakers from all of the groups and an air of enthusiasm at the prospect of unity on the left. The three organizations also cooperated in the organization of Dublin's May Day March. Members of the Left Alternative met to discuss the formation of a civil liberties organization, to highlight the Fine Gael Labour Coalition's increasingly repressive security policy, and in July the Irish Council for Civil Liberties, ICCL, was launched. Among the executive committee of the council were several members and supporters of the officials. By 1976 Sinn Féin dominated the leadership of the 55,000-member Union of Students in Ireland, Eamon Gilmore and Johnny Curran having been elected President and Education Officer, respectively, in January. The officials' dominance was contested by a variety of opponents, who often seized on their pro-Soviet politics. The UC was affiliated to the International Union of Students, IUS, which was composed mainly of student unions in communist countries. Through the IUS, Delegates from Romania, Iraq and the USSR attended UC conferences and the UC had a full-time representative at IUS headquarters in Prague. As a result many of the debates at the UC Congress took on an international flavor. Sinn Féin's opponents tried unsuccessfully to have a motion condemning repression in the Eastern Bloc passed at the 1976 Congress. 
The officials complained that their college opponents represented a right-wing Trotskyite alliance. Sinn Féin advised its student members to devote as much time to student affairs as to international affairs in order to offset scare headlines in the press. But the link with the IUS was seen as valuable by Sinn Féin. It provided contact between the movement and future Eastern Bloc cadres, outside the influence of the Irish Communist Party. There was also tension within the left alternative, despite the early optimism about left-wing unity. Sinn Féin accused the Communist Party of caucusing before resources protection campaign meetings and distributing lists of their candidates for election. Competition between the organizations was inevitable, as the Communists saw themselves as providing the disciplined Marxist core to any alliance while Sinn Féin were still seen as petty bourgeois. But the officials had greater ambitions, as demonstrated by the use of the slogan, Sinn Féin, the Workers' Party, on display in banners at Easter and increasingly on leaflets and posters. The RPC trade union group was dominated by industrial department cadres, with Oliver Donahue, Patty Gillen and John Caden in leading positions during 1976. The industrial department's promotion of Sinn Féin policy at the expense of cooperation with the other affiliated groups was a source of concern to some within the party. Braze Liz McManus argued that, the tactics recently adopted, in the campaign, have had the effect of alienating support, and that, tried Marxist principles for operations within broad fronts had been abandoned. But Smullen and his allies felt they were the main intellectual force within the campaign and were adamant that the other groups should not reap the benefits of official expertise and effort. During 1976 the Industrial Department's research section unveiled a number of policy documents, including Rapid Rail for Dublin, aimed at providing cheap and accessible public transport for the growing suburbs of Tallaght and Blanchardstown, and full employment by 1986, which set out a vigorous expansion of the state sector into job creation and development of natural resources. Sinn Féin also argued for a new state construction company, because of the failure of private firms to ensure adequate standards for houses. The party stated that, we want the state sector to expand until it has obliterated all private enterprise. The industrial department strongly supported a proposal from the Dublin Port and Docks Board that an oil refinery be set up in Dublin Bay. The environmental activists of Antushka and a range of community groups, led by councillor Sean, Dublin Bay, Loftus, opposed the project. Sinn Féin was dismissive of environmental objections and argued that the refinery would both create desperately needed jobs and could eventually be taken into public ownership so that Ireland would have its own independent oil and gas industry. Sinn Féin members on Dublin Trades Council were instrumental in getting that organisation to row in behind the refinery project. Anti-refinery campaigners had complained bitterly about a seven days program broadcast in November 1975 and produced by Harris, which they claimed was heavily biased in favor of the refinery. The program had featured Smullen prominently. Harris was also central to the writing of two new pamphlets, The Banks and Tony O'Reilly's Last Game, A Case History of Irish Capitalism. O'Reilly's career was said to have enshrined all the ambitions of Gombean Ireland, and he personally all the avarice, greed and stupidity of that class. Some thought the tone of the pamphlet too personalized, but Harris explained that the working class needs someone to hate. Significantly, in the pamphlet's introduction Smullen took aim at those who blamed foreign capital for Ireland's difficulties. While he stressed that Sinn Féin wanted state companies in place of the Tony O'Reilly's, in the interim, productive multinationals were preferable to protected Irish sweatshops because in the long term the working class would rid themselves of both. In this view, industrialization, foreign and Irish, strengthened the working class as it helped create its own gravediggers. The industrial department were also pushing for change in the movement's northern policies, Harris circulating a document called From Civil Rights to Class Politics which argued that civil rights had now been attained in Northern Ireland. Within Sinn Féin there were mixed attitudes towards the industrial department. Its members cultivated a certain image, wearing working class clothes like they'd just come in off the building site, it was very irritating, for a lot of people who realized it was a bit of an act. Cynics dubbed the department's Ned Stapleton Cummin the Led Zeppelin Cummin. There was a strong macho tendency among department members, and several activists were involved in the martial arts. The penchant for secrecy and conspiracy alarmed Patty Woodworth. It was very creepy, very creepy. I frankly found the Harris faction a far more frightening phenomenon than the IRA itself. During the 1976 Ard Thais debate on women's rights, Department members proposed a motion concentrating on equal pay but ignoring other legal restrictions on women. Myron de Burka, who had gained national attention with a successful case against the exclusion of council tenants and women from jury service, countered that just because contraception and creche facilities were demanded by middle-class women did not mean that they would not also benefit workers. The industrial department, contemptuous towards what it saw as liberal, middle-class concerns regarding gender and the lumen proletariat, 
pushed for one of their supporters to replace her as Sinn Féin's election candidate in Dublin Central. Former Sinn Féin Vice President Derry Kelleher resigned in July 1976, citing the Industrial Department's activities as his reason. Kelleher would accuse the Industrial Department of having instructed members to curtail strikes on factory construction sites as part of its master plan, never discussed with the party leadership, to speed up the proletarianization of the countryside. The 60th anniversary of the 1916 Rising was a very different affair from that of ten years previously. In the run-up to Easter, Minister for Justice Paddy Cooney argued that the provost violence and the officials, Sino-Hibernian, Marxism represented equal threats to the state, and a commemorative parade in Dublin by the provisionals was banned. The officials condemned the fact that a government of opportunist labor and blue shirt fine gale, had decided to completely ignore the 1916 rebellion, as part of its policy of apologizing to the British government and the intransigent elements of Northern Unionism. The officials organized 40 commemorations of their own, North and South, none of which were prohibited. An official IRA statement lamented that the anniversary was not marked by the secularism, socialism or egalitarianism of the Rising's leaders but by an almost unprecedented wave of sectarianism, authoritarianism and materialism. While condemning the Provost campaign, the officials opposed the ban on the Provo parade, arguing that the government's attack on the right of peaceful assembly, allied to the stringent censorship operated in RTE, helps glamorize rather than expose the perverted ideas of the provisionals. Official Sinn Féin made a concerted effort to distance itself from any connection with political violence, condemning the provost assassination of British ambassador to Ireland Christopher Ewart Biggs in July as a gross act of terrorism, and refusing to ally itself with the campaign set up to call for a reprieve for Noel and Marie Murray, ex-members sentenced to death for killing a Garda in 1975. While the Irish people argued that the couple should not be executed, the party avoided association with the issue. After a Garda raid on the home of activist Nuala Monaghan, she was advised to keep a low profile during the Dublin by-election. The distancing of the party from violent militancy brought about the resignations of Jack Lynch, from Cork, during March and Mickey Montgomery, from Derry, in December. In the longer term both Lynch and Montgomery would join the IRSP, as did some other former officials, such as Golding's daughter-in-law Mary Reed. Some contacts survived the ideological rift between the official movement and the IRSP. Following the March robbery of £200,000 from a mail train in County Kildare four IRSP members, Nikki Kelly, Osgore Briotnock, Brian McNally and Michael Plunkett, were arrested. All were former officials, and despite evidence of Garda brutality in forcing their confessions the four were convicted and sentenced to lengthy prison terms. During their trial and subsequent high-profile appeals the group were aided by a radical lawyers group based in Dublin's Church Street, with Sinn Féin activist Pat McCartan initially prominent in their defense. The idea for such a heist had a long pedigree, having been discussed by Ryan and Garland during the mid-1960s. The phasing out of special category status by the British government affected the officials' approach to prisoners. In January greetings had been sent to the Ard Thais from OIRA prisoners in Long Kesh and Portlawas. The message from Long Kesh asserted the right of political prisoners to political status. Jim Smith, a member of the OIRA prison leadership, argued that as they had fought long and hard to secure their rights they were not prepared to take a retrograde step and give them up. The Ard Thais had endorsed a motion to fight against the removal of political status. However, the fact that Provo and IRSP prisoners benefited from a status that put them above common criminals was hard to accept for many activists. During the debate de Burka had stated that to ask for special status for the murderers of men, women and children is anti-republican, anti-socialist and anti-people. An article on prisoners' rights in the March United Irishmen seemed to reflect de Burka's view. It argued that all prisoners of a corrupt system are political prisoners and that to call for special status was elitist. There were complaints over the tone of the article and the prisoners asked for guidance on the matter from the official leadership. The general opinion among the leadership was that free association was the most important right while clothes and prison work were matters for negotiation. But OIRA prison spokesmen argued that to abandon any of the special category privileges would be to accept criminal status. The prison's issue remained a live one because OIRA volunteers continued to be sentenced. Several had arrived in jail because of the feuds with the IRSP and the provisionals, and the continuing robberies. During May a Craghaven official was jailed for nine years for armed robberies and involvement in shootings, and four more were arrested after holding a family hostage during an attempted raid on the Ulster Bank in Banbridge later that month. In July three Lurgan OIRA men were jailed for a post office robbery in the town. The officials continued to raise money by other means as well, running a construction company in Belfast providing security at building sites in areas of official influence, and continuing exploitation of the tax exemption scam, 
which produced thousands of pounds in revenue for the movement as well as for Harry McEwen and his accomplices. A storm-owned security think tank during March had noted that the OIRA possessed the ability to involve itself in non-sectarian revolutionary violence, and in October British intelligence suggested that the officials were capable of selective sabotage, but that their military capacity was now slight and localized. In fact, the year had seen important changes in the OIRA's structures. Discomfort with Golding's refusal to abandon his painting business and assume a full-time role came to a head. There was frustration about his heavy drinking and failure to contribute seriously to leadership discussions. He was replaced by Garland after an army council vote in summer 1976. Long dismissive of the IRA's titles and formal military structure, Garland was reluctant to adopt the title of chief of staff, but he was now undoubtedly in charge. Golding kept his place on the army council and the two remained friends. Garland set about finalizing the changes that were intended to turn the movement into a Leninist revolutionary party. It was envisaged that the official IRA would become a special department, strictly subordinate to political needs and out of public view. It would have a defensive role, primarily but not exclusively in the North, and be concerned with fundraising and intelligence gathering. Existing unit structures were maintained in Belfast, Lurgan and Newry. All activity was to be strictly controlled by the leadership, with punishment attacks having to be authorized by the command staff. Loosely defined units comprising several dozen members were maintained in Dublin, Cork and Waterford. In Dublin the GHQ staff remained, with most of its members also holding important positions within the Sinn Féin organization. However, operations department members were ordered to distance themselves from open party activity. Garland strongly encouraged the use of the term, Group B, rather than IRA. There was to be no further public manifestation of the official IRA, no Easter statements or claims of attacks. If arrested, Group B members were to deny any links to Sinn Féin. If jailed they would serve their sentences as ordinary prisoners, though their dependents would be looked after as in the past. In the North, prisoners sentenced before the end of special category status would retain that privilege but those jailed afterwards were to accept being regarded as ordinary prisoners. OIRA units were briefed on the changes and, while some expressed unease, one Dublin member recalls his unit were enthusiastic, feeling, it was the way to go. When five prisoners faced charges over clashes at Portlaws their solicitor asked that the biased and dangerous term, official IRA prisoners is not be used about the men. After January 1976 lists of prisoners no longer appeared in the United Irishmen. Public manifestations of the OIRA did not disappear immediately. At the Easter commemoration in Newry, where there had been complaints about the behavior of the parachute regiment, Sean O'Chanath warned that the Army of the People would retaliate if aggression by British troops continued, and later in the year the OIRA carried out a number of gun attacks on security forces. They also continued vigilante activity and punishment attacks. At the funeral of 19-year-old OIRA volunteer Gerard Gilmore, who was shot dead by the UDA at the Boundary Bar in Belfast's Bonmore in July, the RUC arrested members of the Colour Party. Early August saw the OIRA retaliate with a gun attack against troops on the estate. OIRA members had also fired on the British Army elsewhere in Belfast on 9 August. Having a bladder at the Brits on internment night had remained a tradition in the post-ceasefire years. In other areas there were also OIRA warnings to criminals and the security forces. But gradually all public statements ceased. In October, as part of the general move away from the trappings of a traditional Republican military organization, the Irish Democratic Youth Movement, IDYM, was launched, replacing the FIANA as the official's youth wing. After April no more youths had been recruited into the FIANA in Belfast. There was a great deal of resentment among FIANA members in Belfast at this. They felt that the majority of their members had stood by the officials during the recent feuds, and that they were unfairly accused of being militarists. When a compromise, that the FIANA in Belfast formed the basis of the IDYM, was rejected, they stood themselves down. Initially over 100 Belfast ex-FIANA members joined the new group, although some of them drifted out quickly. By 1976 Soviet bloc communism was the dominant ideological influence within the officials. Party delegations frequently traveled beyond the Iron Curtain and party representatives were in regular contact with Eastern Bloc diplomats, attending receptions at the Bulgarian and Soviet embassies in London. Soviet ambassador to Ireland Anatoly Kaplan was a guest at the David commemoration in Dublin, and during September Sinn Féin met representatives of the North Korean government in Brussels. A Sinn Féin office was also opened in Rome after discussions with the Italian communists. Links with liberation movements continued with representatives of the Namibian SWAPO brought on a tour of Ireland while Sinn Féin members visited Cuba, Ghana and Vietnam.
During July 1976 a second anti-imperialist festival was held in Dublin with Palestinian, Angolan and Rhodesian guerrilla groups represented. Activity had also been maintained among the immigrant support groups. The Irish Republican Club organized for Ochenath to address a congressional committee on the subject of civil rights in Northern Ireland in late 1975, and de Burka toured the U.S. during the winter of 1976, visiting 20 cities and raising £1,286. Contacts with Democratic Congressman Lloyd A. Barbie, who attended the Dublin Anti-Imperialist Festival, led to the Wisconsin State Assembly passing a citation praising official Sinn Féin's policies for peace. British Labour MPs Audrey Wise and Joan Maynard agreed to invite Tomás Maggiola to speak at Westminster. Despite condemnation from Tory MPs who had called for a ban on the visit, with one describing Maggiola as the scum of the earth, he met several Labour MPs and spoke at the Communist University, organised by the British CP in London in July. Maggiola also attended an international liberation conference in Algiers, where he condemned the viciously fascist activities of the provost. This theme was echoed by Golding at the Anti-Imperialist Festival when he warned delegates that although the provosts were seeking support in Africa and the Middle East as a national liberation organization, they were not. Sinn Féin also worked to frustrate plans by a British troops out movement delegation to meet Irish trade unionists. English Tom organizer Paddy Prendyville complained that neither the Dublin nor the Belfast Trades Council would meet the delegation as a result. British intelligence noted that the officials were carrying their bitter competition with the provost to an international level. They felt that the officials had achieved qualified success in gaining international recognition, and they were worried about links with the Soviets, who could utilize the common travel area between Britain and Ireland for espionage purposes. The British considered that there were at least three KGB agents operating from the Soviet embassy in Dublin. Surveying the international scene, the United Irishman was optimistic that the examples of Cuba, Vietnam, Mozambique and Angola proved that the flood tide of socialism is surging forward to sweep away the remnants of a system history has marked for obsolescence. While Chile and South Africa proved that capitalism would not concede without a fight, the socialist flood will engulf it all the same. But the movement's leadership were not simply going to wait for socialism to reach Ireland. The officials were about to commit themselves to a radical policy redirection that would aim at building the Irish working class into a force capable of establishing socialism. 10. A historic mission, Sinn Féin the Workers' Party is the historical product of the French Revolution. In turn, the product of our party in history must be the creation of an Irish Industrial Revolution. This, in turn, means the emancipation of the Irish working class so that it can carry out its historic mission, the construction of socialism in Ireland. Eamon Smullen, January 1977 There was no dissension among the official Sinn Féin delegates gathered in Dublin's Mansion House in January 1977 as they ratified the party's rather unwieldy new name, Sinn Féin the Workers' Party. The debate had been well choreographed, with twelve kumain, drawn from every region, placing motions calling for the change. One delegate, speaking in front of the Ard Thay's slogan, Working for Peace, Planning for Progress, attempted to capture the significance of the new name, declaring it, the end of the Griffith era and the beginning of the Connolly age. For industrial department cadres the new title signified their ideological ascendancy. Northerners hoped it would appeal to the Protestant working class and Garland and others saw it as a statement of the party's place within the international struggle between labor and capital. Facing into a southern general election, there was also a more practical reason to welcome the development. The provosts were killing people and they were getting the publicity, and the Sinn Féin name was becoming synonymous with death and killing. An Irish Times editorial welcomed the promising, if cumbersome, new party title. It also noted that, that shadowy organization, the official IRA had not delivered a public message to the Ard Thace, but neither had it announced its disbandment. Although media attention focused on the addition of the Workers' Party to the party's name, the January 1977 Ard Thace saw a no less important development with the publication of the Irish Industrial Revolution. At just over 150 pages, this was the fruit of Owen Harris' endeavors to provide the movement with a comprehensive economic plan, backed by a historical narrative from a scientific socialist perspective. Although advertised as the sixth title in the research section's series Studies in Political Economy, the Irish Industrial Revolution was more wide-reaching and had a far greater impact than any of the previous booklets. The document was distributed by industrial department members, but had not been submitted to the Ard Chomherly previous to publication, a cause of disquiet among some at the Ard face. Industrial department attempts to influence the movement's direction without reference to its decision-making structures had already contributed to Myron de Burka's decision not to seek re-election to the Ard Chomherly and her resignation as general secretary. She had been increasingly disturbed by the intensity of industrial department cadres. They examined people's every word, 
every gesture almost, were they Stalinist or weren't they? If they weren't they did their damnedest to get them out of the party. Some leadership figures had seen the new booklet prior to publication. Smullen had worked closely with Harris, and Garland had also read a pre-publication copy and requested changes. The Irish Industrial Revolution contained two distinct sections, an economic history of Ireland from the 17th century onwards, written mainly by Harris, and a systematic plan for the making of an industrial Ireland, which had been worked on by a number of research section members under Harris' direction. The history section exposed as a fable the idea that Ireland's past was one of inevitable poverty. Instead, in vitriolic language, Irish history was presented as the story of the rise of a Gombean class of Catholic strong farmers, professionals and merchants. The national bourgeoisie had finally gained state power with the 1922 treaty and their bloody triumph in the Civil War. The losers in this rise to power were not the British, whose capitalist system the national bourgeoisie would administer in Ireland at less expense, but the populist Fenian movement, the laborers and cottiers and finally the Irish working class. In the course of this narrative the radical credentials of Daniel O'Connell and Arthur Griffith were debunked while the revolutionary aims of figures such as Michael David and James Connolly were re-emphasized. Southern Irish capitalists were depicted throughout as lazy, cowardly and backward, their symbiotic relationship with the Catholic Church holding back the economic potential of the country and its working class. This was contrasted with the capitalists of the Northeast and their industrialization of Belfast. Independence had simply allowed the national bourgeoisie to demonstrate their inadequacies. Behind de Valera's protective barriers and without direct British interference they still failed to industrialize Ireland. By the late 1950s, Irish capitalism was like a rattled and blowsy prostitute, long past her best. The opening of Ireland to international investment by Sean Lamasse was merely the national bourgeoisie selling out to US monopoly capitalism, while retaining a minor share in any profits that could be beaten out of the servants. However, this process of multinational development was not condemned out of hand. Those with knowledge of elementary dialectics could grasp the progressive tendencies that multinational investment was encouraging. As an unintended consequence it was producing what native capitalism had failed to do, a highly organized and militant working class. As Marx had predicted, advanced capitalism in Ireland was creating its own gravediggers. This meant that the movement's view of the Industrial Development Authority and the EEC would have to change from opposition to qualified support based on a belief that both institutions were aiding Ireland's entry into the world capitalist network. The growing state enterprise sector, consisting of companies such as the ESB, Board Namona, CA and Aer Lingus, was identified as the other key conduit of progressive change. The struggle to defend, consolidate and expand the state sector should be seen as the single most vital task confronting the organized working class at the present time. A variety of groups were identified as standing in the way of the working class's ascent to power. Firstly there was the tiny financial oligarchy of individuals who occupied directorships in both banking and industry and used the major political parties to hold state power. This group was encouraging U.S. economic penetration and attempting to drag Ireland into the Western alliance. On the supposed left were social democrats seeking to divert the working class from revolutionary change. The ultra-leftists were damned for their neurotic phobia of bureaucracy and unrealistic demands for instant solutions. The small farmers, referred to as transitional farmers, would have to accept that their economic role was defunct and take their place among the urban working class or in collective farming endeavors. The Irish Industrial Revolution's economic plan was a broad stroke attempt at formulating policies that would consolidate working class economic power over the next decade. It was based on the premise that the population would become younger during the 1980s, due to the ending of emigration brought about by Irish economic growth and capitalism's global crisis. This would, for the first time since the famine, see Ireland's population structure begin to resemble the European norm. Labour and Fine Gael calls for the legalization of contraception were criticized as a long-term attempt to halt such a development. In order to cater for this young population, and economically enfranchise it, the plan sought to achieve full employment through the creation, by 1986, of 330,000 new jobs in the state sector, and 81,000 in the private sector. In a renunciation of the central plank of Sinn Féin economic policy since Arthur Griffith, economic growth would not be fostered by protectionism but by Irish products competing in international markets. A rapid increase in productivity would be brought about by massive state investment and large-scale rationalization of production. In most industries state companies would be given a dominant role. This industrial utopianism was neatly summed up by the pamphlet's cover, which depicted two boys happily playing with a dog on the beach in front of the impressive outline of Dublin's Pigeon House power station. There could be no mistaking the message that industrial development equaled a bright future for the urban Irish population. 
Although its measures were never formally adopted as policy, the Irish Industrial Revolution redefined SFWP ideology. Many members, particularly those attached to the industrial department and the paramilitary structure, eagerly adopted its thesis. As one activist recalls, the Industrial Revolution was our Bible, it won people over. The brutal simplicity of its core demand, for rapid industrialization through central planning, showed a debt to Stalin. It also drew liberally on the output of the British and Irish Communist Organization, and on the work of mainstream historians such as Joe Lee and John A. Murphy. An attraction for some activists was how much the pamphlet, annoyed the party's enemies. Left-wing journals carried competing reviews and letters on the subject well into the summer. Having recently become the editor of the CPI paper The Irish Socialist, Owen Omer Chu used his contributions to rejoin ideological battle over the importance of the national question. He argued that the pamphlet was a massive revision of republicanism, in that the role and significance of British imperialism in Ireland is minimized, and concluded that it was left in form but right in content. The booklet received a more favorable reception from economic historian Cormac O'Grata, who hoped it would act like a dose of salts on the kind of woolly and utopian thinking about history that too often has influenced the left in Ireland. The pamphlet and its reception were symptomatic of a deterioration in relations between SFWP and the Irish Communists. In March 1977 the Communist Party privately distributed a memorandum, written by Omer Chu, that criticized the changes in the SFWP's ideological position. The memo accused SFWP of describing small farmers and small businessmen as enemies of the working class, posing as a Marxist-Leninist party internationally, and dismissing the national question as mythical. It also claimed that SFWP had rich financial resources, not raised by members' subscriptions, emigrant support groups or any kind of fundraising campaigns. SFWP dismissed the Communist Party's allegations in a point-by-point -point rebuttal, which was also distributed internationally. On the issue of the movement's ideology, the reply stated, while the teachings of Marx and Lenin figure largely in our educational curriculum and play a large part in the formulation of our ideology and organizational principles, we never claimed to be a communist party. In early 1977 resentment towards the industrial department had seen another group of Dublin members resign, among them Jim Sheridan, Sean Dunn and Jer O'Leary. Many went on to join the CPI. One cause of this was the industrial department's decision to vote Labour Party and communist representatives off the Resources Protection Campaign executive. Arrangements were made to pack meetings electing delegates to the RPC's annual general meeting in Dublin's Ormond Hotel. At the latter event, previous allies of SFWP were shocked to find themselves being voted off executive positions in favor of inexperienced SFWP members. Smullen, Harris and Oliver Donahue toured Kumain throughout the country to promote the Irish Industrial Revolution. The industrial department cadre's self-proclaimed role as the progressive wing of the party resonated within a movement that had spent more than a decade challenging tradition. Nonetheless, in many regions debate was fierce. One member recalls bringing his concerns to Garland. I said this is bad Marxism and inaccurate history and Garland said, yeah, you could be right about the details, but we need a working class history of Ireland, a history of our class. None of us agree with this document 100%. It was not until October 1977, following a prolonged period of strife within the leadership over the industrial department's role, that Tony Heffernan provided the most forceful internal critique of the document. Heffernan called for the history section to be deleted and for consideration of whether the entire booklet should be withdrawn. He dismissed the document's style as bigoted, hysterical and sectarian, and claimed that it totally ignored the role of British imperialism in Irish history. He feared the logical conclusion would be for the party to adopt the two nations theory. He disputed that industrial development automatically equaled social progress and attacked the writing off of the farming community as impractical. Finally, Heffernan denounced the document's tone. People in other organizations are not merely criticized, but denounced for holding attitudes which were until a short time ago held by our party. Despite this criticism, in December 1977 the Ard Chomherly, at the proposal of Garland and seconded by Golding, voted to produce an edited but unexpurgated second edition. Apart from Smullen, few within the party leadership had much idea how the industrial department functioned. Its leading members' obsession with secrecy had resulted in Smullen receiving an early 1977 commitment that trade union plans would no longer be referred to in internal party reports. The department's clandestine nature was such that the COIST, CISTA, steering committee, found it necessary to formally demand a complete list of industrial common members. By this period these several dozen activists were organized into the three Dublin-based industrial branches, with smaller groups active in Cork and Belfast and with aligned influential figures in most areas. There was also concern over the industrial department cadre's attempts to foster independent links with the Soviet embassy. 
Eagerness to develop fraternal relations with the Eastern Bloc also saw Industrial Department member Patricia Redlich play a leading role within the Ireland GDR Friendship Society. Disappointingly, elements within the Soviet Communist Party who had been given a copy of the Irish Industrial Revolution to review by an Industrial Department member visiting the Black Sea Resort of Yalta were unimpressed by the publication. Debate was also provoked by the attitude adopted by Industrial Department members within the Irish Council of Civil Liberties. De Burka claimed that Smullen was organizing bloc voting by his supporters on the ICCL executive without the authorization of the party. The central issue here was Industrial Department attempts to get the ICCL to remove its support from a symbolic hunger strike calling for the transfer of Republican prisoners from Porlawas prison to the Kura. This debate had seen Heffernan and Ochenate strongly oppose the Industrial Department's position, but the majority of the leadership rode in behind Smullen's view that the standing and credibility of the ICCL was being endangered by its association with Provo activities. During preparations for the June 1977 general election, the Industrial Department flexed its internal muscle. For some time there had been attempts to sideline the party's candidate in the Rathmines area of Dublin, Pygin Doyle, with a whispering campaign that she was suspect due to her brother's involvement with the provisionals. Her position as SFWP candidate was taken by Eric Byrne, who had the support of the Industrial Department. De Burka, although no longer on the Ard Chomherly, was still the choice of most of the leadership as candidate for the Dublin North Central constituency. She had the highest profile of any party member in the area and had received a respectable vote in 1973. However, the Industrial Department succeeded in replacing her at the selection convention with Ray McGran. Mac Giola reported that there may have been some irregularities in the convention, resulting in an internal party investigation. But McGran was confirmed as the candidate, a decision which led to De Burka ending her 22 years of membership of the party, decrying the fact that a clique controlled party policy. Hibernia magazine felt that the only odd thing about De Burka's resignation was that it was so long in coming, just how a committed pacifist could work alongside prominent members of the official IRA Army Council for so long is something of a mystery. In all, 16 SFWP candidates, five of them in Dublin and all of them male, contested the June election. Nationally SFWP fought the election on a policy platform of a massive increase of employment in the state sector, investment in public housing, introduction of universal free public medical provision, the removal of religious control of education and state ownership of natural resources and the banks. The numbers out of work in the Republic had reached 106,000 by mid-1977, and party propaganda focused on the need for radical solutions if an economic downturn was not to result in a return of mass unemployment and emigration. The party's radio election broadcast summed up the message, we have the most serious crisis in a generation on our hands. With a projected population growth of half a million by 1986 and a job need of up to 40,000 per year in the same period we are facing a daunting challenge indeed. Many people say that there is no difference between the coalition and Fianna Fail. They are quite right, we seek the support of conscious people who are not afraid to meet the challenge of our times by voting for the alternative policy and the alternative party in this election. The election resulted in Jack Lynch's Fianna Fail, whose manifesto had promised to slash taxes and increase private sector employment, achieving its most impressive result since 1938, winning just over 50% of the first preference vote. Significantly Fianna Fail received the support of over 54% of skilled workers, compared to just 11% for labor. The SFWP performance was disappointing. The party's 16 candidates had garnered 27,203 first preference votes in total an average of only 4.4% support in the constituencies contested. In Dublin only Mac Giola in Ballyfermot and Andy Smith in Dublin South Central gained over 5% support, and the highest left-wing non-labor vote in the capital was gained by the Socialist Party in Ballymun. Outside Dublin there were some promising performances, with Joe Sherlock receiving 9.5% in Cork Northeast and Paddy Gallagher 10.6% in Waterford. Both these candidates, as well as Donchad Mac Rignale in Louth, outperformed labor rivals. In Cork, the campaign was dogged by continuing bitterness over the 1975 OIRA killing of Larry White. In the aftermath of the election the United Irishmen felt able to claim that SFWP was, without a shadow of a doubt, the main working-class party in Ireland. A more sober internal review of the election pinpointed the need to surmount a remaining public credibility gap, which was best done by focusing on local activity rather than the expensive strategy of upping the party's profile by fielding a large number of candidates. It was felt that a strategy of attempting to keep rivalry with Labour as amicable as possible was preferable, in order to maximize the likelihood of receiving transfers from Labour voters. The poor results also provoked a major reorganization of the party leadership. Heffernan had decided to resign his general secretary position and a new general secretary role was created for Garland, 
ratifying his primacy within the movement's political and military wings. Mac Giola had given up his ESB job and would now combine his role as president with editing The United Irishman. Dale Hagan was appointed director of elections in addition to his existing role as director of education. During the election postmortem some in the leadership, notably Ochenath and Ryan, saw an opportunity to curtail industrial department influence. An election report drawn up by the research section was suppressed and the Irish Industrial Revolution was defined as not SFWP policy but rather an economic plan, worked out in the light of economic resolutions passed at various Ard Faciana. However, it was an indiscretion by Harris that presented his critics with their clearest opportunity. Earlier in the summer of 1977 SFWP member Paddy Woodworth had been waiting for a bus in Ballsbridge when Harris and his wife Anne pulled up in a car and offered him a lift. During the drive to Bray Harris disclosed to Woodworth his concerns about some members of the party leadership. Woodworth recalled Harris explaining that the party's primary problem was that there were green people, i.e. nationalists, still in charge, namely Mac Giola, Ochenath and Heffernan, and until we get rid of these people we will never make it as a communist party. Not an industrial department member, and already skeptical of Harris' influence, Woodworth was amazed at what he had heard. Such an attempt to influence a member against figures in the leadership clearly contradicted the tenets of democratic centralism. Woodworth recalls feeling really outraged, because we took the thing about being in a Leninist party very strongly, meaning if you were in a branch in Galway and I was in a branch in Clare I would not tell you about my views about Maggiola, the only place I could say my views was in my common, then up to Comherley Cienter then to Ard Chomherley. That was the only way, otherwise you were factionalizing. Woodworth discussed Harris' comments with John McManus in Bray. A few days later Mick Ryan called to see Woodworth at the Project Theatre, where he worked. He was questioned about the allegations and, aware of Ryan's seniority within both the OIRA and the party, stressed that Harris had not meant, eliminated, when he spoke of getting, rid of, the three men. In July Ryan took the matter up with the Coist Sista, a letter requesting that Harris explain his accusation about members of the leadership being opposed to the, further development of our policies resulted in two replies. In the first Harris claimed he was not a member of SFWP, Smullen explained to the Ard Chomherley that the denial of membership was to protect his job at RTE. In a second communication Harris denied making the remarks, attributing them to a third party. A leadership delegation of Ryan, Golding and Smullen was authorized to meet Harris and inform him that any reoccurrence would lead to him being disciplined. Smullen continued to defend his ally, requesting that due to his status as a secret member Harris' name be deleted from party records referring to the allegations. Eventually Golding and Harris met one-to-one. -one. According to Golding's report, Harris continued to deny the allegations. It was impressed upon him the serious view with which the Ard Chomherly took the matter. The fact that Harris was only reprimanded for a contravention that would normally have been cause for expulsion was a sign of the influence of the industrial department, but the incident also aided those opposed to its influence. Woodworth would later be scolded by an RTE producer and SFWP member for having single-handedly put a stop to political progress in the party for two years. The Labour Party's removal from government had heralded another bout of introspection and internal strife. Out of the now-defunct liaison of the left emerged a new Socialist Labour Party, formed around trade union leader Matt Merrigan and TD Noel Brown. The SLP made a number of unsuccessful approaches to the SFWP leadership about joint initiatives, but there was interaction between SLP and SFWP members in campaigns and policy discussion in Dublin. Meanwhile the Communist Party, freed from an obligation to maintain a semblance of good relations with the officials, intensified its contacts with other Republicans. During 1977 meetings were held between the CPI and representatives of the Provisionals and IRSP on the possibility of establishing an anti-imperialist, broad front. Neither of these Republican groups wielded any significant influence in the South, although Provisional Sinn Féin had several rural councillors. The talks were roundly condemned by SFWP and furtive attempts by the Communists to involve them were stridently rebuffed. Seamus Costello's participation in these meetings was brought to an abrupt end when on 5 October the IRSP chairman was shot dead as he sat in his car in Dublin's north inner city. Although many suspected OIRA involvement, SFWP publicly condemned the killing as an act that, in no way served the interest of the Irish working class. The IRSP had failed to make any electoral impact. Costello had won just 955 votes in the June general election, outpolled in Wicklow by SFWP's John McManus. At the time of his death Costello was the party's only councillor and with his passing went any chance that his followers would ever exert an organised influence beyond the paramilitary underworld. None of the official leadership were present among the 2,000 mourners at Costello's funeral, who included Bernadette McAlisky, local Labour, Fine Gale and Fianna failed TDs, 
the CPI's Mick O'Reardon and provisional Shin finds Rory O'Bradi. In her oration Nora Connolly O'Brien declared Costello, the only one who truly understood what her father, James Connolly meant when he spoke of his vision of the freedom of the Irish people. Two men were arrested after Inla volunteers fired a volley of handgun shots over the coffin. The late 1970s marked the height of SFWP influence in the student unions, with a number of mostly undisclosed SFWP members holding full-time elected positions in the Union of Students of Ireland. Among the SFWP members to achieve high UC offices during this period were Presidents Eamon Gilmore and Jerry Granger, Education Officer and later Vice President Padraig Mannion, and Vice President John Ryan. While SFWP were rarely in the majority on UC executives, they could usually rely on the support of other student leaders and the party exerted a defining influence. The party's other avenue of youth recruitment was through the Irish Democratic Youth Movement which, as the decade advanced, developed branches beyond Dublin and the North. The group also began to seek recruits within third-level colleges. The IDYM's orientation towards street politics met with SFWP disapproval, with Smullen criticizing a confrontational protest outside of Fianna Fáil Ard Thais. While Mornington's use by other sections of the movement waned, IDYM members from around the country regularly met at the venue to hear lectures by O'Hagan and Garland. The group's annual congress attracted notable guest speakers such as Sean McBride and the ITGWU leader Michael Mullen. The IDYM's encroachment into colleges was opposed by the SFWP students, who had voted against amalgamating with the IDYM, and became a point of contention among the party leadership. As IDYM recruitment was largely restricted to a handful of technical and teacher training colleges, where the majority of students are working class, and are studying practical subjects relevant to society, the SFWP leadership concluded that the IDYM could have a useful role to play. Over time the IDYM, like the FIANA before it, generally provided recruits for the army, whereas university graduates tended to gravitate towards the industrial department. However, the organization's lack of development became the focus of regular criticism from the Ard Chomherly. The lack of cohesion in the movement's youth recruitment strategy undermined the SFWP position within UC. A 1979 internal report noted the deficiencies. The position of the party within UC is undoubtedly strong in terms of power. The officer board and principal staff positions are filled by people who are, at least, sympathetic to the party's position. This position is deceptive, however, for although the leadership of the union is controlled by the party, the college position has become weak. A number of colleges are now controlled by Fine Gael, who have replaced Fianna Fáil, and the majority of colleges are now controlled by non-politicals, who cannot be relied on. Even worse, the next two years will see the departure of three quarters of the present party membership from UC. At present there is virtually none to replace them. As it takes two to three years to train a person for competency in UC, it is quite likely that unless a number of people are recruited in the coming year the party will lose control by 1981. Apart from the value of controlling a large organization with a good public image, the party should also prioritize retaining control of UC as a means of influencing and attracting left-wing students, and training party members for work in trade unions etc. afterwards. The UC report was correct in emphasizing the importance of student recruitment. Many former student members had maintained their party affiliation as they moved into jobs within state companies, the civil service and trade unions. The post-1973 recession had accelerated a growth in white-collar union membership as the middle classes saw their standard of living recede. In the ten years prior to 1976 membership of Ireland's 46 white-collar unions had increased by 71%. By the late 1970s over 60% of the total workforce were union members and the growth in union bureaucracy to cater for an increasingly professionalized membership provided more employment opportunities for young SFWP-aligned graduates. The recruitment of left-wing graduates was encouraged by ITGWU General Secretary Michael Mullen. ITGWU official and SFWP member Noel Dowling recalls Mullen's enthusiasm being largely born of pragmatism. He had the view that lefties, or people that thought they were, would make great trade union officials because they would work their asses off night, noon and morning because the harder they worked, they believed, the closer the revolution would come. Now Mickey, Mullen, never believed that, but it was a good tactic nonetheless. Mullen continued to be personally close to Garland as well as the new Minister for Health and Social Welfare, Charles Haughey. Mullen's move towards recruitment from student unions rather than from among shop stewards resulted in some resentment and a joke among ITGWU members that their union was being killed by degrees. Within the industrial department there was also some criticism of the graduates as people that never had to get their hands dirty on a building site, that never saw the inside of a jail, who didn't really have to take the rough with the smooth. Some of the new trade union officials had been SFWP members for several years. This category included Eamon Gilmore, 
who after two years as UC president took up a job with the ITGWU. Others only took up party membership after securing a union position. This was the route taken by another former UC president, Pat Rabbit, who left the Labour Party and joined SFWP after becoming the ITGWU official responsible for organizing senior management grade members. At the ITGWU Gilmore and Rabbit joined De Gerity, who by the end of 1980 was editing that union's publication Liberty, assisted by another SFWP. Graduate, D. McGarry, in Cork, party member Doc Doherty oversaw ITGWU activity in the city's port. The influx of SFWP-aligned officials brought a fresh intellectual rigor to trade unionism that won others over. Union of Professional and Technical Civil Servants member Seamus Cody had been active in the Socialist Labour Party before becoming disillusioned by the infighting. He recalls, there was a cutting edge to debate in the trade union movement. There was a sticky ideology that was much more than party membership. People were participating in the debate on the side of the Workers' Party who could not have joined. The most controversial debate would have been around the national question. The only people who were prepared to stand up and articulate a non-national position with any critical mass was the Workers' Party. It just opened up a sphere of influence for the party among skilled semi-professional workers. In the media etc., there was a category of people that were very attracted to the party's message. The Workers' Union of Ireland, WUI, second only to the ITGWU in membership, was initially the union most influenced by the SFWP Industrial Department. At the union's 1978 annual conference Harris delivered a speech in which he declared himself a turncoat on the EEC issue and demanded delegates dismiss a motion calling for a boycott of the upcoming European Parliament election. The industrial department was solidifying its influence within the WUI, pushing its support of national wage agreements while strongly criticizing moves to affiliate the union with the Irish Council for Civil Liberties because of the latter's perceived nationalist posture on Northern Ireland. Air Lingus worker Liam Maguire and Arte's John Caden were industrial department members who rose up the WUI ranks, followed by other SFWP members. Although the political affiliation of such figures was often obvious, a pretense of secrecy was maintained. When a Hibernia article alluded to the existence of a well-organized SFWP caucus within the WUI, the magazine was threatened with legal action and forced to print letters from both Maguire and Caden's solicitors stating neither was a member of any political party. The industrial department was a driving force behind the movement's shifting view on the EEC. In November 1977, the Ard Chomherly had decided to call for the party to contest all five Irish European constituencies. At the March 1978 Ard Thais the debate on whether to contest these upcoming elections was the main point of friction, with questions of finance rather than direct opposition to the EEC being the main argument of those against contesting. SFWP's slow move towards political respectability was illustrated by the handful of IRSP picketers outside the meeting and by Arte's decision to broadcast delegates' speeches directly, rather than via the voiceovers used to relay the utterances of paramilitary organizations under Section 31 of the Broadcasting Act. Garland addressed the conference for the first time as party general secretary. His speeches had become the centerpiece of Ard Thaciana, as a delegate recalls. He was a mystical leader to some degree. Everybody thought they were fucking great speeches and they sort of gave you a bit of time to sit back and listen to what the future struggle might be for you. While Mac Giola's presidential address had focused on the state of current party policy, Garland sought to restate the ethos underpinning the movement, linking Tone's attachment to the ideas of the French Revolution with the Fenians and Connolly's search for inspiration in Marxism. In Garland's opinion the historical tradition he outlined meant this was, not a small isolated movement but a world brotherhood that stretches through developed and developing countries to the underdeveloped and underprivileged of the so-called third world. Within SFWP such a, world brotherhood, was increasingly associated with an alliance with the, socialist countries, and Soviet-backed third world liberation movements. Sean O. Chenath headed the party's International Affairs Bureau, which spent a great deal of energy and effort on establishing links with such movements. A growing list of communiques from various international groups were being read out at Ard Thaciana and observers from organizations such as the PLO were annual fixtures. During 1977 and 1978 Ochenath visited Poland and toured American cities as a guest of black activist Stokely Carmichael's organization. Links were also established with the Puerto Rican Socialist Party. During visits to London he would make courtesy calls and hold meetings with a hodgepodge of international contacts. These included the exiled leaders of the Iraqi Communist Party though within a couple of years this link had been replaced by contacts with the governing Baathist party of Saddam Hussein. Closer to home the party continued to work closely with the Union Démocratique Bretonne within the Declaration of Brest grouping of European independence movements. Party members also visited the Basque region in Spain. 
Here SFWP found itself for a time in the contradictory situation of being linked to the faction of ETA that was continuing its armed struggle against the Spanish state while the provisionals had contacts with the ETA faction that had renounced violence. Funds were raised to help the reconstruction of Vietnam and to send medical equipment to the MPLA government in Angola. Garland visited Romania in October 1978, and relations were also fostered with the governing East German Socialist Unity Party. With the end of the Vietnam War, the focus of solidarity work had shifted from Southeast Asia towards opposing the apartheid regime in South Africa. Republicans had been prominent in the Irish anti-apartheid movement since its foundation, and SFWP maintained a delegate on the group's executive. The centerpiece of international work during the late 1970s was a trip by 23 IDYM and party members to the World Festival of Youth in Cuba in the summer of 1978. The festival was a massive event, with the Cubans playing host to more than 20,000 left-wingers from over 100 countries under a slogan of, anti-imperialist solidarity, peace and friendship. The SFWP contingent staged a number of performances of a play directed by Martin Lynch and distributed party booklets and t-shirts, while taking full advantage of the tropical sun and cheap Cuban rum. SFWP members were among the founders of the Ireland-Cuba Friendship Society in 1979. There was more good news from Latin America in July that year when the Sandinista rebels overthrew a pro-American dictatorship in Nicaragua. SFWP sent warmest best wishes to the new government. As an activist recalls, we basically saw the whole Cold War very much from the Soviet point of view. Anti-Americanism was basically our world view. Not everyone was comfortable with this, and motions from rural Kumain appeared at successive Ard Thaciana calling for the party to distance itself from Soviet communism. Domestically, SFWP was seeking to formulate a coherent position on a thorny issue that had emerged due to Ireland's economic development. In the face of growing energy demands the government had been considering diversifying electricity production, which, apart from turf-fired stations, overwhelmingly depended on imported coal and oil. The 1973 oil crisis concentrated minds on this issue, but it was not until the appointment of Desmond O'Malley as Minister for Industry, Commerce and Energy in 1977 that momentum gathered behind ESB plans for a nuclear power station at Carnosaur Point, Co. Wexford. Announcement of the scheme provoked protest from a nascent environmentalist lobby and many on the left. A SFWP delegation met with Friends of the Earth in early 1978 but there was no meeting of minds and by August that year the leadership was reprimanding the Irish people for giving support to environmentalists. Within SFWP suspicion of environmentalism had roots in the campaigns against a Dublin Bay oil refinery and the expansion of the capital's docks, projects supported by the party. In 1977 the party had welcomed the controversial Rebestos Manhattan plant to Co. Cork, despite its dumping of asbestos materials, and criticized, selfish opposition, to industrial development. The self-appointed leader of Dublin's conservation movement, Sean, Dublin Bay, Loftus, continued to be a party hate figure and, according to the United Irishman, the greatest menace to the city since the Black Death. SFWP's eventual decision to oppose the Carnosaur project arose, in Smullen's words, from the view that the party is committed to exploring the possibilities of all native sources of energy before foreign technology is brought in. Prioritizing the native over the foreign was inconsistent with the general tendency of the party in these years. The fact that the technology in question was American made. The difference. SFWP supported the 10,000-strong rally at the proposed power station site in August 1978 and distributed a leaflet outlining the party's position. The nuclear issue was discussed widely at party meetings. Smullen struggled with the obvious contradiction in opposing a scheme which promised to deliver, in the medium term, a massive increase in cheap electricity. It would not be until late 1979, and following an August rally by nearly 20,000 people at Carnosaur, that SFWP's research section issued a pamphlet, Nuclear Power in Ireland, which outlined a definitive position on the issue. This document expanded on views already aired in party media that the problem was not nuclear energy itself but the type of reactor proposed by the ESB, and hostility was expressed towards the element within the anti-nuclear lobby, who wished to turn back the clock on technology. It was declared that safety in nuclear